GTR 24 H 12 Hours of Monza Special Event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot Elite Gaming ESTV and Motorvision.tv Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the GTR 24 hour, 12 hours of Monza. What a race we've got in store for you. It is going to be a fantastic, fantastic event here today. Uh, we were obviously live with qualifying uh, last night. Uh, just a brilliant, riveting event that kept us all the way through and to the end. And uh, joining me, myself, Dave Christie, we're going to have Ewan O'Leary here with us today. I just absolutely cannot believe how riveting qualifying uh, was last night. It really kept us guessing uh, up until the last possible moment. So as we said, we've got uh, around about uh, 12 teams taking part. We've got one GT, uh, GT4 team that are going to be out there tonight. That is, of course, the Viaduct and Dick Lanes and the Alpine GT4. Uh, we've got the, uh, the 33 Mugen Sim Racing and the Audi of Zoltan Verconi and Christopher Kian, uh, they are sorry, Christopher Kianek, uh, taken against the uh, Romada Motorsport 51 outfit of uh, Pedro Romada and Paolo Reese. We've got 62 units in racing uh, BMW M6 of Max Bunvik and uh, Alexander Zakhanov, the 777 DSR Nightmare outfit of the uh, Carol Lickegaard and Kim Pedersen, the 23 GSR McLaren 720S of Nikos Pamphlel and uh, Christophoros. Karaoris 
uh, the 14 GSR team Aston. Now we didn't actually see the Aston Martin out in qualifying last night. That is of course Stavros Muziadis uh, along with his teammate Nicolas Eustathio. Uh, then you've got the 007 Pro Sim. They were struggling towards the tail end of uh, qualifying last night in that sole Bentley GT3. That is of course Morten Norgard and Morten Eggson. Uh, then you also have the, the two satellite teams, the VRS satellite racing teams, caught up in a little bit of controversy last night in those twin McLaren 720Ss. Uh, Jimmy Nasula and Andre Sinek, along with the 65 of Nilo Pastorino and Tom Capusta. Now, the 65 actually ran out of fuel in qualifying last night and ended up getting a bump from the 64 uh, to, to push it back to pits. Now, that's completely against the, uh, the regulations, and uh, I think the... the the end of it basically was the 65 got into trouble for that uh, because the 64 uh, wasn't told that they weren't allowed to do that. In fact, they were actively encouraged by their sister team to uh, to do that. So a little bit of naughtiness and race control were left scratching their heads towards the end of last night there. Then you've got the 74 Juices Motorsport Club, McLaren 720, that's Ray Ress and Kabasa Kiss in that one as well. And then 717 Unison Racing Corvette GT3 last minute addition to that they were allowed to enter after some uh, pre-race uh, checks went on with that one Denis Ashenko and Arcturus Kamal in the Corvette as well what a wonderful sounding machine as we said the Viaduct and Ducklings uh, Danish team 12 year old Carters joining us on one of their very first sim racing expeditions uh, that is of course Martinus Berg and Victor Dahl best of luck to them they'll be on their own but what an experience that is going to to be for them for sure as you said we'll be joined by Ewan O'Leary in just a couple of minutes time but a very warm welcome to the stream hope you're all doing very very well in these crazy crazy times uh, and as you said the race is about to start in about 25 minutes time so we've got uh, weather to talk about we've got qualifying to talk about the qualifying ended up looking like this it was of course uh, the Mugen Sim Racing team that were up on top after that uh, that final qualifying last night because it was a an aggregate score of course over the uh, the two uh, qualifying sessions it was uh, a 145 Point two seven for the the Mugen Racing of uh, Zoltan that, uh, that that really set the uh, the pace early on and it was a, a fantastic fantastic early pace uh, that, that started there. So as we said, we're about twenty five minutes uh, away from uh, qualifying and really really looking forward to this race. And uh, if I have a look, I think we might even have uh, you know Lady in the comm studio, but he's he's not able to speak just yet. I, you, as if by magic, as if uh, on command, uh, you appear to be there with us. How are you, my friends? Yeah, I'm doing very well, folks. Uh, David, good to good to be here. I've not been here long, by the way, um, but uh, just getting everything set up here, uh, ready for the race. Um, but uh, but yeah, looking forward to it. I've not been on uh, so far this weekend, as you will have noticed if you've been uh, watching on um, for practice and qualifying. Unfortunately, I missed both of those. I was doing other things, but um, yeah, I'm glad to be here for the race now. Uh, special event, no pressure, no. Uh, no, no implications really it's just a, a race in isolation and uh, yeah it should be good fun we'll see how it goes yeah, it certainly should, certainly should. And uh, I mean, one of the things that we were talking about with Chris Buxton last night and uh, with, with Kieran as well was the fact of, you know, this is just another stepping stone in how much sim racing has uh, come along in the past uh, 18 months with the likes of the, the pandemic, uh, you know, really pushing these these virtual events to the forefront. A huge shout out to the production team in the, uh, the background for today's event. Obviously, we have to say a Party, thank you in advance for what they are uh, about to do. They're the, the guys and girls that are behind all of the visuals and indeed sorting us all out uh, behind the scenes as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of minutes. You get to enjoy the uh, the sights and sounds of the cars on track. We'll be back in just a minute's time with myself and you in to, uh, to have a chat, get a little bit of build up and get you all excited for the race ahead.
Welcome back then, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to the 12 Hours here of Monza. It's myself, David Christie, along with Ewan O'Leary, bringing you live coverage throughout the day. We'll also be joined as well by Chris Buxton and by Kieran, as we saw last night as well. Uh, Ewan, a, a big, big day ahead. The weather doesn't seem to be an issue just now, but again, looking at the forecast, it's uh, later on this afternoon, that might be a very, very different story altogether. Yeah, it's uh, apparently uh, recently anyway, the uh, weather has been uh, very changeable uh, around Monza for the last few days. It doesn't normally happen because it's very uh, open and quite flat around Monza. It's not like there's mountains either side, like Spa, for example, where the weather can roll, or the Nürburgring, where the weather can roll in very, very quickly. Um, but uh, seemingly that's all changed in recent days. Anyway, there's been uh, thunderstorms around the area, and uh, that's uh, what we're expecting to see a little bit later on uh, around 5 o'clock below local time is what I saw on a, on a particular uh, forecast site that there's going to be some rain um, at, uh, at four o'clock, uh, sorry, five o'clock local time, four o'clock in the UK. So that's about five hours into the race, expecting thunderstorms. And then when the rain does hit, I think it's probably going to be wet all the way to the very end because uh, the weather seems to be so severe at the moment that uh, you know it could well be uh, a complete washout for the rest of the uh, race and uh, yeah once that rain does start to come down then I don't think there's going to be any turning back for these track conditions which are going to be uh, pretty terrible for the second half of the race. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, real life, we've seen some absolutely scary conditions over the past month or so around about that region. And obviously, our, uh, our, our hearts go out to everyone affected by this. And, you know, thankfully, we're, we're very fortunate here in the virtual commentary box, but stay dry and warm. And uh, even if you're lucky like me, get served the occasional cup of coffee as well. Let's uh, go back to qualifying then last night. And it is, of course, the number 33 Nugan Sim Racing team that are on pole position of Zoltan for Kanye and uh, Christopher uh, Kianchi, uh, sorry, Kianek that's uh, on that pole position. And that was a la late gasp effort there, taking that 145-236, uh, that combined effort over the uh, 64 satellite racing team who were just one-tenth of a second you know, behind that, uh, that pole position time. And then it is really a sort of a, a, a wide chasm to the rest of the field. The 74 Juices Motorsport Club in third place there with a 146.07. 1.6 seconds behind your first and second place there. GSR Team McLaren, the number 23 in fourth place there, 1.9 seconds off the lead. It's then Ramada Motorsport, the number 51 in fifth place with the 007 Pro Sim Team down in sixth place. It's the 717 Unison Racing Team in in seventh place, a DSR Nightmare in eighth place there, Unison Racing 62 in ninth, and the GS GSR Team Aston in tenth place there, obviously not taking part in that nighttime session. And then the 65 Satellite Racing Team, now this is the big news, they get a five second penalty union for that infringement last night of pushing to the pit lane, that puts them right to the back of the field, and they've got it all to do today. Yeah, they have. Um, but uh, looking at the pace that they have shown, I don't think on the, on the length of the race, I don't think it's going to be too much of a problem for them uh, to get through the field uh, here in this one. Uh, as you mentioned, five second penalty added to uh, added to their time. I guess you, you could say they might, would have been around fifth place maybe uh, without that penalty somewhere around there. Anyway, put it somewhere uh, in the upper midfield. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's uh, it's still disappointing for them. Obviously, they'd rather not have to start from the back if they could avoid it. But um, I'm Unfortunately, that infringement means that they have to. Um, but at the front of the field, Mugen versus Satellite, looks like it's going to be between those two uh, for the race, really. If it's as close as qualifying suggests it's going to be, then it's going to be a fantastic race. Just one uh, tenth of a second between them uh, at the end of the two qualifying sessions. Um, and, uh, yeah, that puts us in a great position uh, here for the race. Very much looking forward to it, but uh, there's, there's a big gap back to the rest of the field. Uh, and you could be forgiven for thinking that it's going to be <coughs> excuse me, a two-horse race. Um, however, I do think that the battles in the midfield are going to be very good indeed because um, you have to go down all the way to that satellite racing 65 car that got the penalty to find more than a one second interval between the, uh, one car and the next. It's very, very close um, as you go down. Uh, that 1.6 second margin between second and third could be a little bit misleading if you're just reading off the results on the website right now. Yeah, and, and for sure, and what compounds that as well, Ewan, is the fact that that was a aggregate 
a qualifying session so we had a daytime session and we had a nighttime session as well and uh, basically both times get added up divided by two and there's your um, there's your result the thing for me for that 65 satellite racing uh, the the uh, uh, VRS satellite racing team is the fact that they were actually fighting for pole position but believe it or not they were actually fighting for that pole position with the uh, Negan racing team uh, early on and then they kind of fell back over uh, you know they were up there for about 20-25 minutes and then they just sort of lost all the pace whatsoever Mugen Sim Racing and the uh, the 64 VRS uh, satellite team found incredible pace they were just going toe to toe for about 45 minutes of that hour and a half uh, qualifying session last night so uh, again a very very difficult situation and it leaves that 65 very vulnerable today but I've got no doubt that as you said the mid pack battle is going to be absolutely intense and it's another thing to say you know it's all very well being fast in a one lap uh, setting but how are you able to translate that into 12 hours over the race over what on earth we're about to experience over the uh, the, the next couple of hours here it's uh, it's going to be a very different kettle of fish isn't it uh, it is. It, it's always uh, uh, misleading, the, the qualifying for a 12-hour race, really. It doesn't matter too much uh, in the end, because at the end of the day, the 65 could well still win, uh, even though they're going to be starting from, uh, from last in duty free, they could still uh, be, be the, the last one standing, so to speak, really. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, qualifying, not, never the most important in a 12-hour race, but, uh, you know, for entertainment purposes, it was uh, it was a pretty good idea uh, last night. So, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I guess the, also the thing, and you kind of uh, mentioned it as well, is the fact that the weather may develop throughout this race, and we didn't really see that in the um, in the qualifying sessions. What are these teams going to be like in the weather? Which car is going to be strongest in the rain? Um, because uh, we've seen some uh, a lot of McLarens at the front of the field um, so far. You know, it's satellite juices, GSR, all in McLarens, and the other satellite car would have been as well. That probably would have been four McLarens in the top five. Um, but uh, how are those cars going to do in the race? Um, if it starts to rain, uh, is is the question. Are the Audis going to be stronger in the rain? Maybe the um, Bentley's going to be good in the rain. Not entirely sure, but um, yeah, we're, uh, we'll, we'll see if uh, the rain does indeed come and uh, what effect it does have uh, on these guys. Because uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a vital part of this race, especially towards the end. It certainly will. Profound uh, effect, I think, on our factor two is the platform that we're using here as well. Uh, the, the weather effect that it does have is very pronounced, it's very quick, and that cutoff point between going from dry conditions to greasy conditions to those wet conditions happens a lot faster, perhaps, than in any other, uh, in any other platform. So they're going to have to think about what tyres they use, when they use them, and really, if it's at that point that they need to use them as well because the difference in pace between dry tyres on a wet track uh, that's, that's not quite there yet is absolutely absurd you're talking about three four five seconds a lap that you can get so i think there's there's going to be some big big positions potentially for those who decide to be brave in those changeable conditions and as we heard from our production team as well that's if those conditions come because we've had the threat of uh, some heavy heavy downpours for the past couple of days but they've never really materialized at least at the circuit because of course remember you know this is based on real life uh, weather you know weather uh, forecasts and weather conditions right now so this isn't uh, a simulation over the uh, the race weekend this is actual conditions at the actual track right now so another fantastic and immersive little variable that uh, the team at GTR uh, are able to uh, to throw into the mix here and um, you're obviously looking at the, uh, the the pack that we've got as you said, we've got the two guys up at the front. You've got uh, the Mugen Sim Racing and you've got that 64 VRS uh, satellite sim racing team. That mid-pack, I think, will be more of a, a, of a factor than qualifying leads on. And you said that just a, a couple of minutes ago there. Um, but what did the mid-pack need to do in this first hour coming up? I think get through the first chicane 
is the first job um, because uh, we know how uh, dangerous it can be at Monza. Um, we've, seen, we've all seen the incidents and accidents over the years down there. It's, it can be very dangerous. So that's the first job um, is to just get through there cleanly. Um, and then most of all throughout the race is just to run the laps really, yeah, I think, and um, try and get to get towards the final couple of hours with um, a decent position really, no crashes, nothing like that. And just, uh, you know, we just keep things going in the right direction keep you know and uh, and then uh, and then we'll see where they come out at the at the end of all, all of that after about 10 hours or so and then they can uh, push for a position or uh, or do whatever so um, yeah I think first of all it's going to be very important to get through the first few corners and then uh, start to run laps really and stay out of trouble is, is going to be the name of the game especially if weather hits we keep talking about it but keeping it on the road is going to be very important you don't want to be picking up damage and spending ages repairing the car in the pit lane um, you just got to accept that some cars are going to be faster than you at the early part of the race and uh, you know you've got to not really worry about that because it's not really a problem um, until it, the, the the latter portion so uh, yeah just 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 run the laps for now and then uh, and then see where you come out in in the final two hours which are the most important of course well, let's see uh, if we can do that then. Let's see if we can go actually go on board with uh, Carlos Basto in the uh, the number 51 just now. He's in the uh, Audi just on the back straight just now. And we'll actually, we'll talk you through a little bit of the uh, the, the circuit just now. We're actually watching the uh, the Bentley just now, the 007 Pro Sim team. Um, we'll uh, have a little watch with them just now. So obviously this circuit is a, a very, very fast circuit. Um, uh, one of the fastest in uh, GT3 racing and what you'll find is that the, the the corners really all flow into each other and that sounds so cliche but they really do the exit of one directly affects the uh, the ability or your entry speed into the next one here so we're currently on board with the uh, or we were on board with the uh, 007 Pro Sim team here and we go to start another lap here we're actually up with the uh, the uh, Bentley just behind and there's the uh, Audi in front of it that is uh, Carlo Basto there so on the way down down into turn one then into that first chicane and it's so important to get that breaking point that breaking uh, marker on the left sorted out because you know you're you're focused on it and you want to be as late onto the brakes as you can but as the race goes on your brakes start to wear your tires start to wear and it's very very easy to see that place as uh, a bit of a bottleneck and uh, just saying here this is uh, Jimmy Nasula in the uh, the number 64 we're still on uh, warm up at the moment five and a half minutes to go until we get underway with the race and also five and a half minutes uh, here until we welcome the viewers on motorvision.tv to this uh, to this awesome awesome race as well so um we've got just a couple of minutes before we uh, we get going with things what do you think we should be looking out for this afternoon uh, well, a, a, lot, a lot of racing, a lot of rain, um, and uh, yeah, hopefully excitement um, for us uh, throughout the day. Uh, yeah, it, it should be a, a good race. These special events always do uh, throw up some, some surprises, some uh, things that you don't expect, and uh, yeah, they are they are fun events to do. I know we've done the. Um, 24 hours in Nürburgring in the last couple of years, uh, which has been a fun event to do, and um, yeah, we, we've, uh, d we're doing the uh, the Monza 12 hour this time around in uh, kind of late summer special event. So um, yeah, they're, they're always a, a, a little bit of fun because you know there's no pressure for any of these guys to uh, perform really. It's just about uh, having a bit of fun for all of them, um, and uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see uh, everybody get to the end. And it might be an unrealistic. Um, wish maybe but uh, but you know it's uh, you never know we could get lucky i suppose um in in that respect so yeah it should be uh, good indeed and uh, yeah looking forward to it um yeah let's see uh, some good racing let's hope well, that is certainly what is on the cars just now. We're seeing uh, Jimmy Nsula here in the 64 at the moment then, just come through the uh, second Variante, through the first and second Lesmo, on the run down through Seraglio, onto the bikes, into the left-hander at Ascari. So important not to cut too much of the kerb there on that left-hand side, through the chicane, through nice and wide on that exit. That's exactly what you want. You want to get the power down nice and early as well. And then it's this long run down the back straight here. This is where you're going to 
to see the drag racing. This is where you're going to see cars tucking in behind each other, trying to get the toe as they go as late as they can onto the brakes into the parabolica. The car drifts out wide to the left and again early on the power. That's exactly what you want on this number 64 machine because of course that is the uh, the McLaren 720S and it gets across the line. Again with warm up just to, to give you a flavour of some of the times coming in. We're now into the 147s and again no surprises to see that is the VRS satellite racing team 64 in that uh, that bracket as well as the uh, 33 Megan Sim Racing. Zoltan Varconi though, um, whenever you and he's been able to step into the car uh, we've not really had much of a chance to see Christopher uh, Kianic behind the wheel of the Audi though but when we see Zoltan behind the wheel he is just absolutely devastatingly fast and really between them and the 64 I think there's going to be some big fireworks today yeah, they, they're definitely one of the favourites uh, to take a victory. I was going to uh, bring this up a little bit, a uh, little, little bit later on, but I'll do it now, I suppose, um, because Mugen Sim Racing are in the EWC uh, in a GT3 car. Um, so I thought coming into this weekend, when I was having a look, little look at the uh, at the teams that that might give them a bit of an advantage. But um, they've not actually chosen the car that they run in the EWC with. Um, they have the older generation McLaren 570S, is it, or is that the new one? I think it's that's the, that that's the old, old one, one, isn't it? Because it's, uh, I think it's the uh, the six six twenty seven twenty twenty seven twenty. Seven twenty. There we Something go. With the 20. We know our cars. Don't yeah. We? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're trying. Um, but uh, but but anyway, they, they run the old McLaren in the EWC, and uh, they're going for the uh, Audi on this occasion uh, in the special event, which did surprise me a little bit. But I guess they want to drive something a little bit new. And uh, Christopher Kiernick isn't even one of the drivers in that GT three car. Um, he is uh, an, an LMP two driver uh, for Mugen Sim Racing so uh, that was a, a surprise to me as well um, so uh, so yeah anyway a couple of surprises but from then um, but uh, yeah it doesn't seem to be phasing them at all uh, the way they're going at the moment is they're going to be fighting hard with uh, satellite racing all throughout the day I would expect because uh, yeah two uh, two top teams and uh, very experienced in GT freeze as well so uh, expecting uh, a lot from those guys yeah, we certainly are. We certainly are. Of course, with the 12 hours uh, looming upon us, we are just a couple of minutes from going live with the uh, the race itself. The cars starting to head onto the grid. So let's take you back then through the uh, the order, the running order for today's race. Then we have got uh, 12 cars as they uh, start to do their formation lap. So qualified went like this. It's pole position for the number 33 Mugen Sim race of Zoltan Verconi, Christopher Kianek and Roland Sukes. Uh, it is then going to be alongside them is the 64 VRS Sim Racing Satellite Racing Team of, uh, let's see there, that is the 64, so that is uh, Jimmy Nasula, Henry Sinek and Liam Rance at the wheel. Uh, row 2 is going to be the 74 of Juice's Motorsport Club, that is uh, Rui Ress, Kabasakis and Pedro Cruella Gomes and then on uh, fourth place alongside them on row two is the 23 GSR team of Nikos Pamsel, uh, Christophoros Carolis, and then Andres Rosavo. Uh, fifth place is going to be the Ramada Motorsport outfit. It's 007 Pro Sim Racing. I'm going to ratchet things up because the uh, the pace car is doing a cracking job of getting them around this circuit. Seventh place for the 717 Unison Racing outfit. The 777 DSR Nightmare Audi is in eighth place. I love the livery on that thing. Uh, it's the BMW G2, uh, sorry, GT3 62 outfit of Unison Racing. And then it is the GSR team Aston in 10th place with that penalty going to the 65 team of Satellite Racing, VRS Satellite Racing. Down in 11th place, our sole entrant for the GT4 team is going to be the Team Viaducton in uh, that uh, first place. They're obviously going to be guaranteed you a great win in that GT4. If if they can finish there but uh, cars making their way through the, uh, the the second half of the circuit now and uh, yeah anticipation excitement really starting to build 
Yeah, it will be for all of these drivers, especially uh, who are making their way towards the start line right now. Um, it's uh, it is going to be a lot of anticipation, a lot of nerves, I think, especially uh, at a circuit like this. There's uh, not really anything compared to this um, in the EWC or, or any of the other races uh, that we go to. So, um, yeah, it's uh, ex extremely... Uh, What's the, what's the word for it? They're going to be apprehensive, let's say, about the cautious. first chicane. Yeah, very cautious, let's hope, um, into uh, into the first corners as well, because there's nothing really, no circuit really like this on the uh, on the GTR calendar um, from uh, from here on in. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all on the line for these guys now, and uh, we're not too far away from the start. You disappoint me, Ewan. You disappoint me. Is it even GT3 racing at Monza if we don't have murder, death and mayhem at turn one into the first chicane? Never mind. We're about to find out because the cars come round to the final corner then through to start this 12-hour race here on GTR 24H. Thank you very much to everyone that has joined us as well on MotorVision.tv. A very warm welcome. I'm Tim Chris. Alongside me is Ewan O'Leary. Green flags flying. We go racing then for the 12 hours of of Monza and what a start it has been for the uh, that uh, Zoltan Vaconi, the number 33 outfit as the car is making their way down. We've got a little bit of contact further back but that is looking very, very clean, very prim, very proper and very sensible for a 12 hour race. Um, is this sim racing, Ewan? I, I'm not sure what I'm watching here. Yeah, it is very, very sim sensible indeed um, at the moment, especially at the front. It, I guess it helped with the Mugen Sim Racing really stringing things out and uh, getting a very good start, kind of single filing it just a little bit to make things a little bit simpler for those behind. Um, but uh, now, they, now the battles are starting to happen into the second chicane. There's a couple of guys side by side a little bit further back. But yeah, great to see everybody getting through the first sector of this race without problems. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant start to the race then. So it's still the 33 of Zoltan for Kanye ahead of the 64 of Jimmy Nazula. 74 of Rui Reese in third place just now with Tony Pardon, uh, Paparinopoulos in uh, fourth place there in that 23 car. So again, no issues whatsoever. All of the cars here and... I, I've got to be honest, I'm completely shocked here from all of my experience here in GT3 commentary. I've never seen this. I've never seen a clean opening lap at Monza. This is brilliant stuff here, but uh, an absolute testament to the quality of these drivers as they come out of that uh, that corner there and get themselves on to the long straight there. Ascari is such a difficult corner and it all leads up to getting yourself a good toe down towards the, uh, the Parabolica here and uh, there we see the 007 there, the Pro Sim Racing Team outfit, uh, trying to catch on to the back of uh, Carlos Basto in that 51 Audi. Lap 1 in the books already, and we have got 11 hours, 55 minutes left to go in this race. Cracking, cracking start there. Um, so, obviously, everything is go right now then, Ewan. Uh, car's going to be really trying to settle down, but... I mean, this first hour is so crucial for these drivers, isn't it, to settle down and get themselves into a rhythm. Yeah, it is going to be important for a rhythm uh, in this race. I guess the first hour kind of uh, sets the tone for how the whole race is going to go for you. So uh, it is very important to uh, have a clean first hour. It's good to get through the first lap OK. And now you can start to settle into the stint a little bit. And it puts the rest of the team at ease, really, um, as to how it's going to go for the rest of the race. So, uh, yeah, it's good that everybody's got off to uh, a clean start. Not too many uh, massive disasters for anybody either. You know, we the guys at the front are still generally near the front and the guys at the back are still generally uh, near the back as well so um, nobody's uh, dropped down from the front to the back is uh, what I'm trying to say and um, yeah that's, uh, that's good news as well to get yourself off to uh, off to a clean one. The 65 um, as we'll be kind of watching them throughout the first hour quite a lot because of um, the situation they found themselves in having been uh, given a five second penalty and uh, got, that has got them all the way to the very back of the grid I think they've made up a, a position or two maybe um, but uh, but not too many I'm trying to find them at the moment I think they're uh, 11th maybe I don't know uh, but anyway um, they're, they're a little bit further down and uh, yeah unfortunately haven't been able to make up any spaces yet so uh, I thought they were had uh, I thought I saw a McLaren in front of a couple of people but apparently I didn't um, and that satellite racing car hasn't made any progress just yet which I was expecting actually I was expecting them to make to make their way through the field in the opening lap here but um, they haven't been able to at all unfortunately 
Yeah, they're involved with a cracking fight there, the 65 team that you were talking about there, actually with the number 14 of uh, Valadis Carales there on the run down in towards turn one there, and uh, that's a great move. Just as you literally said that, Ewan, he got his very first move done, but I agree with what you were saying. I was expecting this barnstorming start from the number 65 to keep on to it, and he's actually lost touch with that group in front of him because he's now 12 seconds behind the leader, and he's about three seconds seconds off of the group that's in front of him. He will make very short work of that. I've got no doubt to see that he'll catch up there. But uh, yeah, that is not the kind of start. And you can see there actually in the background, just way off into the background, that is actually the McLaren there of uh, Juan Amaya in that uh, number 65 machine. So he'll definitely be trying to, uh, to catch back up to the group there. But I mean, the race lead, the pace from Zoltan Verconje on that opening two laps there, absolutely incredible. I mean, he's opened up uh, a bit of a gap. Uh, a 147.2 was his last lap there. Actually, hang on a second, because Jimmy Nazula in that 64, the gap was about nine, ten, uh, nine tenths of a second to 1.2 seconds there, and it's now down to about six tenths of a second. So Jimmy Nazula, he's uh, he's wanting to stay in touch on this one here, Ewan. Yeah, he definitely is, and uh, he could uh, use that uh, car quite nicely, actually, to uh, maybe get himself, um, you, you know, a little bit of fuel in this one, maybe play the fuel game in this one, um, and kind of use that sip stream to ease off a little bit down the straights, for example, like you would see at a Le Mans, maybe, or Spa, for example. So, um, yeah, that could be uh, very useful for Nissan Lover. Let's see if he does indeed do that. He's staying behind for the moment, um, and I don't think there is any point for him to actually fight this one out. It's going to be uh, a real slog fest between these two um, teams throughout the entire day and uh, you know there's no point in being ahead at the first hour you've got to be ahead at the end of the 12th hour um, and uh, yeah the, the, the overtaking right now is not really going to help that because it's not like he's got that extra little bit of pace where he can uh, run away from that Audi you know it's going to be close between these two they're going to be able to stay in touch with each other um, here so um, you know there's uh, there's no point in overtaking for Nisola uh, at this point in my opinion but uh, Obviously, it would be exciting for us if he did indeed go for it. I'm just watching this, Ewan, and I was a little bit lost for words there, and I'm looking at the pace that Zoltan Verconje and Jimmy Nuzula have compared to everybody else in this field right now. Only three laps in, and they've opened up a five-second gap over uh, third place of Rui Reese in that 74 outfit. That is incredible early pace to, to be opening up so early on and getting that kind of a gap. And the, the two of them, we said this during qualifying last night, it feels like they're in a completely different league to everyone else. They're actually making it look like they're in GT3 cars and everyone else is in GT4 cars. It is a big gap between that uh, between those cars already, and uh, yeah, I only expect to see that gap extending uh, throughout the day, really, as the two Unison Racing cars are actually going to make a switch there. So Nikolai Bezhukov gets in front of uh, the Corvette um, there. Oh, big slide out of Parabolica as well for that Corvette, which is not really helpful. Uh, and the Audi behind now is going to try and get through. This is Carl Lekagor trying to get through in the Triple Seven TSR Nightmare. Are they going to be able to or not? The Audi looks pretty good in a straight line and the Corvette not so much. Uh, although it's holding on, the BMW punching a big hole in the air for it and that's just helped it along to stay in uh, eighth place here for Denis Tchenko. Uh, um, yeah, throughout the 24 hours of Nürburgring, we saw that old, uh, that Corvette really quite slow in a straight line. On the dusting of her, they were getting absolutely minced, but it seems that uh, the uh, maybe aerodynamic settings they've got on that car at the moment or just something they've done to it um, has uh, clearly helped them out a little bit because they're able to hold on to positions a little bit more easily than they were a few months ago. Yeah, just watching that there, it's a cracking battle as we watch the uh, the leaders coming through uh, the first and second Lesmo. Uh, this is the battle then for fourth and fifth position. Uh, just seeing uh, Tony Paparinopoulos and uh, Carlos Basto fighting it out as well. They're coming out of that second Lesmo on the run down uh, towards uh, Ascari corner there. Ascari, I, I, again, you in one of those corners that you really have to get right. It's one of the most important corners on the track because it exits out onto that long straight and if you lose momentum there you're a sitting duck for the cars behind you 
Yeah, most of these chicanes are very important because they often lead into really long straights. Um, that's the, uh, the kind of way Monza goes, um, really. So uh, it's, uh, it's really quite uh, difficult um, to, uh, to, to get away with mistakes, really. Uh, and you ideally don't want to be making them um, because of the straights we saw. We nearly saw that uh, a perfect example of that with the Unison racing car uh, we were talking about a few moments ago with that slide off of Parabolic at that time uh, nearly got uh, overtaken taken into turn one so um, that was a close moment as well um, but uh, but yeah it's, it's it's certainly an interesting situation we've got going on at the moment certainly the leaders are staying very close together and um, this uh, lap car is going to be upon us very shortly 50 seconds off of uh, the next car at the moment so uh, I would say maybe a couple of laps away uh, maybe from uh, from actually getting lapped here for the first time it's not going to be a huge factor in this race because there is only one GT4 car to be lapping for these cars How However, um, it's still something to think about. And they could be a little bit out of practice, really, uh, throughout this race. Since they're not actually overtaking very many slower cars, it might spring as a bit of a surprise uh, on some of these guys. I mean, um, you know, normally in a multi-class race, you see a lot of lap traffic and you get used to it. But on this occasion, that's not going to be the case. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely spot on. And as we said, it's uh, one of the first races for that team, um, that uh, that very young uh, karting team of Magnusberg, Victor Dahl and Jonas Dyberg. What a fantastic experience, isn't it, though, for, for one of your first sim racing events to jump in to uh, a 12-hour event here at, uh, at Monza. And you've also then got uh, all of the other cars around you uh, teaching you about you know spatial awareness, watching your mirrors and and just really being aware i think they're uh, they're, they're going to do themselves pride for sure today Yes, that's certainly. Um, it's uh, it's going to be good to get experience, and they're kind of gathering that experience for the um, the last two races of the EWC season. Um, the, the Viaduct and Ducklings car. It's, it's the Viaduct and team have already got one car in the EWC in the DPI category um, for the final two races, um, and uh, yeah, the uh, getting some experience for the younger drivers, and that's exactly what uh, we'd like to see more of, really, in the special events. It's some uh, drivers who we haven't really seen before getting some experience in, a, uh, in a, another event very similar to how an EWC event would be actually run uh, and uh, it's a perfect proving ground really because it doesn't matter how they do really um, but uh, it's fantastic experience and uh, it's uh, very very useful for the drivers and the teams to uh, figure out what's what with these uh, new people that uh, you might want to bring on the team when, uh, when a more important event maybe uh, turns around yeah, perfect, perfect training ground for sure on this. And you'll have to forgive me because I have been absolutely glued to this battle for the lead that is going on just now between Jimmy Missoula trying to catch on to the back of uh, Zoltan Varconi. Uh, Jimmy making a little bit of a mistake out the second. Les were running a little bit wide across the gravel. That's cost him about a tenth of a second. But that whole point you were making there about not overtaking, about you know keeping yourself calm and just keeping yourself in that that uh, slipstream of Zoltan Verconi. I don't think Jimmy's got that memo, I'll be honest with you, Ewan, because he's looking very, very menacing right now. He's actually uh, was closer at the start of this lap than he's ever been through the, uh, the course of this race. He was down to about four tenths of a second, but he is starting to drift back a little bit. I wonder if that toe has just been broken from Zoltan Verconi, because that's now up to uh, seven tenths of a second. We were also actually seeing some uncharacteristic errors there. We saw uh, Zoltan on the exit of that first chicane there, just lighting up the rear tyres a little bit too early, a little bit overly keen. And actually, as soon as I say that, Jimmy now right onto the back of that uh, of that leader. And bear in mind, we're only what uh, 15 minutes into the start of this race. This is starting to get a little bit spicy here. It is indeed, and uh, yeah, Nisula is trying to try to uh, apply the pressure, but I don't think he is going to be uh, making a, a move at this point. It's uh, certainly close though um, between them. The battles further down are a little bit closer um, as well, with the uh, Unison Racing and the Triple Seven DSR Nightmare team battling it out. Satellite Racing not far behind in tenth. Uh, so this midfield battle is uh, living up to uh, expectations, and so is the battle for the lead as things stand. It's uh, been very very entertaining so 
far. And it just depends at the strength and depth of these teams at this point. We've got Nissolo in there at the moment. Henry Sinek, Liam Rance and James Zuba also in that satellite racing team. That is a very, very strong team. Um, and it mirrors the 64 in the DPI category uh, we see in the Endurance Racing World Championship um, that uh, has its next round in about four weeks' time. Um, the uh, Mugen Sim Racing team is not... Uh, well, I'm sure they have raced together in the past, but Varking and Kienak is not a team, uh, is not a pairing that's normally seen uh, in events broadcasted by GTR 24H. It's um, a little bit of a new one to us. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how they get on. How can they um, cope with the, the stresses of a 12 hour race as a two man team, uh, as opposed to the, the four man team that we see uh, from Satellite Racing? More options available to them, certainly. Yeah, for sure. And on that note as well, is one thing to uh, to remind the viewers at home about is the the uh, the physical and mental toll that these events have on these drivers. Um, you know, gone are the days, maybe say 10, 15 years ago, where we think that oh, it's just a game. You know, they're just sitting at home with their control pad. These are now, uh, you know, borderline full fledged athletes. Uh, there's there's absolutely no doubt about that. These these youngsters and and not so youngsters are doing several <laughs> events a week. They're they're doing you know they're doing in training, they're doing practice, and I'm just getting slightly distracted. So we've got uh, a bit of a move going on here. Two tenths of a second from Jimmy Nizula. Where did that come from on Zoltan for Kanye? Zoltan is not used to this sort of pressure right now. And uh, given that this is a 12 hour race, uh, I'll come back to my point that was a way to make very, very shortly because I hate to say it, Ewan, but we have got a race on our hands very, very early on. We have indeed, and uh, that's very, very good news for us, certainly. Varking is going to be probably defending into Ascari here, and he does indeed keep it to the middle of the road, just to let uh, Nissala think about it and decide which way he's going to go. He chooses the outside line. Does he break later? No, not really. They're very even through the corner. Varking holds him off for now, and uh, this is uh, almost a precursor to what we're going to see throughout the day. Fantastic racing already between these two. That McLaren looking very strong in us straight line though Oh, this is... Do you know what other the, the other part of this? I mean, this is great to watch, obviously, for everyone at home and for us in the commentary booth, but the other unintended consequence of this is the fact that these two fighting starts sending them backwards and it starts reversing that amazing pace that we've got here. Let's have a look at our, uh, our fancy little replay side by side as they go towards uh, Ascari there. And you've got to be honest, he was kind of showing the door there. But look round the outside going down towards turn one then. And Jimmy is still a temporarily in the lead. Audi's going to have the inside line into the first corner there. Oh my goodness me, we have got fireworks already. The McLaren boots down on the accelerator, fires it out the corner and straight back on to the rear of that car. And that gap that was 9.2 seconds to Rui Reese now down to 8.5 seconds. So the more that they fight, the more that's going to bring them backwards towards that group behind them. Yeah, exactly. I was going to mention the fact that uh, it's going to help everybody in behind. We know how close the midfield is. Um, well, it could become the front of the field and it could be just as close if indeed these guys do uh, battle as closely as they are right now. I've just spotted as well around the corner through Lesmo 2 the uh, Alpine just in front. You can see it in the foreground there. Nissala and Varkingi are going to have to negotiate um, this car and let's see what uh, kind of effect it has indeed on these guys guys first time through it looks like they're going to get it on the run between Ascari and Parabolica so it might not be uh, too much of an effect in this battle on this occasion at least Oh, awesome, awesome stuff though. So they're going to uh, think about it and uh, almost lick their wounds and, and think about it again as we see the, the GT4 uh, outfit <laughs> rather lonely at the back of the uh, the field there, the Viaducting team. Now, this is going to be interesting because they're trying to take the inside line there. Uh, they move off the, uh, the racing line, let the two GT3 cars through. Great spatial awareness from that sole GT4 outfit. But... We start again. We go into the slipstream because uh, Jimmy Nazula just three tenths of a second behind your uh, leading car of Zoltan Varconi in that uh, that 33 outfit, and it has to think better of it. Can't quite make any moves in that Mugen Sim racing. Gets to lift oh. the tail another day, and the Audi slides. And this is exactly what we saw two laps ago. That Audi under pressure really doesn't like taking it because out of that first corner, that's the second time we've seen it 
it power slide as Zoltan gets it too far into the uh, the corner there into the run down towards uh, the uh, the second variante on the inside takes a lot of car and the ID just comes oh, in no. they tear them off into the barriers oh my goodness me the GT4 lives to tell the tale and says see you later and that is absolute drama and chaos and why? Why at the start of a 12-hour race would you put yourself and a car that you're fighting under so much pressure? But hello to blowing the doors off the rest of the race, Ewan. Wow, that is a big, big moment in this race, and it's happened within the first half an hour. Now we've got Juicy's Motorsport Club leading, and we've got the first five cars separated by about three seconds as they make their way through the GT4 car for the first time. Uh, well, for the second time, I guess, for Mugen and for Satellite. It's, and they're seeing it again a bit quicker than they were hoping to. Coming through Ascari at the moment, the leader, Rui Race, has got a little bit of uh, a gap now as uh, Tony Paranopoulos is going to try and get through on Zoltan Vaki rubs salt into the wound almost uh, by getting through here. But just look, the entire race in one shot there, almost the entirety of the field. And it's all on one small straight after just over 20 minutes. A huge, huge moment. Now, how are these two guys going to recover uh, from that? We haven't seen them being set back for, so far. Now, what, how are they going to respond to this little setback that they've got right now? Oh, and there's contact further down the field. We've got a battle going on with Denis Lyshenko, and uh, that is uh, Lickgaard that's in that as well, along with, I think that's uh, the 65 of Juan Amaya that was caught up in that one. So, I mean, it's all going off right now. That is Juan Amaya trying to get on the inside of uh, Lickgaard there. Gets the job done. It's going to be late on to the picks. Is there going to be more contact? No, because the 777 of Lickgaard decides to do the, uh, the better thing there, pull out of it and decides to get going. Wow, what an absolute thing for, the, for that to happen and for the entire race to be turned on its head within the first half an hour of racing, Ewan. I think we're going to need defibrillators by the end of this 12-hour race here. Uh, yeah, possibly. Um, if it's uh, if indeed it carries on like this, it's very, very entertaining indeed. And we, we didn't expect to see such high drama so early on. Um, I was expecting them to come into contact at some point throughout the day because they're just going to be racing so close for so long that it's going to be very, very difficult not to. But um, I wasn't expecting it within the first 20 minutes of the race. But uh, that sets us up beautifully now uh, for indeed the rest of it. Uh, let's see uh, how, how it uh, really affects the race and how it affects Varkingy here because he's, as I mentioned, not really had a setback so far in this race we're so early on that uh, why would you have? But how's that uh, going to affect his tyres? How's it going to affect his morale and his driving throughout this race? You know, well, how's, what's, the, what's the effect of that? So, um, yeah, that's a, a big, big moment. And uh, he's slowly bringing Deuce's Motorsport Club back, but he certainly doesn't seem to have the pace that he did before that spin. They were running away from the rest of the field before. Now they don't seem quite as pacey compared to them as they were before. We'll see uh, once the cut tyres cool down if that changes. But for now, not too much is, uh, is ha happening in terms of uh, marking his pace. It's not uh, increasing, certainly. I tell you what, Rui Reese just wants the race to end right now. He wants that checker flag. He'll take that uh, that win if that was to, to happen. 11 hours, 34 minutes left to go. And he definitely didn't see this one coming. Uh, and that's a lot of pressure for the number 74 uh, Juices Motorsport Club uh, driver to, to actually have on his shoulders right now because Zoltan Verconi is, uh, is absolutely pushing as hard as he can to try and catch back up. But he's also taking uh, Tony Papadinopoulos uh, up with him uh, with that number 23 GSR outfit car as well so uh, looking a little bit further down uh, Juan Amaya really hasn't been able to make any inroads whatsoever uh, as far as he'd like to we're currently watching uh, Lickgaard uh, going through the, uh, the, the corner there but uh, again Papadinopoulos here Ewan he's keeping up with Zoltan Verconi but I wonder if there's damage to that Audi because he's we saw it the two of them were just on a completely different uh, a different playing field but now that Audi just isn't able to catch back up in the same way 
Yeah, not really. I, I just, I do wonder if it, there's maybe a bit of damage, but I think more likely is the fact that the tyres have got very, very warm um, in that spin, and it's really affecting them uh, pace-wise. If he lets them just cool down just a little bit more um, before going again, so to speak, then uh, maybe things will be a little bit different. But um, I think immediately after the spin, he's bound to have be having some problems. It looks like uh, the GSR McLaren is very, very close to actually making a move, maybe, um, in to turn one. Don't quite know if uh, that's going to come off or not, but uh, certainly under a lot of pressure right now. And we know that the Audi doesn't like pressure. That's the thing. It's uh, incredible. Again, uh, a little bit of a slide from that Audi on the first corner there. And... Uh, yeah, this is uh, a fascinating, fascinating battle. So while you're watching the battle for P9 right now, we'll obviously, uh, we've got the luxury of being able to switch between all the different cameras up here in our virtual commentary booth. So we can keep you up to date with everything that's going on right now. And yeah, I I've got to be honest, I am not liking how Zoltan Verconi is driving that Audi right now. Uh, just to give you an update on Jimmy Nuzula in that VRS satellite racing 64 outfit. He is catching on to the back of the number 62 Unison Racing BMW. Great to see them actually taking to the uh, start of the race there, but uh, that 62 uh, Unison Racing currently has uh, that is uh, Nikolai Bezrukov behind the wheel of that, and the BMW seems to really struggle you in a straight line here, and uh, quite honestly, I think the McLaren is going to make very, very short work of it. Yeah, I think the McLaren's quite good in the straight line, actually, which uh, is uh, kind of distorting that effect maybe a little bit. We've just seen Juan Amaya actually get through on the uh, the Corvette just behind there. Another one of the Unison Racing cars, Dennis uh, Enchenko, uh, who's just got past there. So, uh, yeah, I think the McLaren is quite strong in a straight line, and it's making all the other cars look quite bad uh, in a straight line. But, uh, you know, we're not quite deep enough into the race to know for sure um, as things stand. A little bit of weaving around and a little bit of battling going on uh, but uh, yeah the slipstream is uh, going to be very important especially for the car at the back Carl Leikago um, driving the DSR Nightmare car I think we're going to have a real head of steam going down into turn one maybe uh, a movie is going to be on uh, for this car with Eschenko and Amaya just in front of him yeah fascinating fascinating battles cap pretty much happening all throughout the field there I'm still keeping an eye on the uh, the, the car of uh, Nikolai Bezrukov who is in the BMW trying to hold on to that 6th position from the recovering Jimmy Nazula as you're watching that battle for P8 raging on behind here and uh, the McLaren just towing into the slipstream of the BMW ducks out of that to try and make the move that is going to be on the entry of 2nd Variante gets the move done, very very clean very very proper and that that, unfortunately, is how he would have wanted that move to happen on uh, Zoltan Verkonje. But a little bit of an update to the leaders here, Ewan. And I'm, I'm going to call it right now. Um, that Audi is really struggling. Those tyres surely would have cooled down by now. And he's still 1.8 seconds. Now, given that he was lapping about eight tenths of a second faster than everyone else on the track here. Oh. And the fact that... Oh, we've got a car off. That looks to be the Unison Racing outfit. Uh, that's the... Uh, the, the Corvette, the 717 uh, that is off in the background that's Dennis Eschenko there and uh, that looked to have been now was that help drowned or was that off his uh, own accord? Have a look it's a replay coming up on your screen. He just lost it on his own, actually. Uh, Eschenko just loses it on his own completely. Uh, on the entry to the corner, actually, through the entry to mid part of that corner, just losing it, trying to reverse back out there onto the circuit with the car coming is uh, very, very tricky indeed. But Eschenko was able to get himself back going again, and now he's a few seconds off the back of the field, but at least he is indeed back. Yeah. Cracking, cracking replay there. Thanks to the uh, the production team for that one. Uh, just give you an update on your race leader then. Ray Reese, 1.8 seconds ahead of Zoltan Verconi. Still uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff there. But the gap to Tony Papadopoulos in third place kind of opening up now. Uh, that is now 1.3 seconds. So he has broken that gap there. But that Audi still not able to, uh, to catch up to that 74. We're only half an hour, can you believe it, into this 12 hour race but uh, Ray Reese, you do you think he can believe his luck right now given the qualifying and given the way that race started that he's now leading the race and not only is he leading he's looking very comfortable in that lead as well 
Yeah, well, you, pro- you probably can't believe it, if we're honest, um, at this point. It's uh, it's all gone his way. As I mentioned, I expected at some point there to be at least a little bit of contact between Satellite Racing and Mugen because they're so equal on pace that they were bound to be battling the entire day. And even if, you, you know, it, these guys are obviously trying their best not to hit each other, but at some point it's bound to happen, um, whether that's due to racing too hard or not, really. But... Yeah, I don't think uh, anyone was expecting it this early, and uh, Marie Reese was uh, probably uh, not expecting it this early either. But uh, yeah, Rocking is good. Brought their gap down to 1.4 seconds now. Juices have just got to try and make the most of this situation they find themselves in. They've not got to not be like wondering how it happened or in incomplete disbelief. They've just got to get get their heads down and kind of go for it here, um, and just try and do the best that they can with the situation. See, first of all, how long they can hang on to the lead for, and can they hang on? With with the leaders, maybe Rui Reese can't, but you know maybe some of his teammates uh, will be able to uh, hold on to the lead and hold on to um, the cars around. We'll, we'll wait and see if Shaba Kiss can do it, or uh, maybe uh, Pedro Gomez can do it. Um, we'll wait and see. Um, but uh, but you know it, for, for the moment, it's uh, it's all going their way. I tell you what, Juice's Motorsport Club social media has never been so busy right now. They're going to be taking all the screenshots, all the tweets, all the, uh, the updates right now. We're in the lead of this 12-hour race, and rightfully so. They've just kept their heads clean. Uh, but again, this is exactly what endurance racing is all about. You can take your, uh, your season favourites, you can take your uh, commentary tips, you can take your previous performance, and it all means absolutely nothing. Nothing in the blink of an eye. Ray Reese currently in the lead of this uh, race then for Juice's Motorsport Club. He'll be handing over the car to Cabasa Kiss to Pedrosa Krula Gomez and uh, they'll hopefully uh, be enjoying what they're seeing just now because even if they weren't to keep hold of that lead, the performance that they've put in just now in this McLaren with the fact that they can hold on to it they're looking a very strong second place right now, at the very least. And that's on the uh, the assumption that Zoltan can actually get past because we know that Audi's hurting. Uh, we know that there's it's not fully on the pace. It is starting to claw down that gap and the pace is starting to come back. But is it going to be enough? And can Rui Reese, you know, really harass that Audi? Again, Zoltan has been crumbling a little bit under pressure here. A uh, little, little bit. There's been uh, there's been things not going their way. Certainly. Um, for Varking in for Mugen Sim Racing as a whole really but um, yeah I don't think it's too much to worry about for them at the moment there's still 11 and a half hours to go uh, for them to uh, kind of rectify the situation so I don't think they're going to be too worried um, just for the moment it's it's a great moment for Rory Reese though and indeed Deuces Motorsport Club he's a, a new driver to the GT3 team at Deuces not entirely sure if he's a, a new driver to Deuces in, in its entirety or just the um, just GT3 driving at that particular um, at that team but uh, but yeah he's, he's doing a, a great job either way uh, we certainly haven't seen him in uh, in the EWC for example um, but, well at least I don't remember um, possibly may have done but uh, I don't remember um, but uh, but anyway it, it's, it's a fantastic drive from so far he'll be in there for at least a couple of hours and uh, yeah it's it's even if he were to get out right now it would be a job well done really because he's kept the car on the road he's got himself into the lead he's got the team into the lead and uh, yeah they can't really ask for more than that and they cannot indeed and I'm just trying to figure out what has happened actually to Zoltan there because uh, that gaps went up so he is I think he's actually pushing a little bit too hard in that car believe it or not um, uh, he's, he's trying to get onto the back of uh, Ray Reese there but it's it's not happening this is uh this is starting to get a little bit interesting, I've got to be honest with you, purely because, as I said, it's one thing catching up to that car in front, but it's a completely different kettle of fish actually getting past them. Um, and with 12 hours to go, I would argue as well, Ewan, that maybe they're going to want to be a little bit cautious. If they know they've got the pace, then do they really need to go past that car? Do they need to take the lead? Are they just going to settle in and keep their nose clean, given what happened with uh, Jimmy Nazula? 
Yeah, we, we, we said, yeah, we said that with Jimmy Nissel. I thought he was going to stay behind, but he clearly had enough, and uh, that racing driver instinct took over. Speaking of Nissel, he's just gone down the inside of ProSim to get up into fifth place. So back into the top five now for the Finnish driver um, and satellite racing. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a fairly simple slipstream and uh, on the brakes manoeuvre in the end. Um, but uh, but yeah, you, you never know. Those racing drivers' instincts do tend to kind of take over, even when you know rationally win not involved in that car at the moment in the heat of the moment and um, which probably helps but rationally you wouldn't go for it and these drivers probably know that as well if they were thinking straight but you know they're in the car in the heat of the moment and uh, you know thinking can go out of the window uh, every so often so uh, you never know what's going to happen Barking he may well go for it even though he realises that it's not the best choice so uh, let's wait and see he's not there yet as you mentioned he's got to get there and then pass which is a whole different prospect um, but uh, yeah expect to see a couple of surprises maybe uh, when we uh, when we get there is he going to stick behind or not that's the big question Right, here's a plot twist for you. Jimmy Nazula now up to fifth place. Zoltan Verkonyi, the two warriors who tangled up earlier on, in second place. The gap between them, seven seconds and shrinking quite rapidly. It was about eight seconds, nine seconds. Jimmy Nazula carving his way through the field. Zoltan Verkonyi seems to be at a standstill. That gap now back to about a second and a half up to Rui Reese. But the thing is, Jimmy Nazula has the pull of the cars in front of him to keep that forward momentum going, to keep pushing him through that field. So are we going to get to a stage in, say, 20, 25 minutes' time when we have to start thinking about our first pit stops where Jimmy Nazula is right back on the tail of Zoltan Verkonyi? Yeah, we could well see that situation and who knows what's going to happen uh, when that does. I feel like at some point in this race, they are going to cross paths again um, at some point. But uh, it's just a case of when that's going to be, um, really. And I'm not sure for the moment. Um, you know, it, it's, it could be 25 minutes, as you say. It could be 20... No, I was going to say 20 hours, we're not in a 24 hour race but you know, it could be in a good 10 hours time when they cross paths again it could take that long but um, you know, what happens when they get there is is the real important thing, is there going to be any kind of bad blood between them, is Nissan going to be annoyed at Varkingy um, for how the incident happened um, is the uh, you know, what's going to happen uh, with that we'll wait and see when indeed it does happen but um, you know, it's Nissan is certainly in progress well, you're going to have to stay tuned to find out how this one develops, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching the GTR 24-hour, 12-hour race of Monza here with myself, Dave Christie, and Ewan O'Leary. Stick with us. We're going to take a very short commercial break. The GTR 24-H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot. Elite Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. 
Anyone can buy CO2 neutral apps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for New Forest. Racing for Green. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, then, to the 12 Hours of Monza. We hope you've had time to go and get a cup of coffee, some juice, some, some cereal, and uh, settle yourselves down, because we've got another 11 hours and 20 minutes of this. Uh, right, it is all kicked off in the break, so let's bring you back up to speed. Jimmy Nuzula has strapped a rocket to the back of his car, and he's currently making his way back through the field as we speak. He's on the back of Carlo Basto, as you can see here on the the back straight he's possibly going to try and make a move into the parabolica but again he's going to be wanting to be very very measured about it the other man on the move now i'm going to presume this is from a mistake from rui reese because the gap was 1.6 seconds the gap now down to just half a second between rui reese and zoltan verconi for that lead it's highly likely that zoltan will try and make a move but again, he just seems to lack that straight line pace. It's Dave Christie along with Ewan O'Leary for this first couple of hours. And Ewan, I had a look at the commentary rota there. Um, you're in for a long day, my friend, aren't you? Yeah, a little bit. Um, because, uh, yeah, well, I'm not, I don't have anything else to do unlike everybody else. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, so I'm going to be here for pretty much the entire race, I think, at this point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, well, never mind. It doesn't matter. Um, it should be a good race as Nisola is going to get down the inside of the Audi of Carlos Basto. We thought this was going to happen about five minutes ago. Uh, but uh, he's just been biding his time, really, and into that chicane where he and Varkin came in together. Uh, not so long ago, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes ago, uh, may unfortunately have that little accident. Um, well, Nissolo has put those demons to bed almost with one move, and uh, he's through on Basto now. He's going to be marching on up towards the podium. Um, and, uh, yeah, just to go back to Rui Reese for a moment, the gap to uh, from second to third is, is increasing to nearly five seconds now, which suggests to me that Reese has kind of increased his pace a little bit, uh, rather than Varking losing a little bit of pace, because, um, you know, it, was so close to the midfield before this incident you know, 20 minutes ago but as soon as he got into the lead Reese was really uh, starting to uh, starting to put the pace on and uh, yeah I think that might have contributed to uh, Varkingy struggling to get on terms it seems that he has done now though and uh, might be looking to make a move to get back to the lead again in action that we've got going on here. We're watching Zoltan Verconi in that number 33 Mugen Sim Racing Audi onto the back of Rui Reese. He's absolutely glued to the tail end of that car. And again, 11 hours, 15 minutes to go. You would be forgiven to think that this is a one hour sprint race from everything that we've seen right now. Now, this Audi really struggles in that first corner. He got a decent ish exit from that that time, but again, taking so much carbine on that first part of the corner, it really compromises his exit out of that corner, doesn't it? Yeah, they really do monster the curves around here. There's some absolutely massive ones, especially in the chicanes for anti-cut purposes and things like that. Uh, and so it uh, it does look a little bit strange, especially here for the second part. You can see them bouncing across the curves, but um, you know these suspensions can definitely take it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just about how the quickest way round, really. Do you want to shorten the corner off a little bit, or do you want the run down the next straight? Well, it seems that these guys will have found the best way through here um, for the moment um, because uh, you know. They're 
they've been doing all the practice and uh, now they're into the race uh, so uh, you know it's it's quite uh, quite interesting to watch at the moment to see uh, which one is the better strategy at this point but uh, but no it's, it's certainly a fantastic fight and uh, yeah these guys are learning the circuit at the same time as uh, learning each other I guess a little bit learning the strengths of the weaknesses of the car the driver and uh, Barking is just sizing up Ruby's at the moment yeah he certainly is and uh, here's a little bit of a, a, a little into the mix that uh, I'm going to throw in there. Jimmy Nazula was eight and a half. In fact, no, make that nine seconds behind that lead battle. Jimmy Nazula is now five seconds behind that lead battle. Brace for impact, folks. This is going to get rather, rather interesting and very quickly too because what you've got to remember is that we've got pit stops coming up very, very shortly and that adds a whole element of strategy into the mix as well. We've seen various times where pit lane infringements and other issues can lead to to problems there now that Audi is right onto the back of uh, Rui Reese there but again is it quite close enough to uh, to, to think about making the move right now and uh, I, I do wonder Ewan if if that confidence has been knocked a little bit about being around other drivers about you know trying to stick your nose in because what we've got to remember is Zoltan Vercani was in the lead of this race and it was through Jimmy Mazzula fighting him and again we'll have to, to, to have a look at that uh, earlier on the two of them coming together and you see there again a huge moment there from the Audi of uh, Oversteer and that loses him time again he goes back to about a second there I I'm really not too confident in that Audi that there's not some uh, underlying damage there yeah, it could just be the the way the car's set up or indeed the way um, that uh, it's, it's developing at the moment for him or the way he's driving. But, um, yeah, certainly it's a little bit unnerving watching that car. Parky may well be just struggling a little bit with uh, getting over the contact and trying to, uh, you know, get that move going again now. But maybe he's just seen a little bit of sense in it and it's maybe not the best idea to go for it now uh, and uh, he's just staying behind uh, being a little bit sensible for the moment I'm not entirely sure if that is going to be the case or not but um, it's certainly uh, it's certainly a possibility that uh, he's willing to stay behind now and uh, maybe save a bit of fuel and then uh, and then go for it again a little bit later because this race isn't going to be won after the first hour it's going to be after 12 um, so it, there's, there's a long way to go for Varkingy right now and uh, maybe there, he's seen sense that there isn't any point in making a move right now he's better off waiting uh, and uh, striking a little bit later yeah, very, very possibly might be the case. Uh, brilliant pictures that we're able to see here thanks to our production team of an onboard stream with Rui Reese on the right-hand window. There you can see all sorts of information on his screen. I was also noticing you and his tyre temperatures were looking very, very warm indeed. Uh, not anything to be concerned about, but again, just showing how much he is hustling that car and how hard he is pushing right now. Yeah, absolutely. These guys are all up on the ragged edge almost uh, at this early stage. When you see positions around you and in front of you so closely like that, um, then the, you know you, you tend to do that. But um, you know, it, maybe it's not always the best idea. Um, but it certainly seems like you mentioned it a little bit earlier that it's going to be. Uh, it seems like a one-hour sprint at the moment, uh, and that certainly seems to be uh, the case. But uh, these days, these races do tend to be 12 one-hour sprints, really, especially with the GT3 cars, uh, the way they are set up. Um, the, the strategy is a little bit less of a factor normally and uh, it's it's really sprint racing in between the pit stops and that's what we're seeing uh, the first part of at the moment as Nissler and Valkingi both making moves at, at simultaneously almost but uh, fortunately this time it's not going to be on each other uh, because uh, you know we know how that ended last time at the second two game we'll hope things are a little bit cleaner between the next time around Nissler certainly showing that he does have that little bit of pace though as we go on board with him Yep, down the main straight then, and uh, the Audi not looking like it's got the toe. The same can't be said for the McLaren in fourth place, hunting, stalking down Paparinopoulos there, and Paparinopoulos makes the move to the Whoa. outside, goes too wide into turn one, and has to use the escape road there. The McLaren surely is going to take that position from uh, the, uh, the third place 23 car. He does, lets him through, and I wonder if there's uh, some, some issues with that 
that car I'm hearing from production team there might be engine issues with that uh, or transmission issues with that car of Papadopoulos so that would make sense if the car's just straight lines and he's not able to shift down the gears there Ewan so huge drama with uh, just 49 uh, sorry 49 minutes gone in the race Oh, that's uh, really disappointing for them. I've got to. Uh, tr we're going to try and get a replay for it for you uh, right now because uh, yeah, I've uh, got him uh, uh, running down towards turn number one. We'll see what indeed happens uh, to him here. Um, if we we're hearing that it was a double downshift, um, which is uh, quite famous really for blowing engines. Let's see if that indeed is the case. He shifts oh. down very quickly indeed. Um, that, uh, yeah, we didn't really see fifth at all there, did we? We just went sixth to fourth uh, and then third, but realising the fate of that McLaren. I actually thought he was waiting for Nisola to go through so that it would, it would not incur a penalty for skipping the corner, but unfortunately um, its fate is a little bit uh, worse than that. Yeah, so just to remind you then at home what happens with this situation is that the team obviously not out of the race. Uh, they take a virtual tour back to the pits, they get the car repaired and they get back into the race. And in the grand scheme of things, we've seen uh, teams come back from much, much worse than this. So keep an eye out on that team. Uh, they will be on the recovery drive, obviously not what you want to happen. Uh, but yeah, that's been the whole theme of this first hour. Uh, and we see a huge mistake there from the McLaren of Rui Reis. He wiggles from side to side and that almost hands on a silver platter. The lead to the uh, Audi of Zoltan for Konya is going to be the battle of the breakers there. It's going to be on the inside of the corner for Rui Reis. They're on the run down to the chicane but the Audi is going to have it on the brakes and that McLaren tries to think better of it but the lead then almost inevitably going back to Zoltan Varconi but here's the question what is he going to do under pressure here because the Audi really does struggle and have a look on in the background there as well because we need to get the production team readying up the theme from Jaws anytime shortly Jimmy Nazula now 2.7 seconds you in behind your leader yeah, absolutely. He's driving very, very well at the moment. Sometimes we see after an incident for some of these guys that they actually drive a little bit better because they're quite angry and it does give them that little bit of pace. And uh, that might be something that we're seeing right now. I don't think this is particularly uh, angry about it. Do Finnish people get angry? I've not seen it. But anyway, um, maybe they do. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's, he's certainly driving very well at the moment. That's the point. And uh, Varking is being reeled in. Uh, if it was a fight between them one and two, then Nisola would be a good few seconds in the lead at this point um, had they not had that incident Rui Reese has started to pick up his pace a little bit and uh, drop the rest of those guys behind so um, yeah it's all getting quite pacey at the front of the field really um, and uh, yeah there's a, there's a lot going on but Nisola is certainly um, menacing in the background right now and driving very very well at probably the fastest car out there on the circuit Barking he's going to have to respond he certainly is, and uh, the McLaren of Rui Reis tried to hold on to the back of Zoltan Verconi there for that battle for first, second and third there. Further down the order then, fourth place is currently Carlos Basto. Uh, Prosim in the 007 uh, is in fifth place. Uh, Nikolai uh, Bezrukov in the 62 is in uh, sixth place there in the uh, let's see, 62 is of course Unison Racing. It's the 65 VRS satellite racing of Juan Amaya in 7th place, the triple 7 after that spin for DSR Nightmare in 8th place of Lickegaard and then in, uh, sorry, Carl Lickegaard uh, Valadis Corrales in ninth place there in the 14 um, GSR team Aston and then the 717 of Dennis Ishenko in that unison racing uh, machine as well Tony Papadopoulos in the pits there in the 23 uh, GSR team getting repaired just now and then the Viaduct and GT4 team still plodding away by themselves uh, just uh, getting the job done but we're still watching this battle for the lead raging on here Ewan and you get the feeling with the pace of Jim in Missoula, uh, putting in 147.109 the best lap of the race, but he's still lapping about 8 tenths of a second faster than both the cars in front of him. Surely this is a matter of time. 
It, it looks like it at the moment, but let's not forget those pit stops are approaching. What is the Audi going to be like out of the pit stops? Obviously, the McLaren in second and third are going to be the same out of the pit stops, pretty much. It's just going to be a case of which driver is going to uh, hit the ground running, really. Are these guys going to change tyres? Is what they're going to do with a higher fuel load on board? All these questions we've got to really answer um, in the next uh, few moments' time. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just having a little bit of a, an overview, a bit of a look at what um, the standings are looking like after nearly an hour of racing. Varkingi from Reese, uh, then Nisola Basto and then the Pro Sim car running out the top five so uh, very interesting indeed and the top three very very close as well. It's, uh, it's a very interesting race at this stage. Not going to lie, it did have a little bit of a brief panic there as uh, my view certainly switched to the safety car. I thought that was trying to imply something, then just realised that was just a camera randomly switching to the safety car. So panic over everyone, there is not any safety car there. Great to see the, the Viaducting team uh, still out on track. Th do you know what? They are just plodding away and, and I love that. I love the idea, right? They've not got anybody else at the racing. But they're just happily still taking part, still uh, doing their best with that uh, that little GT4 car. Uh, here's a little look at the uh, the weather at the moment. Um, yeah, nothing really to write home about. I know you and you were getting very excited at the prospect of thunder and lightning and torrential, torrential rain. But really, it's it's not looking like we're going to see any of that at least in the next hour or so. Uh, no, it doesn't look like it for the moment. There's a few clouds developing, but uh, that's, that is something to write home about in Italy, I suppose, because it doesn't happen very often. Uh, but, uh, but certainly the rain is uh, very... Uh, around the corner I would say really but I kind of don't want it to come at this point because we've got a fantastic freeway battle for the lead I'd like it to stay dry and this battle to continue really um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll wait to see if it does but uh, Rich is certainly driving very well indeed uh, Varkingi is at the head of the train trying to defend for all he's worth and we'll see how aggressive he is on this occasion is he going to have learnt a lesson and uh, you know try to um, be a little bit more cautious on this occasion not quite defend so hard um, but uh, or is he going to go for it all the same we'll wait and see because we've seen this situation before albeit without the Deuces car involved we've seen this situation before and uh, we all know what happens so uh, yeah let's see if indeed uh, it does spill over on the circuit or indeed if uh, the battle goes to the pit lane because it could well do so the question is, has Zoltan Verkodi learned anything from his previous outing there? And the survey says, no, not a chance, because you can, he's going to get absolutely assaulted by these McLarens here. Rui Rees actually doing a brilliant job of catching back up now to that Audi. He goes a little bit wide out of the second Lesmo there, uh, and that allows Jimmy Nazula to try and get the run on the run out of Ascari here. That Audi just does not look convincing at all right now. I'll be completely honest with you. Uh, that is going to be a double toe for Jimmy Nazula. They're on the run down to the Parabolica here and uh, you can see there a little look out there from Rui Reis. That Audi is under so much pressure right now. Do not be surprised if that thing makes an unforced error because the Audi, notorious for uh, snap over sale. And then the pit then goes Rui Reis. The first one to blink is Rui Reis from second place. That hands Jimmy Nazula that uh, second place then and uh, oh boy oh boy have we got a race on our hands because if we cut to Nazula that gap is now under a second eight tenths of a second there and uh, Ewan this is starting to get a little bit interesting now it is indeed, and uh, yeah, we'll wait and see what develops between the two of them uh, over the course of the next few laps. Are they indeed going to battle it out on the circuit or not at this point? Um, Nissala and Varkingi back together again. I, did, I must admit, I didn't think there would be nose to tail this quickly uh, here once again. I thought it would take a little bit longer than this uh, for Nisola to catch back up again but he's done a, a staggering job to be honest um, at, uh, at catching up and now he's starting to apply the pressure uh, to Varking and we can see him just running onto the gravel on the left hand side there which is not helping his cause now what's going to happen when indeed they come past the pit lane on this occasion um, because uh, it could get very interesting 32 laps uh, was the stint for Juicy's Motorsport Club on this occasion you can't imagine that Nisola is going to be able to go much longer because they are in the same car after all 
Yeah, they certainly, certainly are. Fascinating battle unfolding right in front of your very eyes. A very good afternoon if you've just joined us. This is the Monza 12 hour special event from GTR 24H. We are live on YouTube as well as being live on Motor Vision TV as well. Uh, currently watching then, this is the battle for first and second place. And uh, through the parabolica goes uh, Zoltan Varconi on the tail of him is Jimmy Nazula. And Jimmy Nazula into the pits then. No surprises there because he did a fastest sector one and a fastest sector two. So that tank is absolutely empty. And then that means that Zoltan Varconi runs off into the sunset. But I don't think he's going to have too much pace on this next lap here. This is what's going to count. Yeah, let's see if uh, the uh, undercut is going to work or not. Um, but uh, while this is happening, uh, we're going to take a brief look at some highlights uh, of the uh, race so far. We've had a lot of them um, so far. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, you can still see live pictures from the bottom right. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens on those live pictures because uh, Rui Reese is going to be certainly near to Yumi Nisola at some point um, when he comes out of the pit lane. Is Nisola going to jumped him or not in this one um, that's going to be the uh, that's going to be the big question here and what's Varking going to do is he going to be in at the end of the next lap I would expect him to do so but you never know he might try and run this out a little bit longer to make a bit of a fuel game yeah, so just let's bring you up to speed on what happened in the past hour then. Zoltan Verconi led the field off on that pole position. It was a straight-out dogfight that developed between him and the number 64 of Jimmy Nuzula. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe into the second chicane. There was contact between Nuzula and between the Audi as well later on in the lap. It was a heated battle with many, many bits of paint being exchanged and places going left, right and centre. You can see there that Audi taken that position back, but it was later on at the second chicane where the two of them collided into each other and sent both of them spinning off the track, thankfully avoiding the barriers and uh, sending the race lead into the clutches of Rui Reis, who held on valiantly for a good part of the race. It was then up to Jimmy Nazula to catch back up through the field. He was the worst affected by that early crash in the first 20 minutes of the race. You'll see here up side by side. And this was really one of those moments where we thought, or you don't need to make that happen but it was that early curb and it was the contact between the Audi and the McLaren both of them thankfully avoiding serious damage into the barrier and if I'm honest I think that little squirt of the accelerator there from Missoula is saving him from any uh, real issues there but this was Tony Papadonopoulos there doing a great job of making his way through the mid-pack there you can see that was your former race leader Rui Reese, who uh, took the uh, the, the race lead there and held onto it very, very well as the two drivers tried to recover from the uh, the rest of the race there. But Ewan, a brilliant, brilliant opening hour to this race here. And uh, this is pretty much everything that we expected, isn't it? It's been very, very good racing indeed, yeah, and uh, very much uh, enjoying it so far. Uh, on the live pictures at the moment, Rui Reese has got it out in front of uh, Yumi Nisola, trying to see if Varki is coming this time around. He has indeed. Uh, there's now only two cars to come in, ProSim and uh, the 717 Unison Racing car still to come in. Varki comes out the pit lane there on the left-hand side. Looks like he's going to be behind both of them. So Rui Reese now takes the lead. It's going to be Yumi Nisola in second place with Zoltan in Varkingy in third uh, when this all shakes out. That's very interesting indeed. So the undercut didn't work for Nisola when they were in the same cars, but the Audi has been undercut by both of the McLarens here. And quite honestly, left for dead. The pace that the McLarens have got right now, we're able to get the, the tyres up to speed and up to pressure. Great, great stuff there. So the 007 Pro 17 out into the, uh, the leads just now. So...
Hour two then underway here at the GTR 24H Monza 12 hours. David Christie and Ewan O'Leary taking you through all of the uh, the first couple of hours here. Uh, let's bring it up to speed then. It's the 007 provisionally in the lead just now. They haven't pitted yet along with the 717 of Dennis Eschenko. Uh, they are then behind them is the 74 of Rui Reese, the 64 of uh, Jimmy Nazula and the 33 of Zoltan Verconi. This is the battle essentially for the lead unfolding in front of your eyes here just now. Rui Reese, the unlikely leader of this race, handed it to him on a silver platter by the fight happening between Jimmy Nazula and Zoltan Verconi here. Ewan, what a race we've had here and this is just getting even more exciting. It is indeed at the front of the field right now. Very exciting indeed. Uh, we've uh, we've had that two car battle at the front. Now it's time for a three car battle, I think. And uh, yeah, we, it's uh, it's uh, it's absolutely fantastic between all of these guys. The pit stops have shaken out now. It took us about three or four laps to go through the entire cycle. Unison Racing and Prosim were the uh, biggest cars on the grid, but they're also the last um, to come down pit lane. Probably the most fuel efficient um, by the looks of things. That could play into their hands a little bit later on. But um, yeah, for now we're just in during this fight because it's absolutely wonderful to see. It looks like Nisola is deciding to be a little bit more care careful on this occasion and uh, Varki likewise. He's not quite on the back of them just yet but uh, he will be in a few moments time and uh, yeah it is absolutely fantastic racing. Very very enjoyable indeed at the moment. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic stuff here. And I, again, you get the impression that Jimmy Mazzola really biding his time here. He's waiting, he's watching, he's seeing what Rui Reese is doing. And all he has to do is keep him within his reach as well. Uh, Zoltan Verconi, the big loser out of those pit stops, was in the lead of the race after fighting so hard to, uh, to, to catch back up to Rui Reese there. But, I mean, the big news surely has to be Jimmy Mazzola taking that second place just now and if I'm honest I'm, I'm not sure about this because Rui Reese, right, the pace that he's got is enough to keep Jimmy Nuzula behind but Jimmy doesn't seem too interested in taking the lead and that doesn't make sense with uh, how he was trying to take the, the ID before so is he overdriving that car because look at the ID now, the ID of Zoltan Verconi is starting to come back into the mix as they go down the, uh, the main straight here, you've got some cracking picture in picture views here, you're seeing on the tail end of Rui Reese coming into the first corner there and deep onto the brakes goes uh, Jimmy Nazula there throwing that car about and this is probably Jimmy's best chance you and you've got to say of uh, trying to get the move done yeah it looks like it but uh, I think he's just being a little bit more cautious on this occasion I don't think he really wants to go for it at every opportunity and uh, try to get through at uh, you know every corner here I think he's taking things a little bit more easy because these chicanes are very narrow they're not conducive to uh, racing really we've seen it before Vaking didn't do a lot wrong in there in their spin really in my opinion just sent the car over the curbs obviously it bounced over a little bit and they get came into contact which is very unfortunate but um, yeah it, I mean it was it was bizarre uh, it's, it's bizarre some how these cars are profile really sometimes um, and uh, yeah we, we've seen the cost of it really um, but uh, yeah I think Nisla is just learning from that a little bit deciding to take things a little bit easier on this occasion um, and uh, yeah maybe go for it when the opportunity arises a little bit later on I think personally he was hoping that he would jump the Juicy's Motorsport Club car in the pit lane and then he wouldn't have had to worry about this at all but unfortunately that hasn't materialised for him well, we're watching cars on the run down that back straight there on the uh, the entry to the, the Parabolica. The, the McLaren behind of uh, Jimmy Mazzula really just, I, I think, also trying to put a lot of pressure onto the race. You can see how much wider a line he takes around the Parabolica, gets into the uh, the slipstream of that, uh, that McLaren in front there. And again, it's going to be a question of, is it going to be the last of the late breakers there? He's got a great run on Ray Race. It's going to surely be a move for Jimmy Nisola. He tries to go around the outside. Rui Reese takes the inside line late onto the brakes. And that allows the Audi to catch back up onto the pair of them there. And this is a very dangerous game now that Rui Reese and Jimmy Nisola are playing because it's going to be a very opportunistic uh, Zoltan Varconi that could make the most out of this. 
Yeah, absolutely. He could be picking up the pieces if indeed they come together, the two McLarens here. We've seen this before. Russell are going for a move into the second chicane, but Rui Race decides that it's not the best idea and blocks him off by putting the car in the middle of the road. And now you're right, Vokingi is uh, really getting himself involved here, but he's just leaving himself a car length here just to make sure he can react to anything that goes on in front. Hopefully not, but, you know, you just want to give yourself that little bit of space um, to, uh, to, to account for anything on toward that might happen. However, if Nusseler gets through on the Juicy's Motorsport Club car, I'd imagine he will, will want to slip straight on by as well because um, you know he's not going to want to let Nusseler get away because if he does, then um, that could be the... It's definitely the race lead heading off up the road. It could be the race victory heading off up the road. I know it's early on, but uh, you never know when that race-winning moment can come by. Yeah, that, that brings up a, a very good point, actually, there, you and the fact that, you know, endurance racing nowadays is so different to what it was maybe, say, 10, 15 years ago, where, you know, you, you, you think that the 12-hour event will be, like, an hour or two hours of fast racing, then you'll get a slow driver in, then it'll be, you know, high-paced action again. This is a 12-hour sprint race. Every single driver expected to drive at the absolute peak pinnacle of their performance as they possibly can. We'll come back to that in a second because here comes the McLaren side by side. It's going to be on the inside. Riri's trying to force Jimmy Nazula as wide as he possibly can, but this could be it. This could be the move done for Jimmy Nazula. Tries to get the inside. There's contact again. They're still side by side. Jimmy Nazula keeps the foot in. Rui Reese, take a bow. That is incredibly ballsy racing there. And the two of them still side by side as they come down towards the second chicane. That Audi is waiting there, poised, ready to pick up the pieces of what on earth happens here. Rui Reese is going to try and have the inside line. Goes round the brakes late there. But oh. Rui Reese, oh my goodness me, this is now a three-car battle for the Legion. Can you believe what you're seeing in front of your eyes? No, this is absolutely unbelievable. Nearly free wipe from Varkingy there. And now on the outside line, Reese is going to be hung out to dry here. Varkingy follows Nissala through. So from first to third in about three corners there for the Juices Motorsport Club. He's going to stick onto the back of these guys and try and get involved again because that McLaren's very pacey in a straight line. Varkingy under pressure into Ascari again. Wow. Wow, 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 this is awesome stuff, Rui surely not. Trying to go around the outside at Ascari, I think that's it done. I think the move is absolutely done. But this is the key thing here. If Rui can tuck behind that Audi and get the slipstream down that back straight, he can absolutely fire it up the inside and try and take the car for the parabolic. That looks like what he's going to try and do. He backs off for the brakes there. The Audi goes very, very deep into the parabolica there. I think he might just get away with it, but here comes Rui race in third place then onto the tail end of the Audi this is going to be over and dusted before it even gets going as well Rui race side by side almost thinks better of it pulls it into behind the Audi Oh my goodness me, all the drama, all the action, all the chaos kicking off in just the first 15 minutes of the second hour. Oh. There's contact again, side by side with the Audi and the McLaren. And Ray Reese just absolutely bulldozes his way in. Oh my goodness me, the cojones on this, kids. That McLaren, wow, you, that is probably one of the gutsiest moves I think I've I've seen and uh, the, the whole thing about respectful driving that we saw in that first lap um, I think that's just been drop kicked to the curb right there yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly aggressive racing between these two at the moment, but there's nothing wrong with a, a bit of aggressive racing, really, um, at the end of the day it's, uh, it's just, uh, I wouldn't say anything too bad going on just for the moment, Rui Race may be a little bit um, aggressive into the first chicane but um, you know it's nothing nothing awful for the moment um, and uh, yeah just hard racing really uh, apparently there's an incident between 777 and the 65 on lap 11 that's uh, being reported right now I presume that uh, maybe one of those drivers has just got out the car to uh, well not to report it but um, certainly to uh, uh, to maybe have a look I can see that Mads Hedegor has got into uh, the 777 now as opposed to Carl Leikago who started that car maybe he's got out of that car and reported the incident because it was a good um, you know 45 minutes ago now that incident and now it's been taken in by Rage Control to indeed have a look at uh, around turn 11 which is uh, around the Curva Parabolica I believe
believe. So we didn't quite see that one, but uh, instant report coming in and we'll see what comes of it uh, in a few moments time. Ooh, right, let's uh, let's calm ourselves down. Let's just take a breath and try and figure out what on earth just happened. There's Audi fires up the inside. Zoltan Verkonyi from 15,000 miles back decides oh. to send it in. There was never any other way that that one was ending. And I'm going to be completely honest now. These two need to calm it down. Ravis and Zoltan Verkonyi absolutely trading paint and knocking lumps out of each other. Here we go with the instant replay there you go that move was never happening and Rui Reese uh, you know just decides that he's not letting that happen there and uh, you know, if I'm honest I, I, I just have this gut feeling that the pair of them are going to end up in the barriers here yeah, they, they don't particularly like each other at this point. I think that's fair to say, um, as things stand. And, uh, yeah, it's getting a little bit aggressive now. Ruiz didn't really give racing room to the Audi on the outside of two there. And uh, it's resulted in a bit of gravel for Varkingi. But it's letting the leader get away now. Certainly over five and a half seconds is the lead for Yumi Nisola. And uh, Carlos Basto is getting involved from behind now. Four seconds is the gap between Varkingi and Basto now. So it's uh, all going to close up. Uh, for second place quite possibly it just depends how long it takes the Audi to get through and I think it's going to be very difficult for him if we're on board right now even in the sip stream he's struggling to make inroads in a straight line here that's why he needs to make late moves under the brakes uh, and in the corners here it's very very tricky to do anything when that McLaren has got such straight line speed and uh, yeah, that's why Barking is struggling quite so much uh, it's really starting to um, you know it's really starting to close up for second place Oh, look at that McLaren just drive away from the Audi. Even in the slipstream, the McLaren can just pull away. And, uh, yeah, obviously a little bit of mind games there trying to go on. The Audi locking up its brakes, trying to go into that first corner there. But that McLaren, I think that's done the number. I think there's something not quite right with that Audi. Maybe it's overcooked the tyres. Maybe it's got a little tiny bit of aero damage. But certainly on that parabolica uh, around the corner there, that McLaren able to just drive away from that Audi right now. So Zoltan Varconi in real trouble because, as you said, Carlo Basso in that number three. 51 machine just behind them able to catch up very very quickly and uh, possibly be able to to make a move on them just now so yeah this is cracking cracking action that we've got going on here and uh, quite honestly i didn't see any of this happening right now no, it's uh, been very interesting indeed and uh, a little bit unexpected as well um, and it's uh, I guess it all results from that incident at the second chicane uh, on all those lats ago and uh, that's what's really kicked all this off. So, uh, so yeah, it's a, a bizarre situation we find ourselves in at the moment. And Rocking is going to find it a very frustrating situation that they've got themselves into here. Um, you know, whether it's, it was going to be the satellite racing car or juices that they find themselves behind now, this McLaren is going to be so, so difficult to overtake no matter who's driving it because look at the straight line speed it's got and that's what you really need to try and make a move use the sip stream to get that little bit of overspeed and then make a move under brakes at the moment Rocking can only really do the last bit and it's resulting in some of the battling that we've seen so far he might have another go into turn one on this occasion but he also might decide to just stick behind for the moment and, uh, you know, Keep things as they are, not to risk the car any further because we've seen uh, those two get into contact just a little bit in the past. Yeah, that's uh, wow, 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 wow. Um, I'm almost lost for words, to be honest with you. It's been a spectacular opening uh, first hour and a half that we've had here at the 12 hours of uh, Monza. A brilliant, brilliant race. And uh, again, you just have to hope that we've got another uh, 10 hours and 40 minutes uh, on the, uh, the cards for this one. I've got to be honest, I, I think that Audi is really, really in a bad place right now. Um, Ruiz, quite rightly, isn't just letting it pass. And look at the tail spinning out on that Audi. And uh, that is not a place that you think you'd go and see it. And runs wide into the gravel. That Audi, as I said, is in real, real problems right now. Maybe they've overcooked the tyres. Maybe they've done some sort of damage to that car. But that is not looking happy. And I've got to be honest, I am quite fancying Carlos Masto right now to uh, to potentially get his step onto the podium here. 
Yeah, he's closing in. Three seconds is the gap now. Valky certainly a little bit rattled, I think, by the battles that we've seen so far uh, between the two of them. And it is allowing Basto to get involved. Um, so we'll wait and see what happens if indeed he gets there. Um, but for the moment, he's just hanging back. Rui Reese is going to be loving this situation, though, because he's um, gotten rid of Valky. Not going to be under pressure from him for the next few moments. Uh, and the gap's uh, big to the car in front. Uh, the incident, by the way, between the 777 and the 65 has just been taken uh, to review. The stewards have decided that it needs further review um, and uh, they will decide what to do, of course. Uh, but yeah, the lead now for Emi Nisola, seven seconds. And uh, yeah, it's, that's not an unassailable margin, but uh, it's certainly a big one and going to take a lot of effort to try and, uh, try and bring that down. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, Jimmy Nazula off into the sunset. He's already uh, got a bottle, of, a hand on the bottle of champagne at the moment with an eight-second lead. Um, quite honestly, we've seen races before you and both you and I where that has been wiped out in the space of two corners. Just uh, amazing, amazing stuff. So, again, not to uh, not not to play caution to the wind or anything like that. But uh, yeah, that 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 gap could get wiped out very, very quickly indeed. In fact, he's already lost a second of that uh, that eight second gap. But the gap to Zoltan Verkonya now opening up by a second, and uh, Carlo Basto now uh, just three and a half seconds behind. So. Again, as we start to settle down into the second stint after our first couple of pit stops here, there's some real, real changes afoot here and, and the Audi starting to get quite unsettled. It is a little bit. And uh, we saw this after the incident with Nisola that um, it uh, got a little bit unsettled. But, um, you know, we'll just have to wait and see um, it, how he recovers from this. We, we've seen him uh, have a setback in the past and it did decrease his pace just that little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what ha happens on this occasion. Got a yellow flag in sector two at the moment. I was trying to find what happened uh, or what is happening at the moment. But uh, I can't see anybody who's uh, actually stopped. So. Uh, we'll have to try and figure that one out um, in the, in the future. But uh, but anyway, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly not going well for Varking e at the moment. He's seen satellite racing go on up the road by quite a distance, and uh, yeah, that isn't good at all because he's going to have to, or his teammate indeed, going to have to bring that one back. And just having a look, uh, I was absolutely right. By the way, the uh, the, the GT4 Viaductin team. I said last night. I think they are going to overtake at least two or three uh, GT3 cars, and they have because they've managed to obviously get past the uh, the number 23 GSR Greek uh, McLaren team of and of course uh, Papa Ma Papa Mafail, uh, Christophos Kariolis and Andres Rosival, uh, who are out on can't obviously forget. Uh, Tony Paparinopoulos, who uh, unfortunately had that issue going into uh, to turn one. So uh, GTA 14 of uh, Viaductin move up one place there, right? P11 on the race there, as you see uh, a very, very wide uh, Audi in the background there. That is uh, Carlos Pasto in the uh, number 51 outfit. So, um, Ewan, the great thing about this is that it gives us a little bit of a, a breather gives us a little bit of time to uh, to chat about uh, the race itself. Uh, I'm watching the Audi of uh, Zoltan Verconi, who's looking very, very sketchy out of the, uh, the, the Ascari corners there. But with an hour and a half almost in the books here, what do you think is going to be happening in the next sort of 30 minutes to an hour? Because obviously we'll, we'll take it in little chunks just now. Do you think the drivers are going to try and settle down into a rhythm? Well, they've got to, really, uh, because it's a 12-hour race. They're going to have to kind of uh, settle in uh, for a, a long day. And so, uh, you know, you, you've got to kind of try and find your feet in this one just a little bit. And uh, that's what all these guys are going to try and do over the next uh, next few moments, I would imagine. Um, I mean, getting towards the next half an hour, obviously pit stops coming up uh, again in, in that moment. Um, then, you know, we'll see, we'll see where we are at that point, really. Um, but for the moment... Um, we can't really um, 
you can't really know what's going to happen um, at this point. I think Viking doesn't look like he's going to be challenging Rui Reese for, for the next half an hour or so. I think uh, Carlos Basto may well get on terms maybe with the Audi, but you know I think that uh, looking a little bit unlikely as well. Um, so you know people are just going to kind of, as you said, stay where they are, get into a rhythm, uh, see where they are at the next pit stops, and then we might even see some driver changes um, at that point, and uh, the race can really develop from there. And on that note, how important is it for drivers to be able to s settle down and, and get into that rhythm? Because I'd imagine that 12 hours is a very, very long time, especially if you split it into, say, uh, three, uh, th three driver stints. But uh, that, that state of flow, that ability to just do lap after lap after lap without even thinking about it, that must take some of the strain off of the driving, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. We've got uh, we've got a lot of variations between the different cars at this point, uh, between the different teams. Um, it's all about keeping your drivers rested, but also um, keeping things nice and balanced. It's, it, it's a balance that we all talk about throughout endurance races. It, it, you know, are you going to go for a lot of drivers? Keep your team rested, but also have that palaver of four people pulling different ways to uh, on terms of your setup. Or are you going to go for just two drivers? Be quite tired at the end of the day, but you're both going to be reasonably comfortable with the set it's going to be reasonably close to how you would have it if it was just you so you know it's always finding that balance I think for a 12 hour racing you probably get away with two drivers six hours on six hours off is probably a decent policy at this point it's it's not a bad way to to do this in my opinion but uh, you know I, th I think like satellite racing we've got at the moment four drivers for this event maybe a little bit too many three would be a decent amount because you know if, if you've got four drivers you're only going to be doing uh, three hours or so of driving but you do want the setup to be uh, kind of nice f drive for you so um, yeah that's a, another thing to consider I mean I would personally, three sounds about right to me um, for a 12 hour race. Yeah, first of all, you get four hours in the car, which is a decent amount, and you can do it in two two hour chunks, which is very helpful in terms of the fuel. So, um, because it obviously it rounds up nicely and, and whatever. So, um, yeah, I think, think three drivers is probably the uh, the way you want to go, but obviously all these guys are going to be, uh, be going a slightly different way uh, to go about this race. It's just, just about what your team's comfortable with, I guess. Just looking at the uh, the battle for the top there, and uh, to bring it up to speed, then still race leader Jimmy Nazula and the uh, the 64 ahead of Rui and Zoltan Verconi. Some beautiful uh, on board footage that we were seeing there uh, from the 007 Pro Sim team. Uh, we can see that is uh, Stephen Hove that is or Stephen Hove's rather uh, behind the wheel of that one. But Zoltan Verconi in the 33 Mugen Sim racing. I mean, you know, how did it go so wrong for them? They were looking so comfortable up in that lead, and then Jimmy Nazula in that 64 uh, managed to catch up to them, and it's just been going backwards for them ever since. And, and quite honestly, they're falling back from Rui Reese in second place there. Yeah, they are a little bit, and it's uh, it's certainly not good news. If I was in that Mugen Sim racing camp at the moment, I would definitely be getting Valkyrie out of that car uh, in half an hour and uh, getting Christopher Kianak in that car instead. Um, just to make things a little bit easier on on Viking and uh, you know get it, get it, get him a little bit of a break from from the car because I think um, not driving well at the moment certainly that's uh, that's immediately obvious to us um, that uh, he's not on on peak performance certainly he is one of their best drivers um, in the GT3 team he's uh, you know been at Megan Sim Racing in the GT3 team um, for the EWC and he's been very very good indeed um, but uh, you know what, what's it what's it going to be like. Um, for, for out of race distance and so on. I've just spotted through the parabolica Mads Hedegaard getting off the road uh, in the 777 car. By the way, their incident with the 65 was uh, uh, denoted as a racing incident, so uh, nothing really um, to speak of uh, there. But uh, unfortunately, a spin for Hedegaard has just lost a place and uh, allowed the GSR team to uh, close up massively on them. The gap's now uh, three seconds between them. Yeah, so that's that's not what they wanted to uh, to to happen there, and uh, just back to that that gap between uh, Zoltan Verconi and uh, Carlos Basto. Uh, Basto is really going to be in uh, quite a strong position there uh, within, I think, uh, a couple of laps. The two of them 
not on the, the best of uh, of times just now. In fact, actually, that was a, a cracking lap there from Zoltan Verconi on that last lap there, 147-1. That much pace with your uh, race leader um, going through there. In fact, sorry, I was reading the lo- wrong uh, line there. That was actually their best lap, not their last lap. Uh, 148.5. So, I mean, they're a second and a half off of the pace of your race leader in third place there. So that is... Uh, yeah, that, that, that is absolutely mind-boggling to see where that Audi has gone because at that pace, they're actually slower than the 007 Pro Sim team. Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly not good news. Um, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, I, w- I would be... Uh getting Bucky out of that car at this point it's not it's not uh, it's not good certainly so um, yeah battles going on up and down down the order and these guys will be um, settling in now or trying to we're starting to settle into the races or 90 minutes in um, at this point and uh, yeah it's uh, it's developing nicely now I guess this battle on our screens right now is the closest developing one Yep, and we've had lots and lots to see and to, to process and to, to get our little heads around. So we're going to let you get a chance to do that. We're going to take a little commercial break, time to pay some of the bills, and we'll be back after these messages. The GTR 24 H12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot. Fleet Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the GTR 24 hour, the 12 hours of Monza. Well, we promise we don't do this deliberately, okay? We really, really don't. But while you were away, um, 
basically all hell broke loose. Uh, third place, or the then third place, 33 car of Zoltan Zorokhi, uh, Z Zoltan Zorokhi uh, decided to take a, a bit of an excursion around the Parabolka, sort of around and around and around the corner, as you will, and that's done his race no end of good whatsoever. Ewan, um, it's safe to say that uh, he's, he's not really had a great day at the office, has he? Not, not really. No, it's not been his, uh, not been his day for the moment, and that's why we see the Pro Team car so close um, to the Megan Tim Racing car for the moment. It's, uh, it's good to see that battle now developing. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was, it was just a simple spin, really. No pressure from Karloff Basto behind, just losing it on the way into the corner, um, and uh, a little bit bizarre, really, to see that kind of mistake from uh, such a driver. But yeah, you, you can see already that it's not been uh, his best performance for the moment, and uh, yeah, we, we, that's. It's just a bit unfortunate, really, the way um, that, uh, that that's been going uh, over the last few uh, few moments. Uh, well, not just few moments, is it? It's, it's been the whole stint. Um, the, his stint has been falling apart a little bit. And now I guess the best thing he could do is just try to hold off Prosim uh, for the moment, if he can try to hold off Prosim uh, until the end of the stint at the very least. I think that would just give him a little bit of confidence heading into the next stint and, uh, you know, it, it's uh, just rubbing salt into the wound almost if uh, if indeed he does get overtaken here um, in the next half an hour or so. I think that would be uh, quite damaging for him and he might step into the car next time around with, uh, you know, his uh, head, head down, so to speak. Yeah, and that's what we're watching here. Sebastian Hove in that 007 Pro Sim Bentley, the only Bentley that we have got on the grid just now, trying his best to hunt down that 33 Audi of uh, Zoltan <laughs> Verconje there, doing a cracking job coming through Ascari and then onto that main straight. That gap was uh, around about a second and a half. It's now down to about eight tenths of a second. And if uh, Sebastian can get himself into the toe here, into the slipstream of that car in front, then that is going to come down absolutely massively as they come down into the Parabolica. Very good afternoon, though. Thank you very much for joining us on the GTR 24H YouTube channel and, of course, to all of our viewers who are joining us over on motorvision.tv. A very warm welcome. We hope you're having a lovely afternoon. Thank you for joining myself, David Christie, and Ewan O'Leary for the first couple of hours of this. A huge thank you to our production team in the background who we can hear tackling away as all the action unfolds as well but uh, yeah back to this battle here for Zoltan for Konya and it really is a massive fall for Grace for Zoltan because of course you saw earlier on oh. that battle that uh, intense battle with Jimmy Nazula for the 64 VRS satellite racing team early on in those opening stages of the racing how different things could have been for that team yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's it's a case of what could have been almost uh, for that team. But I'm just seeing that we've got a bit of damage out there on the circuit because we've had a spin and a hit on the wall uh, for the triple uh, seven. Audi that's uh, just got going again now but um, yeah not good news at all because uh, they have lost their rear wing uh, I'm going to try and source a replay um, well I'm going to have to go further, further back than that um, but uh, yeah for the moment that's not good news at all is that ProSim indeed go on the outside line was that was that them going through on it uh, was indeed it was it indeed. was, it was yeah. a mistake by the Audi through the second Lesmo and another unforced error from that Audi and that hand the place on a silver platter to uh, Sebastian Hove in that triple, uh, sorry, that 007 Pro Sim Bentley and to be honest with you, that was a very, very easy move because that Bentley has had the pace on that Audi and uh, a day going from bad to worse for the uh, the Audi 33 Mugen Sim Racing Team. Oh, there you go, into the barriers or Mad Heads guard, and that is a very dangerous rejoin there, yeah. straight out into the path of none other than your race leader there, Ewan. Yeah, exactly. That was Jimmy Nissel coming through the, the second Lesmo and nearly got a nasty surprise, actually. Uh, the gap's been uh, slashed to 11 seconds at the front of the field, which is a little bit less than what it was before, mainly because of that rejoin uh, from Hedegaard. Not uh, not really nice um, on that on that occasion, I'm afraid. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thankfully, everybody got away with it. It was unfortunate, really. Hedegaard did most of the spinning on the circuit, but then when he was trying to spin around again to get going, it, it, you know, do another 180, 
to get back in the right direction. He uh, unfortunately kind of almost reversed into the wall, um, which is uh, not uh, not good really. So uh, yeah, that was unfortunate. And uh, yeah, he's you now in the pit lane getting that uh, damage repaired. There might be a little bit of suspension involved as well, but definitely a new rear wing for that triple seven. Yeah, I, I mean, it's crazy, crazy start to this race. I mean, uh, Ewan, we're less than two hours into this race and we've seen more action than I think I've seen in some uh, six-hour races as well. This is just intense, intense action through the field. Zoltan Verconi dropping through the field like a rock right now in that 33. He's going to have to watch out because about eight and a half seconds, ten seconds behind him is Nikolai Bezrukov. But we have to now turn our attention to the leader who is away with this race right now 12 seconds to the grid Jimmy Nazula in that VRS satellite racing team outfit and uh, what a start I mean he will be absolutely delighted with that start to the race yeah, absolutely. It's been very entertaining for the moment, um, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll wait and see uh, what happens for for the rest of the race um, at the moment. Hedegaard's just got out of the pit lane, by the way. He's just uh, made his repairs, but he's down in tenth place for the moment, which is the last of the running GT3 cars. Unfortunately, um, the other. GT3 that blew its engine earlier on the GSR team. Uh, I don't think they've rejoined um, for whatever reason. So it looks like we are down to uh, 10 GT3s for the moment. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a shame to see because it was only the first hour of the race. They will have been preparing and they, they will have been ready to do a 12 hour race. And unfortunately, they've uh, not even managed to do uh, a one hour race there. So very disappointing for them. Yeah, it certainly, it certainly is. And uh, look, I, I mean, the, the great thing about this is that with it being a 12-hour race, all of the teams, all of the drivers have that chance. They've got several get-out-of-jail-free cards uh, at their disposal so they can potentially, you know, have an issue and get themselves back into contention. They might be out of contention for the race win, but they're certainly in with a chance of getting that into that mid-pack battle. And it's all about getting that finish uh, so keeping that consistency and keeping their head down. If you'd said to uh, the likes of Rui Ruiz or uh, Carlos Basto at the start of this race or five minutes into this race, you guys are going to be on the podium, they would have laughed at you with how the, uh, the start of the race went. But here we are with both the 74 in second place and that 51 in third place as well. Yeah, they're both having great races at the moment. And uh, I think being on the podium definitely for them is not out of the realms of possibility, but it is uh, certainly um, a little bit of a surprise to see it so early on. I think Marie Reese leading the race was definitely one of those moments uh, where, you know, you're thinking, how on earth has this actually happened? Um, but, uh, you know, they've done very well. They've driven very well. Um, I haven't really seen them make any mistakes um, throughout the race so far. You know, there's been spins for a lot of these guys we saw. I, you know, you can count Nisola and Varkini both having issues of their own, and uh, the, the you know the Corvette a little bit further down. Almost all of the all of the other cars have had some kind of problem along the way. However, um, you know, the same can't be said for Rui Reese and Carlos Plaster. They've driven very good races so far, and uh, yet yeah, we're talking about Varkini not having the best day at the office. Well, you know, talk about guys who are. Uh, you know, having a very good one, being very consistent and driving very well. And uh, those two guys will probably be uh, right at the top of your list. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on with that one. Just seeing that the uh, the triple seven of Mads Hedgard now two laps down behind the leader, still going, still uh, on with the race as well as Vangelis Padnovis, uh, a lap down on that one as well. Beautiful scenes here at the virtual recreation of Monza here for the uh, the twelve hours. Dave Christie and Ewan O'Leary uh, with you and that Audi again in fifth place. I'm keeping an eye on it of Zoltan and Verconi hasn't learned any lessons whatsoever you and still harassing that car still throwing it about and still on the absolute edge of adhesion right now as it uh, it makes its way around the uh, the course here it's still trying to catch up to the back of the uh, 007 Bentley there of Sebastian Hove and again not making any real great inroads to, uh, to that one but with the uh, 10 hours left to go, 10 hours and 15 minutes left to go. Um, 
it's it's all kind of evened itself out quite nicely, really. Uh, the drivers now being left alone, with the apart, with the exception of these two, as we've got uh, a yellow flag for the Viaductum team. They get themselves back on the uh, the road just now. They brought out the uh, yellow flags in that Alpine GT4, not looking very very happy. So perhaps a little bit of damage on the uh, the, the car there. But back to the point of. Um, of the, the fourth and fifth place, you, with the exception of them, quite wide gaps now, about 10, 15 seconds between all of the cars right now. Yeah, there are a couple of uh, a couple of wide gaps happening uh, or, or starting to open themselves up um, in the uh, in the order at the moment, which is uh, a little bit of a shame. But uh, you know, it's 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 bound to happen at some point because um, it's the race after all, and uh, these guys are pushing as hard as they can. I'm sure these battles will. Um, Close up again uh, before we know it. Um, just seeing at the moment, I've just got a replay up by the way of the Alpine and its spin, so we'll just be able to a quick look at this one in a few moments' time. It's uh, coming up towards turn four and five, so we've got a little bit of time to wait just yet um, before the viaducting car gets towards um, the actual point of accident. But uh, yeah, it's trying to get out of the way quite clearly of the race leader, Yimi Nissel, who's been involved in a couple of these altercations. We saw Hedegaard uh, re uh, getting onto the circuit in front of him earlier, and this was a spin in front of uh, Nissel a little bit earlier on from the viaducting car. Just went a little bit wide, watching its mirrors a little bit too much, went a little bit wide, bounced across the curbs, and obviously, uh, if you're kind of halfway through a spin and you get onto that curb, that's just going to make sure of it. And unfortunately, it was a 364. That, uh, that viaducting car and fortunately Nisolo had the awareness to uh, back out of it again but uh, he's certainly going to be a little bit tired of all these incidents happening around him yeah, this is the, uh, the the joyous life that they choose, picking a GT4 car. We've got another yellow flag as uh, Denis Eschenko is uh, slowing down. That Corvette is on the, uh, the, the track, and yeah, that is looking slightly worse for wear. Um, struggling to, to get himself back on track there, but uh, gets going again, and... Uh, yeah, that car bouncing about. I wonder if that looks like it's got some severe suspension damage at the back of that uh, of that car. They're really struggling to get things going again. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a shame for the 717 team. They've tried to keep themselves into contention, but I think they're going to find themselves going a lap down here, Ewan. It may look like it. Yeah, I've just got a replay up at the moment. It's a very similar spin to what we saw earlier on and uh, just losing it midway through the corner. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's... Uh it's a little bit uh, of a shame to see. I'm going to have to uh, rewind again and try again here because uh, uh, you didn't get to see it at home. But uh, it's just a very simple spin um, to, uh, to, to, to see here. I'm just going to lose it in the early part or the mid part of the corner. And, uh, yeah, he's uh, not... Uh, not had the best time of it through there so uh, struggling to get back going again uh, on the curb and the gravel and everything it's not particularly uh, easy to get that Corvette going again uh, but uh, didn't hit anything and for the second time it's just a, a simple spin really for Eschenko he's going to want to clean that up a little bit but Lesmo 2 is fast becoming his enemy in this uh, at, this, at this circuit yeah certainly looks like uh, we've got uh, a bit of of uh, a drama going on. I love it, Ewan, as well. You can hear it as well. We've got a production team in our ears and they get so excited whenever they catch a, a, a crash or an accident going on and we then struggle to try and catch up and, and find out. We feel left out here. Um, but uh, yeah, a huge thank you to our production team in the background for keeping us up to date with everything that is going on. And uh, just watching this uh, ProSim team, this is what they're laughing at here because the Bentley under real pressure again now from Zoltan Verconje uh, in that Audi right now. The Audi was dropping away and the Bentley, uh, the pace of that thing has just fallen off an absolute cliff right now. Uh, it tries to go up the inside, but the Audi thinks better of it. Again, out onto that gravel. The Audi really struggling to find any pace to get past this machine right now. And uh, yeah, this is a, a battle essentially for the, the best of the rest. You can see there on the inside there uh, is Zoltan Verconnell, that is actually I believe that's on board with the uh, the Bentley driver just now uh, that's in front, so that's Sebastian Hove that is in the car, in the picture in the picture, great, a great production there from the uh, the team there, but the Audi throwing everything you in that it possibly can, but uh, yeah, this is starting to get a little bit ragged he's a little bit 
but uh, certainly it's, it's certainly good for him I think to refine his feet a little bit in this race he's not been driving too well as, we, as we've mentioned too many times probably um, at this point it almost seems like we're rubbing it in but uh, but no he's certainly starting to find his feet a little bit more in this race now applying the pressure to the pro sim car that's surely going to have to do a bit of defending because that Bentley punches a big hole in the air for the Audi they're quite even on straight line speed really um, but it seems that the Bentley just have a slight edge this Audi the Mugen Sim Racing Audi was struggling to get through on the McLaren of Juice's Motorsport Club earlier on it seems like they're struggling to get through on the Bentley of pro sim as well I'm starting to wonder if it's not an Audi thing but maybe they've got a little bit too high downforce settings on that car because they're really struggling for any straight line speed and that's going to put pay to any chances you have of actually making a move especially here at Monza I'm not so sure about that Ewan because remember they had that spin or uh, the uh, parabolica high speed right hander um, and the car just seemed to lose the, the back end of it so I'm wondering if it's maybe a suspension or a, a, a setup issue that they seem to be having but that out of the way the Audi starting to settle into its rhythm again and, and showing the early pace that it had and this Bentley has been run absolutely ragged but he's obviously not learned that lesson from Rui Rees who made the car as wide as it possibly can be uh, earlier on just to bring you up to date as well the 23 outfits uh, that is of course the, uh, the the Greek team GSR racing they will not be returning to the race so we've had our first retirement they are having uh, technical issues and uh, have decided to retire from the uh, the race so they were already 30 laps down but that means that we now have 11 cars back in the uh, the race we've got some weather coming in you and uh, i thought you might be excited to know about two hours from now it looks like we're going to have some some weather moving in from the uh, from the north it looks like it's going to hit the uh, the cloud will hit the track but uh yeah, again, that just adds a whole new complexion in uh, a couple of hours' time. It does indeed. We'll see if, uh, if slash when uh, the rain hits, how heavy it's going to be, etc. But the rain's certainly starting to develop, and there's some brighter colours as well. It's not just green. It's uh, all colours of the rainbow, actually. There's a bit of red in there, which is uh, presumably bad uh, rain, very heavy rain. Um, so, uh, yeah, that could be a problem. At the moment, it seems to be drifting north ever so slightly, which could save us um, a little bit, but uh, you never know. Uh, when the rain is going to hit as we see marking getting very close to the Bentley now is there going to be a move here not yet into the second chicane uh, so he's just going to have to stick behind for the moment um, as Hedegaard has just uh, had another spin by the way I'll find a replay of that one in a moment while we watch the continuation of this battle between the Bentley and, and certainly the uh, the Audi that's kind of having a bit of a, a resurgence in this race it's starting to pick itself back up again yeah, of course, the, uh, what we'll find is that the uh, the fuel tanks are starting to empty themselves out. We're about 10 minutes away from the uh, the next bout of pit stops here. And uh, we're still seeing Jimmy Nuzula in the lead from about 10 seconds of Rui Reese. That gap hasn't really actually done much, apart from the fact that it is going down quite quickly just now. It goes back up there. But that stayed static at about 10 seconds. Granted, Jimmy Nuzula having to go through some uh, some traffic there. We can see the uh, the Corvette in the background there. I believe that is uh, the 717 of Denis Sashenko uh, just behind him there. But uh, yeah, he's he's done a great job. But again, I have to take my hats off to this man here, Rui Reese in the McLaren in that second place there. Keeping up in pace with that leader. Uh, doing his own race there, but keeping in second place. That is just insane, insane performance. And really, when you saw qualifying, you would never Never have guessed that, Ewan. Yeah, absolutely. They've uh, really outperforming themselves at this point. Nislo seems to be a, a little bit pacier for the moment, but um, I doubt it's going to stay like that forever, really, um, the way that uh, Reese is driving at the moment. Um, he's got some very capable teammates as well. Sabakis uh, is going to be there as well as Pedro Gomez as well, uh, helping him along for this one. Um, so uh, that's going to be very helpful for him. Are they going to be able to keep pace to satellite racing? I think maybe there's a chance certainly um, that they're going to be able to stay up there. And uh, that's great news for us. Certainly 
uh, throughout the remainder uh, of this race. I'm just going to rewind a little bit, by the way, to find this spin for uh, Matt Hedegaard, who's just uh, had a spin at uh, the Parabolica, I'm afraid. It looks like he's got his uh, left-hand wheels onto the grass um, it going into the corner, uh, which is obviously not the, uh, the really the way you want to be going around here. Here it is on the screens right now. And, uh, yeah, just dips the wheel onto the grass, goes for a simple spin in that one. He's got going again, uh, but, uh, yeah, a, a spin that really could have been uh, avoided. Shows the uh, kind of dangers with, uh, with misplacing your car even by a couple of inches. Shows exactly just why these drivers, uh, you need to keep the concentration for the entirety of the stint. There's no switching off. There's no uh, trying to, to sort of just, you know, call a couple of laps in. You have to be on the edge absolutely every single lap that you're uh, you're behind the wheel of these uh, these races here. Uh, again, it goes back to that point that we were making about this is now effectively a 12-hour sprint race where each driver is having to do maybe say two. Two, three hours at a time of just firing in these incredible incredible lap times uh, that they can possibly do it's almost like hot lapping for three hours straight and you know these guys and girls are going to be absolutely exhausted at the end of their stints uh, just looking as well back to that battle for fourth and fifth place there uh, Sebastian Hove in the 007 Pro Sim machine doing a cracking job of holding on to that fourth place Sultan Berkoye looks to have dropped back in pace a little bit as well and I wonder now five minutes left to go in this second hour here Ewan and uh, can you believe we're already looking into uh, to going into our third hour here yeah, not really. It's uh, it's flown by. To be honest, the first half of this ra first half. That's not the first half at all, is it? It's the first sixth of the race, uh, if you want to uh, if you want to call it that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it has flown by so far. We've seen uh, battles for the league going on pretty much constantly. I know that's petered out slightly over the last half an hour, but um, you know we've still got battles to be watching, like this one between ProSim and Mugen at the moment. And uh, yeah, still plenty of things to actually develop here. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's that's good news for us certainly. There's plenty of stuff to keep us entertained throughout the race, um, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll be uh, we'll be enjoying it. It's, it's certainly been it's certainly been entertaining so far, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, it's it's flown by. So uh, that's always a sign of a good race. The fact that the time is is flying by quite quickly the first two hours uh, it often means that there's uh, there's a lot f a lot of other things for our focus to be on. Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, talking about focus, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we do need to take a, a minute out to appreciate Ewan O'Leary here, who is about to embark on a, what looks like a 12-hour stint. So please, in the uh, the chat, if you want to send your thoughts and prayers and possibly some energy drink, uh, or at least 15 cans of it per hour. Energy in any form is accepted, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can go to his uh, home address and we can uh, get some, some delivery sent out. I can see him. What you don't see is I get to see Ewan all the time. Time and every time I'm talking, it's a, a sneaky little drink or a, a couple of Pringles here and there. Other crisps are available, of course. But you, I mean, you're an absolute madman for doing this. It's uh, I, I can't think of a better race to be doing this on. To be fair. Yeah, it's to, it should be entertaining certainly, uh, but uh, yeah, twelve hours is quite a long time, isn't it? Really, uh, to be to be sat here for. I probably need to go outside for a leg stretch afterwards. But anyway, it doesn't doesn't matter um, because uh, yeah, for the. Uh, for the fourth round of the EWC, me and, me and Yusuf did, uh, I think we both did the 12 hours pretty much in one go, or uh, at least uh, most of it. We both did it uh, kind of all the way through. So, um, yeah, I guess I've got some kind of experience under my belt for it. But, um, yeah, 12 hours in one go is quite a long time. It, and, it uh, certainly yeah, is. But it, uh, it. Let's, hope it's a, let's hope it's a good race. I'm sure it will be. Well, it's, I think it's already burned you out within two yeah. hours. I mean, the, the excitement that we've had here is absolutely off the hook. It really, really is. And uh, yeah, more of that to come, please. Of course, third hour coming up in just over an hour. Uh, an hour? Just over a minute and 50 seconds. As a reminder, check us out on Instagram. Head over to Instagram.com, uh, GTR24H. And uh, follow along with all of the, uh, the socials, all of the news that we keep posting over there and you can check us out on Facebook as well Facebook over at GTR24H as well so Jimmy Nazula for uh 
the 6014 um, doing a, a cracking cracking job out there in front VRS satellite racing uh, not so much for the 65 sister team of uh, Wanamaya in the, uh, the the sister McLaren 720S they're down in 7th place just now Ruiz in the 74 Juices Motorsport Club is in 2nd place at the moment in that, uh, that McLaren 720S and then it's the 51 of Carlos Basto in the uh, the Audi in third place as well. Cracking, cracking result for them. So, wow, just a chance for us to, to breathe, relax, get our breath back. I don't know about you guys at home. We've had an absolute ball watching this all unfold uh, of us just now. Just watching this 33 again, still trying to push and catch on to the back of the 007 Bentley of Sebastian Hove, but try as he might, it is just a bad day at the office for Zoltan Varconi. He's going to be coming into the pits in just a couple of minutes' time to, uh, to either fill up the car or get some new tyres on that thing because he desperately, desperately needs it. That gap now, 1.7 seconds. You're watching the Monza 12 Hours here live on GTR 24H. We're going to take a little break as well to pay the bills again and take a little couple of messages from our sponsors. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Leet Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on.
Welcome back then, ladies and gentlemen, to the 12 Hours of Monza here on GTR 24H. To all of the viewers on YouTube, as well as to all of the viewers over on Motorvision.tv. David Christie and Ewan O'Leary here with you for hour number three. And Ewan, this is my last hour with you, my man. This is uh, this is going to be kind of bittersweet because it's been an awesome, awesome race with you guys so far. It's, it's going to be a shame and uh, I know we've got uh, some more commentators coming up um, sooner rather than later but uh, but yeah it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be a shame uh, because it's been a good race um, so far while we've been away by the way there's been uh, some quite big developments particularly for the team that were in second place Juicy's Motorsport Club there was Saba Kiss his first lap out of the pit lane into Ascari for the first time and I'm afraid He's, uh, well, I didn't see what happened, but um, he's clearly gone around at some point and wasn't able to continue. He goes back to the garage now, but uh, that's a real setback for the team that we're in, we're in second place. Uh, Pro Sim are going to be knocking on the door of a podium as well um, before long. They have not pitted yet, which is why they're actually in first right now. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a bizarre situation and uh, obviously some guys are going to benefit from it. You know what? I, di I didn't even realise that. I didn't even real. I, I knew it was Kavasa Kiss, but I didn't re remember that the 74 was, of course, the Juices Motorsport Club. So, I mean, that is an absolute bombshell for that to happen. Uh, and wow, just absolutely mind is melted after all of that effort, all of that fighting that they did to get themselves up into that uh, that second place from Rui Race. The 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 absolutely uh, incredible you know display that we saw with the uh, the number 33 all counts for nothing right now so obviously they're on a recovery drive right now and then you see the car in the pits and I'll be honest with you and that car doesn't look like it's going uh, anywhere right now not for the moment we're trying to get to the bottom of what actually happened um, right now as to uh, you know whether it's going to be able to um, be repaired or not or, or what's going to go on because um, yeah this is a big moment and it will be a shame to lose another car at this early stage but uh, at the moment it looks like they're heading towards maybe last place in the GT3 order that would be absolutely disastrous for them uh, and disastrous for the race overall because um, Juice's Motorsport Club were, were a main player in the kind of action that was going on uh, at the front of the field and it would be a real shame to lose them from that so um, yeah hopefully they can get back into the race sooner rather than later but it isn't looking good no. Well, you hate to see it. You really hate to see it. And uh, by the magic of television, I've now got myself a coffee and a, and a banana. So we are all set here in the virtual commentary box. That, uh, that little message that I sent on uh, Messenger worked to treat. And uh, the uh, the production team have come through rather grandly for that uh, on that one. Uh, Ten hours left to go. Um, I mean... <sighs> What I don't get is the fact that we were expecting, from the first lap, right, we saw a very cool, calm and collected uh, start to the race by everyone. And I thought, right, this is, the, if I'm honest, this is going to be quite sort of drawn out. This is going to be a, a long affair. And what has happened? I mean, we've had three, two, two and a bit hours. And like, it's just this, this constant barrage of uh, overtakes and, and drama and chaos and, uh, and, you know, issues for teams left, right and centre. Yeah, it has been, and uh, yeah, it's, it's not what we want to see, uh, really, because um, yeah, we've uh, we've seen a, a lot of uh, a lot of guys out of the race already. I'm going to go back now to try and find the issue. Oh, there's already a replay coming up, and we'll all be able to see it here in a few moments' time. Um, but uh, Pro Sim are into the pit lane, by the way, from the lead of the race. But here we go with uh, Sarbakis into Ascari for the first time in his stint. Just goes wide on the entry, uh, gets onto the gravel. And uh, yeah, on the left hand side there, there is a wall waiting for you uh, quite imminently, actually. There's not much runoff there at all. There is uh, other parts, but uh, not this part. He's picked the one section of this road where it's, it can be quite nasty, and I'm afraid into the wall. Uh, it looks like they'll put them into the garage for at least uh, an extended amount of time. They're now down to 10th place in the GT3 category and overall. That previous replay was brought to you, ladies and gentlemen, by the letter F.
Uh, that was uh, not what you want to say. That uh, uh, like, that is absolutely gutting cold tyres for Kabasa Kiss, and it throws him into the wall. Meanwhile, Jimmy Jimmy Mazula even uh, regains the uh, the lead there and uh, straight into the uh, the front there. Uh, rightfully so, you've got to say. But uh, I'm interested to see where that triple double uh, seven Bentley comes out. The Pro Sim Racing team because they've been making big moves up through the order there, and you can. See them provisionally into uh, to second place, but Paolo Reese in that uh, number fifty one. In fact, they come into the pit lane just now. Uh, the fifty one uh, that has got uh, Paolo Reese behind the wheel. Yeah, I I think they're uh, they're in a, a good position right now. There, Ian. Yeah, they are indeed. We're just hearing as well that uh, Sarbakis uh, was on cold tyres for Ascari there, which probably contributed his issues. I'm a little bit surprised by that because, uh, you know, you're a fair way through the, the fair way through the track at that point. You know, you've got a little bit of time to um, get things going, get things warmed up by that point, but clearly hasn't really worked. And Sarbakis has uh, indeed gone uh, into the wall uh, on that occasion, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, he's well down the order now, but uh, it, obviously this is benefiting Prosim, who are really gaining on Paolo Reese, as he mentioned, who's got into that Ramada Motorsport car, although the gap for the front of the race now is 37 seconds that has gone from, uh, you know, nearly under a second to uh, over 30 in, in very short order indeed yeah, that's uh, a bit of a strategy masterclass there from Jimmy Nazula to uh, to get that gap up um, after the, uh, the the pit stops as well. And I guess we have to give it kind of five minutes really now to see where the order's going to settle down, to see after the, the pit stops uh, where they're going to go. Now have a look at that. That is a bit of a turn up for the books. That is never what I think has just happened there. That's Zoltan Verkanyi. Has he just been put a lap down? Surely not. Surely that has not just actually happened, that Zoltan Verkanyi has just been put a lap down after what could have been uh, a fight for the lead. I think uh, it sounds about right, though, and it may well have happened um, in the last few moments here because, uh, yeah, it's, it's really not been going too well for them. We'll try and see them as they're going over the line right now. Um, that's the pro sim car in the Bentley. But actually, we've got a long, long way, haven't we? <laughs> at this point, they're probably around the other half of the circuit um, at this point. So, um, yeah, there is the Juicers Motorsport Club car still in the pit lane now, two laps behind the next car. And uh, let's hope they rejoin. But uh, as you mentioned earlier, things not looking good for them right now. Oh, that has to... I'm, I'm currently watching Zoltan Verconi on the, uh, the the trackside cam, and I've got to be honest, you and that is a, a massive, massive dose of salt to the wound right there. Seeing the car that you were fighting with ahead of you and a lap up, I mean... Yeah, that is uh, that's a difficult one to stomach for any driver, for sure. I mean, going going a lap down is is always a difficult one, but seeing the car that you know you were in the lead of this race and you were fighting with this car, and now suddenly you're a lap down. That is. Uh, yeah, that is a, a very, very difficult one for sure. And I also think that the Audi is going to use that as a, as a catalyst to try and push even harder. And what we've seen is that Audi, when it overdrives itself, it gets all sorts of, uh, throws all sorts of shapes and uh, starts losing even more time. So at the moment, Zoltan Verkanyi down in that sixth position, when really, you know, he was up in third or fourth. And again, it just shows what can happen with the likes of Pro Sim Racing and with the likes of the uh, the, the 62 team, the uh, Unison Racing team, they're now up to uh, third and fourth position. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, a real turn up for the books. Not that Unison Racing in, in, in particular is a bad team, Pro Sim likewise, but you know that was a little bit of a surprise if you'd have told them at the start of the day they'd be fighting for a podium um, within three hours in this race, and I think uh, they would have been a little bit surprised. But you know, Unison Racing are the GT3 championship leaders in the EWC right now. I was expecting them to be going a little bit better, actually, um, but they're not using the Aston Martin that they do use in that series. Um, I don't think they've fallen out of favour with it a little bit i can't lie but um they've still got two rounds of that championship to go to maybe hold on for a famous victory um in that one 
So, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have to work hard at that one. But I think for this special event, they've decided to go for something a little bit different because maybe they enjoy driving the BMW a little bit more and uh, they can get more enjoyment out of the event that way. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're in fourth at the moment, having fun, hopefully. And, uh, yeah, it looks like it's uh, going pretty well for Nikolai Bezukov at the moment. It's just uh, good to see watching the 007 Pro Sim team uh, there on the move as we see the 62 of Nikolai Berzurukov there in that uh, purple and black machine uh, just making its way around the track, the uh, 62 BMW they're trying to catch on to the back of the uh, 007 Pro Sim racing team and to be honest that could be happening, uh, so we'll keep our eye on that but one thing I am noticing and I'm, I'm you'll you'll see from my video feed that I'm pulling all sorts of faces here because I'm not liking what I'm seeing transpiring here. That Audi of the number thirty three Zoltan Verconia is catching quite rapidly on Jimmy Nazula and He's perfectly entitled to do that, but I just have this horrible, horrible gut feeling that something bad is happening or is going to happen in the name of retribution uh, I think they're, they're better drivers than that I think that there's absolutely nothing to worry about on that but yet still yeah that idea is really pushing hard to unwrap itself and I wonder if it's maybe pushing a little bit too hard right now no, I haven't. I can't say I've been watching it myself, but uh, yeah, it's certainly a little bit of a, a worry that uh, some old rivals come together again. As uh, Varkini and Nissan are still driving those cars as well, um, but uh, as uh, Ryan Nash said a little bit uh, earlier on in the YouTube, I think it was him anyway in the YouTube chat, um, saying that uh, Jimmy Nissan cannot get angry. It's not. It, it's not a thing. It doesn't really happen. Uh, so uh, I don't think he'll be holding any hard feelings. But you're right. He's not the one who's really lost out in all of this um, in the race. Sultan Varkini is. Let's hope that uh, if indeed there is an unlappery, then there is going to be, it's a clean one, um, because, uh, you know, it, it, whether there's retribution going on or not, it can be a little bit difficult at the best of times, really, with the blue flag rules and etc., to try and unlap yourself. Uh, so let's see what happens. I think it's going to be quite difficult anyway because the McLaren's quite good in a straight line. And so uh, it's not going to get him into turn number one without an outrageous dive. And when you're a lap down, you don't really, uh, you don't really do that. So um, yeah, for now, things are going to be settled between the two. But uh, you know, barking his sticky behind can't be the worst idea because Nissel is going, going to be going pretty quickly at the moment. He's certainly extending his lead. Yeah, he certainly is. Uh, this is a man on the move right now, Nikolai Bezrukov, then in the 62 Unison Racing BMW. He is catching up onto the 007 Pro Sim machine uh, very, very rapidly. The gap was 4.2 seconds, it's now 2.9 seconds to that car in front. And uh, yeah, this is starting to get very, very interesting indeed. We're uh, also watching uh, Paulo Reis in the number 51 Audi uh, making his way. Way around. I, I've got to be honest, I did say that I really, really like the livery on that 51 machine. It looks fantastic. Um, but again, second place, you cannot argue with that whatsoever. A great job there from Pilo in that uh, number 51, uh, just making its way around for Ramada Motorsport. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a pretty good looking car, actually, the, the Audi. But it's, I think it's uh, a... Uh, <laughs> One from, uh, from one from real life, isn't it? I can't quite put my finger on which one, really. But uh, it certainly looks like that's been a thing in real life before. Um, and uh, I think a similar livery won the Nürburgring 24 Hours a few years ago. But um, I don't quite remember exactly what year or who it was. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, I must be getting old. Anyway, um, Dalton Barking is closing in um, on Nisola. We're seeing he, that he's probably the fastest man out there on the circuit right now. But we've seen the Audi come out of the box quite quickly, actually, in all of these stints they seem to be very very strong on the heavy fuel and uh, you know with uh, with new tires on However, when we get down towards the end of the stint, the, low, the fuel goes down and the tyres start to go away. The Audi's not quite so strong anymore, so um, I think uh, Nissola keeping him behind for now is probably a good idea because um, later on, that McLaren is going to come into its own. 
Yeah, it really, really is. And uh, again, just watching all of these battles going on throughout the uh, the, the course of the, uh, the the race here just now, the the twelve hours really boils down into its own individual little chapters, and that's what you can almost treat every hour like. It's like a it's like a different chapter of the book with different storylines progressing, different characters coming to the forefront. Obviously, at the start, it was all about uh, the likes of Jimmy Nissler and uh, Zoltan Ver Verconi, and now as the story progresses, now we start seeing the likes of Paul Loris and uh, you know uh, Sebastian Hove as well. We we did see a brief uh, shining cameo from uh, the the likes of uh, Rui Ress, who had a, a big big starting role earlier on, but it just wasn't to be with that 74 car. We can see Kabasa Kiss uh, still into pit lanes, getting some emergency repairs on that car. And to be honest, I think that uh, that day is done for that team, to be honest. But yeah, this is uh, getting a bit sketchy again. Look at the Audi straight on the tail of that, uh, that McLaren. Again, too far away to do anything. But the Audi is making a nuisance of itself you've got to say it's um and i don't say that in any any malicious way i mean that in like it's it's just it's letting uh the mclaren know that it's there in the background that it's uh, doing its very best to uh to try and hold on to that lap if it can Yes, absolutely. It would uh, rather that Audi was a lap down, really, and uh, you can't blame them because uh, mainly what I mentioned a little bit earlier um, about the McLaren coming into its own later on, which I think is still going to happen. Um, but uh, you know, it's first of all they don't really want the palaver of letting another car through anyway because uh, it, that McLaren might well get it on the next straight. It's very strong in a straight line, and that's why Varkany has not really been able to get through. It's all well and good making a dive when you're on the same lap and battling for positions, etc. But, you know, when you're a lap down, you, do, you don't really want to be making dives that are ridiculously far back and things like that. So, um, you know, that, that kind of threshold for when is it OK to make a move is, is a lot, lot... You have to go a lot further to reach that kind of point uh, if you're a lap down rather than uh, when you're on the same lap so it's uh, it's an interesting moment now for Varkini how risky is he willing to be really with this um, and uh, yeah how far is he willing to go to uh, to try and get through here um, we'll have to wait and see really going up into Ascari but uh, it's uh, it's not happened just for the moment yeah, just watching them going through just now. Obviously, we've got a slight break in the uh, the pictures just now, so we'll keep you updated because here comes the Audi. He's right on the tail of the McLaren. They've just come through uh, Ascari, and it's on the back straight here. The Audi could actually have a look up the inside of the Parabolica. Thinks better of it. Keeps in the toe of the McLaren. This could be a run down to, uh, to the first corner as well. This is awesome, awesome stuff here. And uh, apologies for the uh, the. Slide break in pictures there but they're on to the start finish line just now and uh, yeah that that whole unnerving feeling you and that I had is now starting to amplify more and more and more as these two really start keeping things I do think that Audi is just keeping tabs with the McLaren I, I, I don't think he's going to be sending off and there we go we've got an incident decision there for the, uh, the lap 11 incident between the 777 and the 717 Stewart's decision that it is a racing incident so no further action required on that one but uh, Ewan I, I mean you were mentioning there about the, uh, the the threshold for making a move when you're a lap down it's almost like when you're a lap down the threshold, the conversation just doesn't even happen anymore you know you've got to be so much faster than the car in front to allow yourself to be in that position and quite honestly I, I, I just don't think that Audi I mean he can get past him but it's only going to surely be a matter of time before he ends up back another lap down yeah, absolutely. He's, he's got to get away quite quickly because the blue flags are going to be waving. And uh, so that means he's got to get out of them uh, quite quickly. And uh, that's not looking like it's going to happen for Varkini at the moment because uh, he's not catching quickly enough um, at this stage. But you never know what can happen a little bit later on. This isn't having to do any defending, so he's not doing anything uh, bad in that respect either. These two just uh, kind of happy to run the pace. And they're probably the fastest two cars out there on the circuit right now. It's just the problem that Varkini's got a minute 
minutes to catch up to the 65 satellite racing car and Nissel has got nearly a 50 second margin at the front of the field now due to the demise of the Deuces Much World Cup car so it's not the worst position for either of these two to be in right now and uh, so uh, Varkin he doesn't look like he's really threatening anymore he caught up to the back of Nissel quite quickly but he's not uh, too threatening anymore yeah, he certainly, he certainly isn't. So a uh, cracking, cracking race that we've got on nonetheless. And this distracts us from the fact that the number 62 of Nikolai Bezrukov is right on the back of the 007 Bentley of ProSim right now. So this is the battle for the final step of the podium. And we've still only done two and a half hours of this race. So cracking little battle filtering on here. This is just awesome, awesome stuff that we've got going on. And that Bentley got a little bit wide round the parabolic and the BMW gets great drive round the outside it's going to be a battle of the dragsters down to turn number one and the Bentley is going to have to hold on for dear life here because that BMW is just catching, catching, catching like a, a hunter stalking its prey right now, I don't think it's going to be making any moves on this lap but again look at how uh, wide the Bentley goes, it's so sketchy on the brakes, so uh, loose on the brakes there, get a really good run to be fair to it to be fair to Sebastian Hove and is off like a stab drat away from the uh, the number 62 there of Unison Racing's Nikolai Bezrukov but uh, yeah I mean Ewan, uh, we've we've really been unlucky in this one in terms of we've been able to to barely catch a breath, barely catch a moment to to get a drink of water, to to get something to eat here because it's just, I mean, in on one hand it's brilliant to see, but in the second, my goodness me, we're going to sleep tonight, aren't we? <laughs> well, yeah, it's been very entertaining indeed for the moment, and uh, I think it's uh, about to get more entertaining really with the Pro Sim car in a bit of a well, it was in a bit of a Unison Racing sandwich. The Corvette was uh, in seven place at the moment it was uh, just in front there and it could have made a nuisance of itself but uh, decided not to uh, in the end and uh, that's just uh, cleared things up a little bit uh, for them um, so now it's a straight fight between ProSim and also Unison Racing as well with Ryan Nash only five seconds in the background there you can see the McLaren maybe hiding behind that Audi he's just in the background trying to get through uh, and uh, make a move up towards the front is the, the uh, replay into the, uh, the Ascari for the moment but um, yeah to, for the moment Bezrikov has not tried to make a move he certainly seems to be faster than the Pro Sim car at the moment though I just wonder if that Bentley has a new driver in it we don't I'm not entirely sure I just wonder if it's got a new driver not quite up to speed yet or uh, doesn't quite have the pace that uh, it may otherwise do um, with, uh, with another driver in the car yeah, look, that's actually a brilliant, brilliant observation there, Ewan, because, of course, Sebastian Hove able to throw that thing about, so it could very well be handed over to Morton Norgard or Morton Aixen uh, in that cap. Again, look at how the good the exit of that uh, Bentley is out of the, the first corner there the BMW really bogs down in those lower couple of gears there to get any sort of traction off and then it's through the rest of the track that the BMW really catches up to that uh, that Bentley up in front as well uh, just behind them actually I've just remembered uh, the number 65 the McLaren 720 of uh, VRS Satellite Racing they're just behind them as well by about four seconds so, again, you know, it's two and a half hours in, Ewan, and uh, we've got second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth split by maybe 15 seconds. That's absolutely nothing. Yeah, it's not a lot at all, really, to say that we're two and a half hours into the race very nearly, and uh, that's going to make things very exciting indeed for us. It's all Constantina and up for uh, third place, especially uh, right now, as we can see on board with ProSim and also USM Racing in the, in one go. Can't see very much out of that rear window of the Bentley. It's, it's a big rear wing in the way, but um, it's uh, still making uh, a great noise as, as normal. Um, the BMW isn't, I'm afraid, but uh, never mind. Um, it's uh, getting very close to the back of that Bentley now, though. And uh, just having to weave a little bit to break the slipstream. Bezrikov gets himself into it and now will start to make some inroads. But let's see if it really has the legs here on the straight. Doesn't look like it for the moment. Yeah, it doesn't. It's a drag race down to turn number one. Then it's going to be battle of the late breakers. Then the Bentley 
jinx that car forward and the BMW catches up again but again it gets a poor exit out the corner takes too much of that inside curve on the left hander of that corner there and the Bentley just roars away into life down the, uh, the back straight there but again when you have a look on the, uh, the instant replay here this is into turn one and again then you can see the attitude of these cars the, the way that the, uh, the, the, the weight all goes to that front wheels and that's what makes it when the cars lock up that's why they just go straight rather than being able to, to, to do any turns yeah, it's, it's ducking and diving a little bit, and I think it's more exaggerated with these uh, these bigger cars, really. Um, it's the way GT3 cars have been going recently, if you think about, uh, well, maybe not the Bentley, because they've always been quite big, but if you think about the cars that the BMW has replaced um, in, the, in the world of GT3, you know, you, you think about the Z4, it's a lot more like what you'd expect from a... Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it's it's... It's a lot bigger, and I think that and that kind of effect that you're talking about is a lot more, um, a lot more exaggerated. I mean, the brakes have got to do a lot more work, I suppose, um, on these cars, and they do duck and dive quite a lot. Um, but uh, when there's one against another, I guess it doesn't really matter too much. And uh, you know, it, it, these guys are certainly not thinking about it for the moment. And it just seems that the BMW doesn't quite have the legs on the straight at the moment. But under brakes, it seems to be very strong. You can see again into the parabolica, really d dives very deep under brakes, gets right up close under the rear wing of the Bentley and now not really getting the traction off of the corner. This is the problem for them. Not really any traction there and so it, they're going to struggle to make a move here, although they are closer than last time. Yeah, closer than they've ever been before. They make a move to the inside dead for turn one. It's into the brakes. It's a huge, huge dive up the inside dead. And it's moved on and dusted for the BMW. Classic, classic move there for Nikolai Bezerukov for the 62 team of Unison Racing. Fantastic stuff. But look at the Bentley. It gets the drive out the corner. But is it enough to get it into the uh, second chicane? I don't think it is. I think the BMW is going to have that move done and dusted. The BMW Bentley's going to have a look to the inside, but it's not to be. The BMW will take that position. So the BMW of Nikolai Bezrukov for Unison Racing up into that final step of the podium then and have a look behind because the recovery drive from that 65 of VRS Satellite Racing of Ryan Nash up into a fifth place but just on the tail of this heaven forbid after starting last in the gt3s you do you think it's possible for them for both vrs teams to get onto the podium here I think it's very possible for them, yeah. They've got great strength in depth, both of the teams, and great experience in GT racing as well, um, having taken multiple championships. Uh, and, they, and they, Well, apart from their actual achievements, they've just been around for a long time. Very experienced team, uh, as opposed to uh, some of the others who are very experienced as well, um, but uh, maybe not quite on the same level as satellite racing um, in that respect. But, uh, yeah, they're certainly involved now. Prosim going backwards slightly, and also... Also, uh, Bezrakov getting towards the Romano Motorsport car up front as well for second place. So four cars all in one shot battling over second. It's very entertaining indeed. It certainly is. Well, again, thank you very much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned and don't go anywhere. We're going to take a very short commercial break and we'll be back after these messages. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Leaf Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv.
it. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the 12 Hours of Mons of David Christie and June O'Leary here with you. And you've just joined us right at the best possible time because it is all kicking off right now. We've got battles galore right now. We have got Nikolai uh, Bezrukov against uh, the uh, Paolo Reese, in fact, actually, just in front of him. We've also got Ryan Nash trying to catch on to the back of the Bentley, uh, the 007 Pro Sim Bentley. And then we've also got Nicolas uh, Elf Statsal. Uh, just trying to fight off our Turis Kamal for seventh and eighth place, Ewan. Um, I, I mean, did we go away for coffee and suddenly all hell kicked off here? Yeah, it looks like it, um, because, uh, yeah, the, the, the battles have uh, just been a little bit quieter for, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, and uh, now all of a sudden they're free all along at once here. Uh, I, well, if you count the four as one, then it's two, but you know what I mean. It's uh, it's very close indeed up the front of the field for second place, and this is one of the fights that's going on, Prosim versus uh, Satellite for now. Ryan Nash applying the pressure just a little bit, and uh, that is certainly uh, starting to slow the pro sim car down certainly because uh, there's gaps two seconds to the battling pair up in front just in the foreground there the audi and the bmw also battling over second place so we've got four different manufacturers in this fight as well it's going to be good to see the strengths and weaknesses of the different cars and uh, yeah it's we, we look forward to this fight because ryan nash and satellite racing have been trying to get themselves up the order throughout the entire day and they weren't too successful in the first hour really but now they're starting to get a little bit better and maybe make a move here and they do indeed Oh, great fight going on between Paolo Reese and Nikolai Bezrukov as well for second and third place. A little bit of contact and Nikolai Bezrukov for the 62 outfit of Unison Racing takes second place into the Parabolica. That was an absolutely classic overtake there. Paolo Reese down into third place. Where on earth that pace came from? I've got absolutely no idea. But Ryan Nash now in the 65 up into fourth position. And again, we said just about... Two minutes ago, could the VRS teams get a, uh, both spots on the podium? And I think that we answered that with uh, the best part of nine hours left to go in this race. Incredible, incredible action here. And uh, back to that fight for Nikolaos uh, Elfstatio. Uh, I think he's uh, well and truly got that position sorted for sixth place over uh, Arturis Kamal in eighth place there. So amazing action all the way through this. Uh, this field here and uh, Paolo Ries I think is going to get fed to the dogs here because Ryan Nash in that 64, uh, 65 DRS satellite racing team is breathing all down the neck of uh, Paolo Ries in that 51 right now that Audi kind of slipping back a little bit 
Yeah, it is just a little bit. I think uh, Carlos Pasto was doing a fantastic job in that car, but now he's not in it anymore. Not in it anymore. Uh, it's starting to struggle a little bit that Audi, but um, you know, I'm sure it's going to rise to the fore again uh, at some point throughout the day um, because uh, it, it's a very strong uh, lineup indeed. You've got some highlights, by the way, up in the top right hand side of the screen right now um, from uh, the last hour and a bit um, because uh, you know we didn't have uh, any highlights after um, the. Uh, the top of the hour, so we've got some more uh, now, and uh, and yeah, there's been there's been a fair amount going on. There's still a lot going on in the uh, in the live picture as well with uh, Ryan Nash and uh, the Audi. Uh, as well just in front so this is a battle for third and I can't imagine the Audi is going to stay in front for much longer because we now are strong that McLaren is in a straight line yeah here we go and talking about the highlights from the last hour I mean literally they could just replay the entire last hour the whole thing's been a highlight uh, late on to the breaks goes the McLaren then against the Audi into that first turn the McLaren has a little bit of a wiggle as it tries to put the power down out of that first chicane the Audi lives to tell the tale another day keeps its little grasp on to that last step of the podium but for how long because Ryan Nash is hunting waiting praying to try and take that position away from the Audi keep an eye on on that Bentley in the background as well because he's still trying to uh, catch on to this little group as well but one man that we have to speak about because we're not really saying anything about him just now Jimmy Nazula in the 64 VRS satellite racing machine out in front 70 seconds in the Leeds Ewan I mean this is an absolute master class to be out in front so far out in front and not putting a foot wrong I mean this is an exemplary drive right now you know, he's a very, very strong driver indeed. We've seen him in the EWC driving a DPI, but I don't think that's where his strengths lie. In the GT categories, he is one of the very best indeed, and he's extended this margin by over 30 seconds in this stint to second place. He started about 37 seconds in front of second, and now he's over a minute and seven in front. So a very, very strong drive indeed from this lot, and he's getting away from this lot who are battling really, really hard at the moment. That's a very late dive from Ryan Nash, tried to make it work but um, didn't end up going for the move on the inside line of the Audi, he might try and cut to the inside now though through the Parabolicas they run side by side along the straight, not much to choose between them but Paolo Races probably not got too much longer in, in third place I wouldn't imagine Ryan Nash looks a lot lot pacier for the moment yeah, here we go, side by side then, battle the late breakers, and the Audi late on the brakes in the turn one, he's done it! Somehow manages to hold on to that third position. That is absolutely absurd, you would never have seen that one coming. The McLaren looked like it was going to have that position all day for breakfast, every single day of the week, and the Audi says, no thank you, not today, you're going to have to work for it again. Now again, he's doing brilliantly, as uh, Paolo Reis, on positioning this oh. car, and there we go, it's done and dusted before it's even how did that one happen he, he managed to hold on to it in, in the first corner and then just away by like he's not even uh, not even there it was a very bizarre battle because it had hardly fought it into the first chicane. You'd think he would do the same into the second, but Rich really wasn't interested uh, unless Ryan Nash just outbroke him entirely. But the, the speed at which he did it, uh, I find that a little bit hard to believe. So, uh, yeah, a little bit weird, but uh, Ryan Nash isn't complaining. He's up into third place now, and it's all been changing um, up towards the front nearly three hours into the race. Uh, very interesting indeed. Now, Pro Sim are on the back of Paolo Reese. They might be able to get through as well. Ah, that might actually be a clever move from the Audi because we've seen with the likes of Zoltan Verconi when he overdrives that Audi the tyre life and the, the expected life of that car goes massively, massively down so uh, I thought he might have been trying to hold on to the back of that McLaren maybe he can't, maybe he's just accepted that that McLaren is always going to make its way past uh, as, it, as it rightfully did but the Bentley now starting to make a charge here of the, uh, the 007 Pro Sim racing team that was Sebastian Hove behind the wheel of that car. I think it might still be Sebastian there, but again, a fantastic recovery drive from the uh, the 007 Pro Sim team to get them in a position where they could be taking fourth place with just nine and a quarter hours left to go. This is where the real important part of the race begins because this is where drivers start to get tired towards the end of their three hour stints. This is where they need to be uh, the most focused because they're most awake and just 
piling in these lap times here as well. And uh, I still can't believe that everyone up until fifth position has been lapped. Yeah, absolutely. Only five cars on the lead lap is quite hard to believe, uh, really, at this point, because you'd expect there to be a few more. But uh, it's just the pace that Nissel has been showing, really, um, so far in this race. It's been very, very impressive indeed, and it doesn't show any signs of slowing down anytime soon either, um, which is uh, which is good news for satellite, certainly. But... Uh, it's 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 really starting to string the field out behind. I believe we have a, uh, I've had two retirements because Juice's Motorsport Club don't look like they're going to get back. But if you just count them, you look at uh, the likes of Mads Hedegaard uh, at this point in the race. You know he's he's a few laps down at, at this point, and you know that just shows the field being strung out massively uh, by Yumi Nistler, who's been very very strong so far. Hedegaard is currently um, three laps down on uh, on this uh, near, thereabouts uh, i know he's had his own problems in this race but still that's uh, partly due to the pace of nissala and uh, yeah it means that these battles that are happening are happening a lot lot further down than what we would otherwise expect can i just point out top 10 finish for our gt4 boys the viaduct and team top 10 finish that is an amazing effort from them given that they are literally racing gt3 machinery in a gt4 car so great to see them up at the uh, obvious demise of other teams but hey look a top 10 finish is a, uh, a top 10 finish so well done to them they need to keep going and keep the car uh, on the uh, the black stuff as well for the uh, the final nine and a bit hours here as you're seeing the uh, pro sim 007 team trying to catch up to the back of paulo race but paulo starting to open up that gap a little bit just now as well and they're going to have the uh, i believe the the uh, mclaren of jimmy nisla onto their tail in a about, probably about 15 to 20 laps time to put them a lap down uh, as well. The pace hasn't been massively different. Um, I mean, the last lap there from Jimmy Nisola, 147.9, uh, but everyone else is doing like 148s and 149. So a second to two seconds faster. That is, uh, I mean, the, the consistency of Jimmy Nisola to, to keep firing in those lap times, June, is just unbelievable right now. Yeah, his consistency is very, very good indeed. And that's what one of the parts that makes him a, a really great uh, GT driver over, over an endurance distance, especially not seeing him in sprint racing very much, but over an endurance race, he's very, very strong indeed. As I mentioned, he was part of the winning team of the 12 hours of the Nürburgring uh, a month ago and in the EWC, that was. And uh, he was one of the star drivers from that one, um, really put in a fantastic performance. Um, I think he was the second driver to get into that car. And uh, he, you know, drove away from the LMP2s that were kind of hounding that DPI car so um, yeah he's, he's a really great driver but having a look at the front straight at the moment some cars flying by and some clouds starting to gather overhead as well I wonder if we can have a look at the radar because um, the uh, oh my word it's getting a little bit uh, it's getting a little bit more moisturised I think you could say oh. and uh, Monza's starting to uh, be in danger of getting rained on a little bit ahead of schedule actually I'm going to do my best, best weather person impersonation. But if you have a look down at the uh, bottom left there, uh, we have a, an area of high pressure and some isobars moving up from the uh, the southwest there. Uh, what is going to happen there is that you'll see that bright red intensity patch there. That is some heavy, heavy rain. And the focus, will keep an eye on that in the next half hour or so. But the way that that is moving, you, and you might be getting your Christmases all coming at once today, buddy, with the hope of that rain that is definitely looking like it's on its way certainly some lower temperatures and some cloud cover hitting the track just now that'll be dropping down the uh, the track temperature and potentially the air temperature as well here so yeah wow uh, big big things on the change here for this 12 hours of monza i'm i'm honestly struggling to believe that that is almost another hour done already this is now like this is like warp speed these hours are just passing by at this point but, I mean, it, it brings up another point, actually, I want to bring with you, uh, Ewan, about Jimmy Nissala and that number 64 team in general. So when you've got that pace and you're that far in front, I imagine it must be really difficult to try and keep focus because you've got nobody else around you that you're fighting. You've got nobody else that's on the same pace as you or even from weeks of it in the same 
race. So, you know, how do you think Jimmy keeps his concentration and keeps that focus in to just do those lap after lap? Yeah, I think it must be very difficult, really, um, at this point to, to be able to do that because, uh, you're right, the, the concentration is, is a big key, it is very key, and uh, it's it's easy to lose it when you're out on your own. But I feel like you know, racing drivers always do want to be in the lead, don't they? And, and I, I always found in the very rare occasions I was in the lead when I was, when I was uh, driving still um, that... No, you're right normally in the mid pack and you're on your own you can be very uh, you know you can lose concentration very easily however um, with being in the lead I feel like it just gives you that little extra something to just keep the concentration sticking over and you know you're not on full concentration you know your mind's not going 100 miles an hour the entire time um, concentrating trying to eke out every bit of performance however you know you, you're kind of driving at a safe 95% or so um, just kind of almost unconsciously um, at this point and uh, you know it's uh, it, it's it's I don't want to say easy, but it can feel quite rhythmic and quite um, you know quite. I don't, I don't really know what, what the word is for it without saying the word easy because I know it's not but you know it, it, it just kind of fall into place for you almost and uh, you know it, and this, uh, it's probably experiencing that at some point and let's stop and get us right he's been in this position many times before he's a very experienced driver and uh, he will have certain things that will allow him to keep his concentration up uh, throughout the day yeah, he certainly, certainly will. Just to remind you then, the VRS team's taking both of the podium positions. Uh, Ryan Nash is ahead of Paolo Reis. Paolo Reis now sent back to the realms of the 007 Pro Sim Bentley, who is making, to, looking to make short work of it now. He gets a good run out of the uh, the Parabolica and it's on the run down to that first straight. We saw the Bentley having a little bit of a look up the inside under braking on that last time. Surely he's way too far back to even think about it on this time around. The car's both under braking, you can see the weight of that Bentley really makes it struggle when it's under braking. You see it moving from side to side. That Audi gets a poor exit out of that first corner. They're almost going to be side by side as they come round that right hander down towards the first, uh, sorry, to the second chicane, uh, and then down to second Variante, and then it's going to be the right hander. So the Lesbos will play gamesmanship as a little bit weaving from side to side from the Bentley, trying to make that Audi go too deep into the chicane there. I think it actually worked there because it's going to be on the entry to the Lesmo corners here and that Bentley looking very, very fast indeed. Again, I think it's still Sebastian Bove. We'll get an update as soon as we possibly can to who is behind the wheel there into the second Lesmo here. And again, the Audi gets a nice run out of it. The Bentley, though, has the straight line speed. It has the grunt to try and catch it back up to that car. And, you know, again, I make the point that you'd never think that this is a 12-hour race. You'd think that this was like a, a two-hour sprint race the way these cars are going yeah absolutely it's it's uh, it's it's very close at the moment and these guys are racing very hard indeed not like there is over uh, nine hours to go uh, so uh, yeah it's uh, it's it's still very close uh, even at this point uh, this is the by far the closest battle on the circuit by the way we've got second place sort of going on still and uh, for seventh at the moment there's sort of a battle going on as well but um, the the uh, the unison racing Corvette is falling back a little bit uh, from the GSR Aston Martin as things stand uh, so uh, that's not really a battle that's uh, going to be changing in the next few moments this one still has the potential to though pro sim last time around with the closest they've ever been but uh, diving down the inside with a late one in a bentley is not that easy really because it's quite big it doesn't slow down as well as maybe some of the other cars and also you need a slightly bigger gap to fit through as well so uh, it's uh, it's a little bit more difficult to make those lunges uh, in my opinion anyway uh, in that Bentley but uh, we'll wait and see that doesn't mean it's impossible to get past certainly well, I mean, the great thing about the Bentley, of course, is that it comes with a free butler to help you uh, to steer it around the, uh, the the track as well. It's uh, jokingly and lovingly referred to as the Boatley, um, just because of its size and its weight. And we're seeing exactly why that is into the Lesbos then. That Audi is having a real hard time as Paolo Reis have tried to hold on to that position, forced out wide by the Bentley. It's down into the second Lesbo corner, and that Bentley is going to have to tuck in and think better of it. It's going to be on the run down to Ascari for sure. And 
and this is dropping the pair of them back even further. Uh, it's going to have to go a long, long way to catch up to uh, Zoltan Vodkanyi, but uh, certainly the, the Bentley thinks better of it, tries to pull out of the slipstream there, get a little bit cool there, and trying to harass that Audi into making a mistake. But again, it's going to be on the run to the Parabolica here, dips into the slipstream here, and the Bentley really should have the grunt here, but it just doesn't. It, the Audi looks like it's able to hold its own. And other than a wild lunge, it does look like the Audi has the markings and the 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 you know the hold on the uh, the Bentley there. It certainly looks like it for the moment. I was a little bit surprised because we saw the Audi struggling for a straight line speed a little bit earlier, but seems to be holding its own right now, and uh, it's uh, doing a pretty good job. Prosim certainly uh, will have been knocked back a little bit by losing all those positions uh, so in quick in such quick succession, but uh, they certainly seem to be refining themselves now. What it is doing though is allowing um, oh, there's a wide, and for some reason the Audi just comes to a dead stop coming out of the first chicane. That was very, very weird, but it's allowing the, well, I was going to say, allowing second and third to get away. It's also allowing uh, Zoltan Vargini to decrease the gap by 15 seconds since this battle started. So he's getting into the picture now, but what on earth happened here to Paolo Reese? I can't even understand what happened. He just seems to stop. It, it Maybe even flick the pit limiter on. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I think so. He went in way too deep into uh, the, the, the first corner there and uh, got a little bit of contact from the car behind as he was trying to get back onto the, the power there. But you're right, I think maybe a missed gear or maybe some sort of issue with the uh, the, the steering wheel. He's got going again, but uh, that drops Paolo Reese after all that hard work earlier on down to that fifth place in the 007 Pro Sim racing car up into that fourth position. And uh, quite honestly I, I think that things are going to settle down a little bit just now uh, we can see uh, Ryan, Nash, Ryan Nash actually trying to catch up to the back of Nikolai Berzukov there we're seeing on board with that Audi and that was, that was bizarre there Ewan it looked like pit limiter to me. I didn't quite see what speed it was, but it was a round number on the on the dashboard, which suggests pit limiter to me. Um, and also, he shifted into second gear and didn't go anywhere either. Um, almost trying to figure out himself what happened, but it cost him a position and four seconds, I'm afraid. So that's quite a lot of time, really. And uh, Paolo Ruiz is going to have to try and gain that back, but doesn't seem to have the pace to do so at the moment. Very weird, though, and very rare that you do flick the pit limiter on, but I guess you're all arms and elbows trying to get through this first UK. It's so tight for these GT3 cars that um, I guess with, with your arms flying everywhere it might be viable to accidentally flick it yeah, just also noticing, uh, we'll bring you up to speed on what's actually happening here. Ryan Nash and the 65 VRS satellite racing team is a way to do the unthinkable. He is looking to take second place here from the Unison Racing 62 outfit of Nikolai Bezrukov here. And uh, from last on the grid, we have to remind you of that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the 65 car started last after an infringement in qualifying, being pushed back, running out of fuel in qualifying and the 64 gave a nudge all the way to pit lane there the 65 then started at the back of the grid and now on position to take P2 in the race, that is an absurd turn of events and an amazing recovery drive, maybe a couple of hours later than both myself and yourself, Ewan, expected that to, to actually happen there yeah, I, I was expecting them to make a little bit more progress in the first hour, I've got to admit, but um, I wasn't quite expecting to see them in second at the end of hour three, really. Uh, that is quite a remarkable achievement for them. Obviously, they've got to stay there for it to be an achievement, but... Um, very, very strong driving from uh, Ryan Nash, especially who's been doing a great job. Not that uh, they weren't a little bit earlier, but... Uh, Certainly now they're starting to stretch their legs and, and get involved uh, a little bit further up the order. It doesn't look like they're going to be able to catch their teammates at this point, uh, a minute and 15 down. Even if they did have more pace, um, then, uh, it, you know, that's a, that's a pretty hefty head start for the 64 to uh, to be having. But uh, still, Satellite Racing going to really try and take home this one too, and that'll be uh, absolutely fantastic for them. 
Yeah, it certainly, certainly will as we come up to the end of a yet another hour here at the 12 hours of Monza. This is absolutely flown by. It really, really has. Really, really enjoyed being part of this. And uh, yeah, an awesome, awesome race in it nonetheless. Uh, we're still watching Ryan Nash here for the VRS satellite racing team just making his way uh, through the uh, the order there. And uh, a little bit of a lighting change there. So obviously some some cloud floating by. We've got a yellow flag Ooh. in sector two, which means one of the, uh, the the cars is off there. Is back onto the uh, the the track there. And uh, just watching this this battle here with the second and third place making their way around just now. Um, I mean, Ryan Nash, to, to come from the back of the grid is it, such a, a spirited, spirited drive there and such a strong effort for him to, uh, to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's been absolutely fantastic from Ryan Nash so far. And he's kept himself out of trouble as well, uh, which is uh, very important and uh, very useful for him because uh, he's now uh, able to go for second. Just saw it was Kim Pedersen who caused that yellow flag briefly in sector two there. I've got a replay coming up to the second chicane right now. It looks like he just loses it, really. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll wait and find out. There's certainly no other cars around. That uh, goes over the curbs normally. Just gets on that gravel on the left-hand side and spins around. Even though these cars do have traction control, it doesn't mean that you are unable to spin it, certainly and uh, we just saw that there trying to rejoin at a point like this also is quite a palaver uh, as you can see now i'm trying to get the traction down once again on the grass has caused another quick half spin but uh, kim pedersen back going again and uh, yeah they're currently in p9 trying to uh, gain a bit of time on those in front but uh, obviously struggling too at the moment uh, so just uh, to, to give you an update on the weather as well, we're now receiving reports that there's a tiny little spit of rain starting to fall onto the track, just some very, very light drizzle at some parts of the track. If we have a look at the weather radar, there is a huge patch of weather incoming in the next, I would say, probably next half an hour. And uh, yeah, that is going to make things very, very interesting. The sky's very dark and grey and gloomy over the virtual recreation of Monza here for this 12 hour event we've got uh, 9 hours left to go in the race and we've been treated to an absolutely barnstorming race, this is the last you're going to hear from myself Dave Christie over the course of the race but it is going to be Ewan O'Leary who is doing a superhuman effort along with the rest of the commentary team, we're going to hear from Kieran McGinley very very shortly and Chris Buxton may even make an appearance back in the commentary box as well. Are you feeling good, Ewan? Are you feeling hydrated? Are you feeling you've got coffee, you've got all your sugary sweets and all that sort of stuff ready for the next couple of hours? I am feeling ready, yeah, I am. Um, but I am prepared for uh, another nine hours. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I know it's a bit of a bombshell to drop, but I don't really drink coffee. I've never drunk coffee in my life. Uh, but uh, but anyway, there we are. I just... how, 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 how can you stay for 12 hours and not drink coffee? Like, I need to know those secrets. Those are things you need to share with me. Well, I'm not, I don't know what it is. I just, I just stay awake. I don't know. It just. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, it, I we'll have that same imagine. conversation you in ten years' time, and see yeah, if that I, is still the case. I don't think my answer is going to be the same, no. But I know, I know my days are numbered without coffee, to be honest. Um, but, uh, but yeah. I, I, anyway, maybe I don't even like it. I've never tried it. Oh, great stuff, great stuff. Right, well, we will stay with you for a couple more minutes. We're due to take a commercial break very, very shortly, and we'll dive off, but we don't want to miss this uh, brewing battle for second and third place, so we'll stick with it for a couple laps until the inevitable that we think is going to happen actually does happen here. But Ryan Nash for VRS uh, Satellite Racing still all over the back of Nikolai Bezrukov in that Unison Racing BMW like an absolute rush right now, and uh, the pace that this McLaren has got is absolutely scandalous right now. It is all over the back as they come through a scary chicane for uh, what must be about the 45th lap or 46th lap right now. Uh, I'll tell you that in just a couple of minutes time, but it doesn't matter because with eight hours and 58 minutes left to go, you, I mean, the, the way that this battle has raged on and the fact that we've just had this brilliant, brilliant supply of action and drama throughout this first four hours has just been so intense, hasn't it? 
it has indeed. There's been a lot going on uh, for the last three hours, which is uh, which is certainly good uh, for us and good for uh, spectators to watch as well. Um, but uh, things are starting to close up as well. As uh, yeah, I'm seeing Nissala in the pit lane right now. Um, I've, I've worried for a moment that there was an issue, but no, it's on schedule because uh, we've completed another hour, and so satellite racing going to be into the pit lane. It looks like they're doing 12 pretty much identical stints to get to the end of this race. Normally we see them go slightly over the hour and have a slightly shorter final pit stop, but that's not going to be the case uh, for the 64 at least. Yeah, that's, that's certainly the case here. And again, I wonder if Ryan Nash is going to be trying to uh, to make that move purely because, you know, with the, the weather moving in and pit stops coming in as well, this is maybe now the time that he absolutely wants to make it. And yeah, just having a look at the updated weather radar, that uh, massive patch of rain has actually taken a, a direct turn towards the circuit here. So absolutely guaranteed in the next half hour, you're going to be getting some weather uh, moving on uh, into that and that is the number 64 uh, pointing the wrong way and that oh. is uh, Jimmy Nissala what's happened to your race leader facing the wrong way at the chicane you oh my god big big drama there Oh, he's gone back to the pit lane. Oh, dear oh. me. Well, what has gone on here then? Because uh, we're not sure for the moment. I'll try and get a replay in the next few moments' time. But, uh, yeah, big moment. He's facing the right way, actually. But he is stopped out there on the circuit for whatever reason. And uh, that is a, a huge moment. What has gone on That's here at all? I'm going to try and uh, see from the uh, cockpit view because uh, otherwise we're not really going to be able to see. Is Surely it's not a, a double doubt if an engine failure uh, for Nicola. No, he just goes into the corner and then stops for whatever reason. He just stops in oh, the middle no, of the that, corner. Sure, it's that hardware failure. That's that's what that looks like. The fact that it, there's no steering input on the car and no uh, brake and pedal input. In fact, there is a tiny little bit of steering input, but the car has just completely died. So, huge drama, Ewan. How, how can you do this with me with like <laughs> two minutes to go before I leave and the race leader's gone? What yeah, is that it's a real about? shame. It is a real shame to see because uh, they were having such a fantastic run and we were saying how good Nissan has been so far this race. He's been absolutely flawless, but uh, unfortunately something we think out of his hands has uh, taken this race out of his hands and, oh dear, it's, it really is such a shame to see. Uh, really not, not, you don't really, you, I mean, you know, fair enough if somebody comes and takes the race away from him, you know, that kind of thing's fair enough, but when it's when it's taken away from you uh, by a hardware failure or something like that, it's especially heartbreaking, and I'm afraid we believe that's uh, that's what's happened to him. Right, there we go then, ladies and gentlemen. That has been your opening three and a bit hours here at the 12 Hours of Monza. That is it for myself, Dave Christie. Thank you so much for joining me. Do not go anywhere because when we come back after commercial breaks, it's going to be back to you and O'Leary and a very warm welcome to Kieran McGinley. Thank you very much for everyone behind the scenes at production team. Just keep it locked and uh, my goodness me, what on earth is going to happen after the break? The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Fleet Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green.
minutes. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Welcome back to the 12 Hours of Monza here by GTR 24H. We have still got 8 hours and 51 uh, minutes remaining in this race. And it's all kicked off. Jimmy Nissler, who was leading, is now in ninth place in the race after a problem that we don't yet know of, but they're still not back in the race uh, just yet either, which is uh, a real shame to see. And uh, I'll tell you the last thing that David Christie said before he left us uh, here in the broadcast booth. He said uh, that he's off to put some money on the GT4 winning this race because it's uh, been so crazy and there's been so many problems for everybody so far that uh, that they're going to rise to the front. Well, uh, I think it's it's a long shot, but you know, worth it might be worth a go. Uh, three hours to ten in, and we've already got uh, three dry, uh, teams with major major issues in this one. My name's Ian O'Leary. I'll be uh, here with you throughout the day, and now joining me for the next few hours is uh, Kieran McGinley. Welcome along, Kieran. Uh, I know you've been uh, on practice and, and qualifying, doing some coaching, but uh, now it's time for the race uh, the the excitement has been bubbling up throughout the weekend it's certainly starting to deliver this race it was a bit of a runaway for the satellite racing car about an hour ago but now it's all changing around a little bit now yeah, just a little bit, and it had to happen just as soon as I took over from David. I feel sorry for him, actually, because <laughs> of the biggest moments of this race, and he's not here to see how it all develops, but I'm sure he's getting lots of coffee in him and lots of whatever in him just to make sure he recovers from that alone. Yes, I'm here for the next uh, few hours or so, so uh, hopefully you like my dulcet tones. If not, then that is a, a huge, huge shame. But it sounds like I've missed out on a lot, and uh, coming into the sort of last 8 hours, 50 minutes, you and I mean, fill us in. What's, what's been happening? Well... Uh, where, where, where do I start, really? Um, throughout the start of the race, I guess it was uh, it was all about satellite and Mugen sim racing with uh, Nissala versus Valkyrie. It was uh, they were throwing punches at each other figuratively, and then uh, and then actually physically, I guess, uh, into the second chicane they came together um, all those uh, all those hours ago, and uh, yeah, it allowed. Uh, the Deuces Motorsport Club card to take the lead. The three of them had a, had a good fight for a little while, but um, unfortunately, the uh, Deuces Motorsport Club card is now out after a crash at uh, Ascari. Uh, Shabakish was uh, on cold tyres coming through there, and I'm afraid uh, didn't uh, didn't make it out of Ascari for the first time. So uh, they're out of the race now, um, we believe anyway, um, and going to be in 11th until the very end. Um, it was uh, all about Yumi Nisolo from then on, really, uh, until the issue that we've just had right now we've had a fantastic battle going on for second Pro Sim have been involved, Unison Racing Romano Motorsport, uh, Mugen Sim Racing not too far behind the, the other uh, satellite racing car there as well but uh, now it's all kind of turned around and that really tasty battle for second has now become the battle for first uh, which is uh, fantastic news for us really but we're still kind of in the middle of finding out who's actually going to filter themselves out into the lead it might well be the other satellite racing car by the looks of things I do indeed and for it to be this close sort of three hours in it, it's amazing it's an astonishing achievement for the drivers and for the team so uh, looking forward to seeing how this all plays out uh, over the next few hours we've got the uh, the 007 Pro Sim team in the pit lane right now as you rightfully said and Ryan Nash I mean let's talk about that because the, the two teams there the 64 and the 65 got in a little bit of hot water from the stewards they had a discussion last night you're not allowed to push a car which is what happened last night one of them ran out of fuel pushed back to the pit lane so I can only assume that one of them had the penalty and has shot up the order ever since I mean for one team let's have a look I mean the 74 which is now out of the race uh, we've got uh, Jimmy Nissala 
in the 64 there, which is one of the VRS satellite cars, as we were talking about. Five laps down on the leader after three laps. Oh, in fact, they've got a massive red DNF next to their name, so that's uh, that's probably why they're that far down the order. Okay, let's have a look at the treble seven then uh, in Pedersen, who's driving that car right now. Two laps down on the race leaders after three hours. That's not bad going at all, uh, all things considered. Yeah, they've had, they've had a few problems as well, actually, throughout the day. Um, it was it was all going very well with Carl like a good starting that car, um, and then uh, things I don't want to say things fell apart for them. Um, but uh, you know, it, it wasn't going quite as smoothly anymore, uh, I'm afraid. And uh, they've had, had a few spins. They even lost the rear wing actually through Lesmo two uh, one time. But uh, they've they've got a new rear wing, and uh, they're back out there again, uh, running fairly well uh, as things stand. Uh, so uh, so. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's all kind of been tipped on its head uh, in the last few moments. The gaps are very small uh, up and down the field. The gap for the lead is eight seconds. Uh, and you're right, this 65 satellite racing car is the car uh, that was uh, starting from the very back of the field. They got a five second penalty added onto one of their times. Uh, obviously, it's an average um, for the uh, for the kind of qualifying overall. And five second added on is uh, quite disastrous. And they started last um, in this race of the GT free cars Here's some uh, here's a weather report by the way as well. I'm sorry, I didn't know what was coming up there. I was on the edge of my seat, but um, here we go. The uh, the weather. Uh, a lot of the big rainfall has actually just missed us to the north, um, and that would have been quite biblical actually. But it looks like we're going to get some still quite fairly heavy rain coming in, in the next few moments. Just coming up from kind of the bottom left hand side of your screen there. It's uh, not looking particularly promising for those that want a dry race. Not particularly. I mean, the, the, you've got the one there from the north, which is just going to miss the circuit, but then there's more coming from the southwest. So, yeah, not looking great so far for these drivers. And we're being told repeatedly that there's light rain. There's just a sprinkling of rain coming in the next few minutes. So we'll have to keep an eye and see how that affects the track. And sometimes with the driver, you, you want to know where you stand with the wet weather. Sometimes you prefer, you know, a wet circuit you know, where you see the standing water or you know the grip's going to be limited with a greasy track which you know you get that light sprinkling of rain all across the circuit that's probably one of the worst ways to find out that you've got no grip coming into the next corner because you can't see it you can't see that subtle change in the tarmac color that leads you to believe there's going to be less grip there and the last place you want to find that is somewhere like Ascari or in towards the Lesmos where you find out there's not actually a lot of grip yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's very very uh, very tricky for all of these guys when it's in that changeable kind of window um, that we speak of. You're right. You're right. If if they don't want dry, sorry, if they do want dry weather and they'd rather it wasn't wet, the, the least they can they, they can want is a fully wet track. You don't want it kind of changeable, uh, where you're not quite sure what you're going to get into the next corner. They'd rather it was just tipping it down and full wet, and you wouldn't really have to think about it too much. Um, but uh, it doesn't often happen like that, uh, especially at Monza. I find we, we, I know the the rainfall isn't often very sudden uh, here, although it looks like that we could have some quite sudden rainfall soon. Um, it tends to be quite changeable um, around here from time to time so um, yeah that's uh, that's something that these guys are going to have to be prepared for I'm sure they are um, because surely they will have done some at least practice in the wet weather in the past at this circuit but um, yeah, it's it's just a new challenge and it's a different story kind of executing it on the actual race dates it's, it's one thing doing it in practice you've got to be able to do it uh, when the rain actually hits all at once in the race and uh, yeah it looks like these guys are going to uh, well we're going to find out who's done their wet weather practice and who hasn't really uh, who, who's banked on it being a sunny dry race which it often is at Monza yeah it, it's, it often is sunny and beautiful weather near Milan but yeah the rain is certainly coming and uh, you know none of this simulator weather this is the real weather if you're at Monza right now if you stick a hand out let us know if there's any rain coming and uh, that will greatly help us out we've got the radar and then we'll have you but I'm just having a look at the fastest tra tra well I should say the fastest car right now is just set two personal best sectors on the last lap is the 33 which has now set the fastest lap of the race and that new sim racing I think that's at the hands now of Chris who makes his way now down towards the Retifilio chicane currently fifth place in the race so far still on the lead lap 57 seconds off the leader but 21 seconds behind the number 51 car so that's the Ramada Motorsport car at the hands of Paolo Hayes at the moment so the gap's coming down because the last lap between them was 1.9 seconds difference in favor of the 33. 
Yeah, they've had some issues a little bit earlier on as well. The 33 actually put a lap down not so long ago uh, by Nisselu and they were running nose to tail for quite a while, but that's all uh, changed around again now. We've got the top six, I reckon, separated by about a minute at this stage, which is uh, better than uh, what it was uh, an hour ago where we had one car separated by a minute because uh, Nisselu was just crushing it out front, but now it's uh, it's all kind of uh, closing up very nicely indeed uh, with uh, Kianak, the last of those. Paolo Ruiz has not been quite as fast as his teammate uh, in the Ramada Motorsport car, Carlos Basto, I'm afraid, but um, he's still at least uh, keeping things on the straight and narrow and he's not, um, you know, crushing the car, which is uh, the main thing really at this stage in the race. So, uh, yeah, keeping pace with your teammates is uh, very difficult at the best of times, but, um, you know, you've got to uh, at least just run your pace really. I know that uh, sometimes people find themselves in lofty heights almost and you, you put a slower driver into the car and it can be a bit of a problem but you've just got to realise and run your pace really at this stage in the race, there's no point pushing harder than you really what you can do because otherwise that's just going to cause more problems for you really than losing a second here or there is actually going to yeah, and driving beyond your talent is something you've got to really nurture and have a handle on when it comes to a long endurance race. Keep to what you know. You know if you put in the practice and you know where the breaking point is at the Retrofilia Chicane, where um, the number 33 is coming up to now, you know where the breaking point is. Just stick to that. You know it works. Don't try and push it this early on into the endurance because it's still we're still early on in the endurance. A lot can happen. A lot has happened. We've already lost two drivers out of the G. Oh, sorry, two teams out of the G. T3 car so it's a huge shame to lose them you know there's still chances here to pick up the pieces if you're one of those teams that maybe you know maybe had an outside chance of a podium qualified outside of the top three there's still a chance maybe more than ever now yeah, absolutely. There, there really is a chance, and it's a very open race. We've seen this. Uh, I'll, I'll use the uh, Unison Racing Car as an example. Currently in second place right now, and uh, not to about ten seconds behind uh, Ryan Nash in the lead. Um, you know, they started uh, really quite a long way down um, in this race, uh, but uh, they've not really. Uh, been involved in any battles that we've not really talked about them very much they've just been slowly making their way through the order and now suddenly they find themselves in second place um, which is a little bit bizarre because as I said we've not really talked about them however um, it's a real case in point that you shouldn't really be pushing at this point and to be honest we shouldn't really be talking if we're talking about you too much then it means you're getting in a bit too much trouble really uh, and so uh, you know with guys like the 64 and the and Mugen Sim Racing we've been saying their name about every 10 minutes really because uh, they've been in involved in so much fighting but Unison Racing we've barely talked about them at all and uh, that's the best way to be really staying out of trouble and uh, you can see that it's served them well really everyone was flying into all of these corners trying to battle as hard as possible but Unison Racing were taking a back seat and it's uh, paying off for them so far so good and that's what you need in, in endurance making sure that you stay out of trouble as you said there you and that's one of the main things stay out of trouble you've got a good chance of a, a good result there so we shall see how it all pans together over these next few hours to come there's still plenty on the horizon including the weather so we'll have to see how the drivers and the teams react to those situations when it starts to rain how do you react obviously you'll have to see if you want to change tires if it's wet enough but do you switch the driver as well do you try and bring in your wet weather specialist do you try and ring them up because of course when it comes to sim racing you might have teams here that are you know broadly based wherever they say they are so i think we've got a team from the u.s we've got a team as well from uh, uh you know all, all across europe but then you might have the odd driver who's in a different time zone and that's something you have to take into account they might not be necessarily available if you need a quick changeover if the weather's maybe you maybe you expected to hit in hour four and it actually hits in hour three yeah, I, I said it a little bit earlier on that I was expecting the rain to fit, hit, hit, hit excuse me, at 5 o'clock cool time. We're still an hour and a half away from that now, an hour and 40 minutes away from that right now. Uh, and uh, as we're looking at the radar, it seems to be a lot uh, closer to us than we were expecting a little bit earlier on. But personally, I, I talk about this quite, quite a lot in wet weather uh, for endurance races when it changes around, you know, I would keep the same driver in almost always unless there's a real uh, chance like something like driver time or some kind of issue that uh, someone has to deal with because they've sat there and watched the conditions evolve. They know how the conditions evolve and they're exactly in tune with how the track is. So you can tell someone about what the track conditions are like uh, and you know you might even be able to simulate it on, an, on your own server, try to get a feel for the conditions, but they can never be exactly the same. Um, so that's why I would leave the, uh, the original driver in for as long as possible 
for at least until things have stabilised, and then maybe you can bring someone else in. Um, but uh, but really, it's it's so tricky to pick up these conditions in 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 the, in the heat of the moment that uh, that I would be I would well try and avoid it really at all costs. Absolutely. As uh, I'm just watching on now, but I've got a lovely camera angle of uh, the uh, GT4, the Via Ducton, which I believe translates to ducklings. Uh, they're, they're, they're David Christie's tip for winning this race outright <laughs> and overall, so just thought I'd keep an eye on them. They're currently leading their class. Obviously, they're unfortunately the only GT4 entrant, but the story behind these is that they're all 12-year-old go-kart racers, and this is pretty much the start of their sim racing journey. So it's a bit of a ring of uh, you know baptism of fire coming into here and an endurance with lots of gt3 cars around you with no other gt4 cars every car in your rearview mirror is going to be faster than you that's a terrifying prospect it is quite a terrifying prospect but what better place to actually like make your debut and get some load of experience it's a 12 hour race and there's going to be a lot of time here to actually get some experience uh, with this car with the format of an endurance race and uh, yeah that's uh, that's certainly good news for them um, just looking inside this car right now it's absolutely fantastic the detail that this uh, this car has at the moment um, I, I've not seen very many Alpines in real life actually uh, in the GT4 racing that goes on in the real world but um, yeah we, we, we don't really know if it's one of the stronger ones or not because it's the only one at the moment in the GT4 category so um, yeah it's, it's certainly nice to have it out here anyway a little bit of multi-class I guess for these guys but there's no competition for these guys at all there's there's no worries at all it's a fantastic place to make your debut and a fantastic place to uh, to kind of get some experience really without the pressure of, uh, of a normal championship or, or a bigger class for example Absolutely. And unfortunately, we don't know who's driving the car right now, but uh, we do know uh, that the team is made up of uh, Magnus Berg, I think as well, uh, Jonas Dyerberg. I think that's how you pronounce the name as well. Uh, but uh, feel free to correct me in there as well. But they're just two of the drivers uh, onto this this team. And yeah, as you say, it's going to be an interesting one. If they can make it to the checkered flag, that's going to be a, a great thing as well. They'll win the GT4 class if they do that. So that's going to be a bonus as well. So let's just keep an eye on them as i said they are david christie's tip to winning the entire thing so keep an eye on them yeah absolutely uh they're still good they're in p9 at the moment they've got eight cars to go uh so three <laughs> down and eight to go uh after three uh and a half hours very nearly um but uh, yeah it's great to ride on board with this car at the moment and it certainly seems to be uh, very consistent at least uh, running out, out there on the road and not not getting caught up in any incidents or anything like that which is uh, certainly good to see but uh, in a closer battles let's say uh, GT3 it's uh, it's all going on really uh, with uh, Paolo Race and Christopher Kianak only 8 seconds apart at the moment for Ramada Motorsport and Mugen uh, Sim Racing for now so uh, we'll wait and see how quickly that battle closes in but Kianak certainly seems to be the fastest man out there on the circuit uh, he did a 47.6 last time around which is only half a second down on his uh, on the best of the race which is the fastest up of the race overall and that was 1.8 seconds quicker than Paolo Race. So um, certainly closing in very quickly indeed. And about five or six laps time, we might have a battle on our hands between the two of them. Maybe a one-sided one, but it's uh, going to be a battle nonetheless. And we love battles. We love battles. We've been spoiled, well and truly spoiled, the first three hours. So this is now probably going to be the time when drivers start to think, right, actually, this is a long, long game we have here. We've got a lot to think about. Let's just settle into our own pace. Let's see how it goes. The 007 Pro Sim team are starting to catch the 62 team at the moment. So keep an eye on that one. Gap is around about 10 seconds and coming down by about half a second per lap. So that's going to be a, maybe a battle for second place in the next few minutes but uh, yeah, you can see the uh, number 33 of uh, Kienik there currently holding the fastest lap of the entire race so far 47.020 currently 52.8 off of the race lead but closing in very quickly to the number 51 car so yeah. that's gonna be about for four soon all right, speaking of uh, closing in quickly, um, I j just realised as well, so excited to say it, that ProSim uh, are closing in on Unison Racing fairly 
quickly as well. The gap's just dipped under 10 seconds for the first time in a little while. Uh, Zakirov is being caught ever so slightly. I didn't think I'd be saying those words because he's a very strong driver indeed, but uh, apparently struggling out there a little bit uh, right now. Prosin took about half a second out of him last time around, and uh, yeah, we'll see uh, next time what uh, what the gap is as well because uh, they're about to come across the line in the next few moments, but under six seconds now for Christopher Kienek. Five and a half seconds. It really is going down ever so slightly, uh, uh, well, not ever so slightly, really quite quickly uh, is probably the phrase um, because uh, Kianak certainly seems to be on a mission. I guess when you're driving and you're seeing the gap coming down so quickly like that, it can be quite demoralising almost and uh, it might even cause you to drive even a little bit slower once again, uh, which, uh, you know, c contributes to you know, downfall and, and possibly accelerates it as well. So that could be happening for uh, Ramada Motorsport right now as well. We're hearing that one of the retirements was due to uh, hardware failure. I think uh, if I'm right in saying that's the 64, unfortunately. So that's uh, that's a, that's why. So I think David's. I'm um, oh, sorry, 74. I'm being corrected in my ear now. So the number 74 was due to hardware a failure. The Juicy's Motorsport Club car. So that is really unfortunate. And uh, wow, sounds like their day has come to an end. Unfortunately. Yeah, it does indeed. That's uh, a real shame, really, uh, to see that uh, it's not gone uh, particularly well for Deuces or indeed Satellite or indeed uh, GSR team who were, uh, had an engine failure in the first hour of this race, which is uh, very painful indeed. But uh, yeah, it looks like free retirements indeed. Nissala has uh, left the uh, team speak now, so I think he's well and truly out of the race. But what it has given us is a, a real fight for the win here between five cars separated by not very much at all. It's only 4.7 seconds between Kianak and Ramada at the moment and uh, overall I guess there's about 40 seconds separating the top five right now very close indeed um, just uh, no nose to tail battles just for the moment we, we can definitely see one brewing and developing though and uh, I just wonder if this is a, a side effect to the fact that Kianak has just gone into this car and so maybe with a, a fresh pair of eyes uh, feeling a little bit fresher as well maybe he's finding a little bit of pace in that car that's Zoltan barking he couldn't yeah, it's it's one of those, isn't it? Maybe a fresher driver might be, you know, looking to get the pace in there. A fresh driver in the weather, as we're seeing right now, it's uh, pretty much on course. We we can update you with that. You can see from the weather radar, it is coming and it's going to hit the circuit. We uh, we reckon, as uh, David was saying, that half hour he said has gone past. So it's slowly approaching the circuit. It's ominous. It's there. It's waiting to hit the circuit, but we just don't know when. It is going to be a tricky one. To see when that hits and yeah we'll have to keep you up to date whenever we can and obviously being this close to the Alps as well that weather change we, we saw it last night we were expecting rain pretty much from the off in Q1 yesterday but not a drop of rain whatsoever throughout the entire session the entire two sessions actually so the Alps can play a huge part in how that weather changes but from what we're seeing for the radar at the moment it's on course. Yeah, a little, little bit surprised about that because uh, the, 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 uh, they're about 100 kilometres away, but still, uh, it, they can still have an effect, um, I guess, at this point. The, the weather's not actually coming from that direction on this occasion, though. It's coming from uh, the uh, the west, and it doesn't look like there's going to be rain for too long because it's got a, it's, it's, it's a, quite a patch of rain, and then it kind of uh, fizzles out again. So maybe we're going to have a downpour and then um, some uh, dry tyres again before another bit of rain, which is uh, probably more likely. But... Uh, uh, we'll wait and see uh, how indeed it does fall. Christopher Kianak's closing of Ramada Motorsport is so more slowly um, but uh, it still is happening hopefully when we return from this ad break we will have this uh, battle uh, going on for you you're watching the 12 hours of Monza here on GTR 24H hope you're enjoying it we're just going off for a quick commercial break but in a few minutes we will return uh, with some more racing back in a moment The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Leet Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on.
Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green Welcome back to Monza, where there are eight and a half hours remaining in the 12 hours of Monza, and we have a fight on for P4 that's about to happen rather urgently, actually. Paolo Ruiz uh, is being caught by Christopher Kian at quite an alarming rate at this point, and that slide we just saw on board with him through Parabolica definitely is not helping the cause. Uh, a lot of pressure being put onto uh, the Audi in front. Now, it's an all-Audi fight, but uh, that, that's not going to uh, dampen any spirits here, I wouldn't imagine. Kianak certainly starting to apply that pressure and it seems to be working as well judging by the evidence of a few corners ago absolutely and you can see now how close that gap is it's coming down at a rate of knots then Kinnock in the 33 really is closing in and on that lap alone he was nine tenths of a second in fact one point uh, what's that yeah about nine tenths of a second quicker on that last lap alone than the number 51 so looking like here it's it's one thing catching the car it's another thing passing it but going through the Roger chain and in towards the first Lesmo here goes Kinnock then does he fancy a move up the first Lesmo no he doesn't backs out of it there and onwards now towards the second Lesmo they will go and again just trying to fill the mirrors is this tactic right now just try and put the car ahead oh. under that little bit of pressure a little bit of a snap as we head through the Curva del Seraglio and onwards now we go underneath the old banking towards the Scari. Scari is not normally a place you try and overtake here but they're going to try it now Kianek up the inside we go in the 33 in we go towards the Scari, and he is ahead gets the position moves now up into fourth place great respect between the two drivers there and Kianek now moves his team up a position yeah he does indeed you don't often see moves into a score as you say but when you're that far alongside I guess the guy on the outside doesn't really have much choice than to just let you go I was seeing visions of uh, the instant we saw a little bit earlier on where the Mugen Sim Racing car clunked the curbing and then clunked the car on the outside of it uh, which uh, could have been a real problem and uh, we could have seen a very similar thing happening just there but fortunately they've kept things very clean indeed and Kianek has been able to get through without really too much of an argument um, from Paolo Reese in the end uh, so uh, yeah very good move and racing between the two of them uh, he's now going to set his sights on the pro sim car I guess Kiena. 20 seconds up in front and even on that last lap even though they were fighting he did gain 7 tenths of a second uh, on that car in front pro sim and uh, Unison kind of holding each other at a similar margin right now um, so uh, yeah it's all down to Kianak now to try and make some moves and try and get up the order uh, a little bit further get get this is uh, or use his pace let's say and uh, yeah certainly seems to be doing that right now even though he's overtaking cars he's still faster than them yeah, I've got a nice little replay here on board with the 33 of Kiede as he made his way underneath the old banking here into the slipstream. He went all to the left-hand side of the track and again, just trying to move up in towards Ascari here. Just about managed to get the car slowed down. Nice move in the end and uh, yeah, that's them up a position. That's an important position and they're well on their way now. Let's see what their next target is. Well, uh, it's going to be the, uh, the 51 right ahead, is it? Um... Let's have a look. Um, no, I'm not too sure. But no. um, anyway, they're uh, they're trying to uh, trying to get towards the Bentley anyway. Um, at this point, not entirely sure uh, who's going to be in between. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, Certainly not closing down again, this battle between Ramada and Mugen. There's only one winner in this fight, really. We talk about this quite a lot uh, in endurance racing, really. You know, we, we, uh, Especially after the first hour, which of these cars are still going to be here at the end of the next hour and the next one and the next one? Because it's not just about your starting driver, it's always about uh, your teammates as well. Not that uh, Ramada much, but have a bad team by any stretch of the imagination with uh, Pedro Ramada... Uh, Paolo Reis and Carlos Basto all driving but Basto started the car and ever since uh, Reis got into that car it was uh, yeah not uh, it's not been quite going uh, as well for him um, as, as we saw 
Bob Basto uh, not so long ago. Uh, Ray started uh, virtual racing or sim racing a few years ago on the other games, more arcade games, but obviously take it a little bit more seriously now. And uh, yeah, he's, a, he's a Portuguese person living in uh, Belgium at the moment. So there you are, there's a few facts for you. Uh, but uh, currently down in fifth place uh, and uh, losing a bit of time. Uh, to Kianak right now uh, but uh, it's still plenty of time left in this race uh, to be able to pick up again and uh, yeah we, I'm sure we're going to see this race race change again as I said it earlier on Ramada and Basto are very capable drivers indeed so uh, I wouldn't say that a podium certainly out of the question for them by any, by any stretch not by any stretch at all and obviously when, you, when you're coming into a long endurance race and you, know, you put yourself in those shoes of right where do we think we can finish I mean it's it's pointless trying to guess where you're going to be around uh, four hours in but you know you, you get more of an idea when you get those final pit stops done and that really really happens in the last two hours of the race you get a better idea of right who am I actually fighting and what position will it be for and well, we've still got a long, long way to go. A lot can happen. We've already seen uh, the likes of hardware failure uh, coming across the uh, the number 74, the uh, Juicy's Motorsport Club. Hardware failure is a thing, and it can happen. It's one of those things that happens in sim racing. Uh, mechanically, you've got to make sure the car is working in order. Make sure you're not hitting those curves too much. Make sure there's not many trips to the barrier as well, as that can obviously affect how the car handles and the top speed even you know you can get aero damage on these cars and you're going to have to stick with that for the entire rest of the race if it's severe enough you'll be down on top speed at a circuit which thrives on top speed yeah, that uh, is, is very important indeed, and that's why we've seen, uh, especially the Mugen car, struggling to actually overtake because of its lack of straight line speed. We did wonder briefly if it was a bit of an aerod aerodynamic uh, disadvantage they had because of damage, but um, I reckon it's just uh, a bit of setup really at this point. Um, but uh, but you never really know what it is. Um, he's to, starting to pull away his Kianek, but the, the, the thing that made the last pass easy, I guess, is the fact that he was racing against an Audi. These McLarens are so sleek and so slippery in a straight line that it's almost impossible to get through on them especially if you are an Audi yourself so um, yeah it's uh, it's let's hope that Kianak doesn't come across one of them because he might struggle um, just a little bit four different manufacturers in the top four though which is uh, very good to see we've got a McLaren leading as they have done for almost the entirety of this race we've got a BMW in second which I really wasn't expecting at the start of the day and a Bentley in third which I also wasn't expecting uh, and Audi not on the podium for the moment which is uh, a big surprise as well so a couple of surprises being thrown up but Nugent Sim Racing after all of their issues look like they're starting to to, uh, kind of uh, resurrect themselves almost at the moment and uh, get back towards uh, the podium gap down now down to 16 seconds to pro sim and uh, once they pick those guys off i reckon uh, unison racing won't be too far behind in terms of being demoted in another place yeah, and there is the 65 VRS satellite racing team then leading the way at the hands of Ryan Nash at the moment. And if you saw practice and qualifying uh, over the previous two days, you'll have seen that Ryan Nash really had trouble keeping this car on the track. Now we're starting to see that maybe that was because he really was trying to push the limits and see how far the car how much punishment the car will take before it bites back and how much curbing he can take and how he can throw the car in before it really goes wrong because he's done a solid job so far leading this race by a good 26 seconds and uh, there is the third place car the 007 pro sim car currently third place as well and yeah they had uh, all four of their drivers out in the practice session all in the same car you were allowed to do that in practice but they were all battling each other so maybe that was a way of uh, character building or, yeah, or, or practicing the battles that might happen here today. You never know. Uh, but uh, I believe for most of the day we've had uh, an actual live stream of uh, of them in the car on the uh, for the pro sim car. I'm not entirely sure if we still have that. Uh, if we can bring it up, because uh, yeah, it's uh, there. It is on the right hand side of your screen. We can see. Uh, well, we can't see who's driving because it's a little bit small on my screen right now. But um, we can see the inputs that are having to be made and the kind of uh, uh, and what the driver can actually see. Uh, from their particular view and uh, yeah third place not a bad position to be in uh, just for the moment and uh, we're just uh, able to see the amount of rest you get on this circuit it's quite phenomenal really um, because of the 
of the straights, but I guess uh, the chicanes, are, you, you have to concentrate quite hard, so I guess they deserve it, but, um, you, you know, it really gives it a view as to how aggressive, for me anyway, the, the, the most apparent thing is how aggressive the curbs are. We're about to see it through the first chicane, you'll especially see it through the second one in Ascari. You know, the drivers are bouncing themselves over the curbs, and, uh, you know, it's it's going to be taking a toll on their arms, certainly, and their wrists uh, as they try and withstand the bouncing over these curbs. through the Curva Grande at the moment, heading towards the second chicane uh, once again. And uh, yeah, we, we, we're going to see from the driver's eye what uh, what what these curves are, are really like bouncing across them. He actually missed the second one ever so slightly. Not entirely sure if that was intentional or not, but um, I presume not um, at this point. We have a look at the exit of uh, Lesnar O2 and the run up towards uh, Ascari with Ryan Nash and the Pro Sim car in the in the foreground and here is the race leader 26.9 seconds in front just tricked over to 27 for the first time so nearly half a minute of an advantage for the british driver been gaining some experience over the last couple of years with uh, satellite racing especially in prototypes but now Trying his hand at the GTs, which is not a uh, not a bad idea, really. Let's, let's have a quick look at the weather, shall we? Because uh, we've got some very gloomy clouds, and uh, they're bound to uh, burst before long. You see that uh, the big one just missing us from the north, and it actually looks like in a near miracle. This one might miss us as well, just time to the south. I can't I can't quite believe this, but the clouds are actually disappearing as soon as they reach the circuit. This is quite unbelievable, actually. This doesn't look like we might get away with it after all. I've I've heard of the Sundance Festival, but I'm really, really thinking now, this is ridiculous. Someone is down there at the Monza circuit doing their Sundance and making sure this rain stays away, doing whatever they can. But yeah, phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. I, I don't think I've really seen anything like it. It's it's almost like a, a Formula One race this season. You, you get the weather report and it's, oh, it's gonna be raining and then it never shows, it never shows. But there you go, that's 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 the beauty of motorsport. Even the, uh, the weather can play tricks on us and we love it so. Yeah, they, they is playing tricks on us at the moment, definitely. Um, we thought we were going to get some really biblical rainfall, um, but uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen in the near future. We're about an hour and 15 away from the first piece of scheduled rainfall that I saw anyway, um, and uh, then I saw that it was going to be raining to the end of the race, but uh, for the moment, it doesn't look like that's quite going to happen um, as things stand, but you never know. Things could uh, things could change uh, rather soon. There's the crowd on, on on the right. They're loving it. But here's the standings. Uh, Ryan Nash for Satellite Racing is currently leading ahead of uh, Unison Racing and ProSim. That's your top three. Then Mugen Sim Racing and Ramada Motorsport, your top five. Behind that, we've got DSR... Uh, Team, uh, sorry, GSR Team Aston, uh, the 14 car in sixth place, having a decent run at things. And then the 717 Unison Racing car uh, is uh, currently in seventh. Um, and then the, the, the Team Viaduction car in ninth position. Didn't quite catch who, who's eighth, uh, but it's probably the uh, DSR Nightmare 777 team. Uh, ahead of Team Viaducton, who are in ninth, and uh, yeah, that's uh, the GT4 car, let's not forget. Uh, so that's a quick rundown of your order, with 8 hours and 13 minutes to go, just under of the 12 hours of Monza, currently with uh, ProSim on the screen right now. Uh, yeah, very interested to see how the weather's going to affect things, because like in other series, single make series for example, um, it's not about how the driver deals with it really it's sort of about how the car deals with it, you know, if the car is particularly terrible in wet weather conditions then uh, you know, these guys are going to be praying it stays away, so um, yeah, I'm very interested to find out who's going to uh, who's going to thrive in these conditions and who isn't basically 
Yeah, you're right there. The, the, I think we're, there's a little bit of a curse going on because the more we talk about the rain, the more it just avoids the circuit. So maybe we're doing the drivers a favour by talking about the weather all the time. Who knows? Who knows? But you're absolutely right, you and um, all about making sure the car's set up and making sure you've got the right driver in the car because you do have those wet weather specialists that can really get the car to thrive in those really treacherous conditions. So just making sure that you can react quickly enough to the changing situation because it will change very quickly looking at it and uh, at the moment the weather's and the rain's threading the needle of the circuit at the moment but we shall wait and see there's still plenty of time left on the clock there is still a long time remaining one of the Audi's just making their way out of the pit lane there by the way didn't quite catch which one probably DSL Nightmare uh, the 777 Carl Leikagor now into that car uh, so they've been through the entire cycle now that team and uh, they're back up on the road here once again. Carl Leica got uh, the fastest of them, I would have said. Um, it drove uh, the uh, he drives the LMP2s in the EWC this season. He's been gt 3s in the past. In Pedersen, likewise, and uh, Mads Hedegaard as well. Uh, they uh, they often drive together in the same car in the EWC, and uh, they're doing the same again in this special event. A, a lot of familiar faces, actually. Um, no, I don't think, other than the GSR teams, I don't think any teams are here that aren't in the EWC um, in one form or another. The GSR teams are made up of uh, people that I, I don't actually recognise too much, um, if I'm honest, but I do have a, a couple of uh, people I recognised, uh, like uh, Valadis Karolis, who was uh, starting the car, I think, or at least uh, second in the car. Uh, he drives in the uh, European Hill Climb Championship events that we see uh, on Monday nights. Uh, we, the, we, the next one of those is still four Mondays away or three Mondays away now um, so we've got a little bit of time to wait for that one but um, it's uh, it's still good to see him here we've also uh, with the other car that's unfortunately not in the race anymore um, there was uh, another driver that drives in the Hill Climb Championship Antonis uh, Parano Paranopolis or something like that David was saying it a lot better than me anyway um, and I realised I've been saying it wrong for five weeks um, in the Hill Climb Championship but we, you know, we won't worry about that um, but because it's a difficult name um, so anyway they're out of the race now unfortunately blew their engine down into turn one with a double downshift and uh, yeah, how many times have we heard that in sim racing a double downshift is often the fate of many races and obviously your engine's not going to survive one of those uh, so it, uh, it just shows that you, you need to be aware at all times that the hardware can also let you down though because it's, it's not often the driver that actually does it it's just the uh, wheel registering two downshifts and uh, you know that uh, that's disastrous really for the uh, for, for the team and it just shows that we can never really rest because uh, something like that can happen at, uh, at seemingly any moment yeah you're right there and and that's such a shame you know if they have the double downshift and it blows up the engine i mean that has to be a lesson learned but whether that was a a mistake by the driver or whether you say that it registered twice for some reason that's a one-way ticket to unfortunately the, the gearbox and the engine just absolutely not being able to cope with it and you know when you're doing it in that quick succession you're not giving the, the gearbox the, the right amount of you know time to make sure that everything's okay and making sure everything's spinning at the right speed and yeah you can easily see why the engine just gets overworked and decides to pack it up which is totally fair enough if that's the case but at the moment then you know through the weather can't really decide what it wants to do at the moment that's that's the that's the fairest way to say what's going on it's a lot of cloud over the circuit but what that does mean is that then you know the track temperature comes into effect as well it's slightly different conditions to what it was yesterday i think this track is slightly cooler today than it was in the day qualifying sessions yesterday but also this is one of the first times that the cars are going to be fully loaded up with fuel at the start of a steed so the drivers are going to have to be wary of that they've probably got used to it by now the, the race sim and they probably would have done a lot of work with how does the car differ being on qualifying sim and being on a race stint sim as well so they would have done all the work behind the scene and in the official practice session i mean they gave us a great show uh, all four of the uh, 007 pro sim cars gave us a fantastic show albeit they did make contact once or twice maybe thrice but you know that's on them they have to be the team now for the rest of the race 
you know, well, they are teammates, I guess they can get away with that kind of thing. Um, a little bit, uh, getting a little bit friendly, let's say. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they're currently in third place, being chased down by Christopher Kiernak, who's currently in fourth. And uh, we're on board with on the right-hand side of his screen. You can see Alexander Zakharov on the left. And, uh, yeah, they're very... Uh, I know, well, Kianak on your right is certainly quicker than uh, those on the left, I'm afraid, at this point. You can see him racing, closing in on Prosim just for the moment. You can see him going through the second chicane right now and monstering the curbs as uh, as we've seen in the past. The Prosim car wasn't really too keen on doing that, actually, but um, Kianak doesn't really, uh, not really bothered about keeping his car in good condition, clearly, or suspension, anyway. Going through uh, the second Lesmo as things stand and uh, heading towards Ascari as well. I yeah, think things probably getting quite cold for a, a sort of summer day in Italy, certainly um, with the clouds the way they are. But uh, for the moment, not providing any moisture. Just over seven seconds now uh, between Kianak. And he's kind of that frustrating distance as the Prozim car at the moment because they can kind of see him up the road, but um, not really able to do anything about uh, that car at this stage, which is uh, yeah going to be pretty frustrating for the Hungarian trying to chase him. Yeah, at the moment anyway, but there's still plenty of time and the gap is coming down. It's going in the right direction for the Mugen Sim Racing Team. So it's only going to be a matter of time before they're onto the back of that uh, Unison Racing BMW, the number 62, uh, in the hands of the moment. Uh, we don't uh, quite... Uh, oh, no, it's uh, Alexander uh, Zakharov who's at the wheel of that one at the moment. But we don't know who's at the wheel of the 007, which is such a huge shame. I mean, we, we can try and narrow it down to the likes of uh, Morten Norgard, uh, Morton uh, Angerson, I think that's how you pronounce that one. Sebastian Hove, it could be behind the wheel. Any one of those three. Unfortunately, we can't tell you who exactly it is. Uh, no, we can't. That's a, a picture of the pro sim teams because I believe they're still all in the same location um, uh, as our Viaducton. Um, they are in the same location as well, which means that uh, they're not doing driver swaps within the game, if you see, see what I mean. Um, well, that one, they're just swapping seats in real life, um, which is uh, a little bit different, and it means that it doesn't quite pick up for us here, um, which is, uh, it can be a little bit on the, uh, on the annoying side, but we can, uh, we, we can deal with it, certainly. 10 seconds up to Unison Racing, 7 seconds back to Mugen Sim Racing. Kianak just went a little bit wide into Turn 1 on that occasion, actually, uh, which was uh, a little bit of a mistake. But uh, he's still uh, keeping things going. Uh, just under seven seconds behind the ProSim car. Uh, they're just about to start another lap right now, and uh, we've got a, an onboard camera with the Mugen Sim Racing car, so uh, I think we are going to be quiet for an hour. Uh, sorry, not an hour. An, <laughs> an a, hour. Minute, a, a minute and 40, or was what I was going to say. Uh, a minute and 40, and uh, let you listen to the sights and sounds of Monza here on board with Christopher Kiernak.
Yeah, I've got a, got a lovely slow-mo shot here. I think you're coming through okay, Ewan. But uh, yeah, lovely slow-mo shot there of the Corvette just picking up the gravel there on the exit of the Roger Chicane. And it's, you know, it's been a common factor. I'm surprised that there's so much gravel not been put onto the circuit or, you know, you see this massive dig into the, uh, into the gravel there so far. It's been used so many times. However, uh, it's, uh, you know, pushing the limits and beyond. It's, uh, it's good to see. But I don't know how much time they're actually going to lose there. It seems like it's going to be a lot when they're cooking up that dust. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Leaf Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on.
welcome back to the 12 Hours of Monza here, broadcasted by GTR 24-8. Still just under eight hours to go, and I've got my mic on now, which is great. Uh, so uh, so anyway, we'll leave that. Uh, what I will talk about, though, is the battle for third place that's going on between ProSim and also Mugen Sim Racing. There's a car separating them at the moment, one of the lapped cars. Looks like the 777 could be um, at the moment, but uh, I can't quite so tell. Uh, from this angle. It's certainly closing up though. Unfortunately, we might, excuse me, we might be robbed of this battle um, because the pit stops are upon us and Ryan Nash from the lead of the race indeed is coming into the pit lane right now. Is indeed so. Race leaders then into the pit lane. One of the VR, VRS car, the sole VRS car in the race. And of course, nowadays you uh, you anger yourself in the pit lane now to try and get the best line away. It's a recent thing in motorsport now that uh, drivers like to do that. But of course, now the, the the work begins on the car, the fueling and the tyres, and making sure that if they want to make a driver change, that they make it now. And you can see just that LED, that yellow LED, tells you how many seconds they've been stopped for. Nice touch there, I think. Yeah, that is quite helpful, actually, um, for us. I'm not sure what started all this wonky pit lane business because it looks absolutely horrible when you when you see all the lines. And the, maybe it's just me because I like things to be in a nice line. But, um, you know, it's it just looks ridiculous. Um, I'm not entirely sure what started all of it either, really. I guess it's kind of practical to have it not dead straight because um, so, you can get trapped in. But... I don't, I don't really know who started or, or what started what started it, and um, but uh, it certainly seems to work. And uh, it's a very recent thing, but uh, I guess it's a, I guess somebody's thought of it, and everyone else thought, oh, that's a good idea. I might do that, and uh, and they have done so. Uh, so yeah, I, yeah. I, as I said, I'm not I'm not entirely sure who started it all, but um, yeah, it certainly seems to be the new trend does indeed and you can just see there about 56 seconds that McLaren was stopped for which you're pretty much losing more than three quarters of a lap being in the pit lane with the tyre changes the fuel and possibly even a driver change as well being told in our ear to have a look at the weather radar what's going on here then <laughs> what's going on now at Monza I wonder just uh, a couple of uh, 30 miles away from Milan wow look at that there you go then so the rain misses Oh, oh, it might just at the south south. What's that south? Where, uh, southeast side of the circuit. So we're looking at. Uh, if I can get my geography right, we're looking at. I believe Parabolica. That's where it could hit originally. Then uh, I'm not sure which way is north. Actually, uh, oh yeah, you're north right. Is, north is towards the uh, the uh, Lesmos, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Um, I think we'll he's going to hit we'll Parabolica first. Go. Yeah, well, <laughs> just pick a corner, it's going to arrive there first. There we are. Um, a 1 in 11 chance of doing yeah. that. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, it's, the rain does look like it may uh, nick us, or it may just uh, it's like slide on by, maybe, um, just without hitting us, but uh, certainly uh, going to be um, very, uh, very interesting to see. Which one? Uh, wow, Peter just said he's going to hit the toilet. Sorry, I, my brain couldn't process that information. He's just going to start punching it and something. But no, it's not what he means. Anyway, uh, we're watching the battle. What is thought is now for second place because Ryan Nash just came in the pit lane, and uh, he's down to uh, what I believe is fifth right now. But uh, Kianak versus Prosim is going to be happening very, very soon. Uh, you might imagine. And uh, yeah, at the moment, there's an Audi in the way. It's a difficult position to be in a, a lap car here, actually, because um, you don't really want to get out of the way and lose time yourself, but uh, you also kind of have to at some point. And so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky situation for everybody. A little bit tricky, and I think uh, Kenneth here will have a bit of deja vu as we head our way through the Lesmos because he's only passed that. Uh, I think that's the uh, what's that, the 51, so that's the Ramada Motorsport Audi. He only passed that about 10 15 minutes ago, but Ramada has since been in the pit lane and then now come back out, and that shows you how much time you lose in the pit lane. You almost go a lap down, it's very close to going a lap down, but uh, yeah, it's pretty much in layman's term, if you pit, you lose a lap, so that's going to be something you have to uh, take into account. I'm uh, I'm not sure, on the top of this 007, there's a bit of moisture on the top, or is that just the decal? Am I making stuff up? <laughs> it looks very, very minor at the moment, but uh, it's difficult to tell. Could be the decal, I'm not sure. Although I'm not sure why you'd have water-type decal at the top. Well, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, uh, these 
deliveries these days get crazier and crazier, don't they? So you never know uh, really what's going to be on them. Uh, looks like pit stops maybe for the Mugen Sim Racing car, and indeed it is into the pit lane on this occasion. Satellite Racing are going to retake one of the other or another position at least uh, at the moment. It's Juan Amaya who's now into that car, and so uh, he's uh, going to be driving in. He started that race. Uh, he started the race uh, here today in that car. Uh, I'm trying to find a, a little bit of information on him because I saw some earlier. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, apparently a Colombian Canadian I've never heard of before, but uh, there we are. Uh, is indeed. And uh, is uh, very experienced in GT3s, which is obviously useful uh, in this kind of event. He's going to retake third place at least away from Mugen Sim Racing. And uh, that's going to be easy enough. Uh, but uh, what's going to happen when the likes of ProSim indeed come into the pit lane? in the next few moments because uh, that's going to be the real crunch point however they've been staying out quite a long time in the uh, in the stints actually they've not really been pitting with everybody else but going a little bit longer and that's going to help them towards the end of the race they're going to be able to hopefully do a shorter pit stop in their 11th and final stop uh, of this race Absolutely, and uh, we were talking about you were talking about that uh, that 65 satellite team, which is uh, well, it's truly international. They they say their their team nationality is the US, but as you rightfully said, you know you know you've got um, I think. Uh, Juan Amaya, who is a Colombian Canadian, I thought I saw uh, uh, somebody else there, Polish American. Uh, that's uh, Tom Capusta, who is uh, you know. Polish American, so it's it's truly international. That team. they say their country is from the US, even though they've got a Colombian Canadian racing for them. Maybe he's just saying he's flying for the US flag today and just makes it a little bit easier not racing under the Canadian flag. Who knows? Yeah, I don't really know. Also, the, uh, the the satellite racing team, to my knowledge, anyway, don't have that many Americans on on the. Uh on the t on the uh, on the driving list for today at least um, but I'm sure they do uh, in uh, in the entirety of their team yeah yeah I'm, uh, I'm sure the, the, the team itself is American that's probably what they mean yes yes yeah. It's probably something like that. Um, but uh, at the moment, we've got uh, Prosim back in the lead now because uh, Alexander Zakharov just came into the pit lane. And there he is, uh, just taking a stop right now. One of is going to now be into second place. Uh, but Kianak will be into third. Uh, quite possible. Well, no, actually, he might not be. Uh, we'll wait and see how much time he actually gains in the pit stops here. Uh, Zakharov already moving now. And uh, Unison uh, Racing are going to be well in front of Mugen Sim Racing here so uh, Pedro Armada is not really any closer to Mugen but uh, I'm afraid Mugen have actually dropped back a little bit from this BMW here which is uh, not good news but Zakirov looks like he's had a pretty decent stop there by the looks of things as indeed and this weather we're expecting at Bonza we've been talking about it the whole time there's going to be heavy rain it's, it might be thunderstorm it's happening outside my window right now are you sure the weather radar's not over my house guys uh, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see uh, get that checked get that checked yeah, I'm not entirely sure what's going on where, where I am. It might be tipping it down as well, but I can't see uh, for the moment. But anyway, yeah, it's it's certainly uh, been a little bit crazy recently uh, with, uh, with the weather, certainly in, in Italy and on the UK a little bit as well. But uh, here is who is going to be the race leader in the next few moments. 14 and a half seconds over Unison Racing, which is a lot less than before, before the pit stops, uh, it must be said. Uh, Zakharov now a lot closer to Amaya uh, or uh, Ryan Nash as it was. So uh, we'll see how that, that, that develops, whether uh, they've done something a little bit with the strategy maybe um, in this one. But uh, we'll wait and find out. And uh, Kiernak still quite a long way behind uh, Zakharov. We're all kind of waiting on tenterhooks really for Prosim to come into pit lane. Then we're going to know if Mugen Sim Racing will manage to get out in front of them and do the undercut or not. Um, it would be a little bit disappointing if they had done because we were looking forward to an on-track battle between them. But obviously the most efficient way to get past someone is in the pit lane. So you can't hardly blame them. No, absolutely, and that's where the most time could be won and lost is you know how much fuel do you take on board, how long does it take to change the tyres, so uh, worth trying to get the position done there and then, so we'll have to wait and see uh, how that develops and how that you know changes the battle in the long run. Still plenty of pit stops to go here, so still plenty of opportunities left in this race, and uh, yeah, we're just seeing now, it's it's one of those now where the drivers are sort of settling into their race and settling into their stint, and uh, Ron Amaya being one of them, he's just into the car, 
car now and he'll want to just take a couple of laps here to get used to the track make sure he gets used to the car again see what it's like on race fuel get to know the car again before he uh, you know really pushes the mark again but at the moment currently as far as i know this is the 65 car that will be in the net lead of the race but kind of hard to say net lead of the race for it's in terms of myself because when it comes to strategies you know you could be trying to make one fewer stop than anybody else on tracks it's kind of hard to say they're in the net lead the second place right now though uh, yeah, you're right. It, they could indeed be. You know, the, the thing of, but that's the thing of posting really about uh, the shorter pit stop at the end. Are they going to even save a pit stop? I doubt that. But uh, you know, they could end up maybe shortening a stop late on and jumping up in front that way. Let's see though. The Bentley's into the pit lane now, and we'll see where Christopher Kiernak is in relation to them. Uh, one of my is the main part of your screen uh, right now. But uh, what about? The 33 at Mugen Sim Racing Car. Are they going to be able to get in front uh, in the pit stops or not? It is, as I mentioned, the most efficient way to get through. Kianak's been uh, going quite a lot faster than the Pro Sim Car in recent laps, anyway, and this uh, could mean that Mugen get in front of the Bentley without having to actually uh, do anything on the circuit here. Unison Racing are definitely going to be second place. There's no arguments about that, especially given their pit stop, which was very, very good indeed. But uh, where is Christopher Gearnock going to be in relation to the ProSim car? They're still not moving just for the moment. ProSim still not going anywhere. And now they finally begin to roll. But where is the... Mugen Sim Racing car just coming out of Parabarca right now and over the start finish line. Pro Sim still making their way down the pit lane though and if unless they release the pit limiter very very soon they're not going to be able to do it and I'm afraid even before they were able to get out of the pit lane Christopher Kiernak was able to get through. That was very very convincing indeed and I guess it's a great illustration of his pace in this race. Definitely. And so the uh, the Mugen Sim Racing car making their way once again up the order. What that has done now, it's allowed the 65 uh, to take the race lead. So the VRS satellite car taking the lead at the hands now of Juan Amaya. There is Christopher Kianek then currently third place as it stands, making his way now on towards the Roger Chicane. So by all accounts then, again, get ourselves, you know, get the timing sheets to catch up with the pit stops as well and we'll be able to figure out uh, what is left to go here. But the McLaren, the Mugen Sim Racing team, at the moment, they're looking pretty good right now. Still though, as we've always said, Ewan, since the time I came into the box and since, probably the, uh, the sort of lowering of the green flag at the very first time has a hell of a long way to go. Well, yeah, we can't say, keep saying it the entire race but because there's going to be a point where it's not true anymore. But, uh, yeah, you're still right. It's uh, still a fair amount of time here to go. Seven hours, 43 minutes, uh, and just over uh, before the end of this one when the, the darkness will fall on Monza and, indeed, this race, probably the rain as well. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll park that thought for the moment. Kidax just over 10 seconds uh, in front of Prosim then. 22 seconds up to Zakharov, who's got less than 20 seconds to uh, Juan Amaya. And then, uh, yeah, that's where you find the front of the race uh, as things stand. Amaya's gained five seconds on Zakharov already since the pit stop uh, about 20 minutes ago for Amaya. So um, still a lot can happen in this race. Uh, the thing, yeah, pros, uh, I'm uh, trying to find the, the, to find the right way to say this, but always oh, Christopher Kiernak goes across turn one there and has to go through the polystyrene chicane and takes one of them with him but that doesn't really matter he's going to carry on either way that's the penalty you pay if you go a little bit too deep into turn one you have to go through those chicanes and in the end it just cost you about a second so um, yeah it's, it's a system that's been in place for a very long time it still is and uh, probably always will be and uh, Christopher Kiernak like I'm afraid has uh, found out that uh, breaking too late into turn one is uh, is quite damaging actually he's lost uh, a good second or two there yeah it looks like it and uh, having a replay on board of uh, what happened there to uh, Kianek then making his way down towards the Retifilio chicane and yeah just way too hot in and uh 
Yeah, it's almost like the, the, the brakes were just too cold. Obviously, there's a long time to get them then. Uh, that's not actually what happened, but there's a <laughs> long time there who uh, to get them uh, for the brakes to cool down once you're out of Parabolica and then down towards the Retrofilio chicane. So, it, you know, there could be a situation like that, but, you know, a bit of a mistake then from Kianek and, you know, want to try and gloss over that as quickly as possible. Yeah, he will indeed, and uh, just to uh, try and get on with it, really, uh, back onto how he was doing before. Um, let's uh, see, you know, just under 23 seconds, and he's uh, restoring the, the all the time that he lost. He's almost restored it within a lap uh, to the Pro Sim car, which is now in fourth place. This is the view coming out of the second chicane, and uh, that was the GT4 Viaduction car coming through. Well, the Audi and McLaren, which is the 65 leading uh, car. I believe that might be a Ramada Motorsport just behind them, but this is a little rundown of the order. Satellite Racing and Unison Racing, just in front of uh, Mugen Sim Racing, and then Pro Sim, Ramada Motorsport, TSR Team, Aston Unison Racing, and DSR Nightmare, rounding out your top eight in GT3. And then we've got the GT4 car, uh, the Viaduct in Ducklings number four, uh, which is uh, on its own at the moment, but still uh, still going at least, which is uh, what can be said for nine of these cars. We haven't had a retirement for a little while now, which is good news, but let's hope I haven't just cursed it. You have. You have, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> possibly. But There's uh, a retirement but... in the next 20 minutes. That's on you. Uh, yeah, it, it might well be, uh, but uh, we're, we're to be honest, we're, we're always cursing things as commentary. You just get used to it, desensitised. To be honest, I know, I know it's a terrible thing, but uh, yeah. but, but, but we just good way to describe it. I think desensitised to it. Oh no, it's happened again. <laughs> oh no. I know. If, if you ever want something to happen, just say that, and uh, and then it will. But uh, but yeah, it's still nine cars. Uh, out there at the moment in the uh, in the 12 hours of Monza. So uh, closest battles going on. Uh, Mugen Sim Racing versus um, Pro Sim is the closest one. 10 seconds apart uh, for the moment. But uh, I'm afraid for us, it's going the wrong way. Uh, with uh, Kianak trying to apply some pace right now. He's trying to catch Alexander Zakirov, who's uh, going on a, a bit of a double stint on the tyres, I would have said. Anyway, um, I, I'll, I'll, I need to try and fish through the replay to maybe find a, a replay of the pit stop but I don't think I'm going to be able to find it uh, very easily uh, now that we're this deep into the race so uh, I won't do that but what I will say is that it's uh, it's uh, Zakharov's second stint in the car and uh, still on his first set of tyres now I'm not entirely sure if, if maybe Bezrakov couldn't manage the double stint or, or what's going on with that one but um, it's certainly something a little bit different uh, and I guess we're going to find out very quickly uh, if this one actually works or not because uh, let's not forget they were a, a good 10, 15, 20 seconds in front of Mugen Sim Racing before they decided to go for this strategy maybe um, this wasn't the best choice because it's already down to 18 seconds Yes, yeah, see, it's, it's almost like a game of chess, this, making sure you make the right moves at the right time, or at least the moves possible you can make at the right times. Just making sure you stick to your own strategy, and there's an element of hoping that your strategy is the best one, because at the end of the day, you can put the fastest drivers in there, but if you get the strategy wrong, if you make an extra pit stop when maybe you don't have to, that's going to cost you, you know, around a minute and 20 here in one of these races, especially if you're doing all the work, so driver change, maybe even fuel and tyres as well. So really got to think about how many stops do we need not really not really how many stops do we have to make or how many stops should we make it's how many stops do we need to make without losing all of that time so that's all going to be working out and for these drivers as well they're they're sort of hardwired to be strategists as well on the fly they'll be looking at their tires they'll be looking at how much fuel they're using per lap and sort of thinking right am i on target if not i better fuel saver if not let's revise the strategy it'll be the last thing they want to do is revise the strategy they've already put in place but if they have to do, then they have to. Yeah, absolutely. If, if what you've already gone for is not really working, then uh, maybe that's not uh, the best idea to carry on with that anymore. Um, so uh, you know, you've got to you've got to try something a little bit different to uh, get up the order a little bit. 
and uh, we'll wait and see if it works but for the moment uh, one Amaya is holding him off and he's doing a good drive here actually is uh, Amaya because in the first stint he started right at the back he started this car and he was uh, really quite struggling I would have said because we're, we're expecting that satellite racing car to really fly through the order um, well not fly through the order but certainly uh, get up the order just a little bit and uh, they, they really didn't in the in the opening part of this race um, however Wanamaya is more than holding his own now. Maybe in traffic he was struggling a little bit, but now that he's out on his own, things have become a little bit easier for him, and that, that does tend to happen. Some drivers find it much easier in clean air than uh, battling around the, all the other cars at the start of a race. Yeah, and once you get into that clear air as well, you can find it just a little bit easier to make sure you stick to your own pace, stick to your own lines, and just making sure that you are making sure you hit the lines and doing what you've been doing all this time in preparation for this 12-hour event. As uh, yeah, we can see here, Juan Amaya doing a good job right now. Last lap times, so just having a look at see what he's doing at the moment. Uh, a bit of traffic on that lap, 48-1, but that's still not so far away from the best lap overall from that team of 47-5. So only around six tenths off and with a bit of traffic as well. Not too shabby at all. So he's got some good pace on him. He has indeed. And uh, it doesn't look like... Uh, he, he, oh yeah, he's going fairly strong at the moment. Maybe not quite as strong as some behind, like Christopher Kiernick, who's set the fastest lap of the race once again. He brought a second out of uh, Amaya on that occasion, and 2.3 seconds out of Zakirov, which is a scary amount of time. Uh, but as you can see right now, this is uh, Lesmo 1, and it's quite scary actually looking at that shot there. He wouldn't want to be stood there in real life, would he? Because it's... Uh, it's a bit dangerous, but anyway, uh, the point is the shadows are out and the sun is as well, uh, which we weren't expecting to sneer about an hour ago. We were talking about the rain and how terrible it's going to be, and all of a sudden the exact opposite's happened. Goodness, you can see on board with the uh, on board with Kinnick there. There's actually bits of blue sky, blue sky. Mm. When we were we, we were pretty sure it was going to rain at some point in this race, and yeah, blue sky is now just starting to poke through, I should say as well uh, the uh, the 33 of Christopher Kinnick has now set the fastest lap of the race so far, it is a 46 747 set on his previous lap, so he's absolutely flying at the moment, he's getting every bit of performance out there, but gets slightly onto the gravel on the exit of the second race mode might cost him a 10 for 2, especially now he's got to carry that momentum underneath the old banking, and then towards there and we've got Juan Amaya, uh, oh. Oh. Oof. At a moment there, he's back, he's back. Stand down, he's back. <laughs> oh, that would have been a very nervous moment for the team because uh, he did just dip there slightly and uh, some kind of connection problem anyway. And uh, Amaya is back now, which is fortunate, but we we're about to have a, another huge change in the course of this race for first position. 27 seconds is the lead, but it was about to be a lot less than that with a disconnection. And uh, Amaya is able to continue on, but uh, that would have uh, sent horses ra hearts racing, excuse me, at, at uh, satellite racing. They're currently stuck behind Pedro Ramada in the Ramada Motorsport car, I'm pretty sure that is. Um, just in front, it's uh, holding pace very well with Amaya but uh, not quite close enough to uh, let the McLaren through just for the moment. And uh, you wouldn't really want to be near that McLaren right now because it's blinking around just ever so slightly and, uh, you know, losing connection. Uh, you don't quite know where it's going to end up if you're uh, the car in front or behind. So it would make you a little bit nervous seeing that in your rearview mirror would a little bit but I think it might be making the team more nervous as well just see this car blinking in and out as it tries to establish that long strong connection and yeah I think the team might be slightly concerned they'll be thinking maybe is there a chance of getting him into the pit lane and maybe seeing if there can be a, a quick fix but you know it's the last thing they want to do is make an unscheduled stop due to internet trouble so they'll be keeping their fingers crossed that Juan Amaya's internet stays firm at the moment it looks like it's doing okay but it's given the team it's given the uh, production crew as well a bit of a scare that the car just disappeared but at the moment though still in this one yeah they are still in this one indeed they don't really want to have to change strategy right because they've not really been going very long on their stints they pit on the hour pretty much every time uh, and what that means is they've not given themselves that much flexibility they would have to have saved uh, like 32 minutes of fuel uh, to make it to the end on the same amount of stops uh, compared to what they were doing before maybe that is possible for them but still they would rather not and uh, that's the advantage that a car like ProSim have got right now because um, they've been going really 
quite long. They're actually 15 minutes in the green, so to speak, um, at the moment, and uh, you know they're they're in a much better place. So if something like that were to happen to them, they've got a lot more flexibility, and that's uh, you know even if you don't save a pit stop, even if you, your pit stop isn't that much shorter, the flexibility that you get from running that tiny bit longer is uh, it would be invaluable in a situation like that would really be as we see Holomire then exiting out of the second lace blow and getting a little bit of a kick of dust from the uh, number 51 Audi ahead of him in the Ramada Motorsport car just running slightly wide it's so easy as well if you're following a car to end up following that line I've, I've fallen victim to it many a time because it's just you get so involved in the race so uh, but yeah no good driving there from uh, from the number 65 making sure that uh, they keep themselves out of trouble sticking to their own lines because they know that's the line that works. Yeah, I find Lesmo 2 exceptionally annoying actually to drive um, because uh, you feel like you're not quite getting the exit that you really want uh, and then you try and take it a little bit uh, take it into the corner a little bit harder on the entry and uh, you, you smash the curb on the inside and your entry and your exit's rubbish as well there so uh, I find it exceptionally annoying really in this corner but these guys have clearly got things uh, sorted out you do tend to dip a wheel into the gravel as well on the left hand side however they put those kind of rumbly curbs on, I don't know what you call them it's kind of those painted white curbs on the outside of the real curb uh, they kind of um, yeah thing but uh, I don't really know what you call them and it keeps you kind of within sometimes Times, but um, not always um, on, on occasion. There's some more on the exit of Ascari here, if you see what I mean on, on the stream. Uh, there they are. Uh, yes, yes. I don't, I don't, I don't quite know what they're called. Uh, have they got a name? I t well, see, they're not sleeping policemen, are they? Because you, oh. they're the big, massive orange things that you have across the curb. But yeah, you're right. They're, they're designed there to make sure that you don't use those parts of the curb because you get the, uh, you know, possibly a little bit of damage to the underside of the car by using them. But yeah, so. Yeah, and they're not sleeping policemen because you've got sleeping policemen on the inside of uh, the Retifilio chicane to keep you off of those curbs. So, yeah, not sure. Might be one we'd have to look up there, Ewan. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how you'd Google that kind of thing. Uh, What's but, it on uh, the inside of the curb called? Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, good uh, luck. Uh, yeah, good luck, exactly. Um, yeah, basically the, the, the kind of uh, the roughness of it would mean you don't really want to scrape the underside of your car on it, which uh, means that you don't run out too wide, which is the idea. But um, sometimes, as we've already seen, it doesn't always happen like that. Uh, OK, then, seven and a half hours still remaining on the clock right now. In the 12 hours of Monza, Joanna Amaya for Satellite Racing is still in the lead. We're going to take a quick commercial break, though. On the other side, we'll have more racing uh, from the 12 hours of Monza back in a moment. The GTR 24H 12 hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot. Fleet Gaming. ESTV and Motorvision.tv Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green.
it. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Welcome back to the 12 Hours of Monza, where we have just under 7 hours and 26 minutes remaining on the clock. I'm Yuna Liri, alongside Kieran McGinley for uh, the next half an hour or so. I'll be uh, taking a short break. Yusuf Bin Sahel will be here in a few moments. Um, but, uh, well, I'll say a few moments. It'll be quite a few. But anyway, um, yeah, it, that's what's coming up um, throughout the... Uh, next couple of hours. Alexander Zekarov at the moment is coming under a bit of pressure from Christopher Kianak. No, we've, we've been watching this battle develop for a very, very long time. Now it's finally starting to come to the fore. Zakharov's old guys are starting to uh, really... Well, he's starting to pay for them, let's put it that way. And two and a half seconds down the road, uh, Christopher Kianak in that Mugen Sim Racing car is going to look to take advantage of them. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, just looking at the timings, it's just coming down very slightly every single sector. So something that uh, Zakharov is going to have to focus on. And, you know, you can fall victim to it because I've fallen victim to it. When you see the times getting closer and closer, you start looking more behind you than you do ahead of you. So you've got to focus on your own lines. It's easy to say up in the commentary box when there's no pressure on you whatsoever. But for the Unison Racing team, they've just got to focus on their own lines. They've got to try and stay ahead of the Audi as long as they can. Yeah, absolutely. It would really help their strategy out if they can indeed do that. Here's a bit of a slow-mo going into Ascari, but I'm afraid they're not going... Well, they're going quicker than that, but they are not going that quickly, um, especially compared to Christopher Kianak, who's uh, driving exceptionally quickly. A 48.2 last time around. He was only eight thousandths of a second slower than Juan Amaya, and he was 1.7 seconds quicker uh, than the uh, BMW up in front. I think it's safe to say that this double stint in terms of the strategy really hasn't worked for uh, Alexander Zakirov. Not at the moment. I mean, they've got track position at the moment, but, you know, with uh, a good few hours left on the clock, that might not necessarily be the case or a good case right now. They are being reeled in by the 33 team there, the Mugen Sim Racing team, really on the, uh, on the attack as they're looking to just try and find a way past now slowly closing in once again riding on board then with Christopher Kianek then as he makes his way out of Ascari now onwards then towards Parabolica could if he gets the line right out of the final corner might be able to size himself up here for a move in towards the Retifilio chicane let's see then coming in towards the final corner at the Parabolica you can see that BMW is hanging on to its tyres right now back onto the power for the Audi and for the Mugen Sim racing team into the slipstream they go let's see how effective this car is at punching a hole through the air and at the moment doesn't look like it's gaining a lot on the bmw ahead of it as probably you were alluding to earlier there you and that this that mugen sim racing audi just doesn't seem to even in the slipstream be able to keep up with the bmw yeah, the, uh, the slipstream obviously is having its effect, but the straight line speed on the Audi really is quite poor. Um, we saw it very easily over, able to overtake the Ramada Motorsport car, but only because it was another Audi. Now that we're seeing other manufacturers coming into play, uh, we're seeing it very difficult to pass, and that's another reason why they wanted to get the Pro Sim car in the pit stop cycle, because uh, otherwise it would have been impossible nearly for them. Trying to go late on the brakes into the second chicane, but not able to do it on this occasion. We saw what happened last time they went side by 
by side through the Della Roggio chicane. It ended in disaster for both them and the 64 satellite racing car, trying to avoid that one here once again into the two Lesmos, uh, into the second one. Now a bit wide from Zakharov, and he's not got the best run uh, coming up towards Ascari. Is there going to be a move this time around from the Mugen Sim racing car? This is exactly how Kianak got the Romana Motorsport car. It looks like it's going to be an absolute carbon copy. Down the inside goes the Audi, and the BMW can't put up much of a fight, even if it wanted to. And on this occasion, Kianak is through. Can Zakirov uh, maybe respond, though? Because that straight line speed of the BMW might play into his hands. Yeah, but he's gone instantly to the left-hand side of the Sega to try and break that slipstream up towards Parabolica. We will go, and the Audi staying ahead once again. But now this will be a test for the Mugen Sim Racing team. Can they try and hold back now that BMW as they now make their way on towards the start-finish straight? And yeah, again, trying to break that slipstream as much as possible as we see that move happening once again then as uh, Kenick up the inside. He went in towards Ascari, taking that line away, and really doing a good job of making sure that he gets the Audi exactly where he wants it. Positioning was exquisite there from the Audi. Yeah, absolutely. And breaking the slipstream as well down towards Parabolica and indeed Turn 1. The fact that Zakharov didn't chase him for slipstream, though, suggests to me that he wasn't really interested in getting back past again. And so, uh, you know, he's decided to just hold back for now. And I'm not entirely sure what the best uh, strategy for him would have been there, whether to let him go or try and keep him behind or not. Um, but uh, certainly he wasn't interested in keeping him behind. He didn't try too hard to defend or indeed repass again. Yeah, I think that's a, another big thing about uh, endurance races that, you know, sometimes it's worth just letting that car go rather than battling away with it for a couple of laps. You'll just lose yourself time and you could, you know, cost yourself a bit of tyre wear. You might use a bit more fuel than you wanted to because you might be on full attack at that point. So sometimes it's best just to let that car go. You might see it again later on in the race. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, they're going to be hoping so anyway, uh, and maybe it won't be the battle for seconds, maybe for a little bit more than that. Kianak's got 33 seconds up to Wanamaya, who's now leading this race. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get some lap times in in a few moments' time, because uh, they're about to come, well, uh, Kianak's about to come across the line again, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a look and uh, see who's going well at the moment. It looks like by a roughly half a second, Amaya um, outdid Kianak on that last time around. However, let's not forget uh, the Megan Sim Racing car had to get through on the BMW last time, so uh, that could be changing things ever so slightly. Uh, when's Kianak going to come across the line and put in a new lap time? It's a it's 47.6, so eight tenths of a second quicker than Amaya on his first lap in clean air, which is um, a very strong lap time indeed, and he's certainly making use of the clean air now. Amaya gets through on the Ramada Motorsport car and indeed gets uh, through on the Alpine GT4 as well um, which is very useful indeed so uh, yeah both of these guys will be pushing very hard indeed it's going to be um, yeah time trial mode for both of them certainly as out of uh, Lesmo 2 comes Amaya and uh, through on the Alpine so he's got a big job on his hands he's, he knows the Megan Sim Racing car is coming in uh, really quite hot from behind but um, you never know uh, Amaya is going to try and hold, uh, hold up at least some resistance uh, to that car and I doubt in the next 18 20 minutes or so we're actually going to see these two close in too much more that we're definitely not going to see a fight between them I wouldn't imagine in the next 20 minutes or so well, anything can happen, but I think you're right. It's going to be a case of now that the two drivers will be focusing on their stints and, you know, we'll see now how the Audi, because this is going to be a real good lap uh, underneath uh, clear air. Just have a look at the sector time. Nothing out of the ordinary here for the Audi. No personal best. And that's to be expected, really, when you're on a little bit of warm tyres here, so you won't have the grip you once had when you first started. But Kianek then, uh, seeing as the gap is still around about 33 and a half seconds at the moment heading out his way in towards Parabolic as you can see the, the race leader making their way now in towards and out of the Retifilio chicane as second place just making their way out of Parabolica onto the start finish straight let's have a look at the lap times then between the two of them as they head their way towards the line we'll get that lap time from Kianek any moment now as it's 47.6 last time around compared to Juan Amaya's 48.4. So that gap is going to come down uh, quite some way. It is indeed. 
question of how quickly, but uh, yeah, certainly is coming down uh, right now. Uh, we've been promised, by the way, some rain. Uh, the weather is uh, uh, now, taken... now. <laughs> well, yeah. now, now. We've been taken. Uh, the, the weather has taken a bit of a change, and uh, apparently we're going to get some rain in the next hour. We were told. Uh, we, we've been told this since uh, since the very start, actually, but uh, it's never quite materialised. At about five o'clock local time, I was expecting the rain, and now finally it might indeed come. And we're kind of in this real we're in a valley of rain on the either side of us at the moment surely this look is not is going to run out at some point and you can see actually um, just to the very left hand side of your screen right now that uh, little bit of rain is no longer going to be a, a thin valley of, of dryness it's going to be uh, fully a downpour I'm afraid on the circuit a little bit past the 5 o'clock schedule that I proposed at the start of the day but um, still not too far off schedule um, and uh, yeah it's certainly going to wreak havoc with these guys it also depends whether it, it I, I, I'll tell you what will be the most exciting really would be if it just started sprinkling just as these guys had to make a field stop and then uh, they would have to decide between actually taking the wets on that uh, on that occasion and risk burning them out and uh, overcooking them or indeed uh, you know going out on dries only to come back in a couple of laps later it would be a real conundrum I don't think that's quite going to happen however it's still that little bit of extra strategy that these guys are going to have to work out yeah, because then you have to decide whether the driver will have to go for a couple of hero laps on, on a set of uh, of wet weather tyres when it's quite not yeah, the distance or the or the conditions suitable for the tyres they've selected and just try and keep it on the track as long as possible. But yeah, that's that's going to be a, a, a huge decision for the teams to make, and they'll be hoping for their sake that that won't be the case. That it'll be more clear cut as to where they have to change the tyres, but. You need to be prepared as a team for anything that's thrown your way. You need to be on your toes, making sure that you make the right calls when they're thrown at you. It's not necessarily if you're the quickest car out there. If you can react to problems being thrown your way the best, chances are you've got a good chance of getting a good result. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's see. Um, we are also, uh, another point on this I guess is uh, I'll use the Prosim car as an example as again the flexibility that they have is uh, is a lot better uh, for this race so uh, they may be able to stretch out their fuel just a little bit longer if say the rain comes on half hour then uh, they could be able to save the fuel to still make the same amount of pit stops but um, you know the, the, uh, a team like Satellite Racing may not have that flexibility also with flat out satellite racing pitting on the hour and uh, ProSim are going to be uh, about 18 minutes past the hour, then maybe uh, there's a chance that the rain could fall in that little window there uh, and really screw over satellite, but not ProSim. It may not affect everybody equally. Now that we're in this part of the race where the strategy is so all over the place, people are no longer coming in on the exact same lap like they were at the end of the first hour. Uh, you know, it could affect different teams to, uh, very, very differently. Yeah, and, and as I said, you can you can have the set strategy in there, but you've got to have plan Bs, you've got to have plan Cs, you've got to have plan Ds, you've got to have every single letter of the alphabet lined up with a plan so that you know, right, if this happens, then we'll have to go to this strategy. We're expecting rain. Well, when that rain does come, we need to do this. So you're going to have to play that by ear in a sense of when the rain will hit, but what you're going to do, you need to make sure you have that down to a T. Normally, when it starts to rain, you use less fuel. So maybe stops on that occasion, for fuel will not be as long because you'll need less fuel in the car who knows though because uh, the, the teams I'm sure will have done a lot of sim making sure they get the running in the dry making sure they get the running in the wet so that they have a clear idea of what they need to do and what the vitals need and how much fuel you need on board that's going to be a main one yeah that is going to be a, a pretty big deal um, because obviously there's no real tired choice uh, when you've when, the, when it's a downpour so um, yeah it's going to be very important indeed and I'm sure these guys have accounted for it as you say and uh, that's all going to play out in front of our eyes um, before long we're just a case of when really I remember the uh, the rain pour uh, the, the rain pour sorry the, the rain and downpours in this part of the world aren't often 
um, particularly strong. However, uh, I remember last year there was a 12 hours of Monza in real life and the rain was so heavy that the tree actually blew onto the circuit, which was uh, a little bit weird. Um, but uh, it just shows that the weather conditions can get a little bit extreme. Hopefully no trees this time around on the circuit, but um, certainly a lot of rain we're expecting um, throughout, the, throughout the day here. And uh, yeah, that would be uh, that is certainly going to shake up things in this order. It's just a case of who reads it right and also which car deals with the rain the best. Of course, we don't quite know uh, the answers to those questions. I, I really hoped that you were going to say when a tree fell on the circuit at Monza and you were going to say in the extreme weather, but you never did so. I, I was a bit disappointed, Ewan. But hey-ho, oh. the pun's gone. I've made it instead. At the moment, though, half a minute separates the, the first and second teams in this race. And, uh, well, I have to say, we've had rain been many times, but we've never had the... <laughs> we've never had... I've just been told in the ear that we've never had the radar turn red with the, the amount of uh, hail. I think that means hail uh, is on the on the horizon here. So it, that could throw up something as well. That It's so cold up up in the sky that it actually might be hail on the horizon as well. So that's a little bit sketchy for the drivers as well. They might not have to deal with just the rain. They might have to deal with hail. And in those conditions, you are going to be up against it. It's going to be an understatement, I think. Yeah, I must admit that I've never seen uh, the 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 weather the the weather radar. That's easy for me to say. Uh, the weather radar turn actual actual red um, in this uh, in well since I've been doing GTR twenty four H anyway uh, and the uh, and uh, other or seeing this radar anyway so um, yeah that's uh, that's going to be a new experience for all these drivers as well I'd expect because uh, not many of them will experience such heavy rainfall but um, finally it might be a good opportunity for us on our factory to actually see the rain which is sometimes difficult um, but uh, we'll definitely know about it um, when it is falling by the sounds of it anyway it's going to be very very tricky indeed also uh, Unison Racing might be put into a difficult situation because um, they are at the moment in the middle of a dual stint in terms of the tyres. Now, if they are trying to do something on the strategy in the long run, hoping for a clean and green race all the way through, they're going to be hoping that this rain stays away, really, because um, you know you don't want your strategy being interrupted by the by the weather and the rainfall because you know it completely ruins um, the strategy that you were going for. You know you plan out 12 dry. Uh, hours at Monza and uh, you know that doesn't happen the strategy is going to be thrown into the air by the sounds of it I don't think any team would have planned for 12 dry hours at Monza they would have expected rain at some point in this uh, session here but just like us we've not been able to pinpoint exactly when this rain is going to hit so that might have been keeping teams slightly on edge they I think that the radars had originally suggested within the first hour of the race we might have got some rain and it's changed so much over the past couple of hours. We're now expecting rain within the next hour. Again, the radar is looking, well, not for the drivers more encouraging, but the rain is being more consistent. There's clouds forming over the circuit in the next hour and that is where the rainfall is going to come. So it looks like it's a bit more permanent this rain that's going to come along we it's a bit more uh, exact this radar and where we've threaded the needle so far in terms of the rain the sun's just poking through the clouds at the moment we just see the shadows being cast onto the circuit at certain points at the moment difficult to say what the teams are going to be thinking about they're certainly on edge as i think uh, oh no viatek was uh, just taking a, a slightly different line out of parabolic i thought that might have been a pit stop but i thought that's way way too early in the stint yeah, it is a little bit early. Uh, I guess you could make it work if you really wanted to, but why would you um, at this point? Uh, currently looking at the ProSim car, which is in fourth position in this race right now. Just trying to get through on the Alpine. Uh, look how big the Bentley is compared to the small little Alpine. This is almost comical uh, to see those two, but um, yeah, there we go. Getting doesn't through. Seem fair, does it? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Well, it isn't really, but uh, but but anyway, uh, it's it is a huge car, the Bentley, and I'm sure the airplane's probably not that small, really, but uh, it just looks small uh, compared to the Bentley. See, it looks a little bit more normal next to the Corvette, and uh, what an experience it's going to be for those guys. We know that there's some very young and inexperienced drivers in that GT4 car, the Viaduct and Ducklings, they're called, and that might be quite uh, actually apt 
for the weather conditions that uh, uh, may be about to hit. We'll see if they do take it to it like a duck to water, but it is certainly going to be a bit of an education for them. I'm glad you nodded at that and knowledge the pun. That was good. Thanks. Uh, but, but no, um, I, I, I hope that they are going to get the experience here, and I hope they do uh, indeed um, take on the challenge here, so to speak. And, uh, and yeah, it's certainly going to be uh, an education for them. It's a 12-hour race, first of all, but also thrown in these weather conditions that none of us have seen before, that even the experienced Cheds um, here in this race won't have seen this amount of rainfall before. It's their first race and they're going to see uh, you know, something that you'd wait 10 years for. That's that's a, that's another thing as well. That hail is uh, is possibly forecast. Yeah, not many races could say that they've had hail in them uh, at some point in the race. So interesting to see how that affects the track as well. I'm not familiar with hail at certain points of the race. Well, we'll just have to wait and see if the hail hits. We've got to see if the rain hits first. But uh, yeah, as we say, in an hour we're expecting rain. But we've said that for the past, was it now, five hours? <laughs> so, uh, but the radar looks a little bit more permanent this time around. Yeah, I think the first hour we got away with a very clear radar, but after that it was pretty not clear, uh, and, and quite a lot like that, really, um, looking at the weather. It looks like we're, we're actually further, furthest away from the rain than we have been for a good hour now, um, as, the, as the band just to the south of us is moving uh, not uh, northwards, but south and east at the same time or a little bit more south than it was before. Um, so anyway, I'm not a weatherman, I'm just, just talking about it as it looks. Uh, but uh, but anyway, it's dry at the moment, that's what we do know. And uh, there is certainly rain on the way, and uh, that's going to uh, shake things up just a little bit. Uh, pro Sim at the moment, we're just seeing the uh, gap to use some racing just dips on just 20 seconds for the first time in quite a long time. And uh, that's probably because Zakirov is struggling out there at the moment. And Ramada Motorsport also closing on Pro Sim at the moment. The gap's below 20 seconds for the first time in a good while there as well. So the uh, kind of, well, we were saying about this at the start of the race, the midfield battle is going to be very, very good in this race because um, the, the cars were so close in qualifying. Uh, and it's uh, proving to be because the midfield of the race has actually become the front of the race now. Yeah, it's, it's quite weird in that sense. I mean, that is when you throw your fastest driver in the car for a lap when on low fuel, on fresh tyres, and see what they can do to get themselves up the order and, up, and the team up the order as well. But, you know, the team is the sum of all of its drivers and the sum of all of its parts. If you have drivers that are slightly off the pace, that's going to you know, take an effect over the hour stint they're doing or the two hour stint they're doing. That's going to add up and build up. And those tenths of a second turn into seconds after 10 laps. They turn into 10 seconds after 100 laps. You get the idea. So making sure that you stay on top and make sure that the drivers you do have are relatively within each other's pace, then you've got a good chance as well of having a more consistent race. You'll know what's happening. You'll know the pace of the entire team rather than your fastest driver. Yeah, absolutely. We're just currently getting some... Uh Still photo, well, not still photos, I was uh, static cameras, that's the word I was looking for. Currently on the front straight, we've seen uh, Ascari in the exit of turn two as well from the first chicane. And uh, yeah, still seeing the cars out there at the moment. Nine of them still running, eight GT3s and the GT4 as well, which has just gone through your shot right now. That was good timing. No, I didn't plan it though. Uh, I thought so I did, but I didn't. Uh, anyway, they're 11 laps down on the next car. This is the triple seven. Uh, Matt Hedegaard driven DSR Nightmare Team. Usually in LMP2s for the uh, EWC, along with their teammates, the 766. They'll be back in action in four weeks' time exactly, or the 24 hours of sport, which is going to be happening here on GTR 24H, and going double the length of this race uh, here at Spa. It's a fairly new addition. Uh, to uh, r Factor 2 as well, but it's been very well used and it's very well made actually, it's a very good circuit and it's found some fantastic racing, so I'm very glad to have uh, Spa on the r Factor 2 service now and it's being utilised as well uh, quite readily, which is good to see. Yeah, Spa Light Monza as well is one of those you know historic tracks that you love to race at and just host some great racing too. And in the middle of the Arden Forest. I mean, if the weather at Mons has been unpredictable, I, I'm struggling to believe what the weather's going to be like when we head to the Arden Forest. Uh, jury's out for that one. However, 
you know, it's it's a great circuit. It's got a little bit of everything. You've got the kettle straight. You've got long flowing quarters. You've even got the chicane at the end of the at the end of the lap just to try and get the slow speed in there as well. So setting up the car for that one is a bit more challenging than at Monza, where you've got to try and run the least amount of aero possible to try and create the least amount of drag without taking away from your cornering performance as well. So there's a little bit of compromise you've got to have there. With Spa, you've really got to have a balanced car all the way through. So that's going to be a challenge for the teams, and I'm sure it's a challenge they'll relish. Uh, yeah, indeed. They're going to be sticking a lot more downforce than they have at Monza, for example, um, because, as you mentioned, it is a lot uh, a lot more twisty, high-speed corners, uh, quite a lot of them as well. So, But as you mentioned, there's a lot of straights there too, so it's going to be a big conundrum. Uh, some of these GT3 teams will be involved, actually, in a GT3 car. The guys on your screen right now, you can see them racing. They'll be in the old version McLaren with uh, notably Adam Sorej will be joining uh, them. He's uh, probably their fastest driver. He finished the 12 hours of Nürburgring race in a suit, I think it was, or at least a shirt and tie. Um, it was absolutely roasting that day in, in Hungary, by the way, which made it all the more, um, well, not good for him, certainly, um, because uh, it was absolutely roasting. But, uh, but yeah, he did, he did that, and uh, they'll be back again trying to take another victory, trying to take the championship lead away from Unison Racing, actually, because um, they are currently uh, only a few points behind. So well worth tuning into. The GTE and GT3 fights, especially in the championship, are absolutely fascinating. Mugen Sim Racing and LMP2 took the first win of their season um, last time around at the Nürburgring as well. So we'll see if they can build on that or whether, <coughs> excuse me, or whether Vargas Sim Racing will be able to uh, return to the top but um, yeah it's certainly going to be an interesting challenge and also the fact that it's a 24 hour race just adds that extra dimension really the fact that you have to go twice around the clock rather than just once because you can play uh, in my opinion you can plan for a 12 hour race you can always back time from the very start but in a 24 it's one of the very few sporting events in the world that are done professionally where you think oh, I'll just start and I'll just see how it goes really and then we'll get to the end and see um, you know that doesn't really happen very often anymore everything's so planned and things these days in whatever it is but uh, a 24 hour race you, 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 there are some things you just can't account for yeah I think Le Mans 2018 comes to mind the very last lap of Le Mans shows you exactly how 23 hours and 59 minutes everything can go according to plan but if the car says no on the final minute it just says no it was an absolute heartbreak for a Toyota at the time but they seem to recover from it because they're doing a, a stunning job right now in, in their uh, endurance feats as well at the moment then it is is of course the uh, number 65 of the VRS satellite racing the uh, the lone now we should say satellite racing car uh, out there leading the way as uh, oh that's a little bit of a moment there for the number 33 uh, going in towards Parabolica but it's then the uh, the number 33 then of Mugen Sim Racing in second place then it's the number 62 of Unison Racing rounding off our top three the 007 of Pro Sim in fourth place the 51 of Ramada Motorsport in fifth uh, then it's the number 14 then of uh, GVR GSR team Aston rounding off our top six and just the triple seven rounding off the position seven for DSR Nightmare. We'll be back just in a couple of minutes and uh, we'll be back after these commercial breaks. So don't go anywhere. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot. Fleet Gaming. ESTV. And Motorvision.tv.
A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. GTR 24 hour here at Monza for 12 hours of much of the same. My name is Kira McGinley and obviously you has just got off for a little bit of a break. It was mad of him to try and the whole 12 hours, but just got off for a little break. In his place though, we've of course got Yusuf Bin Sahel. Yusuf, good to have you along. Yeah, pleasure to be here alongside you, Kieran. And, uh, well, you know what they say about you. And he's, he's a real madman. You and the madman O'Leary. That's what we call him here at GTR 24 <laughs> Absolutely. And if you've just seen there, you've just joined us back. We did have the BMW running off the road then on the entrance in towards the Retifilio chicane. And, uh, well, that has allowed the Audi to just slip through and get up to, I believe, that's now second place. So they're on the charge now. And Yusuf, I don't know if you've been filled in on the drama right now. We've been expecting rain for a long, long time. We have the uh, weather radar, uh, I'm sure, pretty soon. <laughs> that was the Pro Sim team. Uh, I've heard the production team in my ear get all excited about about that one just a bit of a miscommunication there between the back barkers but the pro sim car has made it through in the 007 let's have a, another look at this then so this would be then uh this is the uh, third place car then the audi making their way through so pro sim now oh that was close wasn't it very very close with the number 51 there which was the uh, uh, the ramada motorsport audi but they've made it through that's the main thing uh, they'll claim one position up the order and we'll see whether they can go any further Ramada Motorsport in that number 51 car we've you know become accustomed to them in the Endurance Racing World Championship where they race in the LMP2 class doing a decent job there fourth if I recall correctly and we'll see if they can do any better in our Monza special event yeah, I'm just having a look here. Oh, there's the Unison racing car that went around. I've just saw that on the replay there. The number 62 going in towards the Parabolica. Let's have another look at this then. Coming in towards there, clips the grass on entrance and round she goes. So that is an unfortunate one and just getting into the gravel as well. But, you know, on the, on the bright side, kept out of the wall, but that's going to be a frustrating mistake to have made there. But as you mentioned, the crucial thing is you keep it out of the wall. And mistakes will always happen in endurance racing, you know, especially in a race as long as 24 hours. You can never get a race that is perfectly clean. Well, I mean, sometimes you can, and then you're fairly likely to win. But it's important that when you do get those mistakes, it's a case of damage limitation, making sure that it's only bad, not really bad. And by keeping it out of the Armco barrier, just limit the damage limit the damage to the car and what will become you know maybe a 10 second loss is only 10 seconds rather than an entire minute yeah you're right there Yusuf you'd rather take that 10 second loss of just a slight mistake than you know 
getting the car into the wall and maybe even having to face a retirement. Big snap of oversteer from the VRS car coming out of the Retifilio chicane. They've just come out of the pit lane now. And uh, is that still uh, the same driver behind the wheel of that car? I think it is. It's still Juan Amaya. So doing a double stint he is in that one. So uh, something changed there, either tyres or fuel, maybe even both. But the driver stays the same then in towards the Roger chicane. So now into third place, of course, making that stop. And they're sort of making it relatively on the hour of uh, each and every stint. So rough estimation of when they're going to pit. So that's nice of them there. But the clouds gathering over the circuit. We had a little bit of, sort of sunshine poking through the clouds. Now it really has clouded over. And you can see as well, some of the drivers turning their lights on as well. Maybe not necessarily due to the visibility out on track, but just so other drivers can actually see them in these uh, darkening conditions, I guess. It's one of the weird times where we've got better weather over here in the UK than they do in Italy. I know for me, it, it's scorching hot. It feels like it's something about 30 degrees. But over in Tuscany, in Monza, we are using the live weather data from Italy. It is not looking like one of their most pleasant summer days, to say the least. Oh, and I really did think they had a radar over my, my house because the, the rain we've been predicting, this heavy rain, was absolutely chucking it down outside my house about 20 minutes ago. So I really did think, wait, hang on, is that my house? Well, uh, we know then the rain is coming and it's going to be more concrete this time around. There is clouds gathering to the southwest of the circuit and it's making its way up. So we are expecting this rain and it's a bit more concrete bit more chance of it this time around than maybe other times and Yusuf we haven't actually seen a bit a drop of rain throughout this entire event through practice we were expecting a little bit through qualifying we we're expecting it you know in the first qualifying session to chuck it down with rain never did and now in the race this this rain just seems to be holding off as much as it can maybe just waiting for the perfect opportunity to create some drama I was about to say that exact same thing, Kieran. I think maybe the rain is just waiting for the optimal moment, you know, waiting for the leaders to pass the pit lane and then absolutely bomb it down and <laughs> pelt it down. At the moment is Christopher Kianek, who leads the way in the 33 Mugen Sim Racing car. And he's currently 22 seconds ahead of the 007 Pro Sim car. Moment, yes, but uh, slightly out of sync at the moment. I, I mean, you'll oh, be yeah. slightly out of sync until yeah. the, about a, the last hour of the race, of course. So we'll have a better idea of who's going to be challenging for that win and by how much. But it's it's relatively safe to assume that the McLaren, uh, driven by Juan Amaya in that VRS satellite car, has a good run at the top of the standings at the moment. Yeah, and as you said, that then my timing sheet updated. It made me look like a complete fool. Christopher Kianik completing his pit stop. He's down two thirds. The Prosim take the lead provisionally. But as you mentioned, that 65, the Ramada Racing Car, piloted by Juan Amaya, is currently sitting in second. He's 20 seconds behind Prosim. But once the Prosim make their stop, we'll feed out. Well, about over a minute behind the 65 car and Honamaya, 50 seconds clear of Christopher Kianik. It's all going rather nice and tidily for him and for the Ramada Motorsport team. So far so good then as we're riding on board with the number 62 BMW, the unison, unison racing of uh, Max Budovic here as he makes his way through the Curva del Seraglio underneath the old banking. And I was discussing yesterday, Yusuf, about that old banking. It's uh, a little bit disused, obviously uh, gone into disrepair, unfortunately, now because of the low maintenance. It's got grass growing through. But the heavy banking of, you know, the early 20s must have been an astonishing place to come racing here. It's one of those things, is that every time you get the F1 heading to Monza, it's um, that they always do a little piece on the old banking, the old circuit, um, and that old circuit that feeds into the parabolic. In fact, I'm actually taking a look at um, Christopher Kianik, and you can just see in the background of your shot that old banking that did used to exist and that was once used and well when you talk about like nascar you see the banking that exists on those oval tracks in america and that this kind of tops that by a fair amount i don't quite know exactly how steep that banking is it's in 30s I'm, I'm pretty sure it's about I'm 34 really 35 sense. yeah check that because i'm pretty sure it's that high it's uh, it's one of those where you see trust people try and walk up it and they just can't get to the top it is that steep in the banking so 21 yeah. degrees uh, 21 so i was overselling it then there you go well, even I mean, then for context looks... for context let's let's check indianapolis yeah. nine <laughs> degrees Here so it's more than double the banking of indianapolis which i guess is probably 
the most, or at least one of the most famous speedways in the United States? Yeah, I believe as well that the only one that was pretty much close to matching that sort of banking was Brooklyn's, the old Brooklyn circuit, before it was uh, unfortunately uh, put into uh, disuse now. So, yeah, it had a lot of history and a lot of banking. They love their banking in the in the old circuits. Yeah. Um, probably because, you know, the cars and, um, you know, some of maybe the old car fans in our chat might not like me for saying this, but because the cars back then weren't very good, they didn't have a lot of um, natural downforce on the cars, you know, the spoilers just didn't generate as much force that pushes the car down onto the track. So the bank, it just helps the cars go around the corners. So instead of having to see, you know, the cars really slow it down to, well, whatever speed they need to do to get around a corner, that banking just means that they can absolutely chuck the car in. Aren't they just? And it's, it's one of those where the, the car, back in those days as well, would, would jump on the oval as well so you'd start trying oh, wow. to make sure you get the car in the right position and then as you're going around the oval it would, it would jump and it would make its way to the walls of the top so that must have been absolutely terrifying but I bet the drivers then absolutely loved it a long way we've come in terms of safety and in, in building yeah. circuits as well but a circuit like you know the, the banking at Monza may never exist again probably won't to, to be fair to it and if it does it would literally probably be created just for the purpose of beating the Monza record of the steepest banking out there. And since we're talking about Monza track history, do you know what the old track layout used to be? Do you know what the changes that were made to turn one back in, I think it was in the late 90s, the changes were made? Yes, because I think the, the chicane at the start has gone through a lot, hasn't it? Because it used yes. to be a sort of, it used to be right, left, then left, right. So it used to be sort of two 90 degree angles, if you like, going all the way through. I do remember that, in, at least in the late 80s. But yeah, beyond that, I'm not sure. I, I, you're going to have so, to remind me, Yusuf. I know back in 1994, and I know it's because of an old game called Grand Prix 2, the first corner, or the first sequence of corners, I should say, used to be a left-right, a very short straight, we're talking about a second long, and then followed by another left-right, and then that would lead onto the Curva Grande and uh, down towards uh, the uh, Roger Chicane. And uh, obviously it's uh, Curva Grande has pretty much stayed uh, as, pretty much as it is really after all these years. It's still been that long, long right hander with a slight bit of banking added over the years. And then you've got the uh, Roger Chicane now, which you know was installed. I think in the uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the late in the 90s. I want to say. Mm. Uh, don't quote me on that one though. But it's uh, it's still a fantastic circuit and of course back in the 50s and the 60s the uh, Formula 1 circuit especially in I think it's 67 they used the full layout of Monza that's not just you know the added chicanes they used uh, the sort of the shoe and the infield and the oval as well which must have been you know it, it certainly favoured those that had the engine not only to make it to the end but had the top speed as well and it makes it hard, doesn't it, when you want to set up your car because you want to be setting up part of the car, you know, to deal with the infield, the twistier parts of the circuit, and then you're going to be wanting that more open setup where the car can really, or more specifically, the engine can really stretch out its legs. But at least nowadays, a lot more simple to set up a car around here in Monza. You usually just go low downforce, and the cars will just stick to the track anyway with the amount of natural downforce that they do have. The only other change to this Monza circuit was actually fairly recently, I think this was about five, six years ago, where they removed the gravel trap through Parabolica, which I know quite a few drivers weren't a fan of. Um, I don't even know where I sit on that, because I just see Christopher Kianek losing his back end momentarily through the Ascari chicane. Catches it well though, and that might just cost him a couple of tenths of a second. Yeah, you saw in the onboard shot of the 007, just looking at the, the bonnet of the car at the moment and the production team hearing in my ear going, is that rain? Is that moisture on the top? Uh, I'm not sure. I, yeah, debating. Is it rain? Is it not? It's been there for a while, if that's the case, because I think I was uh, saying that to you about an hour ago. I think that's just part of the decal, just to mislead us slightly. So uh, we will we'll see how that goes. But at the moment, your 007 is the race leader at the moment. And having a look at the radar, let's have a look. And yeah, just at the uh, south southeast of the circuit it's going to maybe come through so we've already discussed that's probably going to be a parabolic it might get a light dusting of rain before there you can see that wall of rain coming and it is coming Yusuf yeah 
and hopefully we won't be misled by the rain i was misled by the rain slightly earlier on today it was at a karting event and i got told by met by met office that it was going to rain at some point it didn't much to my um well i was very happy to hear that it wasn't raining i don't quite like racing in the in the rain you get wet you get soaked and then it's it's just a pain nobody likes it um but we like it when we're spectating because it makes things interesting and it just gives an extra challenge for the drivers out on circuit. As well as that, I was saying to you before, if it starts to rain, chances are you're starting to use less fuel. So all those stints Absolutely. you have planned out, you know, you've got to have a readjustment. Obviously, the drivers and the teams would have been doing a lot of sim and making sure that, you know, they whatever they whatever thrown at them, whether it's dry or wet, that they know how much fuel their car's going to use per lap. And that's not necessarily going to be the same for each and every driver. They'll have to take that into account as well. How much fuel does each driver use over a lap? It's a lot of work to do before an event like this. So for some of our viewers who might be slightly newer to racing or to sim racing are wondering what we're talking about when we're saying that the cars and the drivers will use less fuel when it's raining. There's two reasons for that. The first reason is you change your engine map and by changing your engine map is it applies a little bit less throttle. The engine uses up less fuel and the reason why this happens is so that you don't wheel spin on the exit of corners. You're also turning up your traction control as well. As well as adjusting your driving style, you're going to be off the throttle a little bit early because in the wet there's less, you can't brake as late. And all of this just means that you're off the throttle for more periods of time during your lap. And it means that you consume less fuel. And, you know, you can sometimes, depending on the track, even use up to, you know, 20, 30% less fuel over the course of one lap. That's it, and you know that's going to be something that the drivers and the teams will have had to have discussed and made sure they know exactly how much fuel they're going to use. And a lot of work goes into this. You know, we have the official practice session on Thursday, but a lot of hours would have gone into this as the race leaders now come into the pit lane. The 007 uh, racing team make their way in towards the pit lane, the Pro Sim team. Uh, well, let's see what happens there. There's also the Corvette, then the sixth place Corvette coming in as well. So that's uh, Valadis Carolis uh, making his way into the pit lane. So that's the, I think that's the GSR team, Aston, if I'm right in thinking. Uh, might have been completely wrong, but I'm, I'm sure I'll be unlike. And I'm pretty sure that was the GSR team, Aston. And you and I were discussing this. This is the new way of coming into the pit lane where you turn towards the pit lane exit or at least the fast lane of the pit lane. So you're at an angle when you're in the pit box. I have not seen that. I, I need to take a look. Uh, who did he say has just jumped in so I can get a look at that? Uh, it's the 007 that's in the pit lane at the moment. Uh, 007. Ah... Okay, so, so there's a couple of reasons why that can happen and why the drivers will do it. A, so it's, it only really helps if someone else around you is pitting. And if you imagine that the pit boxes are fairly close together, if your car is, you know, straight, for another car to then pit in, they've essentially got to wheel themselves in because it's impossible for them to feed their cars. So by having it slanted, it just means that the cars can just feed in quite nicely one alongside the other. It's, um, I mean, it's it's the same as when you see Le Mans style starts, whether that's in the actual Le Mans series or for something like, um, you know, karting Le Mans, when all the cars will be pointed at an angle. It means that you can jump in, you can get on the power, and if the car ahead of you is slightly slow getting away, you don't end up driving into the back of them all pretty good reasons as to why you'd angle the way into the pit lane there as we do see the pro sim team making their way out of the pit lane and they do rejoin ahead of the 62 car so they have got ahead of unison racing that's exactly what they wanted to do in that stop and the unison racing car currently stuck behind the number 14 which was the gsr team aston uh making their way through now i, I that doesn't look like an aston it's actually the other uni unison racing car uh making their way through then so all is good then for the third place team as the BMW gets a little bit out of shape coming through the Roger chicane and those you know the, the chicanes here the Retifilio and the Roger chicane those curves really do bite back if you don't treat them with respect and it all depends on you know what sim you're on because certain sims will punish you a little bit more if you use the curbs i know um i know kieran you've got a lot of experience with f1 and back on the old f1 2020 game you'd absolutely use as much of the curb as you could through that roger chicane 
but here on ATC, or oh, here on ATC and R Factor 2, you just can't quite use that much because it will punish you, it will unsettle these GT cars. Will indeed, and you know you're really relying on the suspension to do its job, uh, making yeah. sure that it can handle the bumps and make sure that it gives you that ride you need and that stable, predictable ride. Although at a track like Monza, you know if you soften the suspension too much, or oh, a bit of a tail happy moment then from the uh, the fourth placed Unison Racing car, the number 62, just having a slight moment of the exit of Parabolica, not a place where you'd want to have a moment like that. However, it's happened now. Uh, the Corvette behind is the sister Unison racing car I've identified as the 717 that's the Corvette I did think that was a funny looking Aston Martin and to go back to what you were talking about regarding the bumps um, something that I actually had a bit of experience with only a few months ago when I was uh, preparing for an endurance race here at Monza albeit this was on a set of course of competizione but I think out of all the sims ACC and uh, R Factor 2 very similar I think in the handling model and one of the the biggest decisions we had to take when selecting a car was what car can ride the curbs well because if you get a car that can ride the curbs well through that first chicane the retrofilio chicane and the roger chicane it can give you so much time even a little bit through ascari but the curbs in ascari aren't really that race so pretty much all the cars can ride on it fairly comfortably and one of the best cars for riding curbs was the bentley which i think is being used by the 33 car if i'm not mistaken i'm not sure if there are any other bentleys out there um, so, ah, the Bentley's a 007, as um, our production informs us. I don't think any of the other cars are, are particularly great over the bumps. Maybe the BMW for the 62 Unison racing car is. Yeah, and no, that's actually quite an interesting insight into that. You know, getting a car that can ride the bumps well. You know, the, when it comes to Monza, you're, you normally sort of think, try and put the aero or try and take as much air off the car as you can without compromising your turning ability. In yeah. These high-speed corners, when you go through Parabolica, when you go through the Curva Grande, for example, you know, making sure that you've got enough grip, just enough grip to make it through. But then you don't want to create too much drag when you've got long straights like this down towards the Retafilio chicane, as we see then the uh, the fourth place team, the number uh, 62 there, the Unison Racing BMW, flying down the straight. And this is where you don't want a high aero setup, or at least an aero setup that's going to compromise you too much top speed. And when it comes to top speed, you're usually looking at something like the Audi, usually very good in a straight line. The Bentley's decent in a straight line as well, and the Bentley just... Apparently, from what's told to me, I never have really driven the Bentley. It's just a very easy car to get used to, to be able to drive, to be able to set up. And that's why I think usually quite a few teams like to pick it, although it is just pro sim this time round. As Unison Racing make a, a little bit of a mistake on the exit of the Roger Chicane. And now um, there's someone starting to close up onto the back of them, but I think it is just a back marker and nothing that will cause too much concern for Max Benovic. Not at the moment, anyway, that's the main thing. As uh, we see then this sort of picture in picture with a, with a great view there of the track behind. But we've got, uh, you know, we've got the fourth place car, the uh, Max Bonovic on the left hand side. We've also got the Treble 7 car, which is the DSN, DSR Nightmare, the, the Danish team in the Audi R8, making their way on towards the start finish straight. And actually, uh, it was a late call then for Mads Herdegaard, who he's in the car right now in the Treble 7. I think he was only. He only got into the car on Thursday night because it was such a late call. I think one of their team unfortunately got ill before the start of the weekend. So very late call for Hedegaard to go in, but fair play to him. You know, not a lot of time yeah. to prepare yourself and he's jumped straight in. Currently, the team is in eighth place, last of the GT4s, but do you know what? They're not out of the woods yet. They're just about, what's this, uh, about 87 seconds off the next car, but over, you know, coming up towards the halfway point, 87 seconds is not a lot at all. No, and anything can happen in the endurance races. You see it from time to time. Even on the last lap of a 24-hour race, something can happen and something usually does happen because it's those later stages where those cars have been under so much stress that things, you know, parts of the car are likely to break. And Mads Heredegård doing a decent job so far. 
and as you mentioned it is always difficult to jump into the car late on fortunately for him though i'm sure his teammates would have done a fantastic job already picking up a setup and that's the most crucial thing when preparing for an endurance with so much time so much effort goes into identifying a setup that works well for the car not only in the dry conditions but in the wet conditions as well and we've already talked about it kieran that chance of rain that is imminently approaching the circuit yeah, it's going to be a lot, is what we're being told in our ears right now. Apparently, the production team will have never seen rain like this before. That <laughs> is a very ominous statement. Well, we'll have to wait and see how that develops. Uh, we're expecting the rain you, here. You know those floods that occur at Spa, like, every now and then? That's going to happen here at Monza. Uh, you can see the latest weather radar then the clouds building up the rains building up and yeah it's it's on its way it is on its way and uh yeah it looks like a wall of rain coming through there you can see the the bits of red and yellow as well which indicate hail in the middle of those uh, in the middle of those that rain that's coming on its way so i've not dealt with rain in a rate uh, hail in a race before yusuf i don't know if you ever have um, I haven't, fortunately. Um, what I do know is that on the sim racing platforms, hell usually just gets treated as rain. So for the drivers, they can just take it as rain. Um, but if you were actually driving, um, you could still treat hell as rain because you're sitting nice and comfortably in your car. You don't really get to feel the effect. Like instead of hearing like a pata 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 on your front wheel, wheel on your front windscreen, you'll just hear a thud thud thud, depending on how big those hailstones are. Yeah, a big thud, 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 though, doesn't sound encouraging to these drivers, really, does it? It's, uh, that's going to be a little bit of a, 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 a sketchy one, to be sure. But heavy rain is on the way. That's what the drivers will be needing to know, and that will change the race. You can see the sun still trying to poke through very late on before this rain's supposed to hit. But just looking above uh, Christopher Kedek, then just above Ascari, there's a lot of grey cloud. And yep. that's not encouraging. You don't, that that colour of cloud is not a good sign it's not i mean for me i've always noticed um my computer does this weird thing where depending on the monitor that i'm looking at the race at it makes the track look really sunny and right now it's giving me the sunny effect so for me it's a beautiful day in monza and i can't see any clouds because my monitor likes to do that to me Oh, that's nice. That's nice of your monitor to do that. I can confirm it's a bit overcast and everything, sunshine and everything. But from what we're being told at the moment, we are expecting at least eight millimetres of rain. And that could be up to 30, three zero millimetres across the 12 hour tonight. That's, uh, that's a lot of rain. That's a lot of rain. I'm just trying to think, you know, 30 millimetres, what's that, about three, is, well, it is exactly three centimetres, but I'm just trying to think how much is three centimetres, because I'm just terrible. over an inch. It's just over an inch, yeah. which is less than a foot as well. So 12. They, they, that's a 12th of a foot. Ooh, it's a bit of a moment there from the number 33 coming through in towards the first part of the Lesmo there. Just managed to catch that one up. See if I can find a replay of that one because he, he managed to catch that one really, really well. But yeah, bit of a scary moment. And I've been told by production that the rain is going to hit the track at 7 p.m. onward. So we'll get a nice evening shower or an evening downpour, as, as the case might be. So for the drivers, it's their last chance, really, to enjoy a nice dry track. You know, get in that fastest lap, because once the rain comes, they will not be able to improve. And uh, the bragging rights currently are going on over to Christopher Kianek in that 33 car pass lap of a 46.7 which is 8 tenths quicker than what Juan Amaya has been able to do in the 65 Ramada or pardon me in the 65 VRS satellite racing car yeah, and they put Kianek in the car for qualifying as well, so they know he's a quick driver. He knows he's one of their quickest, and over one lap he is uh, doing the job. And in this stint as well, he's lapping at the moment faster than anybody else out on circuit. So they've got the right person in the car at the moment. Kianek's one of those ones, though, that you probably want him to finish the race. A couple of errors then coming through the Retifilio chicane, a couple of bites of the cherry to make sure the car turns in from him. But Kianek is one of those that you'd want in the car at the end of the race, surely. I mean, it all comes down to the situation you're in. I mean, if Kianek's in the car at the end of the race, it means he can just pump in those quick laps. But 
when you look at it from you know a theoretical standpoint, it, it doesn't really matter if Kianik's doing the stint just before the end or the stint at the end, but usually it comes down to a pressure scenario who performs better under pressure you know if you go to something like athletics i know the olympics are going on right now when you have your relay races you usually have you know your strongest runner doing that final leg of the race you know when the pressure's on they can see their target and they can push to the end so if you're if you're the chasing car i think you want to have your fastest driver at the end if you are at the front if you've got a decent gap then it doesn't really matter too much that's all being thought of. That's all being thought of by the teams, by the drivers, because yeah. they have to make sure that, you know, when it comes to sim racing as well, you hear a lot of sim racers being sort of saying you have to be a complete driver. And they're talking about not only the driving, but you've got to be good and sharp in the strategy side. You've got to make sure that the car is performing as it should. It's using the right amount of fuel. And in some you know, in some essence, you can get a, a gauge of how the tyres are, but in some, you might be able to see exactly what the tyre wear is like, so you can judge that for yourself as well. And, you know, having to put that all together, where you're driving the car and also having to try and make up the strategy on the fly, it's a fairly new way of, of looking at it, and it's sort of bleeding into motorsport itself as well, because you're seeing drivers now on the fly talking about strategy. We should do this and we should do that. So it's quite interesting to see how that sort of bled through and now drivers are having more and more to think on their feet. And it's one of the two ways for me sim racing kind of differs from real racing. As you mentioned, in, in sim racing, the drivers tend to do the strategies themselves. And the reason for that is, you know, they've got a heads up display with all of that information readily available to them. So it's very easy. Well, I say very easy. It's far easier for them to be able to look at that information, kind of decide what they want to do. Whereas when you look at something where when you look at, you know, real life racing the drivers don't have that information to them usually they've just got the steering wheel and all of the data all of the telemetry is going on to the pit lane to the race engineers and they'll have a team of you know 50 or so people you know a few strategists working out what to do whereas in sim racing in sim racing usually a smaller team you'll have a couple of teammates maybe a strategist um taking a look at what you can do so a lot more um, there's a lot more responsibility on the driver to work out what's going on. It will indeed, and just making sure that, you know, as you say, you might have someone dedicated to the strategy if you're in motorsport to make sure that nothing goes wrong. But yeah, in that sense, you has, still have to do the job as the driver in it, when you're talking about sim racing. Your strategist yeah. will probably be another driver. Yeah. Is usually the driver, you know, who's who's not in the car or is going to be out in a couple of hours. He's just having a look at how everything is developing and he's just saying, OK, you know, I, I think we go with this. And uh, it, it helps when one of your, strateg your strategists are a driver because they can also think of it from the perspective of what would they do if they were the ones in the car? What, how would, you know, they react? Um, so it does help in, in the grand scheme of things. Just uh, Mads Hedegaard out of the second Lesmo, getting very close and personal with the gravel trap on the exit. Getting away with it though, but almost all four wheels off the track as he as he left there. But yeah, bit of a bit of a sketchy moment. We've seen a lot of gravel being kicked up by the cars and uh, across this whole endurance. So yeah, it, it's safe to say it's not affecting the cars too much. But is it just a slight lapse of concentration? Maybe taking a little bit too much speed into that second Lesmo, especially. And also we're seeing it at the exit of the Rogers chicane. Well, this actually throws me back to one of the Assetto Corsa Convertizione Sprint Series that we had here um, last year at Monza. And I believe it was John Monroe who was driving one of his BMWs at the time. And he was closing in to one of the Musto drivers in, in the final 10-15 minutes of the race. And every time he was heading on into the Lesmos, you could just kind of see a bit of understeer coming through. And the Lesmos, when you compare the corner to, well, pretty much all of the track with the exception of Parabolica, it has a very early turn in. When you look at the, you know, the two chicanes, they're very slow corners. You just stamp on the brakes as side as you can, get it turned in at low speeds. The downforce doesn't really make a difference. It's just about you know, what's the turning circle of your car? Whereas when you're looking at Lesmo, especially Lesmo 1, it's actually much longer of a corner than you would initially think. You've got to turn in fairly early into the corner and then hope that your car, you know, the 
natural downfalls of your car can just get that front end turned in allow it to stick to the track and hold itself all the way around and once you get later and later into a stint those front tires just start to lose a little bit of bite and either you've got to slow it down a bit more otherwise that front end will just wash out that little bit more and you can lose so much time once you get onto the marbles yeah, that's a, it's a huge element of it as well. Just wanted to check in with our uh, GT4 uh, contenders here. The uh, the drivers here are making sure that they uh, get to the end. But they're, if you've just tuned in and if you're just joining us, this is a team of 12-year-old go-karters, and they're pretty much starting their endurance journey today. So this is a pretty much a baptism of fire for them. But they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, most of their lap times have been under two minutes, which is pretty ballpark figure for, for GT4s around Monza. But I think David Christie was saying it was getting so hectic in the first few hours that he was backing this team to win it overall. And uh, just to have a look at David Christie's bet, uh, they're leading their class at least, but, you know, predictably, with the class difference, they're a little bit away off the lead. And uh, I know when I first looked at the timing, how many GT4 cars do we have? It, it's, it's just Viaduct. It is just a Viaduct. Um, you know, they, they did the same thing in the Endurance World Championship last year in the hypercars, and it just means that they get to have a, you know, a nice time just trotting things out, getting used to the car as well, um, and then, you know, taking things up a level when they do want to challenge some of the other drivers in, in the faster car. I mean, back in the EWC last season, they were in the hypercars, which was the fastest, you know, the faster class of all four classes available to the drivers, and for Viaduct, and, you know, they're doing a decent job. They're ahead of a few of the GT3 drivers and to do that in a GT4 car definitely requires a, a fair amount of skill and pace. It does indeed and Viaduct and I believe translates from Danish as bucklings and uh, Ewan said uh, maybe if the rain falls they'll take to water like like ducks. Well it was a, it was it was a nice analogy he said it better than I ever could. Like a duck to water that's the way it goes isn't it? Duck but to water. It's, it's too late now it's gone. <laughs> I mean, I'd say like a fish to water, to be honest. I think they like water. Is it a, fr is it yeah, a duck to water? Is it How did we I get here? I think it was a fr I don't know. I just... I, I kind of did the thing where my mind just blanks, and then the next thing I heard is, you know, like a duck to water. I was, I was like, oh, yeah. Or a fish. And so... Um, I once had a conversation with, with another commentator, and he hadn't heard the term a kettle of fish before. So. Well, yeah, I mean, mm. I've heard yeah. of it, but, you know, that's not the point here. In, in his mind, he just thought it was like you were boiling some water with a, with fish inside it. And he, um, so, yeah, he, he didn't know that there was an <laughs> alternate meaning for, for the word kettle, which is, you know, I guess it's just a small container, like a bucket, really. <laughs> Yeah, this is no longer the uh, 12 Hour Monza, it's now the Sahel uh, and McGinley podcast. So, welcome to it. Uh, it's the very first episode, and we're talking about Kettler Fish for some reason. Uh, we forgot the race leader and the uh, front right hand side tyre as they make their way now past the number 51 car. So, your race leaders so far are the number 65, the, uh, the VRS satellite racing team. Uh, there were two entries for VRS, but unfortunately, their second entrant has since retired at the hands of of Jimmy Nasala uh, unfortunately had uh, some sort of issues out on track and unfortunately didn't make it to the end uh, or at least this far we've also had the number 23 the uh, G G SR team, uh, the team from Greece, or one of the teams from Greece, they had a hardware issue very early on into the race and had to call it a day unfortunately so those are your only two returns from the race so far just the two for now and we'll see whether any more retirements do come in you'd have to assume that there would be a fair few more retirements still got a fair amount of the race to go as Max Bunovic is closing on in to the 007 pros and Benleys now right on the tail on the exit of the Retifilio chicane and it's always a question, isn't it, in endurance racing? How hard do you want to fight? And with still quite a few hours remaining, you generally tend to think Prosim won't want to battle this too hard. But Pedro Ramada, 33 seconds down, there is definitely a margin for error or a margin for battling for both of these drivers. 
There will, and that's something you're going to have to uh, take into effect as well. In fact, we've got a battle for third place here. We've actually got an on-track battle. This is ProSim, uh, the 007, and the number 62 car of Unison Racing. Unison Racing getting into the back of the Bentley up ahead, going through the second Lesmo as they make their way through the curve at Del Seraglio. Underneath the old banking, they will go, and onwards towards Ascari. It's, I think it's very clear Unison want this position now. Well, when you look at their last lap times for Unison Sim Racing, they've been catching up hand over the fist. A 48-4 for Max Bunovic last time round, and for ProSim, a 49.4. Bunovic, one second quicker on the previous lap, and you'd have to think this is a matter of when, not if. It might be a case as the Unison car looking very ominous. Look at him closing in now through Parabolica. Always in towards the start finish straight. And this could be a chance then for the BMW. Uh, Max Vodovic then at the wheel of that one into the slipstream. You can see here the ProSim car trying to stay to the right hand side of the track, then moving slowly across to the racing line. They, of course, are allowed to do that. Will the car, will the BMW try and move up the inside? Thinking about it, but no way through so far. But oh, it hits him. Hits him, and around she goes. Oh, that's not what Unison Racing would have wanted to do. That's not what Max would have wanted. He's going to slow down and allow the ProSim car to get ahead, which might um, kind of make whatever penalty is coming his way somewhat more lenient. Entirely his own fault. You could just see him. He had a little look to the inside, then a look to the outside and couldn't decide which way he wanted to go. And at the end, just got a little bit too late on the brakes. I think he wanted to sell the old dummy and dive it down the inside at the last second, but he just clipped the rear end of the Bentley and uh, sent the ProSim car spinning. Yeah, we'll see if I can find a replay of that one just from the, because uh, we saw it on board. We saw the BMW get into the back then. Here we go then, down in towards the Retafilio chicane. As you said, Yusuf, he was go going left, going right, and then uh, just just clipped the back of him going in towards the Retafilio chicane. And most importantly, though, the Unison racing car has waited for him to take the position back. Yeah. And, and that's critical. It's, it's good to see, you know, mistakes happen in racing. They have, you know, it doesn't matter what racing series you look at, you will be seeing mistakes being made at some point. But good to see a bit of sportsmanship coming in for Max Bonovic. And, uh, well, we say sportsmanship, but at the end of the day, he just didn't want to get a penalty for, you know, uh, taking out another driver and gaining a position. He might still get a penalty on his way. You never know he because, do. you know, it, it will lessen the blow. It's sort of like the, uh, well, sometimes we call it the Aussie rules, don't we, really? Because you, you've given the position back, so therefore there might not be a penalty. But if the students deem it was a contact that was severe enough, uh, you know, or maybe missing the braking zone in an unacceptable way or something along those lines, then they may hand out the penalty anyway. It's, it's the kind of thing where it can go from a 30 second stop to a penalty to just a drive through. And I actually had this, you know, a very similar incident earlier on today in, in my own karting race where I sent a dive down the inside. We made a little bit of contact. I ended up, you know, squeezing him and there was a tire barrier. So he had to back out. And I just thought, I probably don't want to get the position like that. You know, slow down, let him back through. And then when I cross the start finish line the next lap, on the gantry on the the timing display it it gave my number and it gave me a warning and if i hadn't given that place back that would have definitely have been a black flag so it definitely saved me in that instance but um you still usually uh, you know at the very least you get a warning of some or, or something of the sort Absolutely, and uh, yeah, I'm sure the uh, stewards will be having a look at that one down towards the Retafilio chicane, and uh, just looking here, this still is the battle for third place between ProSim and uh, the number 62 Unison Racing, battling on the, sharing the same bit of track at almost the halfway distance of the Monza 12 hour. We'll see if the Unison car can find a way through. Now, considering the fact that it was a hefty whack that the Unison car mm. gave the uh, SimSport up ahead, there might be damage on either car, uh, you know, rear on the Bentley, front on the BMW. You know, how's that going to affect the aero, especially on the BMW behind? Actually, that's a very good point. Um, there should almost be certainly a little bit of aero damage, but I'm just trying to think about the, the time in the place where that contact occurred, because it was towards the end of the braking phase, like right at the end of the braking phase down into turn one. So... I think if there was any contact, it would have been at fairly low speed. So I don't think it was 
too much contact. I think it was just the case of the contact occurred when that Bentley was fully loaded on the brakes. And once the car is fully loaded, if it does get, if it does take a, a bit of a tap, you know, to one side or the other, it becomes very hard to be able to catch the car because it's already fully loaded. The weight's all on one side of the car. And I think that's why the Bentley went around rather, rather than it being, you know, a hard hit. You just saw how close that BMW came once again to the back of the Bentley going through in towards the Retafilio chicane. And I think it's pretty clear to see the Unison Racing Team want this position going now. They want this position. They've already been in the war slightly today, but going through in towards the Roger chicane, still trying to find the way past. They might see if they can try and move around the outside in towards the Lesmos. No, backing out of that one, probably a wise decision. When we're thinking about places where you can overtake, you're looking at the heavy braking zones, and that's down into the first and the second chicane, the Retifilio and the Roger chicane. It's hard to get a move down into Lesmo 1 just because you don't have enough of a run after the chicane to get a move off. You could also look down into Ascari if you can get a good run out of Lesmo 2, but it usually requires a mistake from the car ahead. And as long as the ProSim car doesn't make that mistake, the Unison Racing car will have to sit in behind. They'll want to tuck into the slipstream on the start finish straight and look for a move down into turn one but this time around maybe not hit the prosim car well that's the plan isn't it they'll want to try and get this move done cleanly as they now make their way up towards parabolica and the unison racing team want to get this move done max budovic in the wheel of this one going through parabolica now on towards the start finish straight and once again the prosim team will have to be looking in the mirrors here as they make their way down towards the retifilio chicane we've already seen the bmw can close in at a rate of knots once it's in that slipstream down in towards this heavy braking zone let's see what happens this time i don't think think this time around that the uh, the unison racing team is going to have quite the momentum it did in towards the first couple of corners but i gotta say that bmw is pretty good on its brakes there the, the team are pretty confident they can break later than than the bentley in front and i'm not quite sure what the you know the top speed are the top speeds are of each cars um I would have to imagine that the Bentley is fairly good in a straight line. I don't know if the BMW is quicker, but we do see this from time to time in, in GT racing. I know the Musto drivers were complaining about this somewhat back in Sebring, I think in the Endurance Racing World Championship, where I think, I'm trying to remember now, they're in the BMW, and they were just talking about how it was either the Porsches or the Aston Martins were just so fast in a straight line that even though they were, you know, over half a second a lap quicker, they couldn't find a way through because... Well, the Porsches just park it on the apex, you know, they don't have to go fast through the corners, and then you just absolutely slap the throttle down on the straight. And, well, if you're the car behind, you're not going to be able to find a way through, and setup can also play a part of that if you are running a low downfall setup relative to what could be a high downfall setup for the BMW and Unison guys. And it um, is one of those those things where you have to look sector by sector. Sector one, very low downfall sector. And, you know, whichever car has a higher top speed will usually get a quicker sector time. Whereas sector two and three, especially sector two, much more to, much more favoured towards uh, the higher downforce cars. Once again then, this is the BMW, the Unison Racing Team, trying to close in using a little bit of slipstream as well as uh, oh, we've got one of the fastest drones I think ever on top of these two cars. Uh, so we make our way down towards the Retifida chicane, still no way through then for the BMW and I think uh, coming in there, I thought he was going to understeer actually but he didn't, uh, making his way through now and yeah, bit of, a, bit of a stalemate between the two of them now because we've already seen the Unison Racing car make that little bit of contact and now they're a bit more cautious about trying to find a way past so that might take a little bit of a sting out of the attack for the unison racing team there's an age-old saying once bitten twice shy and uh, once you've made that little mistake you know he's given the position up he hasn't got a penalty for it but if he tries to go for the same move and he makes the same mistake again even if he lets gives the position back there's a chance that he won't get away with that at all that's the back end stepping out through lesmo one for max bunovic and right now he needs to work out where does he want to get the job done. He's had some laps to size up the Prosim car ahead of him. And maybe the team are just telling him, look, Max, save some fuel. It's fine. Save your tires. 
We'll do an alternate pit strategy. We'll get him in the pit, in the pit, uh, in the pit stop phase, and you know that's also a very reasonable solution in endurance racing. It's a very reasonable solution, but it's not the solution the driver wants to hear. They'll, they'll want no. to hear you can make this move out on track. That will be the <laughs> ultimate, you know, satisfaction yep. of getting the move done. But it might have to be a case of they'll have to out strategize the Bentley ahead. But yeah, as a driver, you want this position on track. You want to earn it. And now coming out of Parabolica, that BMW is a lot closer than it has been the previous two laps. Absolutely. And let's see if he can get the draft off the Bentley and get the move done into turn one. He's pretty much right on the rear. Well, no, there's about a couple of car lengths between the two of them. One of the best things you can, get, you can do going down into turn one is using the old diagonal braking. You get the hypotenuse of the triangle. It means you can brake a little bit later and it also means you can stuff it right down the inside of the car ahead. And I think that's what Max Bunovic is going to have to do if he wants to get the move done on track. Do that either into turn one or down into the second chicane, which we will be approaching momentarily. We will indeed, and seeing if Bunovic can get that car past. But at the moment, you've got to say that the ProSim drivers are doing a good job, but they run slightly deep into the first part of the Roger chicane, and that's going to open up the attack here from the BMW, heading away in towards the Lesmos here. Again, a little bit of contact Ooh. made between the two of them as we follow our way through the first Lesmo, now in towards the second Lesmo. And yeah, that ProSim car, whoever's behind the wheel, made a slight error of judgment going in towards the Roger chicane, ran slightly too deep and it compromised the second part now the bmw here is in the slipstream as they make their way on towards the old banking underneath it they will go and again the bmw tries to look left has to then go right in towards ascari on the outside here not normally an overtaking opportunity and slightly goes off the track but the unison racing cars got the move done tail end comes out he's got but he's back. got the move done so far but as you say the bentley's coming back Bentley's got the cutback and Max Bunovic are running a little bit too deep through Ascari and now that Bentley grunt is going to be able to drag him ahead of the Unison racing car. He's ahead down into Parabolica and for Max Bunovic it's about getting the exit out of Parabolica because that Prozim car had to take a tight entry but it just takes too much speed. And Max Bunovic loses the rear end. He's going to have to do that all again. Fantastic defending, fantastic racing from the pair of them. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, this is far from done, this battle. That is for sure. That's one thing we could be certain of. Down in towards the Retafilio chicane. And what's great is as well, you see, this is the battle for the last podium position at the halfway point in this race. Absolutely. And uh, Max Bunovic is just looking a little bit tentative now. I don't think he ever wanted to get the move done into the Lesmo. I think anyone who's watched the Formula One race and saw the incident with Lewis Hamilton through the Lesmo back in, I think it was 2010, will know that looking for the move there is not a smart decision. But what you can do is put the driver ahead and make the driver ahead take a defensive line. That will compromise their exit and then you can get the better run coming out of the Lesmo just like Max Bunovic did and look for a move down into Ascari, which Max Budovic got off, but he compromised his exit slightly, and the Bentley was able to use that superior engine power to get back ahead down into the Parabolica. The thing is as well, the Bentley punch is probably the biggest hole in the air of all the cars that are racing here. So Very where it's true. got the grunt, it's also creating this big pocket of air that the BMW is just able to slip into. And so the BMW's engine doesn't have to work as hard as the Bentley. So kind of a compromise here, but oh, a little bit out of shape coming through the second part of Ascari then was the Unison racing car. Managed to gather it up though, but that could have been a good bit of momentum used there because the Bentley was a little bit shy going through there. You know what we were saying, Kieran, about whether someone had told Max Bunovic, you know, okay, keep it chill, we'll get them in the pits. I don't think they've told that to him, or if they have, Max has told them, well, I don't care, I want to get this move done on track. And there's a little bit of a pride that always exists. When you're behind someone in an endurance race, usually you want to get the move done before pitting. That way you can have the last laugh. And even if they're still right on your tail, if you come into the pits, it's a kind of, haha, I got you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, that's going to be one of those, isn't it? But for now, we're being treated to this fantastic battle for third place as the Unison Racing 62 still draws into the back of the 007 of the Pro Sim car as they make their way now through the Curva Grande. And as you say, the Bentley Power able to get them away from the BMW, but as I previously said, it's punching a massive hole in the air, the biggest hole in the air that Monza's ever seen, down now in towards the Roger Chicane. And the BMW closing in on the brakes as a sort of counteraction there 
And the BMW, I think, is slightly lighter car, so should be able to get onto the brakes a little bit later. Don't forget, though, Max Bunovic, when he was in clear air, when he was catching up to the ProSim car, he was going a second a lap quicker. He's clearly the faster driver. We don't know if there was a little bit of damage picked up by either of these two when they did make their contact five or six laps ago. But right now, it's just a straight-up dogfight between the pair of them. What we do know is that Bentley ever so slightly quicker in a straight line. And when they're side-by-side, side, when they're having a drag race, the Bentley will come out on top. For Max Bunovic, he needs to get a good run. He needs to tuck in behind the Bentley before he can pull alongside. And he might have just got that run as we approach the Parabolica. Might do indeed. He's looking for a move then. Might go round the outside going in towards Parabolica then as we make our way through. The Bentley's got the inside line, but there you can see the BMW gets the position momentarily, but will run wide on the exit of Parabolica and the Bentley will have the inside line to get back onto the power. Not done yet though. This BMW is going to come back at him. But is this what Max Bunovic, is this what Max Bunovic, once he took the wider line, he forced Bentley to take the defensive line. This should mean that he gets a better exit. He's tucked in behind the Bentley once again. Prosim goes somewhat defensive and Bunovic is forced to slot in behind. He's getting closer and closer to getting the move done, but he just needs that little bit more. Just a little bit more. He's got the right idea. Just didn't quite work this time around. The Bentley was well matched to what uh, Budovic was trying there. However, you know, you don't want to show too many cars as how to try and overtake because they'll get wise to it. You've got to try and have that element of surprise as well that catches somebody out. If you try and do it over and over again, might not work the best, but oh. still that BMW is all over the back of that diffuser. And look at that old Alpine GT car, just trying to get well out of the way. It looks so out of place, you know, singular color, no real sponsorship on it, and looks like about half the size of these GT3 monsters. Does, doesn't it? But uh, getting well out of the way, doesn't want to be anywhere near this battle right now, focusing on their own race, and rightfully so. They'll just want to stay away. They won't want to provoke the bear at all, but riding on board then with Max Budovic here as he makes his way through Ascari once again, and the two drivers here are really just throwing everything and the kitchen sink at this one for the Bentley for defending, the BMW for attacking. And there are no back markers that they can approach. No back markers that could be helping Max Bunovic out even slightly. And down into Parabolica this time. The Bentley well and truly ahead. And no chance for Unison to, well, force the Pro Sim car to take, um, you know, a bad line. But this time around for Max Bunovic, he doesn't go sideways. That's kind of been his trademark over the last few laps. Losing the rear end and maybe this time down into turn one, he can look for a dive bomb. He might be able to in towards the red to Filio chicane. He looks to the right-hand side, gets very close to the grass. But again, the Bentley plants the car in the middle of the track. So really, there's nowhere through for the BMW that time around. So the BMW can't find a move up the inside that he wanted. So again, it's good defensive driving from the ProSim team here. And ProSim doing everything they have to. For Unison uh, Racing, they are absolutely livid because, actually, let's just take a look. How much has Pedro Ramada in that 51 Ramada Motorsports car caught up? Well, actually, he's had to make a pit stop. So the next uh, car behind these two is Valadis Carales in the number 14 GSR Team Aston. And they are over a lap and down. So no worries for Max and Prosim at the moment. But when they do make their stop, Pedro Ramada might have gained, you know, you know, over 10 seconds, and that wouldn't even be a stretch. Yeah, as well as that, though, what this means is, is although they're losing time to the car behind, who's on, you know, a lap behind these two, the car ahead is almost a minute ahead now. Second place, a minute up the road for these two. So this is what can happen, the knock-on effect of trying to get that position as you lose touch with everybody else in front of you. But once again, the Unison Racing car wants this move done. And the Bentley, the 007, He's just planting the car in the middle of the track. Oh, no, got to the oh. grass. Onto the grass goes the BMW, and then both off at Parabolica. And you called it. One wheel on the grass for Max Bunovic, and the rear end steps out. It's not even wet on the grass, but Max Bunovic has been trying to use up all of the track, and this time just gets one wheel onto the grass. He's going to dive on into the pits. The Bentley will stay out, so you have to presume that Prosim do not have any damage. But either Max Bunovic has 
some damage or the team have told him to bring it on in and just get a chance to calm himself down. That might be a case as well, but again, just a wheel onto the grass and around it went and just nowhere for the Bentley, no way to react for the Bentley either. And also stopping slightly short of the pit box as well, had to accelerate again just to make sure the uh, the pit crew started to work there. So yeah, not great at all, but now into the pit lane, probably to assess some damages and probably a stern talking to from his team. And I don't even think the Bentley came across him in the braking zone, he was just right behind the Bentley and yeah, I think, oh, just, you know, one wheel on the grass and, and that was it. It was, yeah, it was one wheel on the grass and then you're just not stopping a car that's spinning out of control and the Bentley just absolutely an innocent bystander in that one. But managing to get away with it, again, one of it handed the position back once again, but then came into the pit lane. And for uh, the 0070, that's two moments now they've been, uh, you know, hit up the rear by the same car. And I think yeah. now it will just be the time to sort of refocus. Whoever's at the wheel of that car will be hugely frustrated as the uh, Corvette ahead of the Bentley goes for a little bit of off-roading at Ascari there. But that's going to be our main thing is making sure that the Bentley driver keeps the cool as well. And after that first contact occurred between the two, you know, whoever was at the wheel of the Pro Sim car, you know, would have been a little bit upset, got given the position back and kind of accepting, yeah, it's racing, it happens, even when you're, you know, um, even when you've got the helmet on, when you're behind the wheel of the car, yeah, you're a bit annoyed, but you understand that when it happens a second time, that's when you're, you know, telling your team to go to the stewards and um, asking for a penalty to be dished out. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the other Unison racing car that was caught up in trouble over at uh, Dari then. Just really harmless, just missing the, uh, the breaking point there and just decided to straight lining it instead and uh, making sure that they just make the corner. If they couldn't, then just make sure you don't hit the wall. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Dennis uh, Eschchenko at the wheel of the 717 Unison racing car, the, the second car. And uh, with a name like Eschenko at the end, I would presume that is Ukrainian. Glad you've presumed that, Yusuf. You sounded pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just going off football, right? You know, the, the Ukrainian national team, um, there was a fair amount of, of Shenkos. So um, it's, it's how, you know, I always remember some of the teams. Like, you know, you always get the, um, like, the, the guards, you know, it's Denmark and uh, the Swedish, you get um, like Larsen and um, the Sens at the end, right? Sure, yes. <laughs> I'll let you talk, Yusuf. You, you, <laughs> you have a lot of confidence in me yeah. right now, don't you? No, not at all, not at all. That's why I'm letting you talk. It's quite funny that way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I am my own worst enemy. I will not lie to you on that one. Yeah. I reckon I could do worse, but don't worry about that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the grey clouds in the sky, still very ominous. Oh, look at the spit of flames from the side of the Corvette as well. I was talking yesterday about how the rear wing looks pretty good on the back of that car, but the flames out of the side, that's just adding up and adding up. This is a great little car here. Honestly, that Alpine is, uh, is chucking it around. It, it just, like, I don't mean anything bad by it, but... It just looks so out of place. You've got all these monster GT3 cars, and then there's this little Alpine just like flying around. It's it's like if I take my Kia Picanto one day for a track day, and you know th there'll be some hatchbacks, there'll be some cool looking cars, and then there'll be like my little car going around. And that's what this Alpine feels. You know, it's in <laughs> it's in a world of its own. It's just enjoying some time on the track to itself. You know, it's it's just a good day for whoever's at the wheel of the viaduct in car. And I'm not surprised, you know, unfortunately the only GT4 entrant, but, you know, it's their first time really endurance racing in a 12 hour as well. It's a great experience to have, but every single other car on the track is, is bigger. It's got more aero, it's got more engine power. It is just menacing to have those cars in the rear view mirror. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I do have to, to criticize the color scheme somewhat, you know, Viaduct can usually go with their bright orange livery, makes it very easy, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, there's a Viaduct in car, but now, you know, it's, it's more of a metallic orange, which I think overall looks better on the car, but, you know, it just feels like Viaduct have lost some of their, you know, has have lost what made them iconic. 
essentially. Here, and we but, might get a little bit of a replay coming up as well with the uh, with the 007 Unison. Here it is then. So making our way now up towards Parabolica. So uh, this will be where we dip the two wheels onto the grass on the left-hand side. We're looking to try and take the racing line, pushing the limits and just a little bit too far. And collects the back of the Bentley there. And I didn't actually see if the Bentley hit the wall. I don't think the Bentley hit the wall when it was spinning around there. I think you got away with that one. Yeah, and that's um, the crucial part that you don't hit the wall. We talked about that already before. So you hit the wall, it's just so much more damage. But I think... Is that going to be a perfect time for us to throw to a commercial break? Might be, it might be, and uh, as Yusuf said, we'll hand over to a commercial break and we'll see you on the other side of these messages. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot. Fleet Gaming. ESTV and Motorvision.tv A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. back then to the GTR 24H 12 hours of Monza and if you have just tuned in now you've missed a, a battle for third that may have slightly ended in tears you may have just seen before we went to the commercial break that uh, the number 62 the Unison racing car did receive a drive-through penalty has now served that penalty is back out out on track but a moment into the grass a bit of indecisiveness 
got onto the grass under braking, spun around, and there was nowhere for the Bentley to go. No, just an innocent bystander, the 007 there. But it, what that means now, Yusuf, it means that everyone's sort of spaced out out on track again. We had a great battle until pit stops got, the, got in the way, and unfortunately that battle ended the way it did. Yeah, and we're at that stage now where we don't quite know who's got how many more stops to go, if people are running slightly longer with their stint. What I have on my screen is that Ryan Nash is leading the race currently for VRS at Satellite Racing in the 65 car. Then it's further, then it is 22 seconds to the ProSim car, followed by 15 seconds to Christopher Kianek in the 33 Mugen Sim Racing car. And then you've got Valadis Carales in the 14. And that is the GSR team as and they're a lap down though on the top three. They are indeed, and what that means then is that the Pro 7 team are now in second place. We have seen a pit stop for, as you say, the top two in this one, so that puts them slightly down the order, and that puts Pro 7 up into second place. But there you can see then the uh, the number 14 now has moved up into fourth place, having the uh, the uh, Unison team making a pit stop and also serving a drive through as well. So they are going to be slightly down the order, slightly further down the order than they may be expected, and of course are one and only GT4 competitor the Viaducton team running around there in the Alpine as uh, Yusuf said it looks a little out of place but uh, it's, uh, I can guarantee you the team's having a lot of fun out there maybe at some point when we've got some time we can just have a nice onboard lap with them a chance just to, um, to chill but um, I have a feeling that GSR Team Aston, whoever is the boss of the team, maybe the drivers, maybe all of them, they might be starting to get a little bit hot under the collar because Nikolai Bezrikov is less than 10 seconds behind them and judging by his pace, he'll probably, he will probably be over a second a lap faster than them. So give it 10 minutes and he will be right on the back of that number 14 car and well we saw what happened when Nikolai Bezrukov was behind the 007 ProSim car that was a battle for position this will be a battle for P4 yeah, so another battle that the Unison team would be a part of and we know that the drivers there they've got are quick drivers but a couple of mistakes there from yep. Benevic and it's led them to be slightly further down the order now a drive through here costs you, you know, roughly 20 to 22 seconds depending on whether when you hit the pit speed limiter and how you approach this Monza pit lane which is yeah. really really difficult you I mean you're coming off the exit of Parabolica and then you're straight onto the anchors try not to lock the brake to make it to this 60 kilometers an hour pit lane speed limit line it's a really really tough one to slow that car down in time but I'm actually genuinely surprised I might have to be corrected if I'm wrong but there have been no penalties for speeding in the pit lane that's that's bonkers to me because it's such a difficult pit lane to enter and the one endurance race I did here, uh, I sped into the bit lane, got my team a nice um, 30 second drive through penalty, or it was a drive through penalty, I can't remember which, uh, best bet was as well, I was jumping out of the car, so it's my teammate who had to serve it, which was, um, which was fantastic to say the least. I bet he, uh, I bet he was thrilled with that one. Uh, he absolutely loved it because the means that there were means go going as well because our previous endurance race i came into the pits i actually got my pit lane entry right but then i forgot that i was the one who had to put fuel into the car so my teammate went out with about one lap of fuel remaining and he just i just heard um you know 10 seconds later you surf is there only supposed to be like five liters of fuel in the car i'm like no Maybe. That's our Maybe. new strategy. You see, you were thinking on the fly for a new yeah, strategy. Light fuel, right? Go get a fastest lap, then you can come back in the pits. That's how it works. That's how it works. That's, that's so clear, the strategy, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know why my team had an issue, to be honest. I, I, I thought it was fantastic, but... Um, well, they keep the having it back, so... <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I wasn't at fault for, for the team because that teammate, he served the drive through then he made an excuse of, oh, he has to go fast to, climb, to like claw back up the order. He proceeded to um, ca claw his way through the order, but um, made a few bump and passes along the way and picked up about two black flags and got us disqualified from the race. It was, yeah, it was, it was a race to forget. It was a race to forget, but not because of you. That's bizarre. Yeah. That's bizarre. 
Imagine forgetting to fuel up the car and uh, that yeah. not being the highlight of the race weekend. <laughs> that sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh well. Uh, I, I can say uh, I've only really, I haven't really dabbled in endurance racing, maybe in, maybe in motorsport, in, in carts, but, you know, uh, we'll have to wait and see, uh, you know, I'm, I'm normally one of the slower ones, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. We've got a new incident report then for, uh, for car 00762 there, Yusuf. Yeah, and uh, I'm just trying to take a look, see what has come through. Um... I've only got the one for Car 62, which I think we already talked about, which was the drive-through after the contact between Unison Racing and um, uh, Proson for a break. Oh it's, for oh. The, oh, it's for the Parabolica. So that, so the Ooh. original drive-through was for at the Retifido Chicane. Now they're investigating the one at Parabolica. Now that's getting an interesting one because. Yeah. Because the, he was not in control of the car, he was on the gr he got onto the grass. So I, yeah. I'm assuming another penalty is coming their way. If if the first one was a penalty, the second one is absolutely a penalty. Yeah, you know, I could have seen Max getting away with the first one with just you know a slap on the wrist, like, yeah, don't do that again. But that's going to be another drive through. It's a 30 second stop go penalty. That's a That's tough one. Pleasant. That's a tough one for the team to take. Uh, you know, both barrels within five minutes as well with the, the penalties coming through. So, yeah, they're, so they're going to have to stop the car for 30 seconds and they won't be allowed to work on the car and then they'll yep. have to leave again. So they won't be able to work on that car at all. They have to serve that within the next three laps. And it's just adding insult to injury, you know, because the call has come relatively late from the stewards. Like, it hasn't come within, you know, one or two laps. So the chances are Unison Racing probably thought they got away with that first contact. And then for the two penalties to come through, like right after the spin as well, it's going to really hurt them. And, uh, well, I think if Max had fire in his eyes before, I think his whole point is going to be on fire when he heads back on out onto circuit. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And for, you know, Unison Racing, they, it's, they've been hit with both barrels of a penalty there. You know, they've had yep. the drive through. Then it's come through that the the second one, that the parabolic has now been penalised as well. And it sort of, it almost feels like that scaling one because the, the yeah. Instances have happened so close together that now they've got quite a you know it's one of the harshest penalties you can have in terms of how much time you lose not in the sense of what the decision is it's it's you know 30 second stop and go penalty is one of the toughest penalties around before you know the drivers and the team start to be under review themselves yeah. uh, there's um race control i've actually just confirmed that the reason why the call has been late is because um, they, they're essentially waiting for an incident to be reported. Race control will not investigate any incidents unless it is reported by the drivers themselves. Unless, you know, there's there's a driver who's like weaving across the track and, you know, going to cause absolute carnage, then the race control can decide to jump in. But if there's usually contact between two drivers, race control will wait until um, the incident is submitted by a team, you know, with video footage. So if the side of, or I say if the side, if ProSim, you know, just held back, waited a bit of time before submitting that video, that would be why it came through so, so late the decision. Absolutely right. And then it's the steward's decision then to you know, apply the penalty and, you yeah. know, it's up to them how they go about it. They'll review the decision, obviously, and, and come to that conclusion, which the conclusion is they've decided to drive through and the 30 second stop and go penalty is the decision there for in terms of penalties for the team. So that's going to put them way, way down the order, isn't it? Because now they have to make another pit stop, which pretty much takes the length of time in the pit lane, give or take 20 seconds but they won't be allowed to do anything to the car yep and he's going to be coming in this time around he's holding it nice and tight through parabolica which it's usually a signal that he's about to pit don't speed into the pit lane don't make matters even worse for yourself and for the team you're in p4 you've still got a few hours to go in the race you can still come back on in with just over five and a half hours remaining and currently that 62 car sitting in P5. He's going to drop behind Denis uh, Eschenko. But that's his unison teammate. So if he does catch up, uh, he won't have to find a way through the hard way. 
There they are then in the pit lane now, just to serve that 30 second stop and go penalty. So I think one of the one of the worst things and worst feelings in the world is when you're stuck in the pit lane with a penalty and you hear yeah. the other engines going past you. It oh. must be a nightmare. You must be feeling, oh God, I just, it, it's the longest 30 seconds ever. It, the worst is, it gives you a time and a chance to reflect on your actions, really, because you don't have anything to distract you and your mind just instantly wavers over to that incident, you know, what could you have done differently? Why did you make that mistake? Or, you know, sometimes it's, what, what on earth are those stewards thinking about? In this case, the stewards were 100% right, you know. I don't think Max can have any complaints that he was at fault for those incidents. Maybe he'll think, oh, no, no, not a 30-second drive. This should have only been a drive through But he knows that he's at fault. He knew there was a penalty coming for it. And well, he can just sit and think about it now. The other thing is that the, the driver that got the 30 second stop and go penalty isn't in the car right now because it's oh, yeah, Nikolai uh, yeah. Bezrikov. So Bezrikov's sitting there for 30 seconds, probably thinking, oh, what? <laughs> My teammate's an idiot. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not going to say Mate, that. We won't but, go that far. Yeah. yeah, we won't go that far. We won't go that far. But yeah, he's it's, probably it's sitting there thinking, teammate. it wasn't my fault. <laughs> It's what my teammates thought about me, right, when, when I forgot to put a fuel in the car. No way. No. I mean, my excuse was like, you know, when, when a driver comes into the pits, does he get out and, you know, put in the nozzle and start filling out, out of his car? No, the mechanics do that. I don't think I need to fill up fuel. Oh, we were talking like... earlier about how to be a complete sim racer. You've got to be on yeah. the fuel as well. That's, that's just yeah. the way it goes. And on some sim rigs, you or on some simulations, you have to change your tire pressures. You've got to select the different set of tires. It's all done from the driver's side, not from the engineer's side. So, thankfully, here at Monza, you've got quite a few straights. You know, three straights at the very least, four if you include Curva Grande, and uh, that gives you a fair amount of time to be able to make some changes. But if you were racing at somewhere like Zandvoort. A lot less time to be able to make those adjustments. Absolutely, and there is the 007, the Pro Sim team coming into the pit lane, and it looks like they're straight onto the tyres to change that one. Also, the Corvette in the pit lane. I think that's going to be the 717, driven by Denis Eschenko in the other, the sister Unison racing car. At the moment, though, it is, of course, the number 65 car leading the way, the VRS satellite racing team. There they go now, making their way through the second Lesmo, and to be honest with you, they've been looking pretty good all race long. They haven't really made Made any mistakes they obviously had that moment where one of the cars ran out of fuel during qualifying and they, you know, they were pushing back to the pit lane which is absolutely against the rules and regulations for uh, GTR 24 hour they were penalised for that, at least the team were. They were running two cars. One of them has since had to drop out of the race, so they've got the sole number 65 in the race. And at the moment, Yusuf, it's leading the way. I didn't realise that there was a case of fuel running out. It always seems to happen in GTR 24 hours that one of the teams will run out of fuel or there's always a case of one driver pushing another driver. It happened in the EWC, I think, in the last round where um, a team, you know, pushed their teammate to, to the pits. Um, it happened in the Endurance Racing World Championship last season. Um, one of my favourite incidents of all time, which was um, to two of the uh, the team rookie monsters cars so this was um, an lmp2 and a gt3 car kieran and what the lmp2 car did is he pushed the gt3 car around for the gt3's hot lap and uh, down the molsan straight i think the gt3 car gained over a second on each straight just from that push Oh, we're just looking at that ominous weather radar and you can see it's covered in green rain is imminent yep at the moment so watch out for those uh, windscreens there we're riding on board then with the second place team the number 33 car the Mugen Sim Racing driven at the moment by Christopher Kianek so we're expecting this rain to hit any moment now yeah. that's not well, ominous at all is it <laughs> yeah it, it, it didn't happen you know I thought that was a counter and now the rain just like suddenly checks out but from what we were told it was 7pm um, and that's 7pm European time so that's 35 minutes from now. Ooh, that's Ooh, the I... That's the 33 off. Oh no. 
off at the Roger chicane. It looks like it just took too much curb, unsettled the car, and it went around. Slight kiss of the wall there. We'll get a replay on board of what happened there. It's coming up towards the Roger chicane then. Too much speeding. Yeah, hit the oh. curb on the second part. And that unsettled the car completely. Ooh. That's the, the right rear clip, the Armco Barry that's sticking out. That's what spun it around um, at the end. But yeah, just took too much curb through the left. It unsettled the car. And then the back end just decided to say, see you later, through the right-hander. And well, for Christopher Kianik, he'll be hoping there's not too much damage to his Audi. But I fear that there might be a little bit. And there is, there's definite is damage there to the Audi. Yeah. Oh, actually, can we quickly get an on board and see if he's pulling? Yeah, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. There you go. That, That'll be why then. That's probably a rear tail link broken. Um, you know, it's probably just meaning that one of the wheels is just pointing outwards and he's going to have to bring that car in ASAP. And if it rains in five minutes time, it's going to make that incident even worse. It is indeed, but coming now into the pit lane, 60 kilometers per hour. It's a very, very slow pit lane, but yeah, that is not good then. So a bit of steering damage, possibly suspension as well, that'll need to be half, either the team will have to have a look at, make sure they see yep. if they can fix that up as much as possible. Well, and that's going to be a long stop. Whatever damage that is looks fairly serious and the way the sim works from what I'm aware is, is it's not like, you know, real life where if, if you had a bit of damage to the rear, you know, you'd have to take off the wheel, you know, replace whatever part, put the wheel back on. It's just a case of severe damage takes this long to fix. Non-severe damage takes a lot less time to fix. So as long as it's severe, which that looks to be, he's going to be in the pits for a while. Be indeed, so yeah, we'll have to wait and see how long he's in the pit lane for, and I'll see if I can sort of track back and see what happened there. So, from because uh, we saw it from the onboard, but I'll see if we can get a little bit of a better angle and uh, see if we can get some TV cameras on that one. Yeah. Now, just taking a look at the uh, timing sheet because we did see that Christopher Kianik... Okay, Christopher Kianik has just made his pit stop, and he is now seven seconds behind the ProSim car. And uh, for Christopher Kianik... Oh, pardon me, Christopher... Yeah, sorry, what am I talking about? I thought... I just forgot Christopher Kianik was the one who went into the wall. That's why he, he pitted. Never mind, ignore me. I thought we were going to have a battle for a second, but that is not the case the case at least for now anyway uh, we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out I'm sure it will play out in the end and uh, let me see I'm just uh, just uh, making sure I get the right camera so we can see just from a static camera because uh, obviously uh, a little, little bit of TV cameras there's a little bit of obstruction so making his way now in towards the second Roger a little bit of a clip of the curb and yet yeah, the back end goes around so and yeah, it's almost like he tried to correct it, and that made it worse as well, because it went side on, and for a car to go side on, it's that's not the part of the car that's meant to absorb that kind of impact. Yeah, um, I don't think any car is really meant to absorb that kind of impact. Maybe, you know, um, no, just don't think any car, really. Um, I think all cars kind of want to stay away from the walls. Um, they don't want to be making any contact whatsoever, unless that's maybe with a sponge, if you want to give it a bit of a clean and make it a little bit shinier, perhaps. Absolutely, but uh, at the moment then, they've been in the pit lane for more than two minutes so far in this race. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, they're going to be a bit frustrated about that one. It's one of those, it's such an easy mistake to make as well. You know, the Roger chicane, we've already spoken about the slip and police from both the Roger chicane and at the Retafilio. If you don't respect them, they will bite back. And that's one of the best examples we've seen so far this weekend. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of incident that can throw your race down the drain, you know, the 33 car. Mugen Sim Racing were on course for finishing second or third. And, well, now they're probably going to drop behind Denis Eschenko, which means that Unison Racing will be up to P3 and P4. And maybe they could even hunt down Purison to make it a two Unisons on the top three spots. Yeah, and the, the top two drivers at the moment out there. You know, you've got the... Uh, the Mugen Sim Racing there in 
uh, sorry, ProSim there in second place, the 007, and then it is your race leaders in the uh, number 65 there, the VRS Satellite Racing. So they're separated at the moment by roughly 28 seconds out on track. You can see roughly where they are out on circuit, the race leader making their way out of the second less mode. Meanwhile, now that's the uh, ProSim car making their way uh, on towards the... Uh, I'm a little confused about that one because that's uh, a bit misleading. Yeah. Confusing? <laughs> I need to, I, I'll need to try something because I don't think they're in sync at the moment. <laughs> I think uh, one of the cameras are on replay and it might be mine, so that might be a reason why. Well, I mean, I'm always, you know, trying to fiddle work out which camera to bring up, but while we do have this lull, this is probably a good point th to throw to a commercial break. We're at the half hour. And there are five and a half hours remaining in our 12 hours of Monza. So stay tuned. We'll be back momentarily. The GTR 24H 12 hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot. Fleet Gaming. ESTV. And... Motorvision.tv A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. folks to do the 12 hours of Monza here with GTR 24H. We are six and a half hours in and we have been told that there's rain coming which means Ewan has decided to return to us. Ewan, you excited to see some rain? 
I am excited to see some rain, yeah, but we've been promised it for hours and it's never come. So uh, finally, maybe the promises will be realised because that radar does look like a kid's drawing, doesn't it, really? It's, there's colours everywhere. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised there isn't rain. I mean, just take a look at this. We've been so lucky for so long. There's been so much rain in the area and now it should be absolutely biblical, but still we're not here. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very surprised, but I am looking forward to some rain, yeah. It's, you know, Mons has just been swallowed up by clouds, but it's been the eye of the storm for a while. And we'll have to see if there is some rain coming. And one team that would probably want some rain is the 33 of Mugen Sim Racing, who had a little bit of an off. And by a little bit of an off, we mean they spun, they hit the wall through the Roger Chicane. They had to come into the pits. They were there for a few minutes, and they dropped from P3 all the way down the order and down to P4. Seen some highlights on his screen right now, by the way, of things that have happened in the last 90 minutes. I'm pretty sure that uh, the crash for Mugen is going to be on there, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, for now, things are going fine for them on the highlights. Yeah, there's been a couple of retirements in the last hour, haven't there? There's been, or the last 90 minutes, should I say. There's been Ramada Motorsport who have pulled out now because, uh, well, Pedro Ramada said that he was. Uh, getting a bit ill, so he decided not to carry on anymore. Okay. And it looks like Unison Racing, the 717 anyway, is going to be uh, retired as well now because they've all left Team Speak and their car's in the garage, so it's not looking too promising for them either. And I think that would make Romada Motorsport our fourth retiree or our fourth retirement of the race. We had the 23 of GSR retire first, then we had the 74 Deuces Motorsport retire, Zaba Kiss was at the wheel, then Jimmy Nissela in the 64, that was a VRS satellite racing car. Their teammates, the sister of VRS satellite racing car, are currently leading the race. And now Pedro Ramada also retiring for Ramada Motorsport. Yeah, it's a shame that uh, so many cars have uh, dropped out, but I, I guess it's bound to happen in an endurance race. We're not all bound to get to the end, I suppose. And so, uh, so yeah, that, that kind of thing, uh, it does tend to happen. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, how many are there still left? I think seven cars maybe left? I can't, I can't count. But, uh, not but anyway. a huge amount. No, <laughs> no, I know. Uh, with the with all the retirements. Uh, there's probably going to be some uh, some highlights of the battle between the Bentley and the BMW in a minute, which I'm looking forward to, but oh. uh, we're not quite there yet because it was quite recently. Honestly, for, for the highlights of that, you could just throw in about 10 minutes of raw footage unedited, just just throw it in uh, it was some great battling between the two of them but if you want to potentially see some live battling Christopher Kianek recovering from his uh, previous incident with a certain wall at the exit of the Roger Chicane is now 10 seconds behind Stavros uh, Muzaidis in the number 14 GSR team Aston and as I say that there's a replay of that incident for in the battle for P2 yeah, they got two penalties for uh, two incidents se separately, didn't they? I think uh, the one on the grass was the most spectacular down towards Parabolica, but they got uh, a penalty for both of them, which was which has really set them back now. And yeah. unfortunately, they've retired uh, from the race. But uh, yeah, you're right, it was a fantastic battle. And uh, you can just see here that uh, they certainly weren't leaving anything on the circuit. They were absolutely giving everything to, uh, to try and get past each other. And this is where the move should have been done for Max Manovic. But you'll just see here, runs a little bit wide through the right hand and loses the back end. And that's what allowed the Pro Sim car to get a good run out of Ascari and then get a back ahead. And then this is the big incident. And just watch Max Manovic put a wheel on the grass, which sends his car spinning around. Yeah, this is the moment coming up now. And uh, I'm quite amazed, if I'm honest, that the pro sim car got away so much you know it, it was uh, it was quite a big moment the walls are not too far away at that particular portion of the racetrack and somehow they managed to completely get away with that uh, without any kind of damage at all that's apparent to us anyway um meanwhile the uh, unison racing car spent over a lap in the pit lane so um yeah it's yep. uh, surprised by that one i have to say uh and the amount of time that Unison spent in the pits with uh, penalties was almost the same as the amount of time Mugen Sim Racing spent in the pits to deal with their repairs. 
Chris Vakanek now 10.7 seconds behind Stavros Muzaidis. Last time round, nearly two seconds quicker than the number 14 car. Now, Christopher Kianek, how far is he behind Stavros? My updated timing sheet is saying that the gap is just four seconds and that he took three seconds out of Stavros last time round. And I can see both cars making their way through the Roger Chicane. Stavros Mosaid is firmly in eyesight for Christopher Kianek. Yeah, it's uh, definitely being hunted down now and it's not going to be too long before we see these two battling, but... Yeah, I can't help but feel it's going to be a little bit one-sided with Mugen Sim Racing getting through fairly easily. That's not to say that GSR team haven't, have had a bad race by any stretch of the imagination. They've, uh, they've done very well um, because they started a long way down and quite off the pace, but they're getting up to speed and uh, they're getting up the orders of into a podium position, which is uh, great news for them. But uh, I don't think they're going to be able to hold off Mugen Sim Racing, although they might be able oh, to no. now because Kianek goes for another spin and... The mistakes are starting to snowball. We've seen this a little bit earlier on. Is it raining? It could be, but uh, also he's just, uh, he might have just gone for a spin off his own accord. This is his uh, problem a little bit earlier on with him bouncing across the curbs and into the barriers fairly hard. And now he's gone for another spin, which is setting back. I mean, I want to make a comment about the rear end of that Audi being loose, but. The first incident for the Mugen Sim Racing car didn't happen because of a, a loose rear end, it just came because they took too much curb and unsettled the car, whereas the head through Ascari, the back end just snapped out, and then, yes, if you're going to spin anywhere, Ascari is probably the most likely place to do so, just because of how you're shifting the weight of the car over, and it's so easy for the back end to get light and just quickly snap on you. That's exactly what happened to Mugen Sim Racing there. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's probably the trickiest section on this circuit and the only real high-speed section, unless you count Parabolica, which is more medium speed, really, but it's mostly slow chicanes around Monza and uh, Ascari is quite high speed, really, for the corners that surround it, so um, it can get uh, pretty difficult and uh, unfortunately Koenig has just found out there but let's not forget he doesn't often drive a GT3 in the EUWC he's the, the, one of the LMP2 drivers for Mugen not to say that he's inexperienced in GT3s however uh, you know he's not got quite as much experience as Vaki for example or um, some of the other drivers who are on that Mugen team so uh, yeah it's, maybe that's playing a factor but still he's a, he's a very capable driver and you wouldn't expect him to be making those kind of mistakes near uh, any of the corners really and and uh, yeah unfortunately he has and he's gonna have to do all that work again really the gap's now up to 11 seconds from uh, just under three which is where it was before remember it was that 11 seconds about five six laps ago and all of that hard work that Christopher Kianek did he's gonna have to do it all over again He's been ca he was catching by, you know, nearly three seconds a lap. So, ten and a half seconds, you know, four laps, maybe he can be back on the rear end of the 14 car. But, with rain imminently approaching, if he continues to push right to the ragged edge, he's probably going to be the first one to spin again once that rain does come down. Yeah, but it's possible, um, because... We're expecting the rain to be very heavy as well when it comes, but we've been talking about it all day and it's still not here yet, despite what the radar is telling us. And so it's all a bit of a mystery to everybody. I'm sure the rain, the things uh, will be looking up towards the skies pretty much religiously as well to uh, try and just get an idea as to what it, when it might be, but uh, it's not being particularly helpful at the moment, uh, the rain, so it's holding off for the moment how much longer that carries on for but um, yeah you're right those who are probably right on the edge are probably going to find out first when there's that slight bit of moisture on the road Ooh. that was a very big slide as well there from Kiani in through those mode 2 
mean, Christopher Kianek just looking at his sector times, six tenths or five tenths on Stavros in the open sector. Second sector, another seven tenths. He's gained uh, over a second in the opening two sectors alone. Yeah, it's uh, very quick at the moment, but uh, third might be all he can get from this race, unless there's issues for the top two. He's definitely quicker than the GSL team asked him, but he's not... Well, he probably is quicker than the, the front two as well, but he's so far behind them that it'll be very tricky. He's over, a lap, he's over a lap behind Prosim and then over two laps behind the satellite racing car, which is going to make things very difficult for him to uh, really do anything in this race in terms of a top two. But now that the gap's under nine seconds, it's still closing. And Unison racing behind aren't losing too much time either, to be fair. So uh, they're probably slowly catching the SR team, but uh, they're still quite a long way behind. Yeah. Just going to keep an eye on that gap before P3 is now down to under 10 seconds. And the gap is just going to keep on diminishing and get closer and closer. Denis Eschenko in P5. He's 35 seconds behind these two. Last time around a 48.9. Pretty much the same time as Stavros Muzaidis, but a little bit slower than Kianek. Just slightly, although... I looked down for a moment and the gap's now 17 seconds. I didn't quite see what happened there. Um, maybe there was an issue that we didn't quite catch uh, on the stream, but uh, I can't go back and look for a replay because that would just look a bit weird on the stream. So uh, I'll uh, try and figure it out. But yeah, suddenly the gap's 19, 17 seconds and it looks like, well, the, 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 the amount of time that he lost points towards, massively points towards uh, him having a spin of his own, another spin. I'm still just waiting to see if that rain's coming down. We were told 7 p.m. before. I mean, the, we, we then got told, you know, it's coming earlier and earlier and, you know, the heavens are going to open and the cars are going to become, you know, essentially a reincarnation of Noah's Ark. But 7 p.m. was a time that I was given and that is 15 minutes away, well, 13 minutes away now. Um, as this is in Central European summertime. Um, it's 5.50 for us in the UK. But it's 6.50 for those in Europe, and, and that is the track time in Monza. For those people who don't know, Monza is in Italy, which is also, <laughs> coincidentally, Europe. Oh, well, yeah, I, I didn't realise that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I did I just go and check. But <laughs> I did just go and check, by the way. Christopher Kiernick did indeed have a spin. Um, and, uh, I, I, he did. Thought you were gonna, I thought you were going to say, I just went and checked. Italy is actually in Europe. Oh, yeah, I've just checked, and Italy, I can confirm, is in Europe. No, my, my geography's not that bad. Uh, but um, anyway, so, surely somebody would have been surprised. Some Americans watching were surprised about that. Anyway. Oh, um, don't go down that route. That was, that was a bit controversial, wasn't it? Sorry about that. Um, yeah. I agree with you for what it's worth. Well, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Although I recently did see, this is going off topic slightly, but um, we've got time. Uh, I re recently see a video on Facebook of this guy going around asking questions to people about... Okay, well, don't bring up that video. We, I, I think I think that's the bit where we get very close to a line. I know that video. I saw seen that a long time I don't, ago. I don't know if we're talking about the same one, because okay. uh, anyway, the, the, the thing I was mainly going to mention about, because uh, I'm, I'm calling Americans like not very good at geography or whatever, they were, it was asking them about geography and whatever, and I noticed while watching the video that it's actually from my town, or from very near where I live, and I didn't realise quite how many of the people I live near and with are so stupid. Wait, wait, is this in America or England that you did it? In England, I don't live in America. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that's, that's what I was, no. I was confused because I thought you were saying it was based in the. Yeah, yeah, because I remember there was an original one of that that was done based in the USA, and then there's like a counter one that's done which was based yeah. in the UK, and they were in my hometown yeah. apparently. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not based there, yeah. but it, there was one there, or some kind of video. I don't know if it was like the same thing you're talking about, but a very similar thing to what you're thinking of. But yeah. Near me. <laughs> yeah. I think I've seen that video. <laughs> so if I look closely, will I be able to see your house, Ewan? Uh, no, you won't see my house, no. But uh, but I did recognise quite a lot of the buildings around and whatever. But anyway. 
did, did anyone you know, you know, did any faces appear? And you're like, that's that guy from school who failed his cheat, well, isn't it? <laughs> that, well, um, I did recognise, well, I saw a couple of people like, you know when you see someone but you can't quite picture where they're from? Or where you've seen them yeah. before? Yeah, yeah. I, had, I had that a couple of times. But, okay. Um, but yeah, I mean that's probably why you can't remember them. They like you probably spoke to them and they they were like, yeah, China is in South America or something. And you're like, right, I'm just going to erase you from my memory <laughs> um, and be done with it. Yeah, it is, uh, yeah, maybe. But you, you know what they do? So for for people who don't know, essentially, um, in these videos, they go around with a map and they're like, yo, can you? And they say to people, can you put? I don't, I don't know if to say yo, I mean, maybe they do, if they want to, you know, try and sound cool like me. But they say, can you put a flag down in this country? And they'll say the country. And then the person looks around and puts down a flag. But if you look carefully, you'll notice on the map, the map is labelled with country names, but all of the countries are in the wrong places. So it will actually have, like, China written down as, like... South America or something like that, and oh. it's not, and that's why that's why they put it down on the wrong places because they aren't smart enough to realize they don't have the confidence to say the map is wrong because if oh, you ask them they might get it in the right place but because it's labeled wrong they're like Ugh. yeah I, I, that's uh, some what was it called like social experiment or something whatever yeah. it's called um, because yeah but anyway. Um, for some reason, I'm not entirely sure why this is, but uh, Christopher Kianik's in the pits again, uh, oh and he's no. gone down to fifth. Well, he did have that other spin. Maybe this is a, sh- a schedule pit stop, though, because remember the last pit stop when he actually jumped in was because of the spin that we saw from um, whoever was in the car before, and now maybe they actually need to um, put some new fuel in. Uh, I don't know why they wouldn't have done that um, at, the, at the pit stop before that, really, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, and again. It's true. For some reason. I would not know why they didn't fill up with you. Oh. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. You, 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 they, you would. They must have some new damage then. Well, well maybe. I'm not, uh, it was a very slight tap on the front. I mean, I would be very surprised if indeed there was damage from that, really. Uh, because now the pit stop's getting quite long as well. It's over a minute towards uh, Unison Racing. And normally you only lose just over a minute. But they started in front of Unison Racing, so it's starting to get a little bit strange in terms of its length now, this pit stop. Just trying to see, it's been 71 seconds on the timer. Um, for those people who are unaware, essentially, if you look at the number in the top right corner, it counts how long the car's been in the pits for. And it is now at 84 seconds and getting closer and closer to that 100 second mark. There's a brief hill like in Sector 1 as well, but it's, uh, it's gone again quickly. Oh, it's back again, sort of. I can't decide whether it's, it needs to be there or not, but, uh, but no, it's all sorted now. This is getting a little bit strange for Kiani. He's been in that car for a long time. I think he's been there for four hours now. But finally, he's able to move and uh, get out of the pit lane. Nearly a lap down on Unison Racing now, so uh, it's... It was looking so good for Mugen. They were in contention for the race win, and now they are about to be put uh, in fifth place and a lap down as Roland Zook's now in that car. We have Roland Zook's now at the wheel. We'll see where he can pull off for the team in that 33 Mugen Sim Racing car. Uh, maybe there was an issue for, for the Sim Rig. Maybe, maybe that's why the incident occurred and they just needed to get a driver change and... Um, filled up with fuel, but again, a very long stop, all things considered. So that had to be fuel going in the car, or um, you know, some repairs being made. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit, bit of a weird one. They're seemingly trying to uh, make very minimal driver changes in this one, trying to go for long stints. It's in three hours and now four hours. So uh, Zooks is probably in for a bit of a long haul as well now uh, for Mugen. He's often an LMP2 driver at least in the EWC for the, uh, the team of Mugen Sim Racing so um, yeah that's a bit new for him but I'm sure he's uh, experienced enough to uh, to know what to do at this point and, uh, and he will do uh, not done too much uh, GT3 especially in R-Factor 2 not done too much GT3 but um, you know he's uh, going to try and go up to speed now and 
seems to be doing that as well. He's got Phil and Denis Evchenko already. Just to keep an eye on that gap. Well, Florin Zooks. He maybe could have caught in on to Stavros, but again, that incident threw him 11 seconds behind. He's had to make his pit stop. We'll have to see when Stavros Mosaidis makes his pit stop where he does feed out. Um, if he's, you know, more than 15 seconds, more than 10, 15 seconds ahead, then you know that there was something else going on in the pit stops for Mr. Roland Zooks. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit of a mystery that we're not quite able to uh, get to the bottom of just yet. But, um, yeah, anyway. Still, uh, you know what else is a mystery we can't get to the bottom of? Where's our rain? <laughs> yeah, that is a big mystery. Um, we, we're still yet to uh, really figure out what that's all about, really. Very weird. Apparently it's slightly drizzling out there on the circuit, but not in real life. According to the radar, it's raining a lot harder than that. But And according to my mm. weather, actually, it said it was going to be thunderstorms and very heavy by now. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, getting more bizarre by the minute, really. Yeah. Well, apparently if it is drizzling, then... Um I doubt there could have been any wet tyres going on to that 33 moving some racing car ready way too early if it's just a light drizzle. These cars generate so much heat in the tyres that a light drizzle is absolutely meaningless to them. Um, I mean, again, going back to my karting race earlier today, you know, we're in carts which don't generate as much heat and it was damp on the track, but we, we drive as if it's completely dry. So for these cars, that's even more so the case. Was it raining earlier? Um, it was raining this morning, so when we got to the track, um, the, the sun was coming out, but there was still, like, um, it was a little bit damp. Like, you could put your foot on the curb and you could feel that it was a little bit slippery, essentially. Oh, oh well. So, yeah. It, it just dries up instantly. Um, like, even even if there is a light rain going on, the, the heat generated by, by the cars um, or carts is enough. And, you know, if you've got a few carts going around that, you know, there's constantly tires going over it. It just heats up the water and it's just, yeah, meaningless to it, to the tyres. I guess the fact that it's, it's a shorter circuit than a bigger circuit would probably help that, given the fact you go around more and you can go over the same bit more times in a minute, let's say, or more times yeah. in an hour. Whatever. Yeah, it's more like 50 second lap times, give or take, so it's about yeah. half the length. Exactly, it's... Uh... And... Well, instead of 10 cars, you've got about maybe 30 carts, so I don't know. It depends. Um, would you rather have, you know, quantity over quality, I guess? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just just hearing, by the way, while hey, I'm having this discussion... I I, d I just want to cut in quickly. So, so, sorry about this when you were, but I want to give a massive congratulations to the, um, the 33 for being able to overtake the Bentley, which... Um, and certainly Nikolai Besrikov was unable to do. No, he wasn't quite able to do. <laughs> was it Max Bunovich? Oh, sorry, Max Bunovich. Pardon yeah. me, pardon me. Sorry, Nikolai. Sorry, Nikolai. He, Besrikov had to serve Bunovich's penalty, which was, uh, which was pretty, uh, must have been pretty annoying. Yep. <laughs> I'm sure it's very annoying for him. Yeah. <laughs> They're probably, uh, they are out of the race now, by the way. Uh, they've all le left the team speak. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, they haven't. Uh, it's just uh, a couple of them from the seven ones that they were all in one big team speak and were uh, doing some racing because, uh, well, yeah, why is it? there's no real need to be separate. They can just have a chat between themselves. It's now down, just down to the seven one seven team who are in fourth place at the moment and looking to maybe grab a podium in this race if they can catch the GSR team Aston car or not uh, I don't know quite what the gap is 41 seconds at the moment and uh, yeah not really catching I have to say that it's the gap staying roughly the same at the moment yeah I'll probably stay that way for a while especially if you know there is starting to be a bit of rain you know the drivers who are maybe a bit quicker might get a bit more tentative now especially those towards the front end they don't want to risk throwing their race away it's a chance for those drivers towards the bottom end to maybe experiment with some lines try to gain some time during this window um and very similar you know to those who you know watch more of the classical sprint racing like formula one 
once you do get the rain starting to drop down it's not usually the drivers at the front of the grid who blink first it's usually those guys at the back with nothing to lose or put on the wet tires and then those at the front of the field will be like oh look those tires are working really well let's try them and then follow suit yeah, yeah exactly there's always somebody's got to take the plunge themselves and then uh, and then everyone follows in uh, like sheep but uh, but yeah anyway we're coming up to it well we've just completed another hour seven hours down five hours still to go in this race you mentioned sprint racing there briefly i think we'll, we'll have a bit of a chat about sprint racing in a moment but first we need to um take a, a bit of a commercial break so uh, yeah we'll be back in a few moments time with more racing from the 12 hours of monza The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Fleet Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. Welcome back to the GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event here in Italy where it's supposed to be raining but it's not. We've got the most bizarre set of circumstances uh, where all of the radar suggests that it should be pouring by now but uh, the rain has held off uh, quite valiantly actually. It's been, uh, it's been very, very reluctant to fall and uh, continues to be that way for the moment. And so uh, we're still left with a dry circuit with five hour, uh, sorry, four hours and 55 uh, minutes it's still here to go. I don't reckon I've uh, seen a race like this, Yusuf, really, in terms of the rain. It's been, uh, we've had it promised to us so many times and it's still not delivered. Yeah, it's a bit like football coming home, right? Oh, let's not talk about that. That was, that's hurtful, that was. I've, I've been waiting for an opportunity because I've been feeling like, you know, 
it's, it's been getting closer and closer to the point where I could perfectly drop that in. And that just felt like the best opportunity I was going to You know, it was, it was nearly three weeks ago. Three weeks ago yesterday. It, three weeks ago tomorrow, sorry. I'll still be bringing it up next and year. I know, but it still hurts. Yeah. It, Don't worry. In like one and a half years' time, I'll, I'll just talk about England not making it out of World Cup groups. In for, for the next uh, if, if we don't get it out of the group I'm going to kill myself to be honest I can't take that don't say that on broadcast sorry yeah, sorry that's not good um, so, <laughs> um, but uh, but no I'll just be very very disappointed how about that <laughs> yeah I'll be disappointed as well because it's, really? it's far more fun yeah yeah because it's far more fun for me to poke fun at England fans if they get knocked out in the knockout stages than if they get knocked out in groups it's like it's like after Germany got knocked out in the World Cup, um, the last World Cup, when was that? 20, Eight, 2018, six, yeah. 2018. You know, I, I didn't feel like I could poke fun at them. I just felt, I did. you know, bad for them. Um, you felt bad for them? Yeah, I was like, you know, you, you won the last World Cup and you get, like, knocked out like that. You, you kind I of feel, feel sorry for them too. Like, it's like I can't poke fun at the Brazilian fans after they lose 7-1 against Germany, right? Because it's like well, they, they've had enough. <laughs> well, they did get enough that night. That was quite a monumental whipping, wasn't it, really? Yeah. And that, it was uh, it, the most bizarre World Cup semi-final there probably ever has been, to be honest. Um, but uh, but anyway, yeah, that's a bit off topic. Isn't it? Um, you, you brought you brought that up, though. Um, I so I, I'm I'm just disappointed. This mm. it, it was it was a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You used to just regret what you did at all. You're just quite pleased, actually. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was very damaging. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about I'll talk about the weather, um, and it's still not raining. But I will just run through the audit uh, quickly before we talk about some other things that are coming up here on GTR 24H. Uh, so for the moment, it is still. Satellite racing with Ryan Nash driving once again, who are leading the race after 230 laps. They've got a lap over Prosim, who have got uh, quite a lot more than a lap then over GSR Team Aston, uh, who have got just under 40 seconds over uh, Dennis Eschenko in the Unison Racing car. Then Mugen Sim Racing not that far behind. And Carl Larkin got the last of the six remaining GT3 cars in this race. And then we've got the Viaduction GT4 also running out there at the moment. Uh, in that class, the little Alpine is still going and uh, has moved up now to seventh place overall, which is quite impressive um, considering it started the race nearly double that number. As we see, Brian Nash, the race leader, into the pit lane once again here. So um, if the rain comes down in the next five minutes, he's going to be very frustrated because he's going to have to make two very quick pit stops. But um, yeah, it's been a fantastic run for them from the very back of the field um, to the very front. They started dead last, let's not forget. And now they are leading this race by over a lap. Very impressive drive from them. I think Denis Eschenko slowly closing in onto Stavros Musaitis. And that is a battle for third. And there's currently 40 seconds between the pair of them. I think it was gaining by around a second a lap. Um, he did just pit recently, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm just going to check where Roland Zux is relative to him. So Roland Zux is going down into Parabolica and Denis Seshenko has just made his way through the Roger Chicane. So a fair bit of time between the two of them. Ryan Nash leads by nearly two minutes over Prosim. 106 seconds. You know, bit of a round up there, but it's been a dominant display from the 65 VRS satellite racing car so far. It has indeed ever since they got to the lead uh, whenever it was, quite a long time ago now but uh, Mugen Sim Racing were definitely their closest challengers and now that's uh, really petered out for them I'm afraid because of their incident but uh, now it's given Ryan Nash just over a minute of a lead after this pit stop Pro Sim will probably be in about 15 minutes time to uh, change that round again and it will be restored to over a lap of an advantage Right, I think it's time now to uh, I know that there's some pit stops going on but uh, I don't think 
uh, anything race changing is going to happen in the next uh, 10 or 20 minutes so I think it is now worth talking about uh, what's coming up on GTR 24 H obviously we've mentioned the, the EWC in the in the race so far uh, we've got a hill climb going on still uh, we've five rounds through the 12 race calendar for that in 2021 but uh, coming up new for this uh, well kind of late autumn to winter kind of time uh, we've got the return of the GTR 24 H sprint series where uh, well Yusuf debuted here on the uh, on the channel and uh, I commentated with you for uh, those pretty much all of those races and uh, we enjoyed it very much we've been looking forward to its return and it's finally uh, going to be returning uh, here to GTR 24 H I believe although I'm not entirely sure I think you can sign up already I'm not entirely sure but uh, it's still I think so I think so um, we'll have to get someone to confirm but uh, it's, it's, the start of it is still uh, a good three or four months away so you don't have to panic just yet you're not going to miss out um, because it, it all kicks off on uh, November the 18th uh, and we're both very much looking forward to the return of the Sprint Series yeah, and I know the Sprint Series is something that I've been looking forward to for quite a while. We had a brief showing of the Sprint Series at the start of the year, and we were hoping, you know, that would be our second season of the Sprint Series, but sadly there were some issues with the, with servers and lags, and after the opening round we had to uh, sadly call it quits. But we will be able to come back, and hopefully permanently this time. Season 1 was, I think, by all accounts a great success we had a fantastic battle between Euronics and Amusto a series that you and I you and pretty much commentated from start to finish I know I joined I think it was like round three of the championship I think at Hungaroring if I recall correctly and hopefully season two will be even more thrilling to watch I can't can't remember exactly, but we did do pretty much most of the season uh, in the end. It was uh, very good indeed, uh, very enjoyable, and uh, yeah, it's going to be back again. So uh, it's starting on the 18th of November. So we, we, yeah, we're, we're just three and a half months away from the start now. It's going to be an eight race calendar on this occasion um, instead of the 12 races last time around. But we've got some fantastic circuits. I don't think we're missing out on any circuits. Let me put it that way. I think we're missing out a couple of the bogey tracks certainly for some people um, uh, some unenjoyable tracks for some certainly um, we're kicking it off with Barcelona on the 18th of November at the Circuit Catalunya then we're going to Misano on the 25th uh, then it's going to be uh, December the 2nd for the Nürburgring those races are, are all back to back so uh, three weeks in a row they'll be back to back sprint series races but then we've got uh, over a month off for the kind of uh, festive period I guess you could say with Christmas time and we'll be returning uh, at Brands Hatch on July, January the 13th and then it's going to be uh, two week intervals in between all of the races so Hungaroring, Zolder, Bathurst and Spa to round off the year, uh, round off the season it's not really a year, it's more like a half year but it's uh, Series 2 it's Season 2 is what we're going to call it and uh, yeah, it's, it's a good selection of circuits I especially like Bathurst and Spa being the final two races if we've got a nice championship bubbling up there there's going to be some fantastic circuits to watch it play out at yeah, I, I've, I've always liked Spa. It's one of my favourite circuits just in general. Bathurst, an awesome circuit, a lot of legacy there. Not, I'd say probably not one of my favourite circuits to watch because I think while it is very fun to drive on, I think that kind of middle sector, once you kind of wind your way up the hill, you can't really do much in terms of overtaking. So the track for me just feels like, you know, overtaking opportunity going up towards turn two and then down the hill into... Um, into the final corner or into the uh, the S's but oh pardon me as my arm just kind of snapped to the side or the arm rests on your chair side, not your actual arm yeah, yeah not, not my actual arm <laughs> my arm just snapped to the side it's like a chicken um but no it's, it's good to see about first um Zolder one you know really fun track actually to drive a couple of overtaking opportunities there as well but no, as, as you mentioned, it's got a lot of the, the good tracks on the calendar missed out. Maybe a few of the tracks that some drivers are less keen on, let's say. Yeah, I can't, I can't say that I particularly enjoy Bathurst. <laughs> In the, sorry, not Bathurst, sorry. What were you, you talking Zolder. about? Zolder. 
as Aldo okay. was talking about that uh, I don't particularly enjoy I know a lot of people do uh, I'm not entirely sure why but it is just chicanes uh, really and uh, I don't really enjoy it very much um, personally but I don't have to drive We're, uh, we'll only be watching yeah. slash commentating and so uh, yeah we'll uh, and I'll look forward to that pretty much whatever circuit uh, it is at so uh, so yeah we'll be there for that one of course it'll be streamed live on the YouTube channel we'll be on, we'll be on Facebook we'll, we'll be everywhere basically uh, streaming those races and uh, yeah we're looking forward to it um, certainly the, the other big change I guess for season two and I know this was um, kind of hinted at in the uh, in the Missouri race that uh, we, we had I guess if you call it a false start to season two if you want to say that um, the, the fact that we've got GT3 and GT4 cars now both on the car, on the car on the track sorry on the track yeah. at the same time now instead of it being a single class GT3 sprint it's now a bit of a multi-class sprint uh, with GT3 and four cars yeah I, I don't know what's your take on that are you a fan of, of multi-class in the sprint series or um I'm not sure I, I mean I enjoy British GT, which is a very similar uh, idea to uh, what we, if we are indeed doing two-hour races again, I think it is going to be two-hour races and GT3 and GT4. That's pretty much the British GT format for some some of the races anyway. Um, and I do enjoy that. Um, I think around these circuits as, as well, it's, it's going to be uh, good. I, I'm not really sure, to be honest. I, whether single-class racing should be kept for sprint racing or, or, or not, but... I think uh, if there ever is a mix of cars to have sprint racing multi-class, I think GT3 and GT4 is probably the only mix of cars you could probably get away with. Uh, I think I think this is a better combination. You ever seen F1 cars and monster, and monster trucks? And lawn mowers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to add some excitement. Um, but no, um, in seriousness, I do agree with you. Uh, I think it comes down to you know, do you, do you have um, you know enough cars in each class? Um, as usually, I'm a fan of, of single class racing just because I know you know all of the battlings in one place. Um, and as a commentator, I get very confused when you've got a race start and you've got to keep your eyes out on like two battles for the lead at the same time um so i just like it when it's one class it makes things a bit easier for me and i know everyone's battling against everyone which uh, for me makes it that little bit more exciting but i think from a driver perspective it definitely adds more of a challenge to have multi-class because you know you've got, got to worry about lapping people or if you're in the lower class getting lapped and being able to minimize the deficit that that you have when allowing the faster cars to come through yeah, getting, getting lapped is certainly an art, and uh, that's going to have to be done uh, throughout the GT4 class uh, in that one. And, uh, yeah, we'll see uh, how it pans out. I guess what, one more thing to mention is um, I think that the prize money for the, for the team's championship uh, in GT3, it's €1,200 for um, the... Uh, GT3 winning team and uh, 575 euros for the GT4 winning team um, in this one so uh, yeah well worth having certainly um, and uh, signing up for we'd, uh, we'd, we'd like to see uh, all the cars on the grid and let's not forget this is uh, on ECC on a set of course of competizione rather than R Factor 2 I know we do a lot of uh, racing on R Factor 2 for GT or 24H but um, this is on ACC arguably does GT3 and GT4 cause the best of any sim at the moment and some people would probably say the best sim around at the moment but I know there's a fierce argument or there would be a fierce argument about that um, but uh, it is a very good sim and uh, yeah that's what we'll be using for Sprint Series Season 2 uh, again I, I think that's the, the kind of line and approach you can take um, it is a very good sim and I think most people would agree with that fairly wholeheartedly. Um, I, was, I was actually talking to Tiziano Brioni back when I did my interview with the Master Driver. And uh, after the interview, we were kind of just chatting about different sims. Uh, I also spoke spoke to James Baldwin uh, a long time ago, um, back at one of the F1 esports events. And he kind of said the same thing, that when it comes to GT cars, ACC is, you know, is the best, essentially. Or it feels the most realistic. Um, the kind of consensus that I got is that R-Factor 2 you can carry more speed than you otherwise could um and with something like i racing it's it feels a little bit slower than what it should be in the words of tiziano brioni on i racing it feels like the car is on rails if you go off the rails if you go off that line it just becomes unrealistically bad um 
I'm, I'm too bad to be able to confirm whether that is the case, but, you know, I just thought that's a nice insight for some of our viewers. I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell either, if I'm honest. Um, I wouldn't be much help uh, in that situation. But uh, did, did you interview Brioni in, in Italian or English? Um, I interviewed him in English. We spoke a bit of Italian afterwards. I set up the interview with him in Italian. Okay, um, and he turned up at the right time and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that bad. You know. He knew what he was doing, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, worst case scenario, just go to Google Translate, right? Well, yeah. I've, I've heard bad things about Google Translate. Apparently it's not very good, but... No, it's not um, very good at all. No. Um, yeah, Since I can't is. speak another language to check that, I don't quite know. Um, I can't speak another language well enough to check that. Um, it's kind of, it kind of does Google Translate to the kind, the, the level that I'm capable of translating to. I've noticed sometimes actually with um, Japanese that it's actually a little bit off, and I can't speak Japanese. It's only because I've watched so much anime now oh. that um, every now and then I hear like a few phrases, and I know okay, this this phrase kind of means that, and then I see it on Google Translate, and I'm like, wait. That's not right. But then again, apparently anime, like anime Japanese, is very different to realistic anime Japanese. Yeah. yeah. Um, like certain things are overemphasized, and they use like words that apparently wouldn't actually be used in that context. So I don't know. I don't understand Japanese. So I can't exactly. Apparently. <laughs> Also, if you, if you say certain things in a different turn of, tone of voice, it means a completely new word and everything. Like, what, you, say, you, say, you say the same... Uh, I'm not sure if it's Japanese, but certainly something that I don't understand. Um, it, you know, it didn't use, like, a traditional well, alphabet, really is what I'm trying to say. Narrow it down, no, th it, you and... Yeah, thanks, yeah, since I can't speak any. Um, I mean, I mean, so it, a language that doesn't use our alphabet, is what I meant. Oh, um, OK, so and talking either Arabic, Japanese, or... Russian, like, or something like that. Um, would anyway, you, would you class like the Russian alphabet as like the same as ours? It's somewhat recognisable, but it's not really the same, is it? Greek, Greek, I feel crosses the board. Like Greek is not recognisable, Russian like is. Yeah, yeah. Um, you but, you uh, anyway, recognise Greek because you're like, if you ever get PTSD of maths classes, you're like, ah, that's Greek. I don't, I, I don't. I didn't pay enough attention in maths to really get that. Like, remember the sim, si, the symbols like omega, alpha, no. theta, beta. You must know beta, like beta radiation. Uh, uh, that was physics. That was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. True. Okay. Fine. I didn't pay but enough attention in that either. Alpha in maths. You use alpha in maths. I didn't. In physics. Yeah. Alpha I didn't radiation. I, I. I. How can you not know alpha and beta? Like. I do. I've, I, I, it rings a bell again about radiation or whatever, but I can't. I can't quite. Can't quite remember, but I can't. Uh, I didn't pay enough attention in maths or physics. So I was too busy having a good time. <laughs> You're too busy having a good time. Yeah. Did we have a throwback to school earlier on in the broadcast? I'm talking. I swear we were talking about school not too long ago. Were we? Was it me? <laughs> Well, not, it could have been Kieran, to be honest. Yeah, I know, that's what I mean. Was that me? I can't, because I don't remember it. I was listening to some of the, what, uh, some of Extreme when you were, when I was, well, in between making food and whatever. Did, did you hear the nickname that I gave you so endearingly? No, I didn't actually. We, I called you Ewan the Madman O'Leary. Oh, I didn't hear, I wondered why Kieran said that. In our, in our, in our little chat for commentators and, and producers because and whatever, he said that, and I was a bit confused, like, what is he talking about? Because I saw that message come through, and I saw you hadn't responded, I was like, you don't know the reference to that. No, I don't know uh, the yeah. reference. I wouldn't have responded anyway, probably, but I wouldn't. I also didn't know the reference, no. <laughs> You're very rude like that, just not responding. Right? I, I, I am a little bit, sorry. I often don't know what to say. That's the problem. We just, we just. Um, do you know what to say right now about this race? Go on. Oh no, I, I was hoping. Oh, you, I, I, don't <laughs> have I, I thought okay. that was a rhetorical question. I, I, I can get some if, if you want. I can get some. Oh, we've got an incident uh, report, by the way. Ooh, something's come that's through. That's exciting. I'm trying to uh, try and trying to read it, but it's against the sky, which is quite difficult to read white and white. So between me. And Carl, one, one, one. Right, what's gone on here? 
Our, our producer teacher is having an absolute field day right now. <laughs> What's going on here? I'm not... Did I do something? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think you did anything to you. Wait, I just called you. Yusuf is right. Oh God, it's been a lot. It's been a very long day. I don't know quite what about. I mean, now you're saying stuff as if production has told you that, but I haven't heard it myself. So now I'm getting confused. Is there like another voice? I, I think that's just a ghost, like a ghoul, giving you some like kind of information. I don't know who that was. Yeah. Oh my word, that was a oh, no. that was a very near spin for Roland Zooks, who spelt his own name wrong I'm trying to get into the server earlier. <laughs> I'd like to add. I do that sometimes. Rod Roland or something like that. Anyway, uh, we all know who it is, of course. Roladen. Yes. Roladen. Um, actually, speaking of Roland Zooks, he is 43 seconds behind Stavros, um, Stavros, not Stavros, Stavros. He has spelled his name right, Muzaid. <laughs> um, well, I wouldn't know if he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that was a bit mean. I mean, have you ever heard, like, Star Wars doesn't feel like a right name. Stavros feels like a name. It does feel like a quite good name, actually, yeah. Stavros. Might change my name to Stavros. Yeah. How, how would you feel just introducing me onto the stream as Stavros? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd feel intimidated, actually. Um, by that name, to be honest, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's quite intimidating, isn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't call it intimidating. That's <laughs> going a bit too far. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, yeah, okay. But still, uh, you know what I mean. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it, that's probably uh, the closest we're going to get to a battle mm -hmm. in recent or in the near future, anyway. Excuse me, because Zooks is closing. Uh, well, I don't know quite how slowly, but he's closing, and uh, there's not that oh. far up to you in some racing either. So he um, gained a second on Stavros last time round. Exactly. So we, we've got to wait a few laps, but um, we will uh, we will get there, I reckon, because. You can see racing have been very, very quick all weekend. If you took the qualifying times of all the people who are left, then they would be comfortably in front of everybody else. But not quite the same in a race. But um, I would still have faith in them to catch GSR, Team Aston, and uh, you know, some racing as well for a podium, maybe. They've had a bit. They've had a few too many spins, a few too many offs. It's not been good for them. At least they haven't. Hit the Prosum car twice. Oh, that's Desert a bit Bob. mean. In the Unison Racing car. I mean, he, he did it twice. I mean, it was accidental. Don't get me wrong, but it happened. It has not helped their race. No. And Nikolai Bezrukov. Uh, well, it wasn't. Pardon me. I keep saying Nikolai Bezrukov. It was Max Bunovic yeah. made the contact. Uh, Nikolai Bezrukov had to serve the penalties. And then Nikolai pulled out of the race. We're left with six GT3 cars and one GT4 car, the Viaduct and car, going around in their lovely little Alpine GT4. And I am left with a question, Ewan. Where is this rain that we were promised? <laughs> yeah, I think we're all left with that question, really. It's it's supposed to be um, um, going, but apparently it's just to the north of the circuit um, at the moment. I'm Less just going to say, a... yeah. I said from the get-go it wasn't going to rain. Yeah, you did. It looked quite unlikely uh, half an hour ago, but, you know, you never know. We might get away with it um, at this point. We might get away with it. And by the way, one more thing as well, in the last few moments just developing is the fact that uh, Daniel Seschenko has just come into the pit lane for Unison Racing from third place, drops all the way down to fifth now. Uh, so they're clearly either stretching it out a very long way or uh, a little bit off schedule in terms of their pit stops because, uh, you know, we're, we're nearly at a half hour now, which is pretty much as far away as you can possibly be from the normal pit stop window. Um, and uh, that may well be... Uh, well, that, that's changed a few things, hasn't it, really? So, um, yeah, they're in fifth now, and uh, it's all on Zooks to catch the GSR team Aston up in front now for third place, but it just depends where this Corvette gets back into the order when the race is done, you know. Are they going to end up with an extra stop, or are they going to be 30 seconds in front of everybody else? I don't know. Yeah, I think we just have to wait, honestly, to see how that all pans out, because... 
let's be honest, we have no real way of knowing unless we go and look at how long each stint was and then see the lap times to see whether, you know, they had double stinted their tyres or single stinted them. Probably just going to be seeing drivers single stinting their tyres. I don't think they'll want to double stint them, but you never know. I'm pretty sure we saw Alexander Zakirov in the Unison Racing car um, doing a double stint earlier. But I'm not entirely sure if that was the case or whether he was just losing a bit of time. But he certainly lost a lot more time in the second stint than he did in the first, which points towards a double stint. Yep. So maybe that was the case. Well, maybe not. We'll have to uh, wait and find out, really. But uh, four and a half hours to go right now. Uh, we're going to take uh, a little commercial break right now, but uh, we'll be back in a couple of moments' time with more racing from the 12 Hours of Monza. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot. Elite Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. Welcome back to the 12 Hours of Monza special event here broadcasted by GTR 24H. Uh, we are back with uh, 4 hours 26 uh, minutes remaining just under and uh, still watching Roland Zooks because he's uh, just about to, well not just about to catch GSR team but he's trying to and uh, that's uh, the closest battle we have going on out there at, on the circuit at the moment. Satellite racing still leading with um, Prosim in second, I forgot their name for a minute, uh, and then that Aston Martin Audi battle going on for third, if you count the Corvette of Unison Racing in there as well in P5, and then it's, it's all fairly close in that kind of region of the order, but other than that it's, uh, it's very spaced out with the laps between most of the cars as things stand and we have Four and a half hours remaining in the race. Ryan Nash doing a good job for VSR Satellite Racing. We still lead the race by a fairly comfortable margin as well over a lap clear of ProSim. We might be getting some battles starting to emerge in the battle for P3. Stavros and Musaidis ahead of Roland Zooks and then Arco Tourist Kamal in the 717 Unison Racing Car. The three of them are currently separated by around about 85 seconds. And we'll see whether that does start to close. I mean, Roland Zooks has been closing in on Stavros slowly but surely, and I think Arco Tourist Kamal has been dropping further and further back. It seems to be. Uh, the case for the moment, but it 
so it could change. I can't remember what we were talking about before the ad break because things went on in the ad break that made me completely forget. But anyway, I was going to pick up the conversation where it was, but I can't remember where it was. So, like trying to look for some money you think you lost, but you've actually not lost any, you're just poor. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> Zooks is uh, just having a bit big slide through Ascari there. Of course, that Audi just seemed quite twitchy and slidey actually looking at it. We've seen Kiernick go off the road quite a few times and Dukes now as well is uh, having a few problems trying to manhandle that car so clearly not the most comfortable car to be driving and maybe not the situation you want, you want to be in in a 12 hour race. No, you never want to be in that situation. Um, I think you always want to be at the front of the field, to be honest with you. And Roland Zooks and the 33 of Mugen's in racing could very easily be in the top three if it wasn't for a few silly mistakes they made, namely spinning one time out of the Roger Chicane. And uh, they clipped their rear end against the barrier. They had to sit in the pits for a while, and then afterwards they had a spin on the exit off of Scurry, which we think left them with some damage as they did have a rather long stop afterwards but it could just be coincidence. Yeah, it was, it was a bit weird actually, because we're not so sure, or we didn't see any damage get picked up, yet it seemed like there was damage on the car, the way the pit stop happened, so it was very weird actually, but it doesn't look like it's gonna deny them a podium in this race, the, the way they're going. actually quite surprised at Mugen Sim Race in this race because if we look back to the EWC races and you, yeah. you know, you'd think they're a very consistent team, they wouldn't be thrown off the road uh, all the time but they've had quite a lot of incidents throughout this race, maybe the unfamiliarity of the Audi is not helping because uh, they drive the old McLaren in the uh, EWC yeah. and uh, in I'm just trying to remember. Any EWC is GT and GT3. They're in the GT3 class, so they're in the same class here. I don't know why they didn't go with the McLaren 720S. Oh, actually, no, they go with the 650 usually, don't they? Um, they go for the old version, don't they? Yeah. Uh, 650. Five, five, 650? I thought it was 570. <laughs> um, it's a 570? I don't, I don't know. I having this discussion with David earlier on, and we, neither of us could get to the bottom of it then either. I forgot. <laughs> have to give it a Google. Well, we'll have to check. Actually, you know what? I've got some time now. Why don't I um, drop down a, a good old googly. Um, McLaren 6 50S. Yeah, there's a McLaren 650S. 650, not five, 570 is the GT4 car by the looks of things. I think you might be right looking at the... Uh, yeah, 570 doesn't have a rear spoiler, and the 650 has a tiny little one, like a little. Is, the GE3 version is fantastic looking, isn't it? The Clarence seems think? to be actually really good looking, in fairness to them. I know, I know everyone raves about the new McLaren being very, very nice, but the old ones are pretty good as well. 650. See, now that you've done that, I want to see my um, my favourite car of all time. Um, this was back when I was like actually like really into like new car releases and stuff, and I really liked the Porsche. I think it was the nine one nine Spider. Um, oh which yeah, was, think... like the first hybrid car that they released. Was the nine one nine the LMP one? I don't think. Do you mean the nine eighteen? It might be the nine eighteen. No, okay. no. I think it's... <laughs> Let me check. Nine one eight. Yeah, yeah. Nine one eight. Yeah. The 919 was the uh, oh, did it win? Yeah, it won Le Mans 2015. I there think, you go. Just look at look at that 918. Like, oh, it's so gorgeous. And hybrid too. Like, so you get extra power as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not cheap. hybrid in the traditional sense, is it really? Yeah. Well, I mean, isn't that hybrid though? You know. Oh, it, oh, it still is. It, do, it still counts. It's just not quite the same as cars that normal people can afford. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's just supercars in general. It's like, that's <laughs> well, not really a car, is it? It's too expensive. Yeah, it, it's not a car if it's too expensive. 
Um, if I can't buy it, it's not a car. No. Not, I, I can't buy many cars, to be honest. Cars wouldn't exist if, uh, <laughs> yeah. if they were based on what I could buy. Uh, no. Um, Little matchbox cars. Yeah, exactly. There are only them allowed. Those ones that look like you could roll down a hill, like like when you put someone in, a, in like a tyre, a big tyre, and then you roll them down the hill. No? Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't just re- remind... Like, have you seen Grown Ups? No. No. Oh. Because I think there's a scene in Grown Ups, there are probably a few other films, like, where, where this is, I think, a child just stuck in, like, a really big tractor tyre, and the tractor tyre just rolls down mm. the hill. Um, it's very entertaining. It is, yeah. Yeah. It's it, fantastic. It, I'm sure you can find a, vi- a video somewhere, if you're watching, um, of a similar incident. There's, there's, me- there's probably many. Um, I don't know how you'd go about Googling that, if I'm honest, but uh, go for it. We have ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. This sounds so like eerie and creepy. Doesn't I know. Yeah, that's why I laughed really, because because uh, it was pretty funny. Uh, but uh, but anyway, can't quite remember how we got onto that subject. We talk about cars, and all of a sudden, getting people to Google. Anyway, um, currently on board with the Corvette. We were for briefly <laughs> the last few moments. <laughs> Oh my What's god. What's wrong? Just this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like one of mine, to be honest. It's, yeah. Is this how it's, you usually feel when I talk? It's what <laughs> that's, 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 that's more of an insult than you realise, I think. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, there's the order, by the way, on your screen right now. Um, is this how you feel when I talk? That's really... I'm not, enti- I'm not entirely sure how to go about answering that. Yes. Let's start with a yes, it, well... It's a self-depreciating humour that always works, right? Because, you, like, you can't not laugh because... I mean, self-depreciating is it just feels rude, like, not to at least give it to me. So, give it a snigger. Kind of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Okay. I I just heard that completely differently from what you you had from what you said for a second. I was like, "Wait, what?" And then what? I realized what you actually said. Um, is that not a thing where you're from? No, no, it is, but I just oh, heard okay. it without the s and I was like, we "Oh, well, didn't well say that, that that would yeah. that would have been a great idea to say on a live stream, wouldn't it?" Yeah. Or in any like, situation would never like you and doesn't you and doesn't approach lines so and then I was like, "Oh, that's what you said." Yes. Lots of rain hanging around in the area, by the way, and we're still shocked Look, that it's not here. How about, how about, and hear me out on this. Oh, wait, I see a wiper going. I see wipers. I see wipers for Roland Zutz. So I was about to say, let's not talk about the rain until it actually comes. But then the rain has come, so we can talk about it. We can, because there are wipers. Two millimetres of rain. I don't really know how much that is, if that's light or heavy. But finally, no. it's here. Um, According to the forecast I looked at earlier, it's an hour and 45 behind schedule. And looking at the radars we saw earlier, it's uh, probably nearer to five or six hours behind schedule. But anyway, it is finally here. And uh, it's a real crunch time in the race now because of this rain. Yeah. Well, we, we talked about the rain and now the wipers have gone. The wipers have stopped. You know what? Let's not talk about the rain. Like, even if the rain comes down, we'll just be like, oh, why are these drivers have their wipers on? Oh, that's interesting. And that's it. Yeah. We'll, not, we'll not mention it because it is putting a little bit of curse on things we can't like. Uh, production, could you stop like, trying to jinx it? Like, do you want this rain to come or not? Because if you want the rain to come, stop saying it's going to come. Oh, you don't care. You're you, you're just here for the um, what the information chaos, the anarchy, the anarchy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to ignore everything production says about the rain. Yeah, about the rain, yeah. But when will you know when it's not about the rain? Um. Well, like I'm listening, but it's like the stuff that's like about the rain. I'm like, just that. remove it. Dunk it. Yeah. yeah dunk it. Basketball dunk. I'm like leaning over to the side. Yeah, just half a face of Yusuf, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think one, you know, an entire face is just too much anyway. <laughs> I'll, I'll brighten it up, you know. Brighten up, you, 
and brighten up your day. Oh, hello. Yeah. I brought the sun out in the UK. It's literally a power I have. Is the sun out in the UK? Yeah. I can see the sun's out for you from your curtains. Um, it's just light, I think. Or is it just light? I don't think it's... Not, it's not sunlight. No, it's just Another. cloud light. <laughs> cloud light. <laughs> That's what it's called. It's not, is it? But anyway, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's cloud... It's, uh, there's certainly a lot of cloud light. I don't know. There's another incident here. I wonder is it, <laughs> which of us is this directed at? But I want to know. But I can't read it right now. Um, I mean, I'm here again, is it? Stuff to come up in the Facebook chat. That, that's where I look. I can't. Um, I get a brief moment to read it while it goes over these banners that aren't white. But this one is, so I can't do that. And uh, yeah, the, the sky is not helping me out here, and it's gone. So I'll never know. Well, the event. Hopefully, hopefully people oh. at home. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, the stewards the, are reviewing the rain situation? The, what does the, that mean? Are they going to give... Is this like football? What, they're going to give a red card to the rain? What, like, what does that mean? The rain's under investigation. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> what was like a collision? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure really what you do, but who do you charge about the rain anyway? I don't know. <laughs> God gets 10 points to his racing license. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, rain under investigation for having a collision under yellow flag conditions. I know where... Uh, yeah, the rain is coming, apparently. Uh, We've seen been saying that for ages, though. Um, like, just uh, just don't bring up the rain. Just uh, yeah, we're, like, we're not bringing it up. What I was going to say is that uh, you know, there's going to be lots of penalty points handed out for rain causing a collision at Spa. I know you, people won't have been able to catch much of it because of um, this race, but the Spa 24 Hours is happening, and it, it rained quite a lot, and there was quite a lot of collisions. So uh, yeah. there's a few uh, a few red cards handed out there. Yeah, figuratively. Yeah, speaking of um, Spa 24 Hours, the the good Spa 24 Hours is happening on the uh, 26th of August to the 29th of August. That's the um, Endurance E Racing World Championship, 24 Hours. Um, make sure to tune in, put it in your diaries, put it in your calendar. Right on your mind. If, if that's your kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah, it's already uh, noted it down. Good job. The getting towards the end of summer at that point but hopefully we'll actually have seen the sun by that point because uh, the last week's been all right the last couple of weeks um, felt decent not yeah. really this last last week has not been good uh the, the week before that though was pretty good but i was locked inside so i couldn't enjoy it i can't There's remember like which week but i feel like we had like one week one week at the start of june which was really good then it like rained for two weeks then we had a good week then it's kind of been like mediocre, like we've had some good been things. been very mediocre, this summer, yes. Uh, it's been very coin flip. It has been very mediocre. There's the poster, by the way, for the 24 hours of spell, which is a in like four that. weeks. Yeah. I really like the black, yellow and red use in that poster. Y y y y I mean... <laughs> Please tell me I don't have to explain to you why no, they're there. I know. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was like trying to find something interesting on the boats where I could talk. I was like, I like the colours. I like the <laughs> yellow. And no, red. It, is, it is good actually. Yeah. Uh, no, it is good. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be racing there in four weeks' time. I think that's probably the, that might be the next broadcast for GTL 24. It's is quite a long time. Uh, sprint series is first, I think. Oh, that's in November. That's definitely not next. It's not in November. Yeah, it is. It is. Yes, it oh, is. I thought it, I thought the Sprint Series was going to start in like September or no. August. Well, it was, but it's been moved. Oh, okay. uh, so See, yeah. Wait, I never got told about that. Uh, oh, apparently uh, we can't uh, tell you why it was just back actually on the stream. Tell them that we we're not allowed to tell them that we can't tell them either. It just keeps them on the edge of their seat, doesn't it? Oh yeah, no, but, but then they're gonna like try to like want to find out. It can't be, it can't be that big of a ri well. It might be, I don't know, because I don't know either. But anyway, it doesn't doesn't really matter. I, I, th I thought it was gonna start on the on the 18th. I thought that was the opening round, but 18th of November, yeah. Oh, 
just like the rain, we were told there's rain and it's coming later. We were told there's spring series, but now it's starting in November. That means it's going to be raining because we're using like live weather. I want to do dry races, got some wet races. What's oh, going sorry. on? No, I thought Ryan Nash was going to overshoot turn one there, but uh, he was okay. Uh, the rain didn't cause that mm. particular accident, but the wipers are definitely going again now. And uh, the gap between Mugen and GSR is uh, coming down. Incident under review. Incident Roland Zooks just put in a 47.5, which is which signifies, if anything, signifies that whatever rain has come down so far has not affected the lap times because his fast lap is a 46.7. Either way, that 47.5 for Roland Zooks was nearly three seconds quicker than Stavros or Musaitis, which is one of the coolest names I've got to say all day today. And now he is 17 and a half seconds behind the number 14 GSR team Aston Car. And, well, as we mentioned, closing in. Yeah, it is indeed. It's all about kind of confidence in these conditions. Right? If you are comfortable, uh, then you are going to be able to go fairly quickly in the changeable weather. But if you're not very comfortable, then uh, things are going to go pretty bad for you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's, if you, the Aston Martin might be uh, it might be just struggling a little bit Ron Zooks though it's clearly seems to be very confident in his in in the car although that's a big slide well caught though it's great on board shot though a great a, uh, a great view as to what the weather is actually like right now yeah. should we just get an on board view just to see like how rainy this rain actually is I'm gonna... we've got one on the screen right now yeah oh uh, I wasn't looking at that one. Okay, yeah, the rain is quite rainy. Uh, quite wet. Yeah, it's not rainy, rainy then. Oh, you just given me a great idea. Like, you know how like my online username is Milky Cereal? I yes. think I'm gonna make another one called Wet Rain. <laughs> wet Rain. I, I think I think that has the same kind of energy to it. Like, it's obvious because milk should be on cereal. Yeah, exactly. Um, but unlike milky cereal, it's not something that people like, so I don't know. Well, some people like rain. Maybe I should call myself Dry Sunshine. <laughs> Into the pit lane, by the way, Ron and Zooks, and uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not picking that one up. Um, we'll see what goes on it. Is he going to put wet tyres on or something? I think he's going to the car first. It's going to get raised up on the jacks. Oh yeah, that's going to happen first, but... He's the only one in the pit lane at the moment. He's the first to blink if indeed it is going to be wet tyres. I... It surely can't. Like, they're only going yeah. like two seconds a lap slower. But... It's an odd time to take a pit stop. I can't say I've been noting down when they've been coming in, but I don't think they were due one yet. So, I'm looking at most drivers. They are about two, three seconds off their fastest laps of the race. And considering that they'd usually probably be about a second off anyway. I don't think one second a lap slower is enough to force the wet tyres. I'd laugh if it now stops raining after they put on wet tyres, to be honest, because that's kind of how the weather's been lately. Um, you know, it gets cloudy. Are we going to have rain? No. Are we going to have rain? No. You can sim ratings look, really, in this race uh, for that to happen. Not had it yeah. all their own way, certainly. In fairness for Mugen, um, or in fairness against Mugen, I guess, um, and something we were discussing while we were in the break. All of the mistakes that have affected Mugen have been, you know, Mugen's own fault, right? You know, it hasn't been, um, they haven't, it hasn't been caused by other drivers. It's been their own mistakes that have affected them. And this one, okay, it's not really in their hands what happens with the weather if it stops raining, but I think this is too early to put on wet tires personally, judging by the lap times. Yeah, you could be right, looking at this right now. We, we're not sure, by the way, that uh, rain tyres have indeed been put on that car. This is an off-board shot. Is there to find out for us? Um, Ooh, okay, okay, actually, Roland Sux is four seconds behind Arcturus Kamal. So that is riding on board with Roland Sux now. It's not the car directly in front, it's the one ahead of that. So let's see how that gap evolves. Yeah, let's... Is, uh, that's a very important one, really, uh, in relation to this race. He's already searching for wet patches, though. Trying to get 
get uh, get as much respite from the dry line as possible. Oh, it's got all, all the all the looks of someone who's gone onto wet tyres, isn't it? Really driving for the other parts of the circuit. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, there's no reason for you to do that if you weren't on wet tyres. So you're trying to keep those tyres cool. Um, essentially. Wet tyres are slightly softer rubber than slick tyres and that's just so that you can get heat into them because guess what, when it rains it tends to be cooler so you need to get heat into your tyres easier so they're made out of softer rubber so when you do have wet tyres on and it's these kind of greasy conditions but not fully wet you tend to take the car into the wet patches just so that it's offline and not where the heat is a chance for those tyres to cool down a little yeah, indeed. There's a bit of a wet radar on the, uh, on the. Oh my word! On the left-hand side, that's quite <laughs> soggy. So uh, yeah, while it is raining right now, it looks like it's stopped. Um, but uh, that might not continue on for too much longer. Uh, I would say that's not a great call, really, from Mugen Sim Racing. But it's not really slowing them down, is it? Because um, they're only a second and a bit behind that Unison Racing Corvette now. And oh my goodness, that's a big slide for Sukes. Yep. Maybe he's not in the wets at all. Maybe he just on dry is trying to find the wet patches before it breaks you, and it's like, these tyres need some extra water on them. There he goes anyway. Looks like he's going to try and make the move here. And I don't think there's going to be too much of an argument about it, uh, even if they wanted to, because uh, Unison Racing Car really hasn't got the pace to cope at the moment. Oh, Down the inside, it was oh, in the damp conditions as well. So I now think it is time for wet tyres. Most of the drivers, their laps are about four or five seconds off and it's, you know, starting to increase. So I think maybe Rollins looks and the Mugen Sim Racing team, maybe they found the perfect lap. Maybe it was one lap too early. Oh, this is so brave. But you can see on the outside, the Unison Racing car, there's just no grip out there. They just now run completely wide. And that's what happens when you're on, you know, the grippy line in the wet. Um, if anyone's ever been to a track, if you ever go to, you know, your local karting track when it's kind of damp, um, walk next to the track and kind of rub your foot on the tarmac, and rub it on where, like, the rubber is, and then rub it where the rubber isn't, and you'll notice that it's a lot grippier where the rubber isn't, and your foot will slide less, and that's just because rubber gets very slippery. Um, you know, if you don't have a karting track near you to do this experiment on, um, just get an eraser from your, you know, <laughs> Your, your little brother's pencil case. Dab, dab it in some water and just feel how slippery it is. It's, it's that straightforward. Oh, Vardukton, by the way, the only GT4 car in the field right now has stopped on the way down to Turn 1 and now is in the pit lane. So we're into the garage, so not entirely sure why, but uh, it has unfortunately gone back into the pits hopefully they do return because uh, the experience at the very least would be fantastic for them but um, that's not good news at all hopefully they can get back unfortunately most of the cars that have uh, gone to the garage has not been able to return here so that doesn't bode well, really, for Viaducting. Now let's just see, you know, we kind of expected Roland Zooks to be faster than Arcturus Kamal. Is Stavros in the pit? No, Stavros is... Actually, I think Stavros has pitted. I'm trying to check that. No, he can't have done. He's still a minute 43 in front. Oh, yeah, okay. He's a minute 43 ahead. I think he pits at the end of his lap. Because um, he's been losing half a second each sector to Roland Sutz. And I think, yeah, yeah, he's coming in through the pits. He's taking the tight line through Parabolica. No? no he not. stays out for now. I think this is a bad decision for him. Well, it just depends what, what the rain's doing, really. Is it getting worse or is it getting slightly better before it gets worse? We know it is going to get worse at some point, but we keep pushing back the time frame for when that's going to be. Said it for ages, but still not quite truly 
coming down as heavy as we were promised at the moment. So uh, it's still very bizarre. Well, four hours remaining, Ewan, and I think this might be the ideal time to jump on into another commercial break. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Leet Gaming, ESTV and Motorvision.tv A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. Hello everybody and welcome back to the 12 Hours of Monza here, special event from GTR 24H. We've got uh, three hours and just under 56 minutes remaining. I'm Ian O'Leary, I'm now joined by Chris Buxton for the next few hours in this race. Good to have you along, Chris. I hope you're uh, doing well. And uh, yeah, we've got a, a very nice special event coming up. You've joined at just the right time. It's bubbling up quite nicely and uh, there's some uh, water getting onto the circuit. We've been promised it all day and uh, it's it's finally coming just as you're arriving. I clearly brought the British British weather with me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we've been uh, debating about the weather for several days now and uh, is yet to arrive. So uh, yeah, that's absolutely incredible that we're finally getting it in the uh, tail end of the race. But yeah, what a uh, what a kind of thrills and spills race it's been. You know, the, the for the, the certainly the practice and the qualifying session leading up to up to now, it's been the 65 and 33 teams that have been rocking the top of 
of the tree and suddenly the uh, the, the Mugen Sim Racing squad in the Audi is some four laps behind and uh, you know the 65 VSR satellite racing McLaren is uh, well I, I was about to say romping off into the distance which would be a little bit unfair there's only a lap uh, to their good at the moment but uh, yeah it's amazing how everything can completely change the, the pros in Bentley right up there in the uh, podium position as well yeah, absolutely. We've got a couple of surprise podiums, I would say, anyway, um, at the moment. This, well, first of all, the 65 actually being in the lead is a bit of a miracle because, uh, let's not forget, they were the ones that started from the very back of the field um, in this one. Uh, the the, the uh, sister team took pole position and the uh, 65 were, ended up in last position um, at the end of qualifying. But now, as you can see from the standings on your screen right now, they are currently leading by just over a lap ahead of ProSim. Then we've got GSR team. Aston in second place, sorry, third place ahead of Unison Racing and Mugen Sim Racing. They're all very close actually in fighting over that last podium spot. And then we've got DSR Nightmare. Kurt Mads ahead of Gore after having some issues in the first couple of hours, smoothing things out now, but uh, not having such a good time uh, because they're still a couple of laps down in the Viaduct and GT4, unfortunately. Is uh, down in the garage at the moment, which is uh, a bit of a shame. Um, hopefully, they can get back, but things are not looking great for them uh, at the moment. Um, 65 Satellite Racing Team still leading them. Ryan Nash, we're currently on board with. It's been a fantastic drive from them. We keep, we keep mentioning it. I know we do enjoy qualifying, and, and qualifying this weekend has been absolutely fantastic. We saw it last night, but. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter all that much because you can still come from the very back of the field and uh, be leading the race even after only eight hours. Very true. I mean, we, we talked a lot yesterday about the, the one lap pace being nice but not the be all and end all. Uh, you know, we'll see how that transpires into overall race pace for them, but they seem to be making a pretty good job of it so far, so good. Uh, like I said, Ryan Nash still at the top of the tree. Uh, it's curious to see the pro sim uh, Bentley in second. Uh, the only reason I say that is because they were kind of midfield for most of qualifying, but we saw a lot of slipstreaming practice from them in the practice session uh, two days ago so that they really used that to their effect but I mean it seems that nothing other than themselves can stop the uh, 65 VSR satellite racing McLaren at the moment yeah, it does seem to be that way for the moment. I don't know if we've still got that stream from ProSim at the moment uh, here that we can bring up alongside the car in real life, but uh, probably not because we had it a long time ago and we haven't seen it for <laughs> quite a while, so um, there's probably a new driver in there at this point. We'll, we'll, we'll try and find it because it is good to see the behind the scenes and whatever. Um, I know that we've had that in the past for the EWC, for example, um, the likes of... ISSR lab give us uh, an onboard view of their pit wall where everything's coordinated from and uh, viaduct and give us a, a shot of their rig as well which is a triple screen display and uh, it's all very nice as well but um, yeah we'll, we'll try and get the post pro, pro sim stream uh, up mm -hmm. in a few moments time uh, easy for me to say but they're, no they're only in second place at the moment in the Bentley which is uh, a car that's not been used very much but uh, we're very glad to have it on the grid um, it's uh, a lot of people's favourite car and so uh, it's uh, it's here, and there, there, there's the stream on the right hand side. I said this a little bit earlier on, but the stream for me, anyway, really gives us a view of how hard the drivers have to work and what a battering their arms and wrists to take, especially around Monza where you have to monster the curves in these GT3 cars. It's got to take some kind of a toll at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, we saw a lot of you know, very tail happy cars as well uh, during the practice session in particular. And uh, you know, we're not seeing uh, too much of that at the moment. As uh, yeah, coming out of the pits now is the um, is the sixth position Audi. Uh, so yeah, they're doing a fairly good job and remaining in there. Not a lot of retirements as well. It is uh, good to see. Um, it seems we have lost. Uh, oh no, I was about to say we've lost our GT4 entry, but no, they're right at the seventh position overall. Uh, so a few people seem to have had uh, a few. 
thrills and spills since I last saw them. But uh, still several cars still running good and strong. Fast as that with the 33. That's not a surprise considering how hotly the uh, pole position was contested between the 33 and 65 teams. Uh, but yeah, just the, the 65s, the uh, PSR Satellite Racing Squad have just maintained that level of consistency. They, they barely put a foot wrong all race long. Fair play to them. Yeah, absolutely fair play to them because uh, they've put a fantastic uh, job in here and uh, are doing very well indeed. Uh, kind of replacing the 64 team that we were leading for so long. If you uh, remember back to the start of the race, Mugen Sim Racing took the lead through the first few minutes of the race because the Audi seems to be very, very good on the high fuel load and uh, a, a new set of tyres. They seem to be very quick out the blocks, but then the McLaren comes back to the Audi generally and uh, that's what Yumi Nisolo was able to use to get to, well, nearly get to the lead before they came into contact and Marie Reese got into the lead from Deuce's Motorsport Club um, but uh, eventually was dethroned. Yumi Nisolo got out in front but uh, Elton Vockingy, as it was at the time, was not really able to get through at all for Mugen and they lost quite a lot of time. It would have been all fine uh, had they not had a couple more issues along the way. A few spins at this point and Christopher Kianak's latest one got him into contact with the barriers and a couple of pit stops for damage has uh, put them down into P5. But, I mean, the pace they've shown this weekend has been frightening, really. And uh, it's no surprise to see them catching up fourth and third. And uh, I, th I think we're still th nearly four hours to go. It's not out of the realms of possibility to see them on the podium this weekend, even after all of their trials and tribulations. Yeah, completely. Uh, you know, Monza being one of these circuits that is ingrained in the DNA of any racer, isn't it? It's it's one of these things that it's a track everybody knows. It's a track that everybody has seen, no matter what your category of racing, uh, whether a two wheel, four wheel, single seater, GT, club level, professional level, doesn't matter. Everybody knows this circuit, so it's it's a little bit easier on the drivers to to go through the motions, to go through the you know lap on lap on lap on lap, not necessarily on all autopilot because that would be a little bit unfair to say but it's yeah, you do have an element of just running through the you know, running through the laps when you've got a, a 12 hour even a 6 hour even a 3 hour race there's an element of just muscle memory and not necessarily having the brain engaged at 100% for the whole time they can't do it it's physically impossible but even still these guys have been going for well over half the race now and uh, I would imagine fatigue is going to be really playing a part uh, in this race. Now, of course, you know, it's still broad daylight, which will help them. But you know, we're seeing the headlights on with still that threat of rain that will be, uh, you know, keeping a lot of eyes looking skywards. Uh, it still seems very elusive. I mean, if it was the UK, it would be absolutely flooded by now, uh, as, is the, as is the way of the British weather. But, you know, still so far so good. And yeah, long may it continue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's kind of a different mindset, especially for, for people from a, a rainier part of the world like like we are. It's going to a place like Italy just doesn't seem doesn't seem that that should be possible. What, uh, <laughs> what their weather is like, but um, but it is somehow. And uh, yeah, it's it's a bit weird to see Monza with such thunderstorms. Really, I was talking about this a little bit earlier on, but uh, the Alps are a good hundred kilometres away. And I didn't think it would play too much of an effect. Like it, for example, it's not based within her mountain range like Spa for the Ardennes is, or um, mm. Nürburgring for the Eiffel Mountains is. you know it, I, I wouldn't have thought weather should roll in quite so quickly and it hasn't been rolling in quickly it's been a very slow long and drawn out process but the changeable weather conditions isn't often a, a thing I associate with Monza yet we've had a lot of it so far this race and this weekend <laughs> That's the way it rolls, isn't it? It's, that's the joy of uh, racing, whether it's in sim form or uh, you know the real thing. You you just never know. You you have a uh, a pre predefined idea on who's going to go well, and, and indeed the like I said, the the Mugen Sim Racing Squad and VRS Satellite Racing on the 65 McLaren uh, were in our in our minds due to do well because they were quite some distance in raw lap time ahead of the rest. And look at them now. You know, of course, you have got the 65. Uh, McLaren now in the hands of uh, uh, I think that's just changed whilst I've been here so Tom uh, Capusta now has uh, that one uh, in his hand but he's a 
full, well, he's nearly a minute and a half ahead of the Pro Sim Bentley. And like I said, that started some middle of the pack. Yes, of course, grid starting position is, it's not necessarily irrelevant, but it's its not indicative of really anything in, a, in an in endurance race. Um, but it just goes to show that the raw paces and everything and... Yeah, you know, I would imagine that, like I said earlier, the, you know, the fatigue is really going to be playing a big thing. Looking at the 33, that's in the hands of Roland Souks at the moment. So uh, let's see if he's able to close in. You sort of alluded earlier, he was trying to hunt down the 717. Uh, he's some 33 seconds behind them. So I'll say he not made it lap gaps either in the top six after this length of time. That's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen a, a lot of these guys, I mean, pretty much everybody, surely has had some kind of problem along the way now. And uh, the field is getting more stretched out, as you would imagine, given that we're over eight uh, hours 15 into this one. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we've still got less than a lap out front at the moment because satellite racing have not long been in the pit lane as you say Tom Kapusta now is driving that car for the first time uh, apparently uh, Kieran said this earlier Polish Canadian driver uh, kind of a, a mixed nationality yeah, I'm pretty sure that was Tom Kapusta but anyway um, yeah <laughs> we've got uh, a few uh, different uh, obviously we've got information on, on everybody and we're trying to work, work out what, which which is relevant or not but yeah Tom too, Kapusta yeah. is uh, trying is uh, still leading at the moment, one at one minute and forty-five seconds of an advantage in front of ProSim. As uh, you, you weren't joking about the Mugen Sim Racing car actually pushing because they've just pushed a little bit over the edge actually onto the gravel through Lesmo One, and uh, yeah, that's just an illustration really of how hard they're pushing. Uh, I would argue at some points I don't want to criticise these guys driving too much because I'm a terrible one myself, but um, <laughs> you know. It's kind of our job, um, you know, maybe pushing a little bit too hard at times throughout this race. Uh, and like you say, it's easy for us to say. It's uh, it's a comfy seat in the commentary box <laughs> when uh, when situations like that happens. So uh, yeah, but I mean, looking at uh, looking at some of the cars, they have got some windscreen wipers open. It does look like we're finally seeing signs of the rain beginning to bother some of the drivers. That could shake up the order. Uh, now we didn't get any wet weather running during practice or qualifying. Now qualifying was running both day and night conditions. So that cycle was dealt with, but rain, no sign of it. Well, rain was very much a no-show. And the, the 33 Audi, like I say, in the hands of Ronan Suits at the moment, last time around, 148, 590. He's some three seconds a lap quicker than the 717 team. That's the Unison Racing Corvette. Um, and they struggled a little bit with that Corvette during qualifying, but they managed to keep, again, keep that level of consistency well up there on the field in fourth position. So, yeah, that's good to see that they are still going. And that's a screaming Audi uh, in the hand of Roland Six now heading down towards uh, Del Loggia. Uh, no one immediately ahead of him. He's still got, uh, what's he got to close down? Still 30 seconds, but he's closed in about five seconds uh, in the last three laps or so so like you say he's really really pushing hard but he's got to be careful for overdriving the car especially if the, the grip level is now going to start to descend because there is that for that troublesome falling water that we've been looking forward to well we commentators have been looking forward to it. i'm not sure the drivers have particularly but uh, even still that doesn't seem to be bothering uh, running suits any Lap no, drops are coming down. You can see that across the field. We're seeing the you know, regular 50s and 51s where we were getting the 46th and 47th. My goodness, watching the steering wheel uh, of Rona 6, he's, uh, he's hustling that car hard to make up for last ground. But yeah, I mean, still got three and a bit hours to go. He doesn't need to necessarily push that hard, but he, you know, they're aiming for the top spots. He's got three laps to undo if he wants to get the top spot, certainly. But he's going to need a bit of luck on his side to, to close down three laps in uh, in three hours. I mean, I know that they're, they're, I know they're quicker than the field. They're not that much quicker than the field, but that's not bothering them yet. No, they're certainly doing everything they can at this stage to try and uh, and get up towards the uh, towards the front of the field as i said i think a podium is still possible for them but um, whether they're going to get it or not is another story just under tw uh, 27 seconds up to unison racing uh, but then they're actually over a lap behind uh, GSR Team Aston at the moment, and I'm not entirely sure uh, when they're coming. I think Unison Racing will be in about 10 minutes, so just over that. But um, for some reason, 
uh, GSR team Aston have done themselves a massive favour in these last round of stops or so uh, and they've got themselves a big margin actually and so uh, that's interesting to see but uh, yeah Zooks is certainly pushing we've seen we've enjoyed the ride on board with him in the last few moments and this Audi does seem to be a little bit snappy, a little bit excitable at times. You know, maybe that's helpful for sprint racing. You get the car turned mm -hmm. in, you're going to have no problems with understeer or anything like that. But, you know, can you really keep that car on the road, your concentration for an entire 12-hour race? Unfortunately, we've seen that car in the wall one too many times in this race, really. But um, it's still going. That's the, the most that can be said for it. And it's all about confidence in these conditions. It's changeable right now. What these guys would rather, really, is that well, most of them anyway would rather a completely dry circuit or a completely wet one because that would just make things simple but the way things are right now it's really not simple and um, you've got to judge the grip every single corner that you go into it's a new level of grip you've got to judge it every time and if you're not confident in your, in your car to begin with then that uh, then that calculation all of a sudden becomes a lot more difficult yeah, precisely. And this is not really what these guys want, especially in an endurance event. Now, in, in shorter races, having changeable weather is easier to handle because you're not handling it for so long. But, you know, like we said earlier, these guys have been going for hours. You know, there, there's going to be a fair amount of fatigue. And now they are forced to concentrate more than they normally would do because they can't just rely on mem muscle memory 100% of the time. They can't rely on this set breaking point or this set turning in point being exactly the same as it was last lap because of uh, you know varying amounts of rain out there and like exactly as you said you and that's going to change lap on lap better and worse they can't just assume it's going to degrade as the race goes on so yeah times like this the uh, commentary commentary box seat gets even more comfortable yeah, it does get very comfortable and it gets quite exciting as well uh, for us commentators. We very much enjoy a bit of changeable conditions. Oh my word, Zooks is going backwards in to Lesmo 1 and presumably the same through Lesmo 2. The rain is starting to get a little bit harder now and uh, it's it's getting a little bit more difficult. By the way, we've got an update, an unfortunate update actually, on the only GT4 that entered here this weekend, the Viaduct and Ducklings car. Unfortunately, uh, they absolutely exploded their engine going down towards turn number 1. The fastest point on the circuit uh, and uh, the engine had enough clearly we saw it stopped on the way down towards turn number one well that wasn't um that wasn't for any uh, any good issue i'm afraid as if there is one um mm -hmm. it was the end of their engine i'm afraid and it's it spells the end of their race um so uh, an interesting uh, uh, an interesting lineup certainly we know that it was made up of uh, three very young uh, kart racers up and coming I'm sure we'll see more of them in the future um, and, and a great place to learn actually that there was no pressure on them with no other GT4 cars uh, it's just a special event it doesn't really matter there's not a whole year years work li li lying on this race it's just a special event a bit of a test event for a lot of these guys and uh, not more so than those ones and uh, it was a great place to learn unfortunately um, eight hours was enough for that engine and uh, no more learning can be done for them on this occasion I'm afraid but a great experience for the, those uh, young drivers nonetheless absolutely and they really did give it their best and uh, you know we really do hope they return for future events also the uh, the 62 uh, car uh, hit the protein team twice uh, during the course of the of the event so a drive through and a 30 second stop go penalty uh, for them that's the unison racing BMW uh, has come to grief a few times uh, so yeah they've had some yeah, big surprises as the uh, hours continue to count away but uh, yeah, it just really goes to show the experience as well of the uh, of the 65 team. They've done very, very well to maintain the gap that they have. But I'm also keeping a very, very firm eye on that gap between uh, Ronan Suits in the 33 and the uh, 717 Unison Racing uh, Corvette uh, currently in the, hand, in the hands of Arcturus Kamal. And that gap is plummeting it's now under 20 seconds so uh, he's really come yeah, really got to grips with the lack of grip out there is uh, <laughs> as Roden seeks absolutely having us you know doing a sterling job out there he's currently uh, screaming down towards oh he's just coming in to parabolica now you can just see by the state of the road he, he's just the water level is, is getting more and more of a concern but in 
yeah, in other areas, the, the the water's barely there. So he's really having to focus very, very hard. But at the moment, he is doing a grand job to shrink that gap between himself and the Corvette. Now will be another three seconds to his advantage. 149, 182 for the 33 Audi and 152, 297 for the Corvette. But after that, he's got quite a big gap between himself and uh, Stavros Mazaris in the number 14. That's the uh, that's the GSR team Aston, the sole Aston in the event. Only six cars remaining now. Uh, you know, the, the attrition rate has been a little bit unkind, but that, again, is the nature of endurance racing. Is uh, you know, There will be times where when, you know, by the technical issue, or so we've had actually sickness in in one of uh, one of the teams. So that's a great shame for them. But like you said, you it's, it's not necessarily you know years and years of worth of work that led up to this point. You know, for some teams, it, it's kind of well, let's do a few laps and then give it a try. And, and all credit to them for for trying that. A lot of practice goes into these events, yes. But it, it, at least you know, sim racing is uh, always a cost-effective way of uh, pounding around Monza for twelve hours. Yeah, exactly. It uh, definitely costs a lot less to do this here than in real life. There's no doubt about that one. Um, and uh, yeah, w there is actually, a, or there was last year anyway, a 12-hour race at Monza in real life um, for similar cars in GT3 cars. It, right, it was thunderstormy conditions that weekend as well, actually, uh, which is almost ironic. But it was so thunderstormy that uh, a tree actually blew onto the circuit. I mentioned this a little bit earlier on, um, but uh, that's quite uh, extreme, really. Um, and I know, I'm not going to repeat Kieran's terrible pun about trees and extreme but anyway you, you get the rest <laughs> um it was it, it was very very wet indeed and finally it looks like we're seeing some kind of uh, moisture falling from the sky although it's not quite as much uh, there's no spray being picked up per se and i haven't seen anybody jumping into the pit lane for wet tyres just yet but I'm starting to see a couple of mistakes out there, a two minute lap time from GSR Team Aston has got to be a mistake um, from those guys on that lap and you know, a 1 minute 54 despite not making any mistake, you know that's when you, those kind of lap times is when you start to really realise that these conditions really are actually starting to have an effect now, it's not sort of visual, psychological rain as I would call it anymore it's <laughs> proper rain now and it's actually making a difference to these cars rather than just their brains yeah, the really, really wet rain that, that tends to happen. But yeah, absolutely. It's even affecting the 33 Audi. As I've been keeping a very close eye on that, and even the tail of that under the very experienced right foot of Rona Suits is really getting lively now. He's He's been the fastest man on track for quite some time, even you know quicker than the 65 car uh, of Tom Capusta at the moment. Uh, but, you know, they're out, they, they've got a minute and a half plus uh, lead up front which over the course of nine hours or eight and a half hours is, is not a huge gap but it's certainly enough that he doesn't feel the need to push uh, he's still building that gap, albeit only by about three tenths of a second the last time around. The, the, the lap times are still not dras drastically different. As wow, I just watch the uh, the Audi very sideways through Parabolica. Uh, he caught that one very, very well. You'll not see huge gaps in the lap time either. We're not seeing two minutes from one people, one one fifty from another. It's, it's all in the same kind of ballpark, other than you know individual mistakes that are that are kicking in. So again, great effort from these guys. But the, I'm suspecting we're going to be seeing, seeing some uh, time, certainly some spray, but more than likely some pit stops relatively soon, just watching how these cars are skating around. I'm really quite amazed that we've not seen really pit stops so far for the weather because it's been, uh, it's getting quite wet now and it's getting quite difficult. We've seen Zooks uh, pushing it hard here. We, we've been watching him on board for the last few moments. It looks like the GSR team Aston's actually been in the pit lane unless they've had a catastrophic mistake because the gap's now down below 23 seconds as opposed to the nearly a lap that it was uh, earlier on. The rain is getting heavier as well now, by the way. Three millimetres an hour, which, I, I, again, I'm not quite sure how it is, but uh, it's certainly enough to make a difference. There's no doubt about that, and it is making a difference right now. Let's uh, see if I can find uh, the GSR team and uh, whether they've put... Well, I'm not sure if they've put wet tyres on or not, but uh, what I am sure about is that they've lost a lot of time here because the gap's now 22 seconds to the car behind as opposed to nearly a lap, and we'll know very shortly if they start diving for wet patches on the straights that they have actually put the wet tyres on it might have been a little bit too early even though it looks quite bad for us right now the wet tyres might not actually be that much better the way the conditions are right now 
the Unison Racing 717 Corvette is actually stuck behind the uh, sixth place treble seven uh, Mads Hedegaard in the DSR Nightmare uh, Audi. That won't be pleasing the Corvette any. Uh, if you actually look back from the Corvette, you will see that Audi getting uh, looming large. So. Uh, that'll be annoying him, but he's been there for a little while. But whilst uh, he continues to battle the Audi, uh, we'll have a quick break and a word from our sponsors. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Leap Gaming, ESTV, and motorvision.tv A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this 12 Hours of Monza event held by GTR 24 Hours. We have got three and a half hours remaining. The race is still being led by the 65 car, the VSR Satellite Racing McLaren, in the hands of Tom Capusta. It's uh, in the commercial break, the number 14 Corvette came into the pits, assumedly to fit wet onto the car. <laughs> And they are continuing on their merry way. The uh, 33 Audi was still closing in on them, so no one's actually told Ronan Suggs it's very slippery out there. He's uh, still uh, fighting his way through on the uh, ties he's been on for a while. The lap times are still in Ronan Suggs' favour indeed, so... He's not suffering too badly, but uh, the weather conditions are still deteriorating. The rain is continuing to fall quite a pace, so surely he's going to... So he's going to have to be in at some point, but he's doing a grand old job on those tyres. 
Yeah, he absolutely is. That was uh, a shot of the Unison Racing 717, by the way, with uh, what we believe to be treaded tyres. I didn't see it myself, but I've, been, I've had it confirmed to me that uh, somebody's had a look and they are indeed treaded tyres. So uh, thanks, thanks for that update, um, because uh, we wouldn't have known otherwise. Well, I certainly wouldn't have known um, without, uh, without it. Um, it's uh, difficult to tell, though, uh, at this point. And it will be very interesting to see what the lap times are like. My only kind of reservation about it is is the fact that the Unison Racing car was being caught by the likes of Zooks anyway. Um, it was fairly level with GSR team, so maybe we can pe compare it there, but it's very difficult to compare these lap times sometimes because you don't quite know which is driver talent and which is a, a tyre advantage. I mean, 10 seconds one way or the other maybe does point towards some kind of tyre thing going on, but you know, when these guys are so evenly matched, uh, it can be hard to tell if it's a driver giving one the edge or if it is indeed the tyres carrying them around completely but by this point the uh, the car behavior will tend to be the biggest giveaway on uh, what tires they're on we're starting to see you know real definitive spray coming off the back of these cars now um so last time around for the 717 was a 205 which you know well, given, given the chances of course just come out of the pits but he's not kind of squirming around he's not fighting the car every few moments but in fairness, neither was Ronan Suits. But that, uh, you know, he's going to lose that uh, battle with traction fairly soon, I'd have thought, unless he's been on treaded tyres for a long time. And if he has been, he's managed to make them work really well. A 52.9 for the Audi last time around. So, again, he just seems to be in an, on another planet as far as pace is concerned. 54.1 from the lead McLaren. So everyone is struggling, but they're not wanting to come in to, to get those tyres done. Uh, he's still on slick tyres just had confirmation of that so how the hell he's making that work so well um, fair play oh, it's, it would seem to be he's on slick tyres so he's done a brilliant job and you can see as well the road is very very shiny there is a distinct amount of water out there but I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on how the 717 does the car looks fairly well behaved so I imagine they have gone on to wet tyres now uh, they were being caught pretty rapidly by the 33 Audi of, you know, in the hands of Roland Six before they came in so they may well have opted well we're going to be overtaken anyway we may as well come on to the wet weather tyres and the, the wet weather seems to be pretty persistent it doesn't seem to be going anywhere in a hurry so I'll report back when the fifth place car comes over and it looks like we just stopped raining again uh, oh, by the looks of things. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's not uh, worked out particularly well uh, for Unison Racing, especially who we believe to have just put on those uh, wet weather tyres. The weather conditions have been so changeable, and I said this earlier on that we really weren't expecting it, and it's still ringing true, really, the fact that uh, the rain just keeps starting and stopping, because even according to the forecast that I looked at this morning, I saw, you know, even sunshine towards some of the parts of the parts of the early morning but you know once the rain came it was that was going to be it then that it was going to be a washout for the rest of the day but we've heard we've heard sprinkles for hours now we've had you know drizzles here sprinkles there and um i'm not talking about ice cream flavors either it's been raining a little bit um uh, throughout the the entirety of this race on as it seems as Roland zooks is now across the corner at turn number one clearly pushing hard but you know you can't really correct your mistake when you're on slick tires on a wet track like this it's not like you can slow down any faster and you know, he passed the point of no return there. He had to skip across the curves at turn one. But clearly, that will have woken him, woken him up, and he's going to have to give up a little bit of time so that he didn't actually gain anything there. But I'm sure he didn't. We've not been left wondering about how hard he's pushing, though. He's still going to the absolute edge. Yeah, Windsor and Weber's still going, so there may well still be some rain falling. Uh, that's the, the nature of, of these changeable conditions. It could be raining in one area and, and not raining in another. I won't say it's dry, because it very clearly isn't. Uh, even still, Roland Zeng's last lap was a 53.5, which is, of course, getting slower and slower as these conditions continue to deteriorate. But he's still quicker than anyone else. It's, uh, he, does he realise that it's raining? Does he just think that the car is dying on him? He's just determined to make it work. And uh, very slippery through Parabolica. So uh, he clearly knows that 
uh, the, the conditions are getting worse, but he's making it work. He's, he's staying with these tyres. Are they banking on the you know the rain stopping? Was it you know we had the report that it has stopped. Oh, that looked a little deep coming into Parabolica. Very, the car unwilling to slow down there. But again, if you can make it work, and if you can just bypass having a tire change, it's still no sign of coming into the pits this time around. Yeah, you know, there's time to be made up if you can just work through this slippery phase, and you know get through it and then enjoy the the drier conditions when everyone else has got to come in you'll gain bucket loads of time and still another 53.5 from that Audi despite the fact he skipped over the rest of video she came last time around fantastic work yeah absolutely he's driving really well at the moment and uh, it's just just phenomenal to see him run a ball with him at the moment the thing is as well Uniton Racing having already pitted for wet tyres they've already kind of played their cards here and they can't really go back at this point if things go the way of Mugen Sim Racing and indeed GSR team who will be hoping for this as well um, and they you know they've toughed it out on the wet weather oh, sorry on the dries but it, you know then it's going to dry up a little bit more then they will have saved not one but two pit stops because let's not forget you've got to have one to change onto the wet tyres for the first place and one to take them off again when you realise they don't work so uh, that would have cost them an awful lot of time for um, Unison Racing and uh, you know they're already one minute 45 nearly behind Ronan Zook so they'd probably be nearly a lap and a half down on him if indeed that uh, things don't go their way so um, yeah it's uh, a real crucial moment for Unison Racing and they'll be doing their rain dance certainly uh, so that they don't lose out as much as they're projected to right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I, I'm just stunned that uh, Ronan Seuss is making that work so well. I mean, you've always got one, that there's always someone in, in, in a crew that can just work magic with how well they they uh, stay with these changeable conditions and it would seem Ronan Seuss is the rain master of the 33 team uh, phenomenal work and he could well just hand over fist just destroy the gap ahead of him and I would say it's still you know under three and a half hours to, still to run of this race if these weather conditions don't change to a great degree that's going to really pay dividends for the Mugenson racing team yeah, absolutely it is. Um, so uh, it's it's all about toughing it out at this point. But it doesn't even seem to be, for, for, for most of these people, as I said, it's going to be just toughing it out, just trying to make it around the circuit without crashing. But Zooks is attacking these conditions, and normally you wouldn't really advise that uh, at this point. But um, it, at this point, it's working for Zooks. It's working at the moment, and it's almost mesmerizing to watch at the moment the gap now is coming down to the gsr team uh, ashton in front the gap is just over three seconds we're bound to see a fight between them uh, and by the way i know we we're on commercial while well, it happened but there wasn't really much of a fight between moving sim racing and unison racing anyway um, i know we did uh, we didn't quite catch it but uh, because zooks caught unison car a little bit quicker oh he's off Ronald Zooks is off, just about keeps it out of the barriers, but this is what we mean about pushing a little bit too hard into Lesmo 2. He's just got that kicker oversteer on the entry, and I'm afraid he's going to, have, uh, he's going to pay for that one a little bit. He's lost uh, he's about double his advantage to the car in front, about six or seven seconds now. Oh dear, oh dear, even, uh, even the greats have made mistakes on that one, so... Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, make up that one. But yeah, surely that's going to be the time. Surely that is going to be the indication. Now, you know, I've done the best, done the best I can of this car. Let's uh, let's uh, with these tyres. Let's uh, bring it in and see what we can do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's uh, we'll wait and see. Those decisions have to be made for fairly quickly. The, the gap is now four and a half seconds, so it was down to three um, at about uh, the time at about, at about uh, well, the start of the lap. And then it got up to six or seven, and by the end of the lap, it's down to 4.8 again. So despite that um, little, uh, despite the fact that he's got back going again, it's still not uh, really 
Um, uh, well, still hasn't lost any time really in this one. Uh, still not phased him either. But the thing is, with, with these conditions, you've got to maintain your confidence as well uh, throughout the entirety uh, the, the, of the time that these conditions are actually present. And it doesn't seem that uh, it's, it's phased him at all in this one. He's still attacking these conditions despite the fact he had that little off. Most people would lose confidence and maybe drive a little bit more within themselves. But Sukes is uh, still attacking them and still driving in much the same way than he was before. Yeah, it's, it's been working so, so well for so long. He's not going to change the formula now and absolutely fair play to him for that. Uh, but he's he's getting to the edge of really what he can do on these tyres. But again, no one seems to have told him. He's still making it work. And I mean, that really is the sign. Uh, yeah, that is those kind of things that separate the good from the great in these kind of circumstances. And, you know, the... the the, that team have put the right driver in at the right time which is another very important part of endurance racing having the right guy in the right conditions at the right time yeah, it's no good having your rain master in um, at the wrong time oh as he skips over just as I say that just like I've seen his praises he skips over the uh, Ascari chicane so that's not gone well for him either but uh, he's doing his best with what he's got in, in all fairness yeah, absolutely. We're trying to get a replay for it at the moment, but given that we're nearly nine hours into the race, it's taking quite a long time to load. But uh, that's why you know, don't adjust your sets at home. It's just, it's just, um, it's just the uh, just the replay loading. Here is the mistake. It's just a little bit of an outbreaking, really, a bit of understeer going on into Ascari and. It's harmless really but uh, you just it just does make you wonder about uh, how it could have gone wrong really um, and uh, yeah it's, uh, it's it's certainly something you'd rather avoid as the GSR team Aston actually comes into the pit lane probably for some wet tyres at this point yeah, the the, 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 the Ronan suit is really, really struggling, even by his standard now. Everyone else has pretty much given up on what's going on on these tyres before now, but uh, Ronan suit's pressing on. Um, but, yeah, he, he really is getting to, to the point of no return now. He's, you know, 56-9 his last lap. He's got to be getting in. He can't continue on that uh, that kind of basis. He's going to start losing time over those that start to get into the groove of the groove tyres, pad fully intended, as bad <laughs> as it was. Um, yeah, he's got to be, he's got to bring, bring in that car in. But then, I've said that, and he'll carry on for another 10 laps. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what he does. But I would imagine, surely, now, now is the time he's you know he's got to yeah and, and now the rain is really starting to chuck it down he's he's now really running the risk of just throwing that car into the wall out of sheer determination and stubbornness so yeah he's got to be coming in pretty quickly as uh, Hedegor is off the road oh, at the moment, he's just got back going again now uh, through the first Lesmo so uh, the conditions are starting to catch out a few, the weather has just taken a bit of a turn for the worse and wet weather tyres are now definitely going to be the norm they're definitely going to be actually having to watch the lap times in the next few moments because uh, Unison Racing haven't really been able to make it work too well um, throughout this one they're not faster than any of the top three cars as things stand but are the weather conditions now justified in putting wet tyres on. Well, Roland Zooks doesn't think so. He carries on for another lap, and it's going to be a little while until we find out uh, if the GSR team are actually catching the Mewen team or not. But, uh, you know, a 156.8 for Roland Zooks on that last lap, that is not a bad lap time by any stretch of the imagination, especially in these conditions. But you just wonder how much longer he can actually keep this up for. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're watching him under braking. That car is dancing absolutely everywhere. The, uh, you know, the 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 brake pedal is and the driver, of course, doing exactly everything they can to keep that car from just skewing off uh, into the wall. Surely, sooner or later, he's going to have to admit defeat. But he's been absolutely heroic uh, in his performance on these tyres, in these conditions, in these ever worsening conditions as well. Um, la quickest car kind of last time around was actually the Prosim Bentley um, they were a couple of seconds quicker than the 65 McLaren so uh, it could be that they has, have uh, found some traction somewhere that uh, no one else has we'll see as the uh, as the race goes on a leading car into the pits then so the uh, VSR satellite racing McLaren has decided enough's enough on those tyres I wonder whether the, the Prosim Bentley's already done that process unfortunately I didn't see it if they did but yeah, 
ball to Roland, you know, message to Roland Six for goodness sake, bring it in. Yeah, it's, that might well be the message at this point, really, because it is uh, quite uh, it's quite slippery out there, as you might be able to imagine. He's just coming down towards the parabolica at the moment, and he may well do that now. Uh, so we'll wait and see. The lead has been in. I think there's only about half the field out there not on wet tyres now, and surely this can only go on for so much longer um, because of the conditions, the way they are, and the way they're worsening. Definitely not going to get better before it gets worse here, although Zooks hangs it out wide and he carries on. <laughs> <laughs> for another lap this is quite remarkable at the moment the pro sim car is not too far behind him on the road and they stay out as well right now so leader is in but uh, they've uh, they've blinked before pro sim and mugen there which is a little bit surprising i would have thought that the satellite racing would um you know not to uh, not go on to this strategy unless it was tried and trusted but they've decided to go for it anyway maybe it's a safer choice and they have the uh, time advantage to do it as well, so they'll come out. Still plenty of time in the lead. But that Bentley was one, uh, sorry, 2.3 seconds faster than the Audi last time around. So I reckon the uh, Protein Bentley's already been in, has got the right tyres on the car. And, you know, watching the Audi, you can just see that Bentley getting bigger and noisier uh, in their ears. So, uh, you yeah, know, they're going to be a, another lap down. They're already a lap down from on the uh, Pro Sim Bentley so that's not going to get that's not going to get any better I think the 14 has either been off the road time or has been in the pits again because they did a three minute lap last time around ah there we go 157.7 so they're still lapping in pretty decent pace amazingly running suits he's still in that ballpark at that time for, as I say 57.3 last time around for him but the the, the Bentley behind is uh, considerably quicker I mean sector one alone eight tenths of a second to the Bentley's advantage sector two a full second to the Bentley there's, there's so many indications that that Audi needs to get in but Again, Roland Suits has got has got other ideas. I can just picture, you know, the man on the pit wall frantically waving his board, flag, flares, anything he can find to uh, get a hold of the driver to get him in. Yeah, just uh, they just can't get a hold of him at the moment, and uh, yeah, he's, he's probably enjoying himself too much out there at the moment. Although now, <laughs> finally, he looks like he's. Uh, oh no, it was just nope. a slide. He was just catching a slide, and he's carrying on again uh, here for another lap. What's the lap time going to be on this occasion? A fifty-eight, 58 nine, nine, to my knowledge, and that is starting to get a little bit worse. We'll wait and see what the lap times for the likes of the GSR team and uh, also uh, Unison Racing. And we're going to be coming over the line in about half a lap's time. But, oh, um, the, yeah, that's not good news. The Audi's got uh, Ratafilio all wrong. He's uh, skipped over that one again. And the Bentley is going to be right with them very, very soon. They carry on doing that. Yeah, I, I, you, you've done very, very well, sir. But surely enough's enough. And that's going to allow, or more than likely allow, the number 14, uh, the GSR team Aston to come past them. But we know just how good uh, the 33, the Mugen Sim Racing team is. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if they make up a lot of the time. I can't say they're losing a lot of time up to this point but they certainly are now losing a lot of time you just see the way the car is misbehaving it is getting harder and harder to keep that Audi in a straight line and just look at the raw pace difference of the Bentley coming through Lesmo 2 alone this is a single corner the, you know, the, the, whoever it is piloting the, the Bentley is just so much more confident with it at the moment and Ronin Suits is, will have absolutely no answer at all to the uh, big old Bentley screaming away in his ears uh, and oh. your horn the tail of the uh, Audi is very very loose and the Bentley's just gonna steam on by there's no way Ronin Suits will be able to fight that they're not even they're not on the same lap so you know of course he would uh, you know logic would say you wouldn't fight it but even if even if he had the option to he just he's, there's nothing there surely now and how many times have we said it he's got to come in Oh, that car is just wriggling around. Now, yes, finally. finally, oh. he comes in. 
He's seen sense and he's into the pit lane. Oh dear. He's, he was not before losing a lot of time. I can't help but feel like that might have hurt him a little bit in this race, really. Um, because, you know, he stayed out there for a long time and a lot longer than I certainly would have. We're on board with the Bentley at the moment. The Prosim Bentley driving very well, I have to say. You might think that it's quite a big car and it wouldn't particularly be very suited to the wet weather conditions. You know, not really able to change direction quickly. Not light on its feet, certainly. But what it does do is allow it to keep temperature in the tire for uh, quite a lot longer than uh, maybe other cars and also um, it's, uh, it, it's 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 not really affected by uh, or, well that, that's basically it I think um, uh, it's, it doesn't matter that it's not agile it's just it's it's good at keeping its uh, tyres up to temperature so whether he's on the wet tyres now or indeed trying to stick it out on the dries for any length of time the Bentley is a pretty decent shout at it and the rest of the cars in the field fairly light on their feet which also means not much temperature and uh, that's not really very good in uh the, uh, in the wet weather conditions, but Roland Zooks might have just overdone it there ever so slightly. We're waiting to see how long his pit stop's going to be, because it was quite a short one for the GSR team, and it looks like they've already got through into third place again, so Zooks is going to have to do that catching all over again, but what he has done is been able to get himself into fourth place. He was just behind Unison Racing when they came into pit lane. He's gained about half a minute on them in this time. Yeah, but we'll see now that amount of time he's lost for going on, I would say, at least two laps too long on those tyres. When when he comes around again, we'll then have an idea of the gap between uh, himself and the Unison Racing Ford, uh, sorry, the uh, Team GSR uh, Aston. So, you know, we'll see how... But, you know, he's an incredible driver. That, that team is an incredible team. Uh, so I have no doubt they'll be able to, to get up to pace very, very quickly. But uh, for their sake, I hope it hasn't really cost them too much. I'm keeping an eye on the uh, top lap times as well. 55.7 from uh, Tom Capusta in the lead McLaren. So that McLaren is really, really doing well to maintain its pace. Uh, it's still got a minute and a half advantage over the 007 Pro Sim Bentley. So, uh, you know, the, the 65 team... The uh, VSR Satellite Racing Team have done a great job. Uh, the American squad have done a superb job with that car. 56 flat last time around. Um, you know, the, the lap times will, of course, vary. Uh, lap on lap, it's not going to be too consistent. But their lap times have been really, really strong for a very long time indeed. And in saying that, though, just looking at the Sector 2 time, uh, now that Roland Suits is back on track, he's, he's not... He means business. He's uh, out there and straight on the gas. Was half a second quicker than the lead McLaren. So don't discount him for too long. He's about 13 ish seconds behind the, uh, the Aston Martin. So I can easily see that he can draw that in pretty quickly. Uh, so he'll be hustling for for that podium spot again. But of course, there's every chance that the rain may ease off again. <laughs> Mother Nature will not be dictated to. Nothing is written in stone until that checkered flag falls. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't help but feel like this situation will be very similar, even if it was dry, because the Mugen Sim Racing car, very consistently throughout this race, has been the fastest out there on the circuit. However, um, it has also had quite a lot of issues in this race. Nick, we're now three laps down now from the leaders, um, and uh, that's basically all down to the problems that they've had. They've had so many spins, a couple of uh, re uh, damage repairs as well, uh, when it was all looking very good for a satellite versus Mugen uh, slogfest for the victory. Victory. It's all turned out a little bit pear-shaped for Christopher Kierner because he was coming towards the end of his stint. Um, he was unfortunately had that incident just on the exit of the Della Roggio chicane and uh, that means that he's, uh, or they are now down battling for third place in this race. It's still not a bad result, mind you, but uh, it's still not quite what they were aiming for coming into uh, this weekend and it's probably not what they could have managed either. Um, certainly seems to be one of the faster cars out there on the circuit though at the moment, just the Audi. We're waiting to see a lap time when did they come over the line this time around but uh, you know it could well be in the low 55s uh, roundabout where Satellite and Proxim are and I wouldn't be surprised at all uh, to indeed see that in a few moments time. Yeah, watching that Audi now is a very different beast. It's, or well, you know, despite that uh, little bounce over the apex, or uh, sorry, exit strip of uh, Ascari, it's now much more planted. It looks much more in control than it was before. It's not snaking around under the brakes. It's uh, changing direction very, very nicely, maintaining its momentum. So yeah. It, 
that's uh, that car is going to be absolutely flying. Uh, you have no doubt about that. Yeah, the uh, lap time's just three tenths of a second apart from the top two. A 54-0 for Ronan Souks in that Audi. Good Lord, that is one and a half seconds faster than the leaders. Again, still like like you said earlier, Ewan, that's three laps he's got to he's got to pull in. So that's going to be you know the best part of six minutes that he has to close in if he's looking for the top spot. Only nine and a half seconds between himself and the Aston. Martin of the GSR team so it will be uh, Greece versus Hungary shortly but at that pace I can't really see what uh, and though they've had a, a driver change as well since the last look at them as now uh, Nicholas uh, again apologies for the pronunciation here of uh, Estitatu that's not entirely correct but I apologize for that uh, but yeah they uh, the number 14 team is uh, we all st I would imagine they're going to struggle to get that behind they were nearly four seconds slower on that last lap than this charging Audi goodness me uh, Ronin Souks he really means business now we're assuming he's going to hand that car over uh, again at some point in the race but uh, again he's just so quick they may just leave him out there for as long as they can well, yeah, exactly, and uh, this Mugen Sim Racing team have been known to, to do very, very long stints throughout this race. Um, for example, the first three hours of this race was driven uh, by uh, Zoltan Varkingi, who's a GT3 driver for them in the EWC, and he did the first three stints, which is not out of the ordinary, but then Christopher Kianak did four hours in that car, which is really quite a long time. Uh, Zooks has now spent a couple of hours in that car, but can he really go three more hours at this pace, this intensity in these conditions? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, we know he's a very, very good driver, but um, still, I wouldn't really trust anybody driving in, in these conditions for five long hours, um, especially with the uh, kind of the kind of chasing he's got to do right now to try and get this podium. Uh, you know, he's four seconds behind right now. The battle seems to be imminent between the two of them, but um, that's a long time to be driving. Uh, it's five hours. We, although, you're right, they are going to be reluctant to take him out of the car because he's used to this... Excuse me, he's, he's used to these conditions, he's seen them evolve, and he's shown to be the best of the of the field in these conditions as well, for uh, at least throughout the, uh, throughout the last few moments anyway. Yeah, we don't have a lot of information on uh, Ronan Souks either. He's, uh, he's, well, been racing since the spring of 2020, so he's uh, not an overly experienced in racing driver. Uh, he's also in the uh, WWE. Double E W C. That's a very awkward way of saying that. Uh, so uh, certainly a very very talented uh, sim racer, but against the likes uh, of some of the others that uh, you know maybe have a feel like Carlos Basto, for instance, in the fifty one Ramada Sport Car. Sadly, we, you know that uh, car retired some time ago, and you know it's uh, he's got all kinds of experience, but you know, behind him. And uh, that sadly has not paid off for him. So it's very much, it's almost kind of youth versus uh, the establishment. And it's certainly true. It, oh dear, that's a spin. Who's uh, who's had a spot? Oh, it's the triple so That's uh, Matt Hedegaard that's uh, gone for a bit of an explore on the exit of Parabolica. That's not going to help his time. Uh, as I mentioned, that Ronin suit is now on the tail of the uh, of the Corvette of Nicholas F. Startu. Again, apologies for not saying that name entirely correctly. It's, it's going to be... Uh, I can't really see what defence, based on the lap times alone, that Corvette's going to have. It was a 58.6 for the Corvette last time. What is it? 58.3? A 54.8 for the Audi. Almost four seconds quicker. Absolutely unreal. So we, I'm just imagining he's just going to sail by. Yeah, I can't imagine uh, this is going to take very long for Zooks, although that Mugen Sim Racing car has had a history of not being able to overtake cars very easily all day, because especially here at Monza, the effect is more exaggerated than anywhere else. You need straight line speed to be able to at least pull alongside the, ne the next car and then do the do it under brakes. But this time around, it doesn't look like the Aston Martin has got very much straight line speed at all either. So Zooks is going to be able to head to the inside, brake later, hopefully not too late, because he is on the wrong line 
plan for this, but doesn't matter too much. Duke's able to go through. The GSR team are going to be not too disappointed by it because I think they've uh, completely outperformed themselves in this race and they've completely overperformed their expectations in this race. But uh, they have been demoted to fourth and Roland Zook's back into the top three. He's got over two laps to get up to the Prosim cart. At the rate he's pulling them in, I would say that's pretty much impossible with less than three hours to go. But uh, he's going to be hanging out hope that maybe there's a, there's a glimmer of hope in some kind of incident for those two up in front yeah he, he's going to need some luck on his side to uh, you know really overturn that kind of gap but anything is possible I mean we, we've seen he himself make mistakes we've seen you know cars retire with more experience under their belt so uh, anything is possible he, he's just like we said earlier you cannot uh, you, you can't write the results until the checkered flag falls I've seen cars you know after 23 and a half hours run out of fuel so uh, I think we all have, uh, have seen similar in uh, racing fields and, and sprints uh, alike so you, you just never know it's uh, always those calculations that you have to do and uh, sometimes they get it wrong and that's what you, that they're going to be hoping for um, certainly at this point but uh, yeah we've got just under three hours to go as things stand so I think uh, if we're I think it's time for a, a, a cheeky commercial break we'll just uh, sneak one in here while uh, after that battle now so you're watching the uh, GTR 24H 12 hours of Monza and we'll be back on the other side of this ad break The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Fleet Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, 12 Hours of Monza. And what a, f what a race we've had thus far. We're in the final quarter of it now, less than three hours to go. Uh, still leading the way is uh, Tom Kubusta in the 65 VSR satellite race in McLaren. He still has over a minute and a half to his advantage, but that can change. Uh, it sounds a long time, but it can change in the blink of an eye in an endurance race. Ronan Suits now back up into third position in the uh, Mugen Sim Racing Audi. He's been absolutely charging, but just the, the pace difference alone is not enough. Uh, with the amount of time left, he would have to uh, rely on some bad luck on our competitors. We're seeing the the uh, storm chart and whoa, big area of red. It's just north of the circuit, so we're not going to see that. Um, it looks like it's going to stop raining at some point fairly soon, so our competitors may have to get off those treaded tyres. Uh, so, yeah, that's another thing that our uh, competitors have to deal with. So joining us back in the commentary box, Yusuf, welcome back. Yeah, it's good to be back and uh, good to be alongside you as well, Chris, our, our first pairing of the day. And as you mentioned, that rain may potentially clear a big gap for Tom Kabusa in the 65 car, but this is endurance racing. All it takes is one slip up. And in these conditions, that can be oh so easy to do. And then ProSim would be finding themselves on the top step. Also got a bit of a battle starting to emerge for third. Roland Zooks 12 seconds ahead of Nikolaus F's. F's Tatui, and I think he recently got past him. I don't know if he's got an extra pit stop to make, but either way, good recovery from Mugen Sim Racing to climb up into or back up into the podium spots. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the 33 dispatched of the uh, 14 Aston Martin relatively simply a lap or so ago, and so again looking at the laps, another 55-7 is scary pace from Ronan Suits in these conditions, but he's just got that car absolutely singing his song at the moment. Uh, like I say, still a couple of laps behind the Bentley, so he's going to rely on, uh, you know, he needs to rely on bad luck on the top two if he wants to ascend the podium, but he's doing everything he possibly can. He was worked out we would need over 100 laps to catch the uh, Pro Sim Bentley at this pace difference, which it's not likely they're going to have. And I'm bearing in mind we're approaching 300 laps after nine hours. It's not likely he's going to have that many laps to do, but. Michael Day, anything is possible, and we likely to face another weather change as the race progresses towards its conclusion. Uh, as you said, uh, you said anything can happen in endurance racing, or anything can happen in any racing, but over the span of this length of time, the, the biggest challenge is going to be fatigue. They've been racing in these conditions for a while now. They're starting to get used to where the water's bad and where the grip's good. So fatigue is really going to start to play its part now. With these long races, the drivers have been in their sim rigs for a while. Or sometimes you even start to get a bit of cramp building up if you don't take regular breaks. Just to walk around when you're not in the car. And we saw with that weather forecast, there are patches. You know, the rain is going to be changing amounts. And one of the most tricky parts when it comes to racing in the wet is being able to adapt. Because, you know, when it's, when it's dry, it's dry. You know, so you get slight temperature changes. It doesn't really affect too much, you know, um, in in like F1, sometimes the wind changes direction and that can affect your braking points. But in the dry, usually there isn't too much of a difference. In the wet though, when more rain comes down, you've got to be a little bit more careful because your tires aren't, you know, clearing away as much water means you're on a bit more water. All of a sudden, certain corners become a little bit slower. You've got to brake slightly earlier. So you always have to be at the very, very limit. You always have to be searching for the grip, trying to find where the track is improving, consistently asking your team, you know, is there more rain coming down? Is it starting to ease up so that you, you can react before you even get to a corner? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're on board with uh, Mads Hedegaard in the treble seven Audi. That's the DSR Nightmare squad from Denmark. Uh, so they're the, the last car running. Only six competitors remaining in this race, and they are a few laps behind the 717 Unison Racing Corvette. But you can just see on board with the Audi. Just, again, he's keeping the car nice and steady, which is surprisingly difficult to do when the car is us. Oh! commentator curse that is the uh, precise example of how commentator curse works i uh, uh you need to issue a formal apology for that one correct 
Uh, Marl Unskill is uh, all I will say to that. That's it's not entirely right, but it's close enough. But they're, they're just... <laughs> So, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, for those on nice, I'm trying to say big apology, which I know is not entirely correct how I said it. But, uh, yeah, the, the tail got loose uh, on Matt Hedegaard. He's, he's been uh, in that car for quite some time. Uh, so, again, that, that'll be a little bit uh, fatigue. Uh, oh, and again, he just caught the apex in the middle of a scurry, so he had to turn out on that one. There at the uh, bottom of the shot, he's actually he's rolling suits. He uh, in his Audi, uh, he's flown past. He's pretty. He's made that Audi his own for so long now. You'll be uh, you need to be kind of forced out of it almost. He's uh, had that had the domain of that car for a long time. Yeah, Matt Hedegaard displaying how difficult it is out there. And you kind of saw exactly what was happening to Mads in the middle of the corner. You know, he goes into Lesmo one just a little bit too hot. Gets off the racing line and the back end just steps out. Gets a bit too greedy on the throttle and, you know, as a racing driver, whenever you take the wrong line, whenever you make that slight mistake, you've always got that temptation inside of your head. I can catch it, I can catch it. The car, you know, you have faith in the car that it'll stick, but sometimes it doesn't and that's exactly what happened. You know, if, if this was, if we were racing for real at Monza, he would have gone wide and, well, he would have been on the outside line, which is actually where the grip should be. But that um, tends to not be programmed into the sims, and that's why you see the drivers, they stay on the racing line, despite it raining, uh, where you would usually find you know, more grip off the racing line. Usually you break on the inside, down in corners, but that is not the case. So they stay on that usual dry line. And once you do get off it in the wet, it becomes exceptionally treacherous on the sim. Very, very much so. It's, uh, no one seems to have told Roland Suits that. Uh, he's charging on, uh, trying to do his best to the gap to the <coughs> second place Protein Bentley. They themselves trying to do something about the gap to the leader, but like I say, they're over a minute and a half behind. And last time around, they were about seven tenths slower. So yeah, they, they, it's, every time they try and do you know, gain a little bit on uh, Tom Capusta, the uh, 65 McLaren has got an answer to it. They've been absolutely bulletproof, pretty much all race long. Absolutely, yeah. After this, after this length of time, that is amazing to see. Yeah, and there were some issues well, for quite a few of the other teams early on, but for Tom Capusta. It's going nicely, and you can see by the by his lap times, you know, 57.6 in his last half. He's going a couple of seconds slower than Roland Zooks. I don't think he's pushing. I think he's just taking it nice and steady. In fact, last lap, a 59.8 for him. He's not pushing at all. He is literally taking it as easy as he can, being as gentle to the tyres, as gentle to the engine, as gentle probably to even the windscreen wipers to make sure that absolutely <laughs> nothing can go wrong on his VRS satellite racing McLaren. Yeah, I couldn't have put that better myself. Doing everything they're doing is going right for them. But uh, being that the, my commentator curse seems to be very strong today, I don't want to say too much. Uh, Do you want to drop them. one on uh, comp on Capusta? On Capusta. You know, <laughs> it up, yeah. Well, I was uh, riding on board with the uh, Treble Seven, and then it flew off the road. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what I can do about that one. But now that's. Uh, it, it's surviving this race is is a is a small victory in itself. We've lost half the field already to this stage, so you know it's it's amazing that these competitors are still going uh, and still looking good. With two hours and forty minutes remaining, we are down to just six drivers. All six of them in the GT3 class. I'm just looking because on my timing screen, I know Viaduct can work in the GP4 class, but they have now disappeared off my timing screen. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what's happened to them. I don't know if they're on your timing screen. They, they detonated their engine some time ago. Ah, so, uh, okay. Yeah, the uh, sole GT4 not with us. Sad times for the Alpine. I'm just going to keep an eye on Roland Zooks because I've been spotting him every now and then and he's just making that mistake here and there, you know, one time you see him running wide on the exit of Parabolica, another time, you know, maybe getting too hot into one of the chicanes and those mistakes, well, while they aren't costly, if he does make the wrong mistake at some point, 
just like we've seen it happen before, that could be his car careering into a wall and then, well, he's going to lose those 30 seconds to the number 14 car, that's for certain, and maybe even lose P4 to Arcturus Kamal in the 717 Unison racing car. Well, wonderful display there from the uh, Pro Sim Bentley on how to do it. Just gliding that uh, British beast through Ascari, seemingly seemingly effortlessly. That's very much the swan analogy. It looks very calm on the top, but he's working pretty hard in the driver's seat, I have no doubt. But, you know, they've, they've done so well. I've, I've, I keep saying this, they've all done so well. I have huge respect for all of the drivers taking part in this because... I know I couldn't do it. I, I, I'm a mere pleb at the end of the day. I couldn't <laughs> at all manage to... you're being a bit harsh to, uh, on yourself for that. Well, when it comes to racing, at least, you know, I, I'm a mere mortal. I, I, I can't do these gargantuan tasks that these guys are doing, uh, you know, Seeming, seemingly effortlessly, I can manage, you know, maybe 50 minutes, an hour tops, not, uh, you know, three hours in a stint and then back a few hours later. So... Uh, yeah, amazing respect to all of the drivers, uh, still running or not. They, they put on a pretty good show leading to this point. And being able to have that concentration, you know, in changeable conditions, you know, you, even, even when you're done with your stint, you're not done because you still have to be race engineering for your teammates. You have to be constantly on alert. But, you know, you mentioned the, the kind of dedication needed over the race, but I'm going to slightly disagree with you on that one because I think that once you're in the cockpit, it becomes almost second nature. You're able to get out the time. That's not to say that it isn't hard, but I think, you know, the real hats off to these guys is the amount of time that they would have had, had to have spent doing a setup and you know considering you know this is a 12-hour race over the course of this weekend including practice and qualifying maybe there's been about what 17 hours in total 18 hours these guys would have put in uh, probably over 50 hours leading up to this event you know practicing the track doing setups getting used to whatever car they pick because even picking a car is not a simple task you end up putting in quite a few hours into each car at the track trying to find out which one works best for you trying it in the dry trying it in the wet not only finding a setup that works for you but a setup that works for the rest of your team as well and then once you've got a setup once you've got your car then you start working on your strategy you start to see how far can your fuel go and we're talking you know long stints you do an hour stint okay let's do that same stint but let's do it in a slightly lower fuel mode let's see if we can go slightly further what about if we do it while lifting and coasting and all of these things do come into play and that is what separates the great teams from the decent teams <coughs> yeah entirely uh, yeah, no argument there at all uh, Whilst there, there is always going to be an element of you know, autonomy when they're you know, going through the muscle memory, uh, they know where their, their breaking points are, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is going to be an element of that. However, when you know, there's, there's several factors that I think are going to kind of rock the apple a little bit. One is the weather. How many times are they going to be practicing yeah. in the wet? They would have done some, but certainly most of the practice are going to be in the dry. You know, perfect ideal conditions. And two, as we can quite clearly see, it's getting very dark. So that's when the uh, that's when the attention span certainly needs is really really tested you you can't rely on those visual markers as much as you can in the dry and when you've got the you know, inclement weather and darkness yeah there's not many laps to get practiced under those conditions so we could if we're going to see any kind of mistakes now I think it's going to be the time when we're going to see them and actually, you mentioned it, the whole idea of it getting darker and you requiring more con um, concentration. And I think that's even more so the case here at Monza than other circuits. I remember when I was doing uh, an endurance race on, uh, it was ACC rather than Alpha Factor 2, but it was here at Monza. Monza's one of those tracks where I, I personally, as a driver, I don't like using reference points. You know, I like to see the corner, I like to feel the car break at a specific point. But at Monza, the braking zones are so long, especially into the chicanes, especially with GT cars, that you have to use the markers. And uh, actually, I do want, if we can get the onboard with Roland Zooks, I will show you exactly what I mean when you head down into turn one, because if you don't pay attention properly, it becomes really, really difficult 
to be able to spot your braking markers heading into the first corner and uh, while it is fairly clear for us, sometimes, you know, the drivers, if they're not running the same graphic settings as us, it's a little bit less clear. And uh, quite often, the, the marker boards going into turn one, you can't actually see the numbers at certain times. So you actually just have to count the marker boards. And if you aren't paying attention, it's very easy to miss the first marker board and then miss your braking point going down into the Retifilio chicane. Done that, done that many a time in sim racing terms, where you think you've 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 hit the third board when in actual fact you yeah. missed one, and you just go sailing off into the polystyrene. Uh, Parabolic is another good one for that, uh, especially if you, you if you're concentrating on something else or you just lose that focus at the wrong time, you're sailing off into what's a very big runoff area of Parabolica, but you're going to lose time and you're going to kind of shake your confidence a little bit whilst anyone that is taking part in these events are generally very confident in their abilities, their car, their setups, as you were saying. Those are the mistakes that do play on your mind a little bit, and you then have to put more focus into that. So you, you, you're you using more energy, which after this length of time with the fatigue that's going to be going on, that's not what they want. They want to be going through that, that autonomous process. You, know, you hit the corners, hit the brakes, hit the apexes, yep. yada, yada, yada. The more energy they have to put into focusing on altering that routine takes away from that the, the energy that they've got. And there's a, a, a direct comparable between the sim racing world, or yet another, I should say, uh, between the sim racing world and the real racing world. Uh, you, you can be the fittest person in the world uh, with you know years of experience, but that one lapse of concentration and your car's in the wall destroyed. And that's the big thing with endurance racing, it's about being able to keep up your concentration over those extended periods of times. And if you are going to make a mistake, make sure it's a really tiny one where you drop, you know, a couple of seconds. But for those people who are used to sprint racing, you know, you push out 110%, you go all the way. But in endurance racing, you know, you can push that 110% and you might gain, you know, let's say, let's be generous and say you gain two tenths a lap. One in ten laps, you end up making a mistake because you're pushing 110%. And all that time, you know, two tenths over ten laps, that's two seconds. That one mistake is easily going to be a second. And it's that easy to, to drop the ball. And I was speaking to a couple of drivers. I can't remember who it was. I think it was um, actually Martin Militai, uh, possibly. For that. This is from the Endurance E-Racing World Championship. And we were talking about... The, the struggles that might come with 24-hour races compared to 12-hour races. And for me, he was very weird because he said that he actually preferred racing in the night compared to racing in, in daylight. Just because he said that it's kind of more quiet out on circuit. There's less distractions. You know, sometimes you get the sun glaring in your eyes depending on the time. So it's just you and the track. You know, you're able just to give your complete focus. And you just feel more kind of immersed i guess into the whole atmosphere the whole driving experience yeah completely yeah there, there are those that are more of an expert in the, in the night just the same as there are those that seem to have that that depth such that that the agility to handle the wet better than dry yeah. conditions or or you know to a lesser detriment than those that are experts in the dry now most people are going to handle dry conditions fairly well, not meaning that in a, in a derogatory sense, but not everybody are going to be able to handle the wet. Now, I know that I am not... I, as I, I do like driving in the wet. I'm not very good at driving it's in the fun. wet. It's fun. Okay, yeah, hell yeah, it is. <laughs> but... Um, you know, to be doing the the wet weather element with you know with darkness, with the the change in the way that you've had to do 300 laps leading up to this point after that many hours. Yeah, I, I, again, this is why I have a huge admiration for anybody that is you know experienced and and particularly good in endurance racing, or even those just willing to take part in endurance racing. I, I think you're bonkers, all of you, but um, I, I mean that with a huge amount of respect. It's, I, it's just incredible to see. You know, my my meager sim racing ex exploits are sprint racing based. So, uh, yeah, you know, I can I can last up to about an hour and then I, I'm done. I have to go and have a lunch down but these guys it's just water off a duck's back you know it's just like an hour pff, you know get out of here you know that's, that's yeah. no problem for me and uh, yeah fair play to them 
Well, I'm, I'm the same as you on, on that front, Chris. You know, I've come from you know, more of the F1 sim racing world, shorter races. Um, you know, I'm much more used to doing two one-hour races or four half-an-hour races than one two-hour race. And it's it gets to a stage where it's, it's compounding loads of little things when you get into endurance racing. Mm -hmm. you know, keeping up the concentration, the changeable conditions, being able to consistently, you know, monitor your fuel, making sure you're you're on target to meeting all of your your strategies, whether that's tire wear, whether that's fuel consumption, and then on top of that, you know, sometimes your teammate might go go and make a mistake. We've seen that a few times already today, and then you, as their teammate, you know, you've got to be able to keep their spirits up. Endurance racing is so much more of a team sport than sprint racing. You can't lose your mental. You have to keep on plugging on with the kind of almost faith that someone else will make a mistake at some point. And usually, when we talk about it in sprint racing terms, we say. Yeah, you don't really want to win that way, but in endurance racing, that is how you win. That's part, you know, that's part of the parcel. Absolutely, yeah. You, you touched on a very good point there. The mental game is just as important as the, the ability to be quick. Um, and not just in a, in a discipline sense. Yes, of course, you do need to be well behaved when you're on the track. No one wants to be driving 12 hours with a lunatic out there. Uh, but it, it's more the case of when it goes wrong, and it's it's always a when. Everybody yeah. has issues. Everybody will bounce the car into a wall uh, after everybody has spent, like you said, 50 hours plus practicing for one single event. And, and it, it does... It, it hurts it, it really dents your confidence and um to bounce back from that is very difficult and and you know is not to be underrated uh, you know those that, that don't necessarily uh, follow sim racing to a degree might might see that as oh come on it's you know the old anecdote you know, it's just a game and we spoke about this yesterday um but these days, sim racing ha carries so much more weight with it. it, carries a lot more publicity, a lot of sponsorship. You know, big name companies are getting involved in um, e racing and esports in sim racing terms these days. You know, the, the EEWC is a prime example of that. Um, you know, even just five years ago, you know, it was just. You know the, the the nerds of the world having a bit of fun with the computers. Whereas these days, it's you know, it's, it's a really is a sport, it, and it should be viewed as uh, you know, as such. I remember having an interview with a journalist uh, a couple of years ago. Um, should he um, should esports be considered a sport? And I said, absolutely, it should. I mean, define to me what a sport is. And we both agree that, um, I can't remember the exact wording now, but a sport is deemed to be a, uh, a display of skill in a competitive arena for entertainment purposes. It was along that kind of line. Yeah. And I said, explain to me where esports doesn't fit that. Please yeah. explain to me how esports doesn't um, perfectly fit those conditions. Now, of course, not everybody likes esports. Not everybody likes football. Hand up, myself included, and I'll take the criticism for it. But, you know, not a fan of it, but I accept it's a sport, and I accept it's a very popular sport. So why shouldn't esports be given the same, you know, or, you know, sim racing as a whole, be given that same level of respect? Well, yeah, I, I've come from a chess background, so... Uh, the whole should chess be considered a, a sport should this be considered a sport is uh, something I'm more than aware of and to touch on what you said at the, at the start you know um, it's, it's just a game well I mean I just never give any credit to that it's not even worth an answer really <laughs> like I mean you can just say that about anything I know Toto Wolf said that earlier about Formula 1 you know it's it's just a sport you know don't get so hung up on it there are far more important things in the world so and uh, to be honest he's he's right at the end of the day um, it, depending on who depending on who you are you know what your preferences are certain things just uh, matter matter less you know and um, yeah so I I think people who say that it's just daft, to be honest. Yeah, that's it, it, that's, it's, it's those that don't understand what esports is about that makes that kind oh, of yeah. comment. Let, let's be honest. I mean, I, I'm not particularly complimentary about football. You know, it's um, not, not opening that kind of worms on this stage. And so, no, don't worry, I'm not going there. But um, 
So, yeah, exactly as you say, you see, you can describe any, pretty much any activity, let alone whether it's a sporting activity or even um, an, uh, an, an environment that involves anybody else, frankly. Anything yeah. can be described in a positive and a derogatory sense. So, absolutely. Um, but it's, it's those that, that understand what esports is about. You don't need to explain it to them. But I think esports as a whole, and certainly sim racing as a whole, um, has very much had a lot more emphasis and focus and um, investment. Because you know, it's one benefit of COVID. If you know, to, uh, it's always a dangerous phrase yeah. to use that one. But but because you know, we all had we all needed something to do when uh, no one could leave their house. But look at the 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 spotlight that's been cast on on sim racing from the likes of you know Jensen Button's Team Rocket, for instance. Um, yeah. you know, Fernando Alonso has a, a as an esports team as well. Just to name two drivers from a world that we both love, Formula One. Um, that crossover is is now much more blurred than it used to be and and so it should be and and long may continue to be an avenue for for talented drivers to to maybe look at real you know you know real motorsports well and equally other way around for for drivers that um either just want something to do or need a, an avenue to sharpen their own skills. Jensen, you know, in an interview I had with Jensen Button, I asked him about transferable skill between the sim racing world and uh, the real life cockpit. I mean, Jensen Button's raced pretty much anything with an engine um, and also is is getting yeah. into um, esports and sim racing because of Team Rocket. And and he said that you know, teams for forever and a day, well, forever and a day, for you know, a long time have had drivers that only deal with um, sim works, you know, the, the background simulation and car setup stuff. So why shouldn't you then look at the sim racing world for those to work their way up through the ranks? So, you know, he fully uh, agreed that that's an absolutely, um, you know, an exploitable avenue. And, you know, like I say, long may it continue. And maybe it's an, an avenue for lunatics like us to get into the real life commentary box. Yeah. Well, I mean, for me, when, you know, as you said, the benefits of COVID, uh, for me, not really much changed when, when COVID hit, um, as weird as it is, just because I was so, you know, so much into the esports scene already. So, I mean, for me, it was just more of the same. In fact, it, it kind of blew up a bit because they so much attention came towards esports. And I think esports kind of delivered on that fantastically another um, kind of... Um, avenue that you can take of this conversation that I've heard is should East, should um, eSports players be considered athletes? Well, you know, it depends what you consider an athlete. You know, do you consider a dark player an athlete? Because from a physical perspective, I think most certainly not. But if you think of it from the perspective of as does a player, you know, practice for hours on end to improve their craft, I think the answer is most assuredly yes. I don't think I know of any form of sport aside from eSport where you know the players actually spent as much time as they do to improve improve their craft to the extent where they get burnt out at such a young age from the amount of hours and the amount of dedication that you need to be at the top of to be at the top of the, to be at the top of the world one hundred percent agree with that. Um, you know, do people consider snooker players athletes for for exactly the same reason? Yeah. You know, the, you know, the fitness is not necessarily a big part of snooker, but you know, are they considered an athlete? Uh, it really depends what your yardstick is. If you're thinking about an athlete as only someone that is, I don't know. Uh, uh, an Olympic triathlon, there are very few people that fall into that category, <laughs> yeah. and I certainly ain't one of them. But uh, you know, <laughs> under no no circumstance am I deemed an athlete in any <laughs> way, shape, or form. But yeah, absolutely. And generally, what you'll find as well is that sim racers are generally very, very fit individuals. Um, you know, always one or two exceptions to the mold, of course, but it's because they have to deal with, you know, you take endurance races, they have to have the physical fitness to, to, you know, the physical fitness and the mental fitness are very hand in hand with them. And, you know, you yourself have, have been on the driver's side of the fence. You'll, you'll appreciate that. You know, if you're, you're someone built like me, which has the shape of a sack of potatoes, then you know, you're not going to last long in, in the car. And I know full well that I wouldn't. 
But equally, if you're, you know, if you're physically fit, you're able to, to maintain that level of concentration, just the same as the real life drivers do, you will, you know, you will exceed. You you will do well in that circumstance. I mean, you say that. You look over to real racing. Um and so many times, I mean, I look towards, you know, championships like the British Touring Car Championship and you see drivers who are absolutely phenomenally quick. And I think, you know, some of the BTC drivers are very good to the extent that if you put F1 drivers in that series, I don't think they would be able to really beat them by too much. And, you know, they're not peak athletes, let's say. Um, you know, they don't, let's use the term, they don't look like racing drivers and that's <laughs> let's say the real thing so yeah it's um the common misconception let's say and uh it's starting to um slowly get dimin- slowly get diminished absolutely true it does very much depend on what your expectation is and what the field is yep 100 percent agree with that Let's have a look at some lap times, shall we, from our competitors. Still the fastest man out there is Ronan Sook, so he still has not let up the gas at all. Post pit stop, he is still roaring on to try and do something about the gap. The gaps have pretty much stayed steady. Um, increases here and there, but they haven't really done a great deal from second to third. So we could be looking at where the drivers are going to, um, you know, where they're going to finish, but... Like I say, if anybody makes a mistake, then that whole order could still change. With six drivers remaining, maybe not, or, well, yeah, six drivers remaining, maybe not too much change. Again, it's that group of drivers from P3 down to P5, Roland Sooks in the 33 Mugen Sim Racing car, then the 14. Um, that is the GSR team Aston of Nicolas uh, F. Statui and then the 717 of Arcturus uh, Kamal in the Unison Racing. The three of them currently separated by just under a couple of minutes, so pretty much a lap between all three of them. We'll have to see whether anything does change at the moment. Roland Zooks just continuing to pull away from the 14 GSR team. And as long as he keeps on the track, he should be able to pull himself out a comfortable lead. The 007 Bentley is uh, is in the garage. Well, 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 we did say that disaster would have to befall the top two for Roland Seas to climb, and something has happened to that 007 Bentley. Oh, dear. We will have a look into that, and we'll hopefully have an answer for you post-commercial. Let's have a quick break and a word from the sponsors. Oh, there we go, you're back. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Leap Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this 12 Hours of Monza, as hosted by GTR 24 Hour. Well, well, so disaster has stricken the 007 Bentley. Let's ride on board with them and see what they did. So this is the Del Rogia chicane. Come through the exit, all right. And where has the big old British piece gone? Is this going to be a mistake on the exit of Lesmo 2? No, it's on the way in. They've gone way in a little bit too hot. And just come to a halt. Now, they didn't hit the wall particularly hard. Though, have they had some kind of technical problem then that's uh, led to that? Because it didn't look like they. Uh, it looks like they rather brushed against the wall if they even hit it at all. Judging by that sticking wheel, I suspect they've had a complete technical breakdown of some kind. So, oh dear. What a shame. They've gone this far in the race and it's just. Yeah. Yep, and there we go. That's where they've uh, then retired the car back to the pit. So it was a technical fault of some kind. Uh, I mean, it just, is that just a straight up disconnect? Is that their wheel just having an issue? I that mean, looks more like it looks more like a VR failure. If that if that driver was in uh, was in virtual reality and the headset has decided no, I don't want to play anymore, you just go completely blind. So. I, I, that, that's just a pure guess on what's happened there. It could be that the steering wheel has failed them, but I, that looks more like some kind of display, display failure. Because they, if it was a disconnect, the car would have just vanished, I'd have thought. Um, but we can only guess on, on what issue they've had. A great, great shame. They could have uh, challenged for the lead in the uh, dying moments of the race, but alas, the uh, British Bentley is out and five cars remain. Yep, and the only car that hasn't had any issues so far is, guess what, the car that's leading, the VRS satellite racing car, which is um, more proof in case uh, anyone needed it, but as long as you stay out of trouble, as long as you don't have any bad fortune falling your way, you'll tend to do fairly well in sim racing. It tends to be how the cookie crumbles, and that's whether you're talking about here, on a sim racing platform, in real life, in karting, I know from the amount of endurance karting races I do that there are most certainly issues and if you stay out of trouble you're almost guaranteed a top five finish and that's in a field of about 50 cars. Yeah, having spoken to some very experienced uh, sim racing endurance drivers over the years, uh, th that's a very common story. You can be the fastest guy in the world but if you can't keep it out of the wall you're no good to anyone. So, uh, you know, consistency is always going to be king. Um, if you're damn quick, that does help. But uh, oh. as, as the 30, as uh, Roland Six is rather pro as, as proving. But yeah, uh, you, what can what can you say against the 65? Now, also it just been reported that the rain has finally stopped and looks set to stay that way. So expect people to be coming into the pits again fairly soon. We're not seeing, yeah, we're not seeing any spray coming off the back. Are there anybody looking at our race leader, the 65 McLaren, still in the hands of Tom Capusta? There's not a lot of spray coming off the back of the car. Not that you can see it in some shots, of course, but the windscreen wipers aren't going. So it's not going to take too long for the track to dry out to the point of where oh, slicks will be needed again. I expect the uh, pit lane becoming a little bit busier soon. And it all comes down to how quickly these cars can just clear away the water. Standard thing to look for is once the spray stops coming up, that tends to be when the crossover to slicks will start to appear. If the spray coming up, then if you put on slicks, there's going to be even more spray. It means that there's a bit of standing water. And if you put the, split, the slick tires, there's nothing to dispel that water, which means that, well, because the slick tires, they don't have any grooves in them, they essentially sit on that thin film of water that sits on the track. They can't find grip, they can't find traction. These cars are incredibly light, and that's what causes aquaplaning when it's essentially the cars just sitting on water is not actually on the track. It becomes a boat at that point. So these things do not sail well. Well, what did you think the spoiler was for? <laughs> yeah, and spoiler doesn't uh, substitute for a keel, I'm afraid. I mean, yeah, maybe an outboard needed at that point, but... 
Then, in fairness, Ronan Sooks was doing a damn good job of making it work for lap on lap on lap on lap way yep. after we thought he would. But then he did push that too long. Uh, I reckon he pushed that at least two laps too long uh, on uh, the wet tires. But then this way round, I suspect that Ronan Sooks is probably going to come in earlier than, than we would normally expect because he was so good on the wet tires. But also, it depends on what their driver change strategy is. He's been in there for what seems like forever. Um, we can assume that there's another driver waiting in the wings unless he fancies doing the final two hours and ten minutes uh, on his own and he's certainly got the pace for it but has he got the concentration left to do so because he's pushing half the race he would have done by this stage so you know we will see so we're assuming there's another driver waiting to go into the Mugen Sim Racing Squad and I would imagine there's probably at least one other one, one other driving uh... oh oh no you literally just as we were talking about the 33 Oh no, he's in the garage! I've done Ooh. it again! You're Talk very good someone. at this. I, I, I am, I'm, I, I better leave now, because there's going to be no one left. I'm going to be fired at this rate. Oh my goodness, uh, so... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to GTR 24H Total Wipeout, brought to you by Chris <laughs> Buxton. <laughs> well, we await the replay of that one. Uh, Oh dear, oh dear. So that is good. So four cars remain from our original starting 12. Uh, Denis Shishenko is looking set to uh, claim a podium then. Now I've said it, expect him in the wall in the next five laps. Uh, oh my goodness. The curse of Monza. Why? Well, I think the curse of Buxton strikes. I think it's uh, just a curse of endurance racing, to be honest, at this point. Mm. The Kodiak curse doth be strong. <laughs> well, well. And Here there go. we go. This I bet, I bet you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a limb before we've seen the replay and judging by what our what our producer does as to how accurate I'm gonna be. I reckon this is a mistake on the exit of Lesmo 2. Because that's where we've seen the most amount of mistakes leading up to this point. There's logic is in the that, reason. Has it actually been? Oh, during practice and qualifying, that's where we saw the probably the most amount of spins. When I mean, we saw spins pretty much everywhere, but um, that seemed to be where the most amount of them was. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna have a wager that that's where the incident has happened. See, for me, usually I always think the hot point for incidents is uh, going down into a scary. Um, that's where mm -hmm. you see the big spins, just because of the you know the shift speed of you're doing and yeah. speed. Yeah, the fact that you've got to ride the curbs as well it unsettles the car. Judging by our producer, he's done a good one. He, he hasn't just parked it somewhere, so I look forward to this replay. <laughs> We've got to rate the accident now as well. Yo, oh, okay. Yeah. I wonder, let me see. It. Oh, here we go then. We're on board with the Audi. We're coming through Cabo Grande. They were too early. Oh, he's going to. Mm, he's probably been that fidgety all race long. Okay, over to the right hand side on the brakes just after the. Oh, Oh, Whoa! Okay, nowhere near where I thought it was. Oh! Yeah, so not only is the wing gone, but the uh, uh, whole tail end of the car is now pushed into the front. That car is only now about a metre long. Well, oh, you here, here it is. For it, Chris, but that's, that's pretty much exactly what Max Brunovic did. Oops, but that was going down spin. into Parabolica. Yeah, well, he's uh, he's gone under the. It, it look, I couldn't tell whether he missed his breaking point and then got on the grass. But either way, he's uh, it's not gone well. Uh, it's not gone well for running suits. He is now in the garage. So Son Kabustin now leads uh, Nicholas Estatu and then Denis Shishenko in the third position spot. Yeah, like you say, just keeping him out of trouble. We saw Dennis really struggling to get off the bottom of the qualifying times up until the last qualifying session. Yes, or the last runs, really, in the uh, in qualifying yesterday. My goodness. Yep. And I think Roland Zooks learned the hard way that if you don't have a rear wing, you tend to have less downfalls <laughs> and the rear end might just wash out on you mid-corner. Yeah, as much as these things don't have a lot of downforce in Monza, they still need some to keep the car behaving itself. And, uh, yeah, Roland... Lesmo won. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 
Kermit Grande, you might kind of get away with it because it's uh, a long, gentle corner, but Lesmo, one and two, forget it. No chance. So, yeah, Roland Tooks opted not to limp that one back to the pits. He's uh, just parked I mean, he'll be fifth no matter what happens. At this point, you could argue. And then there were four. My word. So, oh, the Treble 7 car has changed hands uh, whilst we were looking away. Oh, and it's spinning. Again, oh dear. So now uh, Kim um, Pedersen now takes over the Treble Seven Danish squad. That'll uh, be Pedersen, I think, if I remember my Danish pronunciation correctly. Uh, struggling to get up to speed with uh, the Audi. Uh, just spotted uh, a lovely pirouette coming out of Ascari uh, for the astral liveried Audi. But it's going to be fourth. Well, it's going to be fourth in a couple of laps, I should say. And then there were five. Well, let's see for Roland Zooks, he's going to drop a long, long way down the order. Is this just the equivalent of... Um, well, sorry, I say then there were five, then there were four. Is this just the equivalent of the... I'm going to guess this one on a limb. I'm probably wrong. I'm going to say Monaco 97. And you're talking about when Olivier Panis yes. won in a... In a pro, uh, Ligier. Yeah. Uh, I believe you are right. Is that uh, actually 97? Let me look that up. Because I was tempted to say 98, but that was the Spa 98. So I thought, I doubt two of those would have happened in one year. That's just too crazy. And I know Olivier Parnis was racing in 1994 for Ligier or... Or no, he was racing for the Roos in 94, I think. Uh, 1996. You were close, ah. but not quite. Uh, yes, a shock win for Panis in the wet. Uh, four cars finished that night. Or that day. Well, speaking of... Four cars? <laughs> ah, our race lead is in. Um, Capusa has brought the 65 McLaren in. Now we're assuming that... Uh, is it a little early for drives? Probably uh, at the moment. Is he going to hand that car over to a teammate? I'll keep an eye on the board for that one. I'm going to go and do some scouting and take a look you at Denis Eschenko to see is there any spray? And there is spray, so I'm going to say it is not time for drives. I'm going to I'm going to stick to my guns. If there's spray, you don't put on slicks. Yeah, that is the uh, general rule of thumb, isn't it? If uh, if the water be flying, stay on the wets. And out comes uh, still Tom Kubusta behind the wheel of the McLaren. He's looking to continue his stint with just over two hours remaining. That's ten hours down and only four cars remain on the circuit from our starting field of 12. We have lost... The 23 car that was that was being driven by Tony Paparindopoulos. And apologies for the pronunciation. Uh, I don't speak Greek. And that's the uh, 23 McLaren that uh, was the first to fall. And then the 74 team, which is the Deuces Motorsport Club, the UK-US combination McLaren, uh, Saba Kiss. Uh, was behind the wheel at the time. Then it was the 64, which is the second of the VRS satellite racing McLarens. Uh, Jim Nasudo, Nasula, bigger button, uh, was behind the wheel then. And then it was the 51, the Ramada Motorsports uh, Audi, uh, being driven by Pedro Ramada. And then next to four was the 62, the Unison Racing BMW, being driven at the time by Nikolai. Bezrukov, the uh, Russian outfit, sadly not making it through. Then it was the Pro Sim Bentley. We saw us having a very odd moment out in the dust. And then the latest of four, Roland Souks for Mugensim Racing. Has uh, gone backwards into the wall at uh, the Del Rogier. Uh, thus leaves us with leader Tom Putus Kapusta. 65 VSR, uh, VSR satellite racing McLaren and he's been there for a long long time three laps of the good over the now second place car which is the 14 GSR team Aston Aston Martin the Greek squad in the hands of Nicholas uh, F. Startu then in currently third is the 717 the Unison Racing Corvette 
the uh, second of our Russian squads, Denis Sashenko in charge of that one at the moment. And the last car running is the Treble 7, the DSR Nightmare team from Denmark in the Audi. Uh, eight laps behind the leader in a moment, but still running strong. Can you imagine if Nikolai Bess hadn't retired the car? He could have, like, just repaired it, headed back out. He'd be, at worst, well, fifth. And, to be honest, he'd probably be sitting in third right now. Um, you see it so many times. Teams just getting to a point where they say, you know, enough's enough. They don't think that they can go any further. They think the, the race is done, the race is done, or the race is done for them. And they could just stay out and issues do come and it always comes towards the end of the race. We are approaching the final two hours. So, yeah. Well, with two hours remaining, we'll see how things do develop. Indeed, indeed. The 14 team has brought their car in. The Aston Martin are having their pit stop. And they have had a pit, uh, they've had a driver change. Uh, it's uh, Vangelis uh, uh, Parginos that has taken over the team just in time for a commercial break. So we'll have a short break here and a word from our sponsors. The GTR 24 H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot. Elite Gaming. ESTV and Motorvision.tv A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this very highly attritious uh, 12 hours of Monza, as hosted by GTR 24 Hour. 
four cars remain in our original starting lineup of 12. And no two remaining cars are actually the same. Our lead driver is still Duncan Pista in the McLaren. He's actually bearing down on the second place car, which is the uh, number 14 Team GSR Aston Martin. You can actually see them both in the shot there. The American squad bearing down very quickly on the Greeks. In third position now, due to the recent retirement of the 33 Sim uh, Mugen Sim Racing Audi, it is now the 717, the Unison Racing Corvette, in the hands of Denis Ishenko, the uh, Russian outfit. Still turning the laps, and the final car out there is the Treble 7 DSR Nightmare Audi. The Danish crew now in the hands of Jim Pedersen. And alas, the rest of the drivers have shut up shop for the night. A big screen freeze, uh, so a technical failure on the form of the 33 Rodin Sooks. What a great shame for the progress he was making. Uh, for it all to be taken away just at the last moment. So, Tom Kapusta is bearing down on the second place. Aston Van uh, Vangelis Paganos has very dutifully got out of the way. The, uh, Aston just pulling over there in between Lesmo 1 and 2 to let the leader through. So that's now four laps distance between the two competitors. The rain that has been lashing down for quite some time has now finally stopped. I mean, there is still spray there, believe it or not. You can't really see it in the dark. Uh, but there is still enough water out there to take away the possibility of slicks just yet. But we should now start to see the lap times steadily come down. Unsurprisingly, the uh, quickest car out there is our race leader in the form of Tom Kapusia. Uh Not not very much over, actually, Denis Sashenko uh, last time around. 57 twos, two st Sorry, 157.266 for Tom Kabusta and 157.863 for Denis Sachenko. I would imagine Denis is probably going to hand that card over fairly soon, along with Tom, because they've been in there a lengthy, lengthy period of time. But we will see how that transpires. So the concentration really becoming a big issue. And also, um, our technical failings still striking people. And how many cars may we be left with? Uh, will we have these four left by the end, do you think, Yusef? I honestly don't know. Um, you know what? You know what? Let's say all of them. I'm going to cast a curse this. Bold claim. I think three. That's where I'm going. I think we'll have three, one, three, more, three. one more failure before the end of the night. Uh, I, so less than two hours now for that to play out. I have a question for you. Let's say um, three of the four remaining drivers retire. What do you think the final driver will do? Do you think he'll just park it in the garage for, you know, one hour, 50 minutes, and then just do the final, like, five minutes? Or do you think he races the final few hours? If the remaining car is, is, is Tom Kapusta in the lead, then he might well park it. Whoever it is that's remaining will unlap themselves before they do so. I think I, if, if there's just one person circulating with still some quite a bit of time on the board, I think they'll they'll get to a point and park. I, I'm going that far. Do some yeah. donuts out on track. Well, that Why not? It's unsafe driving. Probably. But <laughs> I mean, if they're going to get a time penalty on the board, they'll just undo it. They'll just carry on for a while and you know, maybe build up maybe a two lap gap. Uh, and then as they go and drive into downtown Italy somewhere yeah I remember this was actually a thing back in the endurance racing world championship I think from 2020 no 2019 I think it was where I think a team got a driver to drive for them who was unlisted and as a result they picked up a three lap penalty or some, something like that Ooh. which they ended up pulling back so yeah 
there you go. We just had reports that it's actually started to rain again. It's a bit odd because looking at the weather radar, it looked like the rest of the rain was going to buy is bypass the track entirely. But the rain has now started to fall again. So if anybody was thinking of going this on the slicks, that's probably now just been undone. The rain, the the track was drying out. There's no definitive racing line beginning to form, but the distinct lack of spray would indicate that uh, it was definitely going that way. But now with the rain falling, it's going to reinforce the slippery conditions these guys are going through. And everyone seems to be managing it okay so far. Two more, I should say. One hour and 50 minutes remaining in the race. Tom Capusta leads from Vangelis uh, Parginos, then Denis uh, Eschenko in third for the 717 Unison Racing Car, that's the B team actually, and then it's Kim Pedersen in the 777 DSR, and that is the Nightmare Car, no Dream Team out today, just the one car, usually we see two of their cars out on track, but then well, actually, I was going to say those are for shorter races, but this is still a 12-hour race, so just entering one team. And, well, that team, you know, is doing fairly well. They're in fourth. Uh, it's the last of the remaining runners, but I think they'll take a P4 nonetheless. But indeed, I mean, look at the, the, the high hitters we've lost uh, due to Wunyo for one reason or another. To, like I said earlier, surviving this race is uh, a small victory in itself, and uh, so far, four people championing that cause. Uh, Tom Capista continuing to build up his ease, not resting on his laurels, he's not slowing down any. He's pressing on nonetheless. So 57 246 last time around makes him the quickest to buy some distance. Second place, Vangelis Bargados, 59 2. So that gap continuing to, to rise between the McLaren and the Aston. Dennis Ashenko is less than a lap behind the Aston. So there might be, before the check of that pause, there might be a battle for second uh, between those Ooh. two. That'll be interesting to see. And like I said earlier, Dennis Ashenko was, was struggling to... Uh, you know, get some decent qualifying times in. So the first qualifying session, he was very much at the bottom and some distance behind. By the end of the night qualifying session, he'd actually climbed up to around about eighth or so. So he really started to, to get used to the car and really find some pace in it. So, yeah, again, that really underlines what we were saying earlier, the consistency and keeping it, uh, keeping it out of the wall is very much the key to doing well in these endurance events. One second a lap, 70 seconds behind, 70 laps. And with one hour, 48 minutes, there's probably about 50 or so laps. So if he can just up the pace a bit, then he should have it easy in drums. Also, if he's got one less pit stop to make, then he's pretty much already ahead. We'll have to see how that all develops for Tom Kapusta, though. He is four laps there clear. He could even have a disconnect, reconnect in, take the three lap penalty, and you'd still feed out in the lead. And that's the kind of buffer you need. Four laps is pretty much the perfect amount because then if you do have that issue, you're fine to uh, take that three lap penalty. Good stop and have some food in that time, and uh, you'd be good to go. Could have a fair bit of food actually. Yeah, pull over in a local pizza parlor. It is Italy after all. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit late in the night. They may be a little bit upset, but. They probably wonder oh, why a McLaren 720. Yeah, well, okay, that's true. I mean, they might wonder why a McLaren 720 is just parked in their parking lot, but yeah. Oh, they would love it to be honest, um, especially if it was red. Um, I say <laughs> from experience on that, not McLaren, but uh, a different sports car, and um, the Italians as well as the Spanish actually. That whole Mediterranean area really like uh, exotic cars. So, if you appeared at the pizza parlor at 11 p.m. and rev the engine a bit you would be adored by all the people there <laughs> quite the contrary to what you'd get if you did that in england very much to the contrary you'd be arrested for doing that in this country so... <laughs> okay yeah maybe at 11 at 10 it'd be fine at yeah, 10 yeah you'd probably get away with it then yeah Again, there will probably be some questionable looks on why a GT3 car is parked in the parking lot, but you'd have some some favourable favourable onlookers. We're not uh, completely against a, a good-looking sports car. I mean, Goodwood Festival of Speed is a great place to uh, see some amazing, amazing machinery. I've been there once, and I got sun very heavily sun, but it was quite a long time ago. It was a great experience. Is this that monster? 
What, Goodwood Festival? Oh, Goodwood, Goodwood, Goodwood. Okay, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if you said Goodwood or Monza. I was like, I was... no, I'd lo- I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to go to Monza. <laughs> Uh, the only uh, I've only been to British tracks. So I uh, uh, I'm not well worldly travelled. So all of the tracks that I've been to are I've been to Silverstone. I've been to Snetterton because it's about forty minutes away from me. Been to Brands Hatch, and apparently I once got taken to Donington when I was very young. So I don't remember it, and I don't <laughs> know if that counts. <laughs> Uh, I've uh, I too have been to Donington. Uh, I've I'm due to be in Snetterton in two weeks' time. Okay. Uh, for a uh, I'll actually be in the real life commentary box uh, for that occasion, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. And uh, I too have been to Silverton. I was there in 2017, and I got very burnt. Okay. Was 28? Was it 2018? Was it 2017 for Formula One then? Yes. Oh, okay. Was it twenty? Uh, hang on, I've got to think. No, it's twenty. It was twenty eighteen when we had that horrendous six week heat wave. Well, some people probably enjoyed it. I didn't. I'm not a fan of very very hot <laughs> temperatures. I'm trying to remember. It was twenty eighteen? I'm trying to remember which of the years that Silverstone or Puncture years because obviously last year <laughs> Puncture year. That was nineteen, wasn't it? The uh, Wellington Strait, wasn't it? Or... Uh, oh, hang no, hang it was straight. last year. It was last year that Hamilton got the puncture on the final. Ah, that right? was on the final lap. Yeah, that yeah. was literally as he was coming over the line. No, I'm thinking. No, I'm actually thinking much, much, much longer ago. Than Wait, that. was your one when Raikkonen had that big accident? No, the, well, when he cracked into the wall at the bridge on the ha- on Wellington Strait. No, yes. not that year. Okay. No, the year I went was when um, Vettel won. Because uh, oh, Kimi, that's 2018. Cr- because yeah, Kimi that- crashed into into Hamilton on the opening lap, and Hamilton had to fight his way through the pack from the back. Yeah, I always remember that one because afterwards Vettel said it feels good to beat Hamilton at his home, and then proceeded to bin it in Germany the next race, and Hamilton won, and Vettel threw his title chances. Well, he didn't throw them away, but his season went too pot after that. Yeah, it, it did somewhat, and. Not as a, uh, I'm, I'm not a particular Vettel fan, so I was quite pleased when uh, his his home Grand Prix didn't go well. Mainly in re- in recompense for I I the only time I'm going to watch Hamilton at Silverstone and you beat him. Yeah, no well, venom it, there just, at all. <laughs> I just remember Vettel. The, the the saddest thing for me is I'm not a huge Vettel fan, um, and I particularly dislike Ferrari, so I wanted Hamilton to beat <laughs> Vettel anyway, and. I almost lost a sense of joy seeing Vettel crash because, you know, it wasn't a hard impact, so I knew, you know, he was okay and all of that. But it was the fact that he crashed in his home country and the fans right above him were cheering. Cheering. I was just like, oh, that has got to hurt so much. Yep. Yep, um, that, that's got a sting. That so I always thought Vettel was like widely liked, so I would have thought that'd definitely be the case in Germany, but I think he just crashed. Either where the Max fans were or where the Mercedes slash Lewis fans were. Probably the latter, because I don't think Max had quite the following at the time. Unlike now, I mean, I'm, I'm quickly becoming a Max Verstappen fan, and I will argue with that uh, case with anyone. Oh, I, I've been a Max fan since he's very like since he first joined Formula 1 um, I know our f- fellow commentator Yuno O'Leary does not like this and I, j- and I jab this at him every <laughs> time but hey. no I even even Lewis admits that he's likely to be dethroned by Max so yeah, yeah uh, what bigger endorsement do you need than that? But watching Max at uh, Austria in particular, just a sea of orange, is fantastic yeah. to see. I did like Lando's comment saying that. Oh, look, I've got loads of McLaren fans out there. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? Take full advantage of that. In fairness, Lando has been pretty darn good this year. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm pleasantly surprised by that. Yeah, uh, and and he's uh, he's a local to where I, or relative. Uh, He's from Glastonbury, which isn't far from where I live. So, yeah, he's... He's a local boy in Somerset, see? Even though I'm not born and raised here, but uh, I live in Somerset, so... 
I think it's time for me to drop, you know, my standard claim to fame. I don't know if uh, Mr. Peter Moncolm remembers this from the last time I dropped it, actually. <laughs> okay, so um, I come from... Well, I say I come from... I grew up in a little place called Wisbeach. Uh, it's near Kingslin. And um, for a year, I went to school at school called Wisbeach Grammar School, which is also the same school that George Russell went to. And I used to play tennis with him in school breaks. Is it? Oh. So he probably is remembers it? me. Yeah. Um, so you, point, you're... When, he wins, when he wins a championship, he'll thank me. And he'll <laughs> definitely uh, dedicate his championship to me. So, wow. <laughs> it was a posh school, actually, Peter. It was the, the closest claim I can make is I've interviewed Jensen Button twice. Once in person and once for sim racing. Okay. So, uh, and I live in the town where he is from, so I, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, oh, so Button and Norris are from the same place, then? Not the same county, not the same town. Okay, the same um, So, yeah. One is Gla- uh, Lando's from Glastonbury and, and Jensen's from Froome, and it's in Froome that I live. So, there we go. So you're, you're a Norfolk boy. I am a Norfolk boy. Um, not- I live right... I live right on the border between Norfolk and Cambridgeshire, and, you know, the address says one, but I'm actually in the other. It's, it's very <laughs> interesting. So you, you don't have the Norfolk twang, I notice. No, I don't have the farmer voice just yet, anyway. You, you don't talk proper Norfolk now, do you, boy? I, I don't feel like that's a Norfolk accent. I'm not going to try to actually do the Norfolk accent. That's about, as close as, I can get, that's about as close as I can get to Norfolk. My dad is, is from Norwich, so uh, okay. I, got, I got Norfolk in my blood. But it's quite funny, when I try and do that accent, no one usually knows what I've just said, which, is, which means I'm on yeah. the right lines, because real old-school yeah. Norfolk is impossible to understand. <laughs> it's, like, it's like almost like transcending towards like text, and it's like Norfolk. Down here in Norfolk? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm probably, I'm probably doing it terribly. It sounds good in my head, but I doubt it's sounding good out of my mouth. Um, also, Norwich, for those who don't know, is where Martin Brundle's from. It is. The uh, legendary Brundle is... Uh, when you when you listen to very early footage of Brundle, you can just about hear the, the Norfolk tones there. But uh, he's done very well to. He probably learned very early on that Sony and Sony Lloyd that means no one don't, no one go and take it seriously. So uh, he dropped the uh, he dropped the voice. I mean, I should sound like I'm from Reading, which is a horrendous accent, and I'm not even attempting to put it on. It's like I a have very, no idea what a Reading accent even sounds like. Oh, so it's a very butchered london accent in a very okay uh, i am not even going there i hated it so i i opted to try and sound neutral accented as possible so uh not that i have a problem with that i love accents indeed uh, hence why i try and mimic a few of them but norfolk in particular i love that one and uh, i i'm very much looking forward to being in the heart of norfolk for snetterton yeah i might have to uh, drop down what are you actually commentating on what racing is going on Am I allowed to mention Peter? What I'm going to be commentating on. Okay. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll I'll send you a link, Yusuf, just to be certain. Okay. Uh, I don't want to be upsetting people. It certainly is no, uh, course, my yeah. first broadcast with uh, GTR 24 Hour, and I hope it's not the last. Uh, I don't want to start. Tr- <laughs> to be so, honest, it, I should. I would imagine it's okay, considering that um, usually uh, um, Alex Goshman and I are talking about the various races that he was commentating on and that I was at and um, having a bit of fun because it is real life, so it shouldn't be considered. It, it's not a, it's not a direct better. competitor. It's yeah. the Classic Sports Car Club is where I'm going to be, yeah. uh, is who I'm commentating ah. for uh, in two weeks' time. Literally two weeks today, I will be, well, hopefully back in the hotel by now. Otherwise, okay. something's gone horribly wrong. <laughs> oh, so maybe you get to car some classic cars in the night. Um, as long no as races those do cars happen. Have headlights. Most of them do, uh, but, but yeah, it, it, there's no night racing going on. But that's what I'll be uh, shouting about in the commentary box uh, with Chaz Draco, actually. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, he's uh, or he's due to be there, but he he said he might have a clash with another event he's doing. So. But I'm very much looking forward to it. I've been preparing for it for a long time. I was at Thruxton for the oh, CSCC, uh, which is... I, I'm equidistant between Thruxton and Castlecombe. Um, right. 
and Thruxton, the CSCC do does go to. So on a semi regular basis. So yeah, that was good fun. For some reason, that's just reminded me of um, like I played a game with a friend the other day. I say a game; it's just you know how to waste like half an hour of time, <laughs> which um, was we open up Google Maps, we zoomed out to you know so that you could see the entirety of the UK, mm-hmm. and then we'd say a track name, or he'd say a track name, and I had to like zoom in. Oh, you had like, to find it. Uh, well, okay. no, it's I didn't have to find it. I had to like say it's right here, zoom in and see how many miles out I was, mm-hmm. and uh, I. I got a few of them correct. Uh, we mainly did karting tracks, but we did some of the um, actual tracks like Snetterton, Thruxton. The and the Clay Pigeon, for instance. Clay Pigeon, I know where that is uh, because we had to get um, hotel and accommodation before going there. And I kind of remember where it is. That it's mm-hmm. on like a stretch of road, which I recognize when I look at the map anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know it's there. You, you could get there if you had to, but you couldn't. Uh, I couldn't drive say it there. I wouldn't be able to drive there. I just know it's over there somewhere. <laughs> Towards Yeovil, I'm pretty sure. Um, That's more also, my corner of the world. Fantastic circuit as well, may I add. Uh, one of my favorite tracks in the UK. Cool. Yeah, Thruxton's got a high speed circuit actually. So it very oh, yeah. much favoured the really big, you know, the, the five litre monsters uh, yeah. more than the, the smaller, nippier cars. But Snetterton is, is very much a mixed bag in that sense. It's only driving in sim racing form. It's got, it, it, we're doing the full version, so the Snetterton 300. So you've got both big, big straights in this. I think there's a lot of twisty bits, so the uh, the small engines have got a decent chance of uh, sticking it to the big boys. Yeah, so I, I just did the whole thing with clay pitching just now, and I landed one kilometre away. Oh! Wow! <laughs> that is impressive. I mean, a bit of luck where on the stretch of road it is, but I'll take it. Thruxton's got a great outdoor karting circuit out there as well. I heard that they have a karting circuit, and I heard that it was good. That's a it's brilliant. I, I love outdoor karting in the wet. It's uh, it's brilliant fun. Oh, not you too. Oh no, karting in the wet. See, like I always used to hate karting in the wet because when I grew up and we did karting, it used to rain a lot because guess what? <laughs> I live in England. Yeah. Um, and the wet. I don't think I had a wetsuit at the start. The wetsuit I had wasn't very good, so I just associate wet karting with. Uh, after a race being completely French. French. <laughs> and, it, and literally me being in the back of our Toyota Previa, trying to peel off this really wet oh. t-shirt and be like, oh. And it was just horrible. It's like trying to peel off a layer of skin, probably. Yeah. Ugh. You kind of don't want to because it's, it's like putting on a wet sock onto, onto your foot. It's like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Once it's on, it's fine. But, yeah. but it's, yeah. The, it's, the, yeah. it's the change but, that's the problem. Yeah. Exactly. But once I did um, some BUKC, which is the university karting series in the UK, and I got myself a wetsuit, once I actually learned a little bit about driving in the wet, I've started to really enjoy it. For me, it doesn't beat, you know, being able to go flat out in the dry, but it's a nice change every now and then, especially if I'm not taking a race too seriously, just to be able to <laughs> have some fun in the wet. Yeah, I didn't have a choice but take it seriously. If you've seen the size of me, I don't fit in a cart very well. Yeah, it, it, Imagine, you know, trying to squeeze a rhino into a mini, and then you've got the right idea. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm a big boy, so I don't sit very well in, in a cart. But uh, even still, I gave it a good go. I was a bit smaller back then. Yeah. There, there, there's an image you'll never get out of your head. I, I, <laughs> I apologize in advance for that one, but... Yeah, you get the idea. I'm a, I'm quite a big bloke trying to squeeze into quite a small piece of machinery. Um, yeah, it was still good fun to do. Oh, one of the um, well, because I'm about six foot three, I only weigh for some reason about seventy two, seventy three kilos, which is is very light. Very light um, for that height. You're the same height as me, and I can certainly say I'm considerably. I'm guessing I weigh probably at least at least twenty kilos less. Um, Goodness me! Oh, what twenty kilos less than me? Yeah, I, I, so I, I'm too old school to think in kilos. Hold on a second. What's, okay, what was it? Seventy-two. Seventy-two. I don't know how many stones that is to save my life. <laughs> Crikey, you're a stick. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm literally a stick. Yeah, I'm literally a stick in a go kart. But <laughs> because all of the rental carts they are designed for people larger than myself and shorter than myself as well, it means I'm too close to the pedals. And if I use mm-hmm. a seat insert, I'm way too close to the pedals. So yeah. I end up just being in a seat with like my stick figure literally just flapping around in the seat from side <laughs> to side. So your, your, like knee, think, your knees are up by your nose, basically. Yes, I like to think that if I actually fit into a seat properly I'd gain like a one two tenths a lap which has you, you probably could drivers. I reckon you're right I, I think you actually could do um, yeah let, let's say uh, I'm, I'm not even going to talk about how much of a weight difference there is between <laughs> you and I um, <laughs> uh, it, it's considerable uh, and it's yeah. a hell of a lot more than 20 kilos I can, I can promise you that I, I, I wouldn't be able to, to do it now I, back in the day when I was doing karting at Thruxton I was considerably lighter than where I am now and even then I was still big so yeah moving on moving on ah, perfect timing to have a uh, quick break and a word from our sponsors The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Leet Gaming, ESTV, and Motorvision.tv. A 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the 12 Hours of Monza, as hosted by GTR 24R. Four cars remain. So, uh, me and Yusuf have been having a bit of a podcast moment uh, before the uh, before the last break. 
It's, uh, yeah, there's, no one's particularly close to one another. Tom uh, Kipros is still in charge of the 65 VSR satellite racing McLaren. Leads by a good four laps now over the number 14, the uh, team GSR Aston Martin, uh, currently driven by Vangelis Parginos. In third is Denis Yashenko in the 717 Unison Racing Corvette. And rounding out the field is the treble seven, uh, Kim Pedersen in the Audi for the DSR Nightmare Squad. Still with me in the box, Yusuf has uh, not kicked me out just yet, so uh, <laughs> I haven't been working hard enough. Uh, I don't to have do the power to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Monza continues to be wet. I mean, we thought the rain, rain was going to pass by by now, but it uh, did have a bit of a flurry. Uh, a little while ago, so it's keeping the track fairly damp. Well, we haven't seen any more driver changes going on. It could be that these drivers are going to see the race out, which would be a particular um, impressive stint for uh, Kapusta and Ashenko specifically, because they've been in the car a good three hours at least by this stage. So they must be getting pretty tired with still another hour and 25 minutes to go. And one pit stop remaining in the race. We're expecting that pit stop to be coming through in, well, earliest 15 minutes time. And then any point after that would be the final pit stop these cars can tend to do. About one hour 10 max. I mean, one hour five max, and that's in, in the dry. So in the wet, you'd presume that they could maybe even do one hour 20. Uh, we already talked earlier on in the broadcast about how when it rains, you know, you can save so much fuel. You put it in a different engine map. You can lift and coast a bit more. But we spoke earlier about how we might be seeing a battle starting to emerge later into the race. And Denis Eschenko is still closing in onto Vangelis Parkinos, still gaining almost a second a lap last time around. Only seven tenths the lap before was over a second. Now he's 63 seconds behind us. Has he made a mistake? I th he just lost about two seconds. So. I think that's just where the, because uh, he was going through uh, okay. Retrofilia with the time. It's probably just where the, the braking zones are. There you go, the uh, timing is now a little bit corrected itself. It's, no one's making any uh, any big moves or big mistakes, so it's a little challenging for us to talk about. We'll do our best. Uh, we might be seeing, are we seeing some sunrise going on? The uh, sky didn't look entirely black. It's, I'm not sure what the uh, the timing scale is at the moment, but other than it's dark and very, very wet. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see any more time changes now, because I don't know that there's enough machinery circulating to be able to clear the, the water to any real degree. Likely everyone's going to stay on the tyres they're on. Continue to lap in the fashion they're doing. As mentioned, Tom Kapustia, four laps in the clear. And there he is, coming through the second Lesmo. He's been in that car for a considerable period of time. Big pardon, he's coming into the first Lesmo. Now going through the second one, it's a little difficult to tell from the dark. And even still, that car is still getting a little bit, uh, a little bit slippery as it's coming through, coming through the Lesmo now, heading down towards the Scarry. I would imagine he's uh, he's certainly feeling it by now. If not, he's an absolute machine. <laughs> We're going to have to ask him after the race, you know. Are you a machine? <laughs> are, are you a machine, you know? Were you getting tired? I think the other question is, were you getting a bit bored? Because he's just time trial for him, right? But mm. There's no one that can contest with him. And that's when it becomes even harder to keep concentration, you know? It's kind of like driving on the motorway at night. If you're on the motorway at night... You just, you know, you've got your foot on 70. If you're lucky, you've got cruise control. And that's all you're doing for, you know, half an hour. If you're driving through country roads at night, I find it very easy to stay awake. And it might be the same for Tom Kapusta. If you're making your way through back markers through some traffic, then helps you, you know, keep your eye on the ball a little bit. Whereas if there's nothing happening, you just get into a sense of routine. And sometimes that can be a bit of a bad thing. Yeah, completely. If you've got no one around you to, to sharpen the focus, it's even easier to take your eye off the ball for that split second. And we've seen, oh yeah, obviously with the amount of retirements we've had, not not all of them through driver error, of course, but you, we've seen it happen where that 
yeah, they, they, they've been in that routine for so long without anything to break it. Taking your eye out of focus just for that split second to send you spinning backwards into a wall, and all of that effort and all that time you've put in, and when they've been out there for ten and a half hours now, not one driver, of course, but the car has, the team has, they've been part of this event for pretty much the entirety of it. They're, they're all feeling it by now. Can you imagine? You know, you've been in the lead for well over half the race, and one mistake has stuck the car backwards into the wall. Oh, that would be devastating. But at the moment, Tom Capista is doing a brilliant job of averting exactly that. And trying to amaze had absolutely no uh, contest at all. Its closest com competition all weekend, indeed, has been the Mugen Sim Racing Team, the number 33 Audi, which, as we mentioned earlier, had that big incident with uh, running suits at the wheel, you know, that uh, big screen freeze. You know, four second screen freeze when you're traveling at you know, 200 kilometers plus is not going to end well. We never did hear what happened to the Prosim Bentley either, did we? Well, no, we didn't actually. Yeah. Um, because we saw, I mean, it looked like. It just oddly parked. VR. Didn't they? Yeah. I wonder whether it was a VR failure because it just looked yeah. the way that they kind of went straight off at uh, Lesmo 2, I think it was, or Lesmo, one of the Lesmos, and just then didn't do anything. It was some kind of technical failure, obviously. Or maybe they just decided to go sightseeing on that part of the track circuit who knows but yeah I would love to know what happened to the uh, the pro sim squad also we don't know who was at the wheel of the uh, of the Bentley it's the one team we, we weren't sure of which driver was active at any one time for some uh, reason that's just reminding me of um, I'd say an old YouTuber but I th he still makes his YouTube videos now Arava um, F1 and he once used to do a co-op championship with a lad called Tiamat Marduk and in one of their races, I think they were at Mexico they did a little skit called um, Arabs Wildlife Tour because he was all the way <laughs> at the back of the grid and had nothing to do, so he was just driving around, just talking about the circuit being, just making up some random stuff like this is where they keep the lions yeah, and, and it just went on <laughs> and, yeah. I just got that painted in my head you know, over here if you head into Ascari, this is a little cage where they keep the rhino trying to fit into the mini. And uh, <laughs> it continues. And so the meme begins. Uh, I met uh, I, I met Tim at Maddock when I was at Silverstone in 2018. Okay. That, was the, uh, that was the first season of F1 Esports, actually. And uh, oh. I was part of the commentary team leading up to, not for the live event, but I was part of the commentary team for the qualifiers for F1 Esports, so I had right. the opportunity to go to Silverstone when the F1 Esports drivers were there, so I actually got to meet quite a number of the people I'd been commentating on up to yeah. leading up to that event. That was actually quite nice. Um, we managed to bluff our way into, into a stand during F1 qualifying, I think it was. I had a <laughs> ticket, but the person with me didn't. And right. uh, I managed to, to successfully bluff my way past the uh, attendant, saying I needed him to get me up the stairs. And it worked. Ah. <laughs> so, so did, you, did you get, like, a walking stick out for the act? Or the, no. How did uh, that work? Well, I'm not sure I should tell the story, because it's where I was okay. actually lied to a Silverstone official. But, but uh, well, this was several years ago. I'm not sure, really sure what penalty they're going to put on me now. But... Uh, <laughs> Or so, you just get a letter saying that you're barred from Silverstone forever. Yeah, commencing 2018. Mm. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I basically, it's a bit, because again, I, I'm a big bloke, so I walk a little awkwardly. And I said, well, that's all well and good. You're saying he can't go in, but I need him to get me up the stairs. Because I had a, a, a grandstand ticket that uh, enabled me to go into the stands. So I was fine. So the guy looked at me, looked at the other guy, and went, oh, all right then. So uh, we kind of exaggerated me walking in pain up the stairs and uh, leaning on him, and it worked. <laughs> and uh, he didn't kick us out again. Uh, Not sure that would work now, in fairness. And then later, when, when you left, you just ran past the Leg dip. Perfectly <laughs> fine, yeah. <laughs> So that thought yeah, did, did cross my mind. Yeah, that thought did cross my mind as we came out, but it was a it was a different official when we came uh -huh. out. So, yeah, that probably wouldn't work anymore. 
Um, it's only a nightmare, uh, it's all very Covid affected. Although saying that, the Silverstone Grandstands were packed this year, weren't they? It was 350,000, I think? I mean, when Silverstone rolled around, I think the um, lockdown restrictions had ended. They had. So you can do as you please now. I believe yeah, I think they had, um, yeah, 350,000 over the course of the weekend, I believe, which is, you yeah, know, which is good. Up. Yeah. One or two people. Yeah, just a couple. You know, a couple of mates around the back garden <laughs> for a barbie. <laughs> but, and you imagine doing a barbecue <laughs> in the middle. Of, uh, a lot of people did that when I, because I was in the camping grounds, I didn't say at a hotel. Yeah. Uh, in that horrendous, oh, staying in a tent in that heat wave was not fun. There's just no air, okay. there was no wind at all. The only gust being created was by um, passing the cars. cars. <laughs> I was oh. up at I was up at Luffield's a lovely sound box and so everything sounded much okay. louder than it ought to have done. When I went to Silverstone the one time, and this was for the Renault support series, so they had the Renault McGann's Formula Renault. Um, I was actually also Luffield, I was on the bit from Luffield to Woodcut. Mm-hmm. Um, so somewhere in those stands, um, so I'm guessing in the same area as you. Because I was slightly I- further along, I was l- pretty much at the point where they just stomped on the gas to exit Luffield, so I was a bit more to okay, your yeah. right. Yeah. Um, you also reminded me with um, some of the Barbie talk that um, one of my first ever endurance races I did, which was for the BKC 24 Hours up north in Teesside, I went with um, the lads from York University, and uh, we got there. We thought, you know, we've got to get set up for this um, for this event. So, you know, we went out. We went to our we went to the local Asda. We bought ourselves a portable barbecue, and uh, we lit it up. And I think. This was in the middle of the race, so we would have been about 12 hours into the race. So we light up the barbecue, but we're all useless university students and none of us realize how to light up a barbie properly. So it's literally smoking to high heaven. And we had set up our barbecue right next to the track. I kid you not, it smoked across the track that I could not see properly. We then took the barbie, we tried to like run out as far as we could, but the damage was done. Anyone who's been to BUKC, what was it, 2016-17, will know, should know, the story of the smoking over the track they won't you did it you made a fog basically we made a fog over the track it was a clear it was a beautiful night it was cold as summer nights tend to be but it just randomly <laughs> smoke screen appeared over the track <laughs> oh dear uh, well you always know you always know you're cool when they announce your names over the intercoms. Whoever's <laughs> smoking across a tra- track, please put out your barbecue. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And you'd be surprised by this one, but when you pour water over a burning hot barbecue, it makes more smoke. There's a hell of a lot of smoke when you do that, yes. But then what choice have you got? You can't carry a burning barbecue generally. I suppose well, probably good. I we we ended up taking it over to like the far side of the track, like <laughs> away from the track, and then try to put it out. Um, thankfully, we didn't cause like an actual fire that then lit around the track for extra effect. That's where I thought you were going to go. <laughs> it's like you'd set fire to a table and that caught yeah. the grass this, and, this and stuff like that. This is a good story. It's not an amazing story. <laughs> Uh, I don't have any uh, crazy stories like that. I'm afraid I was a fairly, uh, I, I was a fairly sedate person in my youth. A long time, like I said, like I said yesterday, I was at school in, back in 1858. So my youth was a long time ago. Did you just say 1858? I did. Okay. Slight exaggeration. But, uh, slight exaggeration. I was like, <laughs> did they even have schools back then? Well, we we kind of counted. Uh, our abacuses were made out of rocks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was the height of technology for but us. But, like, so how did your abacuses work? Because I thought, like, the little stones had to go through the, like, poles. Like, did you drill through the stones? How, how did that work? Well, we, we kind of, like I said, we, we ended up just throwing the stones at each other anyway. So uh, nothing worked. Nothing, nothing really worked. <laughs> but, uh... Um, no, one plus one is three. <laughs> <laughs> 
you understand. <laughs> you follow how it worked. Oh, we have an Audi in the pits. Well, uh, whilst, whilst we're rabbiting on a race, he's still continuing. Uh, Kim Bede uh, Pedersen in the uh, treble seven has come in for a pit stop. I'd be surprised he's been in there a while. Mind you, the pit stops do take a while, in fairness. Uh, I'm uh, still not quite accustomed to how long the uh, endurance um, pit stay. But even still, they're still ploughing on. They may well be the uh, last car running, but... Well, they, that car has spun a few times, so there's probably something to fix on that car, in, in fairness. It's four laps down. It's not going to worry too much about uh, effective pit stops, are they? No. Uh, I mean, fair play to them for continuing. Yeah, they're four laps down from Denis Sinchenko. And that's a driver change. Karl uh, Ligard has uh, taken that one over. So, uh, I don't know if that makes the pit stop a little longer. But out they come now. It shouldn't do. Is what I want four to laps to make up in an hour? Easy. Why not? <laughs> well, so I mean, he needs a target, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, the field is perfectly spread, right? First and fourth are four laps away from, you know, that midfield battle. Um, yeah. There you go. Oh, Shenko's in. Shenko. Yep. So in comes... In now, is he going to hand over the car? Surely now the, uh, the Russian squad are just going to tempt him out with, you know, or force him out, probably. He has been in there a long, long time. I mean, it's a glorious car. That Corvette sound, the, the noise it makes when it comes past is just spectacular. Biased? Yes. Very. Oh, yeah. But the Bentley, is, it's got one of the best roars out there. It's very throaty. It's like, I mean... Very, very much so. Isn't it, you know, Bentley, same as Jaguar? Is it V10? I think the Bentley is V10, is it yeah. V6? Okay, V10. I, don't think he's, mm. well, I can't imagine he's V6. I'm going to have to mm. look it up now. I, I always forget what kind of sounds cars make and what Vs they are. <laughs> like, I know Ferraris is usually V12, right? Those are the loud, screamy ones. Um, and Certainly the in F1 terms, go, yeah. Uh, the lower you go, the more throaty they tend to no, get. Twin, twin turbo V8 for the Bentley. Twin turbo V8, there you go. And no, Dennis Ashenka's still in it. Oh, well, that's him to the end, then. Yep. Good grief. Good He's hope. been in there a lot. Well, yeah. Uh, he's been in there so long. What is that man fueled by? <laughs> Various. Uh, <laughs> well, he's Russian, so the obvious uh, is that would be vodka. <laughs> Don't drink and drive. Not condoning it. But. I'm trying to think if there are any other iconic Russian foods or drinks. Um, there, there probably are, but I'm too ignorant to know what they are. Um, probably be potato-based, because vodka is a potato alcohol. But then, Fair enough. then again, maybe it's just similar to Ireland in that sense. I doubt he's fueled by Guinness somehow. <laughs> Guinness. <laughs> Guinness, the Irish vodka. <laughs> That's a new one. How did we get to talking about alcohol? Good question. <laughs> well, what does he feel like was what started that? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's found something to fill himself up, just like we're finding something to fill up the airwaves. <laughs> uh, this actually reminds me of a, a conversation I was having with another caster. Uh, I think this was a, a League of Legends caster who said that he he had to go to a, a LAN event. This was a few years back, and I was just commentating on it. It was a, a fairly chill game, you know, it was like a, an exhibition match. Um, so he, he's doing his job, and um, someone in the audience essentially says, You're crap. I can do better than that. So, in the most Chad way possible, at least this is how he narrates the story. I wasn't there. <laughs> so, in the most Chad way possible, he says, Go Come on, on then. <laughs> and shows out his mic. So, he hands the mic over, and uh, this guy jumps on thinking he's all some kind of hot stuff. Uh, and he starts to commentate, and apparently, he's doing a decent job. And then the fights stop happening, and you get to this stage where nothing's happening. And the lad then very quickly gave the microphone back over <laughs> to <and laughs> <did> the commentator. <laughs> I've had many a conversation with commentators on what to do when the action goes quiet. And 
generally you you know uh, and uh, i'm sure you'll you'll know what i mean here there's you've got a stock of things to talk about yeah um track facts car facts driver facts previous events whatever it is um but there will come a time when you burn through them. Or one of the toughest commentaries uh, I've ever done in my five years of, of doing sim racing mm. commentary was actually on a race that never happened. There, there <laughs> oh, literally Lord. was no action, and this was um, there was an F1 esports event that was. Basically, it was postponed because Xbox Live had a complete meltdown. Which, yep. of course, is not, not anything that, that either we or anyone at Codemasters could control. But we're on air. And you you do what you must. You know, you've got to keep yep. going. And whilst there's still a chance of the race of getting underway, me and, and my co you know, my partner in crime, Justin continued to, to waffle on. And we, we stayed pretty much on topic. Yeah. For 45 minutes. And that's literally with no racing whatsoever. Yep. That was one of the hardest ones. We both, uh, you could just tell, and, and you'll understand that's what I mean, Yusuf, with this. When you repeat the same thing three times, but like 20 <laughs> minute intervals. <laughs> that's one thing. But you, if you've worked with a particular caster for a long time, you, you, you notice little subtle things, particularly when they're struggling. Where or when they when you can tell they're scrabbling for something to say, and we both clock this in each other. We off, yeah. once we'd come off, uh, we both said, Right, how far were you from talking about what breakfast you had in the morning? And we both were like <laughs> one fact away. Yeah, <laughs> we had to we burn everything it, we had. <laughs> I mean, last season in one of the uh, F1 leagues I was commentating with um, a class that you might know, Jacob Hancocks. Um, we so because F1 2020 was being a fun game. Essentially, we kept having lobby restarts for this league because, Excellent. you know, a player would disconnect and then there was a whole you know minus 200 degree tire glitch that existed. So we kept doing lobby restarts. I remember one race we had three lobby restarts, and this was after doing a full oh. qualifying. So we had been broadcasting from seven o'clock. Qualifying ended at eight. And then the race only ended up starting at about 8.40 or something. Um, so we were just filling in. Thankfully, though, we had a highlight video, so we could throw those in. But aside from that, we were just filling in the time. But I, I always just like to think of it. At the end of the day, we are entertainers. So it's, you know, you have to make the judgment call. What's the more entertaining thing? Is it talking after 20 minutes about race facts? Or do you start to go and, um, you know talk about Guinness and uh, vodka <laughs> rhinos in a mini I remember before I I, I I did a few solo endurance commentaries in the past oh, and I was wow. always and they're hard they're, they're difficult mm. um, when you've got someone to bounce off of it becomes so much easier for, for good commentators just to keep the flow going in whatever direction it goes in is not so much irrelevant but it's easy to maintain momentum but if you're on your own it, it, it is much more difficult uh, but I was always worried about you know thinking oh and, you know I, how am I going to keep a, a long broadcast going staying yep. staying on topic uh, well you can quite clearly tell by how much we've talked <laughs> tonight that I don't have that reservation these days but I tell you what broke it was listening to the beginning of the Le Mans 24 hour um I'm trying to remember. I think it was 2019. Listening to the commentary team. I'm afraid I don't know who the Le Mans commentators are. Um, the one of them was... Uh, oh, crikey, I've forgotten his name. F1 driver. Indian F1 driver. Uh, Chandok. Karun Chandok. Um, they were talking about the uh, the Pink Pig Porsche. And one of the commentators said this same sentence, same sorry, said that phrase three times in the same sentence. And Karim Chandot said, "Have you? Are you want to bet on how many times you can say pink, pink Porsche?" <laughs> and at that point, I thought, "There's room for for humour and and such like in a in a yeah. broadcast." It's it's something I have noticed when I compare um, 
I won't even say sim racing broadcast to real broad uh, to you know real life broadcasts. Um, it's something I've just noticed in just esports compared to traditional sports. The esports casters tend to just be a lot more humid, um, a lot more willing just to get into some of the jokes, a lot more willing to incorporate those jokes into their broadcasts and I always wonder, you know, is that just because they're targeted maybe towards a slightly younger audience and maybe so, but I know I enjoy them more. <laughs> uh, that could be part of it. I think, I, I, I fully agree uh, with that statement. I think it's more, um, it's more accepted in a sim racing context to have that kind of humor injected into into the the commentary whereas if you think about like the history again you know i, I refer to formula one because it's the most what i know most about but if yeah. you go back in, in not even that far um but you know the, the regulation the bbc i mean you go back far enough and uh, you you can't have an accent if you you come and you, if you talk with the bbc you have to stream speak like this you know you know, yeah you, you you had to have the very typical posh accent you had to articulate every word you know absolutely yeah. properly it must be queen's english that sort of thing so there was no room for anything any kind of humor you had to stick to the facts and it's taken a very very long time to breed that out of accepted broadcasting and societal standard as well i mean can you imagine um so i mean you do get a little bit of humor from the likes of you know crofty or brundle but it's not often but th there's not very often when they have to fill dead air in, 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 in honesty um, the practices they do in fairness to them although yeah, i've never but, actually listened to that yeah they they do because they must and more, yeah. much more so in practice because it's not constant action um but can you imagine that that sort of commentary that we get now interjected into a broadcast say 30 years ago yeah. someone would have had been fired uh, for doing that so, so the standard has changed over the years but in in sim racing and esport terms as a whole that expectation is very is, has always been very very different you've always well, um, don't even been expected to interject the humor but it's much easier it's much ex more accepted so having that humor there is uh, like you say it, it's great fun to listen to and often much more entertaining than than uh, the, you know the real life stuff in saying that, the, like I say, the societal standard is changing. Yeah, absolutely so, and yeah, there's less of um, an expectation to be, I won't say professional, because I still think he is professional, but to be proper, I think mm -hmm. would be the better term to, uh, for it. Um, but with that, we are at the hour. There remains just one hour in the race, actually 58 minutes. So I think we're going to be jumping to a break, and then after that, we will be heading on into our final hour of the 12 Hours of Monza. Stay tuned. The GTR 24H 12 Hours of Monza special event is brought to you in partnership with Viper Gaming by Patriot, Fleet Gaming, ESTV, and motorvision.tv Racing for Green is here to help you carbon neutralize your racing. By planting new trees, Racing for Green offers to make your racing carbon neutral. We already have the calculations, contacts, infrastructure, deals and solutions ready for you to easily buy carbon neutral laps on any racetrack. It doesn't matter if you are a racing fan, team owner, driver, sponsor or partner. Anyone can buy CO2 neutral laps in the Racing for Green webshop and trade CO2 emissions for new forest. Racing for Green.
a 1v2 for the tournament. Pressure is on. Final hour then of the 12 hours of Bonza as hosted by GTR 24 r Still led by Tom uh, Kapusta. He has not handed that car over in the last pit stop. He is he's probably much just glued to it by now. He's probably stuck in there. Uh, but still piloting the 65 McLaren. He leads by what is now three laps. So in the uh, pit stop phase, the number 14 car has closed in a little bit. That's not enough to uh, make a substantial difference. And so they still continue to uh, make their way around. The rain is absolutely chucking it down again. So the uh, rain passing comment of earlier has been completely proven wrong. Mother Nature will not be tamed. <laughs> it's and just so, um, more with the weather, just defying what we expect of it. It happened earlier yep. on where we said rain's coming, rain's coming, didn't. Never did. Come. <laughs> and then eventually it showed up, and now it's not. It's not. It's not leaving. Well, it took that long to arrive. It's now staying right with us. So, Vangelis Pagados uh, in the number 14 Aston remains in second. Denis Sashenko also didn't hand the car over on his last stop in the 717 Unison Racing Corvette, uh, the treble seven. Uh, DSR Nightmare Squad in the Audi did hand the car over to Carl uh, Ligard in the last stop. Uh, with the gaps between them, it's not likely we'll see a major shift in the positions unless someone has a completely horrendous time, which of course is still possible. We've uh, been going a long, long time now. Less than an hour to go. Uh, final stretches in sight. Does this put more pressure on the drivers, do you think? Probably so. Um, who knows, really? <laughs> um. I mean, with the gaps between them, probably not. But it's that kind of that forcing yourself to focus. You know, we're nearly there. We've come this far. Let's not fail now. Kind of mentality. I've, I've always noticed that with racing, um, and this has gone for real life racing as well as sim racing. Whenever you go into a race with the objective of not going fast and trying to hold on to a position or just taking it calm that's when you make mistakes case in point for me being sebastian vettel canada 2011 uh, thought he had the race in the bag took it easy made a mistake and i think in his own words afterwards he said i'm never going to do that again i will always push <laughs> and he said if i was pushing that mistake would not have happened because when you take things easy that's when that's when things can catch you unaware that's when you know you're not paying full attention because you're not going at the same breakneck speeds you're not on the limit you're not expecting something to happen when, when you're pushing you're always expecting something to, to go wrong your head's constantly going through different scenarios of what can you do if something does go wrong when you're just chilling and driving around you're not expecting anything to go wrong so when something does go wrong you require that little bit of extra time and essentially it adds a reaction time you know it adds thinking time to reaction time because you actually have to think about it whereas before your brain had already considered it before it even happens mm, yeah you're, you're not ready for a mistake to happen when when, when you're at peak performance so to speak you're you're prepared for pretty much anything to happen and if the car then does suddenly start to misbehave your your focus and attention is that sharpened uh, that 
a moment that you react to it straight away. Whereas, you know, exactly you said, we were talking about this earlier, where you know when you've been running in that autonomous mode for a, a very long period of time you can't stay at that heightened level the whole stint long you know the, physically impossible i mean the yeah. the, the, the gods amongst uh, amongst humans might be able to do it you know the very very uh highly experienced and highly athletic uh endurance races but may be able to stay at that level for a long time but there, there'll be a point where they where that will slip yeah i mean just because you can doesn't mean you will right mm. i don't think I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly hugely experienced in endurance racing, but I don't think for any endurance driver, they're pushing, you know, 100% for their entire sin. I don't think that's the case at all. Maybe in kart racing, that might be the case, but in car racing, definitely not. You know, you've got to manage your tyres, you've got to manage your fuel, you've got to ma manage everything. You can't be, you know, using it all. Maybe if you've got a short stint towards the end, you know, a quick splash and dash, throw some fuel in the car, then maybe you give it everything to, to the very end if you're hunting someone down. But otherwise, you know, you do have to be giving yourself a bit of a margin for error so that if something does happen, you can catch it. And that's not to say that you aren't, you know, pushing through corners. It's just, you know, lifting coast into corners. Um, I think it was Jackie Stewart who's, who said, you know, or maybe it was David Coulter, I can't remember which, but you don't want to break as late as you can for a corner you know break a bit earlier let it coast in because if you break as late as you possibly can you might gain a couple of hundreds but by breaking as late as you can that also means you have to get off the brakes at the perfect time and if you hold on to those brakes for literally half a tenth too long you end up losing you know a tenth or so because you end up going into the corner five ten miles an hour too slow yeah, yeah, that that makes perfect sense. Uh, but I mean, <laughs> some drivers won't go by that methodology. They'll, they'll break as late as they can every single time. But yeah. again, it's it's near impossible to maintain top top pace at that level of consistency for a very 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 long period of time. It just, I mean, human endurance just doesn't allow it. If I mean, if there are any like aspiring drivers, if there are any people out there who don't believe that. Go onto any any simulator, load up your lap time, and watch how much quicker you'll go coming out of the corner if you don't go into it quickly. Like, chill into the corner and then get on the power really early and watch you yourself gain time. I've noticed that pretty much every time you go on to, well, usually I do on iRacing because um, they've got, you know, updating like constantly. Um, but to be honest, you can do it with pretty much any, any simulator. And you'll notice that every time you do it, where you take it nice and easy in and you come out, you'll gain a fair bit of time on corner exit. Um, and if you're just pushing into a corner, you know, you just end up scrubbing a bit too much speed going in. Yes, you gain time going into the corner, but depending on the length of the straight after, you end up losing a lot more time. Yeah, and Jackie Stewart also said that uh, the exit of a corner is way more important than its entry. Yeah. Initially, I, I couldn't follow the logic, but then having trying in sim racing, you you far you will gain far more by getting the exit right than the entry. So you know, the far more important in leaving a corner properly at the right pace or with as much pace as you can um, than going into it at a decent pace and getting the exit wrong. Yeah. Um, I mean, Jackie Stewart's given a lot of really good driving tip, tips, actually. Um, some of them are actually incredibly useful. Um, I do recommend that anyone who is actually looking to improve, you know, check out some of the stuff he said. Um, gave a lot of advice apparently on how to get 